Talmud, Mosque Hathabo, A C H A P T E R I Mishnah Maiden is married on the fourth day of the week and a widow on the fifth day for twice in the week. The courts of justice sit in the towns on the second day of the week and on the fifth day, so that if he the husband had a claim as to the virginity of the maiden bride, he could go early on the morning of the fifth day of the week to the court of justice. Gemara R. Joseph said, Rab Judah said that Samuel said, Why did they, the rabbi say? A maiden is married on the fourth day because we have learned if the time appointed for the marriage arrived and they were not married, they eat of his food and they eat of terima. You might think that if the time arrived on the first day in the week, he would have to supply her with food. Therefore, have we learned a maiden is married on the fourth day, said our Joseph, Lord of Abraham. He Samuel attaches a mission which was taught to a mission which was not taught, which was taught and which was. Not taught this was taught and this was taught, but put it this way, he attaches a mission of the reason of which was explained to a mission of the reason of which was not explained, but if it was said it was said thus Rab Judah said that Samuel said, Why did they say a maiden is married on the fourth day? Because if he had a claim as to the virginity, he could go early next morning to the court of justice. Well, let her be married on the first day in the week, so that if he had a claim as to virginity, he could go early on the morning of the second day of the week to the court of justice. The answer is the sages watched over the interests of the daughters of Israel so that the bridegroom should prepare for the wedding feast three days, namely on the first day in the week, the second day in the week, and the third day in the week, and on the fourth day he marries her, and now that we have learned shape that mission which we have learned if the time arrived and they were not. Married they eat of his food and they eat of terima is to be understood as implying that if the time arrived on the first day in the week since he cannot marry her on the first day of the week on account of the ordinance he does not give her food on the three days from the first day of the week to the fourth day therefore our Joseph concludes if he became ill or she became ill or she became menstruous he does not give her food some scholars there are who put this as a question if he became ill what is the law shall I say there the reason he need not support her is because he is forced and here he is also forced or shall I say perhaps there he is forced by an ordinance which the rabbis ordained but here he is not and if you will say if he became ill he supplies her with food and the question would still be if she became ill what is the law can he say unto her I am you ready to marry you or perhaps she can say unto him his field has been flooded and if you will say that she can say to him when she falls ill his field has been flooded and the question is if she became menstruous what is the law during her regular time there is no question Talmud, Mosque hath both be that she cannot say to him his field has been flooded when is the question asked if she became menstruous not during her regular time what is the law since it is not during her regular time she can say unto him his field has been flooded or perhaps since there are women who change their periods it is as if it was her regular time Araha explained we learned when the time came and they were not married they eat of his food and they eat of terima it does not state that the men did not marry them the women but it says that the women were not married in what case if they prevent why do they eat of his food and eat of the terima hence you must say must you not that they were forced as in this case and it states they eat of his food and they eat of terima Arashi said indeed I can say that in the case of an accident she does not eat of his and here they the men prevented and by right he ought to have stated that the men did not marry the women but since the first clause speaks of them the women the latter clause also speaks of them the women Rabbah said and with regard to divorce it is not so accordingly Rabbah holds that accident is no plea in regard to divorce whence does Rabbah get this rule shall I say from what we have learned. Behold this is thy bill of divorce if I come not back from now until twelve months and he died within the twelve months there is no divorce and we would conclude from this that only if he died there is no divorce but if he became ill there is a divorce but perhaps indeed I might say that if he became ill there would also he no divorce and the mission lets us hear just this rule that there is no divorce after death that there is no divorce after death a previous mission teaches. Behold, this is a bill of divorce if I die, or behold, this is a bill of divorce from this illness, or behold, this is a bill of divorce after my death. He has not said anything, but perhaps that is to exclude from that of our teachers, for it has been taught our teachers allowed her to marry again, and we said who are our teachers. Rab Judah said that Samuel said the court that allowed the oil of the heathen they hold like our Jose who said the date of the document shows it, but from the later clause, this is a bill of divorce from now. If I come not back from now and until twelve months and he died within the twelve months, it is a divorce, and we may deduce if he died, and the same rule applies if he became ill, but perhaps the divorce is effective only when he died because it was not pleasing to him that she should become subject to the Yabam, but the deduction can be made from this. There was a certain man who said unto them, If I do not come back from now. Until thirty days it shall be a divorce. He came back at the end of thirty days, but the fairy stopped him. He said unto them, Look, I have come back, look, I have come back, said Samuel. This is not regarded as having come back, but perhaps an accident which is frequent is different, for since he ought to have stipulated it, and he did not stipulate it, he injured himself. But we must say Rabbah expressed an opinion of his own on account of the chaste women and on account of the loose women on account of the chaste women, because if you will say that it should not be a divorce, Talmud, Mosque Hathabo, that sometimes it may happen that he was not held back by an accident, and she would think that he was held back by an accident, and she would be tied and sit and on account of the loose women, because if you will say that it should not be a divorce, sometimes it may happen that he was held back by an accident, and she would say that he was not held back by an accident, and she would go and Get married and the result would be that the divorce was invalid and her children from the second marriage would be bastards but is it possible that according to the law of the Bible it would not be a divorce and on account of the chaste women and on account of the loose women we should allow a married woman to the world yes everyone who betrothes in accordance with the sense of the rabbis he betrothed and the rabbis have annulled his betrothal said Rabbanu Arashi this might be well if he betrothed her with money but if he betrothed her by act of marriage what can one say then the rabbis have made his act of marriage non-marital some however say as follows Rabbah said and so also with regard to divorce accordingly Rabbah holds that the plea of accident applies to divorce an objection was raised behold this is a bill of divorce if I come not back from now and until twelve months and he died within the twelve months there is no divorce now if he dies there is no divorce, but if he became ill, there would be a divorce. Indeed, El might say unto thee that if he became ill, there would be no divorce either. And the Mishnah lets us hear just this rule that there is no divorce after death, that there is no divorce after death. The previous Mishnah teaches perhaps that is to exclude from that of our teachers come and hear from now. If I have not come back from now and until twelve months and he died within the twelve months, it is a divorce would not. The same rule apply if he became ill, no only if he died because it was not pleasing to him that she should become subject to the Yabam. Come and hear a certain man said unto them, If I do not come back from now and until thirty days, it shall be a divorce. He came back at the end of thirty days, but the fairy stopped him and he said unto them, Look, I have come back, look, I have come back. And Samuel said, This is not regarded as having come back an accident which is frequent is different. For since he ought to have stipulated it and he did not stipulate it, he injured himself. Our Samuel B. Isaac said they have only taught since the institution of Ezra and after according to which the courts of justice sit only on the second day and on the fifth day of the week. But before the institution of Ezra, when the courts of justice sat every day, a woman could be married on any day before the institution of Ezra. What there was there was he means it thus if there are courts of justice that sit now as before the institution of Ezra, a woman may be married on any day. But what of Sheikh do we suppose that he had already taken the trouble? Talmud, Mosque Hathabot B. What is the reference to Sheikh before it has been taught? Why did they say that a maiden is married on the fourth day? Because if he had a claim as to virginity, he could go early next morning to the court of justice, but let her be married on the first day in the week. And if he had a claim as to virginity, he could go. Early on the morning of the second day in the week to the court of justice the sages watched over the interests of the daughters of Israel so that the man should prepare for the wedding dash feast three days the first day in the week and the second day in the week and the third day in the week and on the fourth day he marries her and from the time of danger and onwards the people made it a custom to marry on the third day and the sages did not interfere with them and on the second day of the week he shall not marry and if on account of the constraint it is allowed and one separates the bridegroom from the bride on the nights of Sabbath at the beginning because he makes a wound what was the danger if I say that they said a
into a room and the bridegroom and the bride into the bridal chamber Talmud, Moskata both a and he performs the dutiful marital act and then separates himself from her and then he keeps the seven days of the wedding dash feast and after that he keeps the seven days of mourning and during all these days he sleeps among the men and she sleeps among the women and they do not withhold ornaments from the bride all the thirty days but that is only if the father of the bridegroom or the mother of the bride died because there is then no one who should prepare for them for the wedding but not in case of the reverse Raphram B. Papa said that Aristas said they taught this only when water had already been put on the meat but if water had not yet been put on the meat it is to be sold Rabba said and in a city although water had been put on the meat it is sold Our Papa said and in a village although water had not been put on the meat it is not sold but where then will you Find the rule of our to apply said Arashi for instance in Matha Mahaja which is neither a city nor a village it has been taught according to our Hista, if his bread was baked and his meat prepared and his wine mixed and water had been put on the meat and the father of the bridegroom or the mother of the bride died they bring the dead person into a room and the bridegroom and the bride into the bridal chamber and he performs the dutiful marital act and then separates himself from her and then he keeps the seven days of the wedding dash feast and after that he keeps the seven days of mourning and all these days he sleeps among the men and she sleeps among the women and so also if his wife became menstruous does he sleep among the men and she sleeps among the women and they do not withhold ornaments from the bride all the thirty days in any case he must not perform the first marital act on the eve of Sabbath or in the night following the Sabbath the master said above. He sleeps among the men and she sleeps among the women that supports our Yohanan for our Yohanan said although they said that there is no mourning on a festival yet matters of privacy he keeps our Joseph the son of Rabba lectured in the name of Rabba they taught only if he had yet no intercourse with her but if he had already intercourse his wife may sleep with him but here we deal with the case when he had intercourse and still it teaches that he sleeps among the men and she sleeps among the women when did he say it with regard to his wife becoming menstruous but it says and so also if his wife became menstruous Talmud, Moskata both be thus he means to say and so also if his wife became menstruous and he had not yet had intercourse with her he sleeps among the men and she sleeps among the women is this then to say that he treats mourning more lightly than menstruation surely our Isaac the son of Hanan said that Arhuna said all kinds of work which a wife performs for her Husband the menstruant may perform for her husband except the mixing of the cup and the making of the bed and the washing of his face his hands and his feet while with regard to mourning it has been taught although they said no man has a right to force his wife to paint her eyes or rouge her face in truth they said she mixes him the cup and she makes him the bed and she washes his face his hands and his feet this is not difficult here it speaks of his mourning there it speaks of her mourning but it says the father of the bridegroom or the mother of the bride died this refers to the rest but is there a difference between his mourning and her mourning surely it has been taught if a man's father-in-law or mother-in-law died he cannot force his wife to paint her eyes and to rouge her face but he lowers his bed and keeps mourning with her and so also if a woman's father-in-law or mother-in-law died she is not allowed to paint her eyes and to rouge her face but she Lowers her bed and keeps mourning with him teach with reference to his mourning he sleeps among the men and his wife sleeps among the women but it says and so also this refers to painting and rouging but it says with him does this not mean with him in one bed no it means with him in one house and as Rab said to his son hi in her presence keep mourning in her absence do not keep mourning Arashi said can you compare this morning with ordinary morning ordinary morning is strict and one would not deal lightly with it but this morning since the rabbis were lenient about it one might deal lightly with it what is the leniency shall I say because it says he performs the dutiful act of marriage and separates himself from her that is because the morning has not rested upon him yet namely if according to our Eliza the morning does not begin until the body has been taken out of the house and if according to our Joshua the morning does not begin until the Golel has been closed, but the leniency is this because it says he keeps first the seven days of the wedding dash feast and after that he keeps the seven days of mourning the master said in any case he must not perform the first marital act on the eve of sabbath or in the night following the sabbath it is right that he may not perform it on the eve of sabbath because of a wound but in the night following the sabbath why not said our zera talmud moskata both the talmud moskata both because of accounts said of a to him and our accounts of a religious nature forbidden surely our hista and our hamna both said accounts of a religious nature one is allowed to calculate them on sabbath and our eliezer said one may assign charity to the poor on sabbath and our jacob said that our yohanan said one may go to synagogues and to school houses to watch over public affairs on sabbath and our jacob the son of Edi said that our yohanan said one may do any work to save a life on sabbath and our samuel the son of Namani said that our Jonathan said one may go to theaters and circuses to watch over public affairs on Sabbath and a scholar of the school of Minashia taught one may negotiate about the girls to be betrothed on Sabbath and about a boy to teach him the book and to teach him a trade but said Arzara it has been prohibited lest he might slaughter a fowl said Abbe to him but if this were so then the day of atonement which fell on the second day of the week should be postponed for fear lest he might slaughter a fowl there that he has to prepare only for himself he is not troubled so much but here that he has to prepare for others he is troubled or there he has an interval but here he has no interval now that you have come so far the eve of Sabbath also is prohibited for fear lest he might slaughter a fowl the question was asked does the mission mean a maiden is married on the fourth day of the week and the intercourse takes place on the fourth day and we are not Afraid that he might be pacified, or perhaps the meaning is a maiden is married on the fourth day of the week and the intercourse takes place on the fifth day because we are afraid that he might be pacified. Come and hear Barkabur taught a maiden is married on the fourth day of the week and the intercourse takes place on the fifth day because on it the fifth day the blessing for the fishes was pronounced. The widow is married on the fifth day of the week and the intercourse takes place on the sixth day because on it the sixth day was pronounced. The blessing for man we thus see that the reason is on account of the blessing, but as to his being pacified, we are not afraid. If so, in the case of a widow also the intercourse should take place on the fifth day of the week because on it the fifth day was pronounced. The blessing for the fishes, the blessing for man is better for him, or on account of they have watched for it has been taught. Why did they say that a widow is? Married on the fifth day of the week and the intercourse takes place on the sixth day because if you will say that the intercourse should take place on the fifth day in the morning he will rise and go to his work therefore the sages watched over the welfare of the daughters of Israel that he should rejoice with her three days namely on the fifth day of the week on the eve of Sabbath and on Sabbath what is the difference between the blessing and they have watched the difference is this in the case of a man of leisure or in the case when a festival falls on the eve of Sabbath Barkabra expounded the work of the righteous is greater than the work of heaven and earth for in regard to the creation of heaven and earth it is written in my hand hath laid the foundation of the earth and my right hand hath spread out the heavens while in regard to the work of the hands of the righteous it is written the place which thou hast made for thee to dwell in O Lord the sanctuary O Lord which thy hands have established replied one Babylonian and our high was his name it is written and the dry land his hands formed it is to be written his hand but it is written they formed said Arnam and be Isaac his fingers formed as it is written when I behold thy heavens the work of thy fingers the moon and the stars which thou hast established an objection was raised it is written the heavens declare the glory of God and the work of his hands the firmament shows thus he said it and the work of the righteous who shoes at the firmament and what is it rain Barkabra also expounded what is the meaning of what is written and thou shalt have a peg among thy implements do not read thy implements but upon thy ear this means to say that if a man hears an unworthy thing Talmud Moskata both be he shall plug his finger into his ears and this is the same that our Eliezer said why do the fingers of men resemble pigs why shall I say because they are divided surely each one has been made for its own purpose for a master said this one is used for measuring the span this one is used for taking a fistful of the meal offering this one is used for defining the cubit measure this one is used for taking the measure of a finger and this one is used for service with the thumb but the question is why are the fingers pointed like pigs the reason is that if a man hears an unworthy thing he shall plug his fingers into his ears a member of the school of R. Ishmael taught why is the whole your heart and the ear
We'll say that the Halachat is according to Arjuna then the question arises does he do damage by making a wound or does he improve by making a wound and if you will say that he does damage by making a wound and the question arises with regard to one who does damage is the Halachat according to Arjuna Talmud, Mas Ketha both or is the law according to our Simeon in the school of Rab they said Rab aloud and Samuel forbade and Nihartia they said Rab forbade and Samuel aloud. Said Arnam and B. Isaac in your mnemotechnical sign is these make it lenient for themselves and these make it lenient for themselves but does Rab allow it surely Arshai my B. Hezekiah said in the name of Rab as regards that stopper of the brewing boiler it is forbidden to squeeze it in on a festival day in that case even Arsimian admits that it is forbidden for Abe and Rabba both of them say Arsimian admits that it is forbidden in a case of let his head be cut off and let him not. Die but Arhai the son of Ashi said that Rab said the Halachat is according to Arjuta and Arhain and the son of Amai said that Samuel said the Halachat is according to Arsimian and Arhai the son of Abin taught it without naming the men Rab said that the Halachat is according to Arjuta and Samuel said that the Halachat is according to Arsimian still Rab holds like Arjuta but according to that version that says the blood is stored up in the womb he does damage in regard to it. Opening and according to that version that says the blood is the result of a wound he does damage in making a wound are his dog objected if a girl whose period to see blood had not arrived yet got married Beth I say one gives her four nights and the disciples of Hillel say until the wound is healed up if her period to see blood had arrived and she married Beth I say one gives her the first night and Beth Hillel say until the night following the Sabbath one gives her four. Nights Talmud, Mas Ketha both be now does it not mean that if he had yet no intercourse with his wife he may have intercourse with her even on Sabbath said Rabba no except Sabbath said Abbe to him but it says until the night following the Sabbath one gives her four nights only said Rabba when he already had intercourse with her if it were as you say after he already had intercourse what does he let us hear he lets us hear that it is allowed to have intercourse on Sabbath is that. Statement of Samuel teaches for Samuel said one may enter into a narrow opening on Sabbath although he causes pebbles to break loose our Joseph objective bridegroom is free from the reading of Shema in the first night until the night following the Sabbath if he has not performed yet an act is it not because he is anxious to perform the marital act said Abbe to him no he is anxious because he has not had intercourse said Rabba to him and on account of anxiety only he is free from reading. Shema if this were so then if his ship sank in the sea he would also be free from the reading of Shema and should you say that it is really so surely our Abba Bizab said that Rab said a mourner is bound to observe all the precepts that are stated in the Torah except that of the Tefillin because it is said with regard to them an ornament but said Rabba this is a dispute of Tanaim for one very the teaches if he did not do an act of cohesion in the first night he is free from reading Shema also in the second night in the second night he is free from reading Shema also in the third night and another very the teaches in the first and second night he is free but in the third night he is obliged to read Shema and Abba holds that there also they differ with regard to anxiety and these Tanaim are like those Tanaim for it has been taught in the very the he who marries a maiden shall not perform the first intercourse on Sabbath and the sages. Allow it who are the sages said Rabbi it is Arsimian who says a thing which is not intended is allowed said Abbe to him but Arsimian admits that it is forbidden in a case of let his head be cut off and let him not die said he to him not like those Babylonians who are not skilled in moving aside but there are some who are skilled in moving aside if so why give the reason of anxious for one who is not skilled and let them say one who is skilled is allowed to perform the first intercourse on Sabbath one who is not skilled is forbidden most people are skilled said Rabbi the son of Arhain and to Abbe if this were so then why have groomsmen why have a sheet Abbe said to him there the groomsmen and the sheet are necessary perhaps he will see and destroy the tokens of her virginity are I objected he who pierces an abscess on Sabbath if in order to make an opening to it he is guilty but if in order to cause pus to come out of it Talmud, Mas Ketha both. He is free from punishment there it is stored up and is entirely loose here it is stored up but is not entirely loose or am I allowed to have first intercourse on Sabbath said the rabbis to him but her ketubah is not written yet he said to them let her seize movable goods are Zebah permitted to have the first intercourse on Sabbath some say Arzebah himself had the first intercourse on Sabbath Rab Judah allowed to have the first intercourse on a festival our poppy said in the name of Rabbah. You shall not say that on a festival it is allowed but that on Sabbath it is forbidden it is just as well allowed on Sabbath only it happens so our papa said in the name of Rabbah on a festival it is allowed on Sabbath it is forbidden said our papa to our papa what is your opinion since a wound has been permitted on a festival for a necessity it has been permitted also when there is no necessity if that were so it should be permitted to put spices on coals on a festival for since the kindling of Fire has been allowed on a festival for a necessity it should be allowed also when there is no necessity said he to him concerning this the biblical verse said save that which every man must eat this means a thing which is useful for every man Araha the son of Rabbah said to Arashi if this were so then if a deer happened to come to the hands of a person on a festival shall we say that since it is not of equal usefulness for every person is it really so that it would be forbidden to kill it? Said he to him I say a thing that is needful for every person and a deer is needful for every person our Jacob the son of Edi said our Yohanan gave a decision in Zidon it is forbidden to perform the first intercourse on Sabbath and is there an instructive decision for a prohibition yes we have learned in a mission of the school of Hillel gave a decision regarding her that she should be a Nazi right yet another seven years or indeed it is as that which has been taught at the court of the spinal. Column is separate in its larger portion. The animal is trefa. This is a view of Rabbi Ar Jacob says even if it is only perforated, the animal is trefa. Rabbi gave a decision according to Ar Jacob. Ar Huna said the halachah is not as stated by Ar Jacob. Ar Naman B Isaac taught us. Ar Rabbi said Ar Ishmael B Jacob from Tyre asked Ar Yohanan in Zidon and I heard it is it allowed to have the first intercourse on Sabbath and he said to him it is forbidden and the law is it is allowed to have it. First intercourse on Sabbath. Ar Helbo said that Ar Huna said that Ar Rabbi the son of Zabdi said that Rabbi said a maiden as well as a widow requires a benediction but did Ar Huna say so did not Ar Huna say a widow does not require a benediction it is not difficult here it speaks of a young man who marries a widow there of a widower who marries a widow and when a widower marries a widow benediction is not required did not Ar Naman say Huna be Nathan said to me attend taught whence is it. Derived that the benediction of the bridegrooms has to be said in the presence of ten persons because it is said and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said sit ye down here and they sat down and Boaz was a widower who married a widow what is the meaning of the words she does not require a benediction which Arhuna said she does not require a benediction during all the seven days but on one day she requires a benediction but that which has been taught the sages were anxious. For the welfare of the daughters of Israel that he may rejoice with her three days how is this to be understood if it speaks of a young man did you not say seven if a widower did you not say one day if you wish you may say that it speaks of a widower and in this case one day is for the benediction and three days are for rejoicing and if you wish you may say that it speaks of a young man and in this case seven days are for the benediction and three days for rejoicing Talmud. Mosque at both be an objection was raised it has been taught the benediction is said at the celebration of the marriage for a maiden seven days and for a widow one day is it not to be understood that even in the case of a widow who marries a young man the benediction is said only on one day no only when the widow marries a widower but if the widow marries a young man within seven days if that is so let it be taught the benediction is said for a maiden seven days and for a widow who marries a young man seven days and for a widow who marries a widower one day it taught a decided thing that there is no maiden who has less than seven days and there is no widow who has less than one day the above text says Arnaman said Hunabi Nathan said to me attend taught once is it derived that the benediction of the bridegrooms has to be said in the presence of ten persons because it is said and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said sit ye down. Here but Arabah said that it is derived from here in assemblies bless ye God the Lord from the fountain of Israel and how does Arnaman expound this verse of Arabah he requires it for the same purpose as has been set out in the very
Universe who has sanctified us by his commandments and has commanded us concerning the forbidden relations and has forbidden unto us the betrothed and has allowed unto us the wedded through the marriage canopy and sanctification. Araha the son of Rabbah concludes it in the name of Rab Judah with the words Blessed art thou, O Lord, who sanctifies Israel through canopy and sanctification. He who does not seal holds that it is analogous to the blessing over fruits and to the benediction set on. Performing religious commandments and he who seals holds that it is analogous to the Kiddush. Our rabbis taught the blessing of the bridegrooms is said in the presence of ten persons all the seven days Rab Judah said and that is only if new guests come what does one say Rab Judah and blessed art thou O Lord our God King of the universe Talmud, Mosque Ketha who has created all things to his glory and the creator of man and who has created man in his image and the image of the likeness of his form and has prepared unto him out of himself a building forever blessed art thou O Lord creator of man may the barren greatly rejoice and exult when her children will be gathered in her midst enjoy blessed art thou O Lord who makes Zion joyful through her children mayest thou make the love companions greatly to rejoice even as of old thou didst gladden thy creature in the garden of Eden blessed art thou O Lord who make bridegroom and bride to rejoice blessed art thou O Lord our King. God of the universe who has created joy and gladness, bridegroom and bride, rejoicing, song, mirth and delight, love and brotherhood and peace and friendship, speedily, O Lord our God, may be heard in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of the singing of bridegrooms from their canopies and of youths from their feasts of song, blessed art thou, O Lord, who make the bridegroom to rejoice with the bride. Levi came to the house of Rabbi to the wedding feast of our Simeon his son and said five benedictions, Arasi came to the house of Arashi to the wedding feast of Mar his son and said six benedictions. Does it mean to say that they differ in this that one holds that there was one formation and the other holds that there were two formations? No, all agree that there was only one formation, but they differ in this one holds that we go according to the intention and it. Other holds that we go according to the fact as that statement of Rab Judah who asked it is written and God created man in his own image and it is written male and female created he them how is this to be understood in this way in the beginning it was the intention of God to create two human beings and in the end only one human being was created Arashi came to the house of Arkahana the first day he said all the benedictions from men and further on if there were new guests he said all the benedictions but if not he declared it to be merely a continuance of the same joy in which case one says only the benedictions in whose dwelling there is joy and who has created from the seventh day to the thirtieth day whether he said to them because of the wedding or whether he did not say to them because of the wedding one says the benediction in whose dwelling there is joy from men and further on if he said to them because of the wedding he says the benediction in whose Dwelling there is joy but not otherwise and if he says to them because of the wedding until when is this benediction said said our papi in the name of Rabbah twelve months forming a year and at first from when said our papa from the time that they put barley into the mortar but this is not so did not our papa busy himself for his son Abamar and say the benediction from the time of the betrothal it was different in the case of the papa because he took the trouble of preparing everything for the wedding Rabbah busied himself for his son in the house of Arhabba and said the benediction from the time of the betrothal he said I am sure with regard to them that they will not retract the betrothal but the matter was not successful and they did retract our Talifa son of the west came to Babylon and said six long benedictions but the law is not according to him Arhabba came into the house of a circumcision and said the benediction in whose dwelling there is joy but the law is not According to him, since they are distressed because the child has pain, Arnaman said that Rab said bridegrooms are of the number and mourners are not of the number. An objection was raised, bridegrooms and mourners are of the number. You ask from Avarita against Rab Rab is a tana and differs. It has been said, Our Isaac said that our Yohanan said bridegrooms are of the number and mourners are not of the number. An objection was raised, bridegrooms and mourners are of the number. Talmud, Moss. Ketha both be with regard to what was that taught with regard to grace after meals and with regard to what did our Yohanan say this ruling with regard to the line of comforters. But then what of the dictum of which our Isaac said that our Yohanan said one says the benediction of the bridegrooms in the presence of ten male persons and the bridegrooms are of the number and one says the benediction of the mourners in the presence of ten male persons and the mourners are not of the number. Is there a benediction said in the line of comforters? But the answer is with regard to what did our Yohanan say? This ruling with regard to the benediction recited in the open space. But then what of the dictum which our Isaac said that our Yohanan said? One says the benediction of the bridegrooms in the presence of ten male persons all the seven days, and the bridegrooms are of the number. And one says the benediction of the mourners in the presence of ten male persons all the seven days, and the mourners are not of the number. Is the benediction recited in the open space? Said all the seven days it is possible in the presence of new friends, as in the case of Arhai the son of Abba, who was the Bible teacher of the son of Reshlakish, or as some say the Mishnah teacher of the son of Reshlakish. It happened as follows: a child of Arhai the son of Abba died. The first day he Reshlakish did not go to him. The next day he Reshlakish took with him Judah. The Son of Namani his maturgement and said to him rise and say something with regard to the death of the child he spoke and said it is written and the Lord saw and spurned because of the provoking of his sons and his daughters this means in a generation in which the fathers spurned the holy one blessed be he he is angry with their sons and their daughters and they die when they are young and some say that he the child of Arhai the son of Abba that died was a young man and that he Judah the son of Namani said thus to him therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men neither shall he have compassion on their fatherless and widows for everyone is profane and an evildoer and every mouth speak folly for all this his anger is not turned away but his hand is stretched out still what is the meaning of but his hand is stretched out still said Arhain and the son of Rab all know for what purpose a bride is brought into the bridal chamber but whoever disgraces his Mouth and utters a word of folly, even if a divine decree of seventy years of happiness were sealed and granted unto him, it is turned for him into evil. He came to comfort and he grieved him. This he said to him, Thou art important enough to be held responsible for the shortcomings of the generation. He then said to him, Rise and say something with regard to the praise of the Holy One. Blessed be he. He spoke and said, The God who is great in the abundance of his greatness, mighty and strong. In the multitude of awe inspiring deeds who revive the dead with his word, who does great things that are unsearchable and wondrous works without number. Blessed art thou, O Lord, who revivest the dead. He then said to him, Rise and say something with regard to the mourners. He spoke and said, Our brethren who are worn out, who are crushed by this bereavement, set your heart to consider this. This it is that stands forever. It is a path from the six days of creation. Many have drunk, many will drink. As the drinking of the first one so will be that of the last ones our brethren the Lord of consolation comfort you blessed be he who comforteth the mourner said Abbe many have drunk he should have said many will drink one should not have said the drinking of the first ones he should have said the drinking of the last ones one should not have said for our Simeon the son of Lachish said and so one has taught in the name of our Jose man should never open his mouth to Satan said our Joseph what text shows this we should have been as Sodom we should have been like unto tomorrow what did he reply unto him hear the word of the Lord ye rulers of Sodom etc he then said to him rise and say something with regard to the comforters of the mourners he spoke and said our brethren bestows of loving kindnesses sons of bestows of loving kindnesses who hold fast to the covenant of Abraham our father for it is said for I have known him to the end that he may command his children etc our brethren May the Lord of recompense pay you your reward. Blessed art thou who payest the recompense. He then said unto him, Rise and say something with regard to the whole of Israel. He spoke and said, Master of the world's redeem and save, deliver and help that people Israel from pestilence and from the sword and from plundering and from the blast and from the mildew and from all kinds of calamities that may break forth and come into the world before we call. Mayest thou answer, Blessed art thou who stayest the plague. Ola said, and some say that it was taught in the very the ten cups of wine the scholars have instituted to be drunk in the house of the mourner three before the meal in order to open the small bowels, three during the meal in order to dissolve the food in the bowels, and four after the meal, one corresponding to who feedeth, one corresponding to the blessing of the land, one corresponding to who rebuildeth Jerusalem
Here by the sense we have already learned it if a man says to a woman I have betrothed thee to myself and she says thou hast not betrothed me to thyself she is allowed to marry his relatives but he is forbidden to marry her relatives what you might have supposed is that there he causes a prohibition to himself because it is certain to him but here it is not quite certain to him therefore he lets us hear this rule but did our Eliezer say so did not our Eliezer say the wife does not become forbidden for her husband save in the case of warning and seclusion and as we find in the occurrence that happened but how can you in any case understand it was the occurrence that happened accompanied by warning and seclusion and again did they declare her forbidden this is no difficulty for thus he means to say the wife does not become forbidden for her husband save in the case of warning and seclusion and this we learn from the occurrence that happened because there there was no warning and seclusion and therefore she was not forbidden but the former question is nevertheless difficult in the case of warning and seclusion but not in the case of an open opening but according to your argument the question could be asked in the case of warning and seclusion yes and in the case of witnesses no hence he means to say thus the wife does not become forbidden for her husband through one witness but through two witnesses but in the case of warning and Seclusion even through one witness and an open opening is like two witnesses and if you will say in the case of the occurrence that happened why did they not declare her forbidden the answer is there it was compulsion and if you wish you can say as our Samuel the son of Naaman he said that our Jonathan said Talmud, Mosk hath both be Talmud, Mosk hath both be everyone who goes out into the war of the house of David writes for his wife a deed of divorce for it is written and to thy brethren shalt. Thou bring greetings and take their pledge what is the meaning of and take their pledge our Joseph learned things which are pledged between him and her Abbe said we have also learned this a maiden is married on the fourth day of the week this implies only on the fourth day but not the fifth day what is the reason presumably on account of the cooling of the temper now in which respect could the cooling of the mind have a bad result if with regard to giving her the kathub let him give. It to her consequently we must say only with regard to making her forbidden for him and it is a case where he puts forward a claim is it not that he puts forward the claim of an open opening no it is a case where he puts forward the claim of blood Rab Judah said that Samuel said if anyone says I have found an open opening he is trusted to cause her to lose her kathuba said our Joseph what does he let us hear we have already learned this he who eats at his father-in-law's between the time of betrothal and the time of marriage in Judea without witnesses cannot after the marriage raise the claim of the loss of virginity because he is alone with her in Judea he cannot raise this claim but in Galilee he can raise it now in which respect if to make her forbidden for him why should he not be able to raise this claim in Judea consequently we must say it is to cause her to lose her kathuba and it is in a case when he raises a claim is it not that he raises it Claim of an open opening. No, when he raises the claim of blood, Talmud, Moscat of it was stated. Rabnam and said that Samuel said in the name of our Simeon B. Eliezer, the scholars ordained for the daughters of Israel as follows: for a maiden two hundred zoos and for a widow a maiden one hundred zoos, and they trusted him so that when he said, I have found an open opening, he is believed. If so, what have the sages accomplished with their ordinance? Said Rabbi, the presumption is that no one will take the trouble of preparing a wedding dash feast and will then spoil it. One has taught since it is a fine instituted by the sages, she shall collect only from the worst land of the husband's estate. You say a fine, why a fine? Say then, since it is an ordinance of the sages, she shall collect only from the worst land of the husband's estate. Rabbi Simeon B. Gamaliel says the kathub of a wife is from the Torah, but did Rabbi Simeon B. Gamaliel say so? Surely it has been taught it is. Written in the Torah, he shall pay money according to the Dari of Virgins. This teaches us that this is as much as the Dari of the Virgins, and the Dari of the Virgins is as much as this. But the sages found a support for the rule that the Kathuba of a wife is from the Torah. Rabbi Simeon B. Gamaliel says the Kathuba of a wife is not from the words of the Bible, but from the words of the Sofrim. Reverse it, and why does it appear to you right to reverse the latter teaching? Reverse it. Former teaching, we have already heard that our Simeon, the son of Gamaliel, said that the Kathuba is from the Bible, for we learned Rabbi Simeon B. Gamaliel says he gives her the Kathuba in Cappadocian points, and if you wish, you may say the whole of it is according to Rabbi Simeon B. Gamaliel, only it is defective, and it teaches us here the sages found a support for the rule that the Kathuba of a wife is from the Torah. The Kathuba of a widow, however, is not from the words of the Torah. But from the words of the Sofrim, for Rabbi Simeon B. Gamaliel says the Kathuba of a widow is not from the words of the Torah, but from the words of the Sofrim. Someone came before Arnaman and said to him, I have found an open opening. Arnaman answered, Lash him with palms, which is harlots lie prostrate before him. But it is Arnaman who said that he, the husband, is believed, he is believed. But at the same time, one lashes him with palms, which is Araha answered. Here it speaks of a young man. There it speaks of one who was married before someone came before Rabbi Gamaliel and said to him, I have found an open opening. He, Rabbi Gamaliel, answered him, Perhaps you moved aside, I will give you an illustration to what is this like to a man who was walking in the deep darkness of the night and came to his house and found the door locked. If he moves aside the bolt of the door, he finds it open. If he does not move aside the bolt of the door, he finds it locked. Some say that he are. Gamaliel answered him thus perhaps you moved aside willfully and you tore away the door and the bar I will give you an illustration to what is this like to a man who was walking in the deep darkness of the night and came to his house and found the door locked if he moves aside the bolt of the door willfully he finds it open if he does not move aside the bolt of the door willfully he finds it locked someone came before Rabbi Gamaliel the son of Rabbi and said to him my master I have had intercourse with my newly wedded wife and I have not found any blood she the wife said to him my master I was a virgin he said to them bring me that cloth they brought him the cloth and he soaked it in water and he washed it and he found on it a good many drops of blood thereupon he Rabbi Gamaliel said to him the husband go be happy with thy bargain Hunamar the son of Rabbi Parazika said to our Ashi shall we also do it he answered him Talmud Mosk hath both be our laundry work is like their washing and if you will say let us do laundry work my answer is the smoothing stone will remove it someone came before Rabbi Gamaliel the son of Rabbi and said to him my master I have had intercourse with my newly wedded wife and I have not found any blood she the wife said to him my master I am still a virgin he then said to them bring me two handmaids one who is a virgin and one who had intercourse with a man they brought to him two such handmaids and he placed them upon a cask of wine in the case of the one who was no more a virgin it smell went through in the case of the virgin the smell did not go through he then placed this one the young wife also on a cask of wine and it smell did not go through he then said to him go be happy with thy bargain but he should have examined her from the very beginning he had heard a tradition but he had not seen it done in practice and he thought the matter might not be certain and it would not be proper to deal lightly with daughters of Israel, someone came before Rabbi Gamaliel the elder and said to him, My master, I have had intercourse with my newly wedded wife, and I have not found any blood. She the wife said to him, My master, I am of the family of Dorkadi, the women of which have neither blood of menstruation nor blood of virginity. Rabbi Gamaliel investigated among her women relatives, and he found the facts to be in accordance with her words. He then said to him, Go be happy with thy bargain. Happy art thou that thou hast been privileged to marry a woman of the family of Dorkadi. What is the meaning of Dorkadi? A cut off generation. Our Hannah said, Vain consolation. Rabbi Gamaliel offered to that man for our high taught as the leaven is wholesome for the dough, so is blood wholesome for a woman. And one has also taught in the name of our Mayor, every woman who has abundant blood has many children. It has been said, Our Jeremiah B. Abba said, He Rabbi Gamaliel said to him, Husband be happy with thy bargain but our Jose B. Aben said he said to him thou hast been punished with thy bargain we quite understand the one who says thou hast been punished with thy bargain this is according to the view of our Hannah but according to him who says be happy with thy bargain what is the advantage of such a marriage he the husband does not come to any doubt regarding menstruation someone came to Rabbi and said my master I have had intercourse with my newly wedded wife and I have not found any blood she said my master I was and am still a virgin and it was a period of years of dearth Rabbi saw that their faces were black and he commanded concerning them and they brought them to a bath and
Atones and removes the same meaning it removes evil decrees and atones for sins are Hannah of Baghdad also said dates warm satisfy act as a laxative strengthen and do not make one delicate rap said if one has eaten dates he should not give a legal decision an objection was raised dates are wholesome morning and evening in the afternoon they are bad at noon they are incomparable and they remove three things evil thoughts stress of the bowels and abdominal troubles do we say that they are no good. They are indeed good only for the moment they cause unsteadiness it is analogous to wine for the master said he who has drunk one fourth of a log of wine shall not give a legal decision and if you wish you may say there is no difficulty this is before a meal and that is after a meal for Abbe said mother told me dates before a meal are as an axe to the palm tree after a meal as a bar to the door dasha door Rabba explained Derek Sham the way their darkest stairs ladder Rabba explained Derek. Gag the way of the root bed our papa explained Shetir and Wirabin Allah because one is fruitful and multiplies on it Arnam and B. Isaac said Talmud, Mosque Ketha both we will also say and if the barren woman that is a man like woman who does not bear children Mishnah a woman proselyte a woman captive and a woman slave who have been redeemed converted or freed when they were less than three years and one day old their Ketha is two hundred Zuz and there is with regard to them. The claim of non dash virginity Gamara Arhuna said a minor proselyte is immersed by the direction of the court what does he let us know that it is an advantage to him and one may act for a person in his absence to his advantage surely we have learned this already one may act for a person in his absence to his advantage but one cannot act for a person in his absence to his disadvantage what you might have supposed is that an idolater prefers a life without restraint because it is established. For us that a slave certainly prefers a dissolute life therefore he lets us know that this is said only in the case of a grown-up person who has already tasted sin but in the case of a minor it is an advantage to him may we say that this mission supports him a woman proselyte a woman captive and a woman slave who have been redeemed converted or freed when they were less than three years and one day old etc is it not that they immerse them by the direction of the court no here we treat of the case of a proselyte whose sons and daughters were converted with him so that they are satisfied with what their father does our Joseph said when they have become of age they can protest against their conversion Abbe asked a woman proselyte a woman captive and a woman slave who have been redeemed converted or freed when they were less than three years and one day old their ketubah is two hundred Zuz now if you indeed mean to say that when they have become of age they can Protest against their conversion would we give her the ketubah that she may go and eat it in her heathen state when she has become of age but when she has become of age too she can protest and go out as soon as she was of age one hour and did not protest she cannot protest any more robber raised an objection these maidens receive the fine if a man has intercourse with a bastard in ethan akuti and a proselyte a captive or a slave who have been redeemed converted or freed when they were less than three years and one day old they have to be paid the fine now if you say that when they have become of age they can protest would we give her the fine that she may go and eat it in her heathen state when she has become of age when she has become of age too she can protest and go out as soon as she was of age one hour and did not protest she cannot protest any more Abbe did not say as Rabbi said because there where it speaks of fines we can say this is the reason that they Sinner should not have any benefit. Rabbi did not say, as Abbe said, because in the case of the Ketubah, we can say that this is the reason that it should not be a light matter in his eyes to send her away. Mishnah, when a grown-up man has had sexual intercourse with a little girl, or when a small boy has intercourse with a grown-up woman, or when a girl was accidentally injured by a piece of wood. In all these cases, their Ketubah is two hundred Zuz. So, according to our Meir, but the sages say, the girl who was injured accidentally by a piece of wood, her Ketubah is a maina, a virgin who was a widow, a divorcee, or a halia, from marriage, her Ketubah is a maina Talmud. Mas Ketubah both be, and there is with regard to them no charge of non-virginity. A woman proselyte, a woman captive, and a woman slave who have been redeemed, converted, or freed when they were more than three years and one day old, their Ketubah is a maina, and there is with regard to them no charge of non-virginity. Gemara Rab. Judah said that Rab said a small boy who has intercourse with a grown-up woman makes her as though she were injured by a piece of wood. When I said it before Samuel, he said injured by a piece of wood does not apply to flesh. Some teach this teaching by itself as to a small boy who has intercourse with a grown-up woman. Rab said he makes her as though she were injured by a piece of wood. Whereas Samuel said injured by a piece of wood does not apply to flesh. Arashi objected when a grown-up man has had intercourse with a little girl, or when a small boy has intercourse with a grown-up woman, or when a girl was accidentally injured by a piece of wood. Dash in all these cases, their ketubah is two hundred zuz. So according to our Meir, but the sages say a girl who was injured accidentally by a piece of wood, her ketubah is a main Rabbi said it means this when a grown-up man has intercourse with a little girl, it is nothing for when the girl is less than this, it is as if one puts a finger. Into the eye, but when a small boy has intercourse with a grown-up woman, he makes her as a girl who is injured by a piece of wood. And with regard to the case of a girl injured by a piece of wood itself, there is a difference of opinion between Armadier and the sages. Rami Bihama said the difference of opinion is only when he knew her. For Armadier compares her to a mature girl, and the sages compare her to a woman who had intercourse with a man. But if he did not know her, all agree that she has nothing. And why does Armadier compare her to a mature girl? Let him compare her to a woman who had intercourse with a man. In the case of a woman who had intercourse with a man, a deed had been done to her by a man. But in her case, no deed has been done to her by a man. And why do the rabbis compare her to a woman who had intercourse with a man? Let them compare her to a mature girl. In the case of a mature girl, no deed whatsoever has been done to her. But in her case, a deed has been done to her. But if he did not know her, all agree that she gets nothing. Our nomin objected if she says I was injured by a piece of wood, and he says no. But thou hadst intercourse with a man, Rabbi Gamaliel, and our Eliezer say that she is believed. But said Rabbi whether he knew her and whether he did not know her. According to our Meir, her ketubah is two hundred zuz. Whereas according to the rabbis, if he knew her, her ketubah is a mina. If he did not know her, she gets nothing. Rabbi however changed his opinion for it has been taught. How does the bringing out of an evil name take place? He comes to court and says I so and so have not found in thy daughter the tokens of virginity. If there are witnesses that she has been unchanged, asked under him she gets a ketubah of a mina. But surely if there are witnesses that she has been unchanged, asked under him she is to be stoned. It means this if there are witnesses that she has been unchanged, asked under him she has to be stoned. If she was unchanged, asked before the Betrothal she gets a ketubah of a maina now our high bi said that Arshis hate said this teaches if he married her in the presumption that she is a virgin and she was found to have had intercourse with a man she gets a ketubah of a maina whereupon our nomin objected if one marries a woman and does not find in her virginity and she says after thou hadst betrothed me to thyself I was forced and thus thy field has been inundated and he says no but before I betrothed thee unto me. Thou hadst intercourse with a man my bargain is thus a mistaken one etc and this assuredly means she is to get nothing and our high bi said to them is it possible Aram and all the great ones of the age sat when Arshis hate said that teaching and they found it difficult and he answered in which respect is it indeed a mistaken bargain in respect of two hundred zoos but a she gets as a ketubah and you say that it means she gets nothing whereupon Rabbi said he who asked this. Question has asked well for a mistaken bargain means entirely but then that other teaching presents a difficulty put it right and say thus if there are witnesses that she was unchanged asked under him she has to be stoned if she was unchanged asked before the betrothal she gets nothing if she was found to be injured by a piece of wood she has a ketubah of a mina but surely it was Rabbi who said above that according to the rabbis if he did not know her she gets nothing hence you must conclude from this that Rabbi retracted from that opinion our rabbis taught if the first husband took her the bride to his home for the purpose of marriage and she has witnesses that she was not alone with him or even if she was alone with him but she did not stay with him as much time as is needed for intercourse the second husband cannot raise any complaint with regard to her virginity for the first husband had taken her to his home for the purpose of marriage Talmud, Mosque Rabbi said this teaches that if he married her in the presumption that she was a virgin and she was found to have had
Presence of witnesses cannot raise a complaint regarding the virginity because he has been alone with her Gemara since it says in the Mishnah he who eats it follows that there are places also in Judea where one does not eat. Abbe said conclude from this that in Judea too the places differ in their custom as it was taught our Judah said in Judea they used formerly to leave the bridegroom and the bride alone one hour before their entry into the bridal chamber so that he may become intimate with her but in Galilee they did not do so in Judea they used formerly to put up two best men one for him and one for her in order to examine the bridegroom and the bride when they entered the bridal chamber and in Galilee they did not do so in Judea formerly the best men used to sleep in the house in which the bridegroom and the bride slept and in Galilee they did not do so and he who did not act according to this custom could not raise the charge of non-virginity to which does this refer shall I? Say that it refers to the first clause if so it ought to read he who acted according to this custom again if you will say that it refers to the last clause it ought to read he who was not examined Abbe said indeed it refers to the first clause so read he who acted according to this custom said Rabbah to him but it reads he who did not act but said Rabbah it means thus he who did not act according to the custom of Galilee in Galilee but acted according to the custom of Judea in Galilee cannot raise the claim of virginity or as she said indeed it refers to the last clause and we should read he who was not examined Mishnah it is all one whether the woman is an Israeli Tishwidow or a priestly widow or Kethubah is a main of the court of the priests collected for a maiden 400 ZUZ and the sages did not prohibit it to them Gemara Tana taught and the priestly widow her Kethubah is 200 ZUZ but we have taught in our Mishnah an Israeli Tishwidow as well. As a priestly widow, her Kethuba is a maina said, Arashi, there were two ordinances. At first, they ordained for a maiden 400 zoos and for a widow, a maina Talmud. Mos Ketha both be when they saw that they treated them lightly, they ordained for them 200 zoos when they saw again that they kept away from them. For they said, instead of marrying a priestly widow, we shall rather marry the virgin daughter of an Israelite. They restored their former ordinance, the court of our priests. Etc. Our Judah said that Samuel said they did not say it only regarding the court of the priests, but even the noble families in Israel, if they want to do as the priests do, may do so. An objection was raised if one wants to do as the priests do. For instance, if the daughter of an Israelite gets married to a priest, or the daughter of a priest gets married to an Israelite, one may do so. We would infer from this that only if the daughter of an Israelite gets married to a priest or the Daughter of a priest gets married to an Israelite, it is allowed to do as the priests do because there is then one side of priesthood, but if the daughter of an Israelite gets married to an Israelite, it is not allowed to do as the priests do. The Mishnah states here a case of not only not only is it allowed in the case of the daughter of an Israelite getting married to an Israelite who cannot say to her, I raise thee to a higher position, but in the case of the daughter of an Israelite getting married to a priest who can say to her, I raise thee to a higher position, I might think that it is not allowed. Hence he lets us hear that this is not so Mishnah if a man marries a woman and does not find in her virginity, and she says, After thou hadst betrothed me unto thee was forced, and so thy field has been inundated, and he says, No, but I occurred before I betrothed thee to me, and my bargain was a mistaken bargain, Rabbi Gamaliel and our Eliezer say that. She is believed, but our Joshua says we do not live from her mouth, but she is in the presumption of having had intercourse before she was betrothed and having deceived him until she brings proof for her statement. Gemara, it was stated if one person says to another person, I have a mina in your hand, and the latter says, I do not know Rab Judah and Arhuna say he is bound to pay, and Arnaman and Aryohan and say he is free from the obligation to pay Arhuna and Arjuda say he is bound to pay because they hold that in the case of Shurian, perhaps Shur has it Arnaman and Aryohan and say he is free from the obligation to pay because they hold the view leave the money in the possession of its present owner. Abbe said to our Joseph, the opinion of Arhuna and Rab Judah corresponds with the view of Samuel, for we have learned if she was pregnant, and they said to her, What is the nature of this embryo? And she answered, It is from the man so and so, and he is a priest rabbin. Gamaliel and our Eliezer say that she is believed and Rab Judah said that Samuel said that the Halachah is according to Rabban Gamaliel and our Samuel B. Judah said to Rab Judah sharp with one you said to us in the name of Samuel that the Halachah is according to Rabban Gamaliel also in the first mission now what means also in the first mission assuredly it must mean although one could say leave the money in the possession of its present owner still Rabban Gamaliel said sure has. It is it then to say that our Judah and our Huna follow the opinion of Rabban Gamaliel and our Naman and our Yohan and follow the opinion of our Joshua our Naman can answer you I even follow the opinion of Rabban Gamaliel only Rabban Gamaliel says it there because there is Migo but what Migo is there here or again Rabban Gamaliel says it only there because we say leave her in her presumptive state but here what presumptive state has he got it is also evident that it is right as we have answered. That our Naman follows the opinion of Rabban Gamaliel Talmud, Mos Ketha Botha, for if it were not so there would be a difficulty between one law and another law, for it is established for us that in civil matters the law is according to our Naman, whereas in this case our Judah said that Samuel said that the Halachah is according to Rabban Gamaliel, is it not then to be concluded from this that it is as we have answered conclude so from this Mishnah if she says I was injured by a piece of wood and he says no thou hast had intercourse with a man Rabban Gamaliel and our Eliezer say she is believed and our Joshua says we do not live from her month but she is in the presumption of having had intercourse with a man until she brings proof for her statement tomorrow with regard to what are their claims are Yohanan says with regard to 200 zoos and Amin our Eliezer says with regard to Amin and nothing are Yohanan says with regard to 200 zoos and Amin because he Shares the opinion of Armeir who says that whether he knew of her or did not know of her she gets as her Kethuba 200 zoos and our Eliezer says with regard to Amina or nothing because he shares the view of the rabbis who say that whether he knew of her or did not know of her she gets as her Kethuba Amina it is quite right that our Eliezer does not say as our Yohanan says because he establishes it according to the rabbis but why does not our Yohanan say as our Eliezer says he holds that when he married her in the presumption of her being a virgin and she is found to have had intercourse she has a Kethuba of Amina according to this view here he would say Amina and she would say Amina and what difference would there be between his claim and her claim now it is quite right according to our Eliezer that we have stated two cases wanted to exclude the opinion of Rami Biham and one to exclude the opinion of our Habib in the name of our hate but According to our Yohan and why are two cases necessary one to show you the strength of Rabban Gamaliel and one to show you the strength of our Joshua the first case to show you the strength of our Joshua that although one could say there Migoshi is not believed the second case to show you the strength of Rabban Gamaliel that although one cannot say there Migoshi is believed Mishnah if they saw her talking with someone and they said to her what sort of a man is he and she answered he is a man so and so and he is a priest Rabban Gamaliel and our Eliezer say she is believed and our Joshua says we do not live from her mouth but she is in the presumption of having had intercourse with a Nathan or a Mamzer until she brings proof for her statement if she was pregnant and they said unto her what is the nature of this poetess and she answered it is from the man so and so and he is a priest Rabban Gamaliel and our Eliezer say she is believed and our Joshua says we do not live from her mouth but she is in the presumption of being pregnant from a Nathan or a Mamzer until she brings evidence for her statement tomorrow what is the meaning of talking Zeiri said she was hidden RC said she had intercourse it is quite right according to Zeiri that it says talking but according to RC why does it say talking it is a more appropriate expression as it is written she eat and wipe her mouth and said I have done no wickedness it is quite right according to Zeiri that he teaches in the Mishnah two cases talking and pregnant but according to RC why does the Mishnah teach two cases one case to declare her fit and one case to declare her daughter fit that is quite right according to him who says that he who declares her fit declares also her daughter fit but according to him who says that he who declares her fit declares her daughter unfit what is there to say RC holds a view of him who says that he who declares her fit declares also her daughter fit our papa said to Abbe according to Zeiri who said what is talking she was hidden and our Joshua said that she is not believed did not rap say we punish
town are fit with regard to her, but in the case of a ruin of a field when most of the men are unfit with regard to her, I might say that he agrees with our Joshua, and if it had told us only this case, I might have said that only in this case did our Joshua say that she is not believed, but in that case, I might say that he agrees with Rabban Gamaliel, therefore it was necessary to state both cases. An objection was raised. This is a testimony with regard to which the woman is fit, but are. Joshua says she is not believed, said our Joshua to them. Do you not agree that in the case of a woman who was captured and there are witnesses that she was captured and she says I am pure, she is not believed. They said to him, Yes, but what a difference there is between this case and that case. In this case there are witnesses, and in that case there are no witnesses. He said to them, In that case too, there are also witnesses for her stomach reaches up to her teeth. They said to him, Most of the idolaters are unrestrained in sexual matters. He said to them, There is no guardian against unjustity. This applies only in the case of the testimony of the woman with regard to herself, but in the case of the testimony of the woman with regard to her daughter, all agree that the child is a shedaki. Now what did he say unto them and what did they answer him? This they said unto him, You have answered us with regard to the pregnant woman. What will you answer us with regard to the woman whom they saw? Talking to a man, he said to them, the woman whom they saw talking to a man is the same as the captive woman. They said to him, the captive woman is different for most of the idolaters are unrestrained in sexual matters. He said to them, here also since she hid herself, there is no guardian against unjustity. Now at all events, he teaches two cases, the woman whom they saw talking to a man and the pregnant woman. This is a refutation of RC. This is indeed a refutation, but let this difference weigh with him there. Most of the men are unfit with regard to her, but here most of the men are fit with regard to her. This supports the opinion of our Joshua B. Levi for our Joshua B. Levi said, he who declares her fit declares her fit even when most of the men are unfit and he who declares her unfit declares her unfit even when most of the men are fit. Our Yohanan said, he who declares her fit declares also her daughter fit and he who declares her unfit declares also her daughter unfit and our Eliezer said even he who declares her fit declares her daughter unfit. Rabbi said what is the reason of our Eliezer this it is quite right with regard to her she has the presumption of fitness but her daughter has no presumption of fitness. Our Eliezer objected to the ruling of our Yohanan this only applies to the testimony of the woman with regard to herself but in the case of the testimony of the woman with regard to her daughter all agree that the child is a Shedeki does this not mean a Shedeki and unfit no a Shedeki and fit but is there a Shedeki who is fit yes according to Samuel for Samuel said if ten priests are standing together and one of them goes away and has intercourse with a woman the child is a Shedeki now what means here a Shedeki is it to say that he is silenced from the property of his father this is evident do we know who his father is it means one silences him from the rights of priesthood for it is written and it shall be unto him and to his Seat after him the covenant of an everlasting priesthood that is only one whose seat is legitimately descending from him, excluding this one whose seat is not legitimately descending from him. A bridal couple once came before our Joseph, she said it is from him, and he said Talmud, Moscow, both yes it is from here. Joseph said, Why should we be afraid? First he admits, and moreover, Rab Judah said that Samuel said the Halachah is according to Rabban Gamaliel, Abbe said to him, and in this case, if he did not admit, would Rabban Gamaliel declare her as fit? Did not Samuel say to Rab Judah, Sharp would one the Halachah is according to Rabban Gamaliel, but you should not act upon it unless most men are fit for her, whereas here most men are unfit for her, and according to your reasoning is not this statement in itself difficult. First he says the Halachah is etc., and then do not act in practice on it, hence you must say the one ruling applies before the other after it was done and in. This case also it is like after it was done. Abbe asked Rabbi, did our Joshua say she is not believed? This would be in contradiction with the following our Joshua and our Judah be, but there are testified concerning the widow of one who was of a mixed family that she is fit to marry a priest. He said to him, Now is this so there the woman marries and in that case she examines and then marries, but here the woman misconducts herself. Does she first examine and then misconduct herself? Rabbi said is the contradiction only between one statement of our Joshua and the other statement of our Joshua, but not between one statement of Rabban Gamaliel and another statement of Rabban Gamaliel. Surely the concluding clause teaches Rabban Gamaliel said to them, We accept your testimony, but what can we do since Rabban Yohan and Bizakai decreed that no court be set up for this purpose because the priests will obey you to remove but not to bring near, but said Rabbi, there is no contradiction between the Statement of Rabban Gamaliel and the other statement of Rabban Gamaliel because there it is sure and here it is perhaps neither is there a contradiction between the one statement of our Joshua and the other statement of our Joshua because there there is one doubt and here there is a double doubt therefore according to Rabban Gamaliel the sure is so strong a plea that even where there is only one doubt he declares her fit and the perhaps is so we could plead that even where there is a double doubt he declares her unfit and according to our Joshua one doubt is so strong that even in the case where she pleads sure he declares her unfit and a double doubt is so light that even in the case where she pleads perhaps he declares her fit our rabbis taught which is the widow of one of a mixed family when there is with regard to it no doubt on account of Mom's Ruth Nadeth and on account of slaves of the king's army said Talmud Mosque hath both be I have Heard that when there is none of these defects in the family, one permits its members to marry into the priesthood. Our Simeon B. Eliezer said in the name of our Meir and our Simeon, the son of Manasseh, also said it, which is the widow of one of a mixed family. When a doubtful halal was mixed up in it, for the Israelites know the Mamzerim who are among them, but they do not know the halalim who are among them. The master said, which is the widow of one of a mixed family, when there is with regard to it. No doubt on account of Mamzerim, Nathan, and on account of slaves of the kings, this would show that if there is a doubt on account of a halal in the family, it is fit. Why should these be different? Because these are biblical. A halal is also biblical. And further, our Meir said, I have heard that when there is none of these defects in the family, one permits its members to marry into the priesthood. This is the same as that which the first tenet taught. And further, our Simeon B. Eliezer. Said in the name of Armeir and Arsimian Bimanazi also said it which is the widow of one of a mixed family when a halal was mixed up in it for the Israelites know the Mamzerim who are among them but they do not know the halalim who are among them surely it says in the first clause that if there is a doubt regarding a halal in the family the family is fit to marry into the priesthood our Yohanan said there is a difference between them concerning a person who when he is called Mamzer protest and when he is called halal is silent the first tana holds that every person who when called unfit is silent is considered unfit and thus the first tana said which is the widow of one of a mixed family when there is in it no one who is silent if he is called Mamzer or Nathan or slave of the king or halal whereupon Armeir said to him this applies only to each of these cases since he who calls him thus is liable to render him unfit to enter into the congregation but he who is called the halal and is silent is fit and the reason he is silent is that it does not trouble him whereupon our Simeon B. Eliezer said to the first tana of our if you have heard that our mayor declares the person fit in the case of silence this is not when he is called halal and is silent but when he is called mamzer and is silent for the reason he is silent is because he says to himself a mamzer is well known but if he is called mamzer and he protests or he is called halal and is silent he is unfit for the reason he is silent is because he thinks it is enough if he is not excluded from the congregation one buried the taught our Jose says if he is called mamzer and is silent he is fit and if he is called halal and is silent he is unfit and another buried the taught if he is called halal and is silent he is fit but if he is called mamzer and is silent he is unfit there is no difficulty the one is according to the first tana in the sense of our mayor and the other one is according to our Simeon B. Eliezer in the sense of our Meir Mishnah, our Jose said it happened that a girl went down to draw water from a spring and she was ravished. Our Yohanan Binuri said if most of the inhabitants of the town marry their daughters into the priesthood, this girl may also marry into the priesthood. Gemara Rabbah said to our Naman, according to whom did our Yohanan Binuri say this? And the Mishnah, if according to Rabban Gamaliel, surely he declares as fit even when there is a majority of unfit. And if it is according to our Joshua, surely he declares as unfit even when there is a majority of fit. He said to him, Rajuda
of the majority of the inhabitants of the town if he went to her let us say that he who separates himself separates himself from the majority it speaks of a case when she went to him so that he was stationary and Arzara said all that is stationary is considered as have to have but do we require two majorities has it not been taught if nine meat shops all of them sell ritually killed meat and one shop sells meat not ritually slaughtered and he bought in one of them and he does not know in which of them he bought it is prohibited because of the doubt but if meat was found one goes after the majority and if you will say that it speaks of a case when the gates of the city are not closed so that a majority came also from outside did not Arzara say even when the gates of the city are closed where purity of descent is concerned they put up a higher standard the text says Arzara said all that is stationary is considered as have to have this apparently means whether it is for leniency or for strictness whence does Arzara take it shall I say from the very which teaches that if nine meat shops all of them sell ritually killed meat and one shop sells meat not ritually slaughtered and he bought in one of them and he does not know in which of them he bought it is prohibited because of the doubt but if meat was found one goes after the majority there it is for strictness but he derives it from the following if there were in a certain place nine frogs and one reptile and he touches one of them and he does not know which of them he touched he is unclean because of the doubt there also it is for strictness but rather from the following if there were in a certain place nine reptiles and one frog and he touches one of them and he does not know which of them he touched if this happened on private ground he is unclean because of the doubt but if this happened in a public place he is clean because of the doubt and how do we know this from the Bible the verse says and if he lie in wait for him and rise up against him that is to say that he is not guilty of murder until he intended to kill him and the rabbis they said in the school of Arjane this excludes one who throws a stone into a group of people what case do you mean do you mean the case when there are nine idolaters and one Israelite let it be sufficient for him that the majority are idolaters and even if you will say that it is considered as have to have the rule is that when there is a doubt in capital cases one takes a lenient view it speaks of a case when there are nine Israelites and one idolater so that the idolater is stationary and whatever is stationary is considered as have to have it was stated our high B. Ashi said that Rab said that the law is according to our Hosea and our Hanan B. Rabba said that Rab said that it was only a decision for the hour our Jeremiah argued and for pure descent we do not require two majorities have we not Learn Talmud, Mosque Ketha if one found in it an abandoned child if the majority of the inhabitants of the town consist of non-Israelites the child is a non-Israelite if the majority of the inhabitants of the town consist of Israelites the child is an Israelite and if the inhabitants of the town are half to half the child is an Israelite and Rab said they have taught this only with regard to sustaining it but not with regard to pure descent and Samuel said they have taught this only with regard to removing the brief for its sake that which Rab Judah said in the name of Rab namely that the incident happened at the springs of Zephoris escaped his attention but according to Arhan and Biraba who said that it was a decision for the hour it is difficult he who taught this did not teach that the above text says if one found in it an abandoned child if the majority of the inhabitants of the town consist of non-Israelites the child is a non-Israelite if it Majority of the inhabitants of the town consist of Israelites, the child is an Israelite, and if the inhabitants of the town are half to half, the child is an Israelite. Rab said they have taught this only with regard to sustaining it, but not with regard to pure descent. But Samuel said they have taught this only with regard to removing debris for its sake. But did Samuel say so? Did not our Joseph say that our Judah said in the name of Samuel, we do not go with regard to saving life after the majority? But the saying of Samuel referred to the first clause. If the majority of the inhabitants of the town consist of non Israelites, the child is a non Israelite. Upon the Samuel said, and with regard to removing debris, it is not so. If the majority of the inhabitants of the town consist of non Israelites, the child is a non Israelite. For what practical purposes is taught our Papa said to allow him to eat meat of animals not ritually slaughtered if the majority of it. Inhabitants of the town consist of Israelites, the child is an Israelite for what practical purposes this taught our Papa said that one returns to him a lost object if the inhabitants of the town are half to half the child is an Israelite for what practical purposes this taught Reshlech said with regard to damages how shall we imagine this case shall we say that an ox of ours gourd an ox of his in this case let him say to him bring evidence that you are an Israelite and take it speaks of a case when an ox of his gourd an ox of ours one half he pays and with regard to the other half he says to them bring evidence that I am not an Israelite and I will pay you chapteri mission if a woman became a widow or was divorced and she says out it's marry me as a virgin and he says not so but I married thee as a old if there are witnesses that she went out with a high and her head uncovered her ketubah is 200 zuz are Yohanan the son of Baraka says also the distribution of roasted ears of corn is evidence and our Joshua admits that if one says to his fellow this field belongs to your father and I bought it from him he is believed Talmud, Mosketha both for the mouth that bound is the mouth that loosens but if there are witnesses that it belonged to his father and he says I bought it from him he is not believed Gemara the reason is that there are witnesses but if there are no witnesses the husband is believed is it to say that the anonymous and undisputed decision recorded in our mission is not according to Rabban Gamaliel for if it were according to Rabban Gamaliel did not he say that she is believed you may even say that it is according to Rabban Gamaliel for Rabban Gamaliel says it only there in a case of sure and perhaps but here where they are both sure in their statements he did not say it but he who raised the question how could he raise it at all surely this is a case where they are both sure. In their statements, since most women get married as virgins, you might say that it is like sure, and perhaps this may also be proved by the following reasoning, since it is stated and our Joshua admits, etc. It is well if you say that Rabban Gamaliel admits, but if you say that Rabban Gamaliel does not admit, to whom does then our Joshua admit? Do you think that our Joshua refers to this chapter? He refers to Migo in the first chapter, to which is it to say that he refers to this if she was pregnant? And they said to her, What is the nature of this embryo? And she answered, It is from man so and so, and he is a priest, Rabban Gamaliel, and our Eliezer say she is believed, and our Joshua says, We do not live from her mouth. What Migo is there in that case? Behold, her stomach reaches up to her teeth again. Should it refer to this? They saw her talking with someone, and they said to her, What is the character of this man? And she answered, It is man so and so, and he is a priest, Rabban Gamaliel. And our Eliezer say she is believed and our Joshua says we do not live from her mouth there too what Migo is there true there is according to Zeiri who says that she was talking means she was hiding herself with a man in which case she has a Migo for if she wished she could say I had no intercourse and still she said I had intercourse therefore she is believed but according to R.C. who says that she was talking means she had intercourse what Migo is there or again should he refer to this she says I was injured by a piece of wood and he says not so but thou wast trodden by a man Rabban Gamaliel and our Eliezer say she is believed and our Joshua says we do not live from her mouth there too what Migo is there true there is according to our Eliezer who says that the dispute between the husband and the wife is with regard to a man and nothing in which case she has a Migo for if she wished she could say I was injured by a piece of wood under the and she would Get 200 zoos and still she said that she was injured earlier therefore she is believed but according to our Yohanan who says that the dispute between the husband and the wife is with regard to 200 zoos and Amena what Migo is there but he refers to this if one has married a woman and has not found in her virginity and she says after thou hadst betrothed me to thyself I was violated and thy field has been inundated and he says not so but it happened before I betrothed thee to myself Rabban Gamaliel and our Eliezer say she is believed and our Joshua says we do not live from her mouth for here there is Amigo because if she wished she could say I was injured by a piece of wood under the end by saying that she would not make herself unfit for the priesthood and still she said I have been violated and by saying that she made herself unfit for the priesthood therefore Rabban Gamaliel said that she is believed and our Joshua said to Rabban Gamaliel with regard to this Migo here I agree with you but with regard to that Migo there I differ from you now this is Amigo and that is Amigo what difference is there between this Migo and that Migo here there is no slaughtered ox before you there there is a slaughtered ox before you but since most women get married as virgins even if no witnesses came what of it Rabban is said because one can say most women marry as maidens and a minority as widows
Berita, if she lost her Kethuba document or she hid it or it was burnt, then the matter is as follows if they dance before her plate, before her pass, before her the cup of glad tidings or the cloth of virginity, and if she has witnesses with regard to one of these things, her Kethuba is 200 zoos. Now, should we not be afraid that perhaps she might produce witnesses before this court and get her Kethuba paid, and later she might produce a written document before another? Court and get her Kethuba paid a second time by that document. Our said this teaches that one writes acquittance. Our Papa said it speaks of a place in which one does not write a Kethuba document, but does it not say if she lost her Kethuba document, it so happened that he wrote her one, but may she not after all produce it and get her Kethuba paid a second time with it? The meaning of she lost it is she lost it in fire, if so, it is the same as it was burnt, and then what? Can you say with regard to she hid it and furthermore why mention she lost it but this is what the Beritha means if she lost it it is as if she had hidden it before us and we do not give her the Kethuba money until witnesses say that her Kethuba document has been burnt he who refers this to the Beritha all the more does he refer it to the mission but he who refers this to our mission does not refer it to the Beritha because of the difficulty if there are witnesses etc. Should we not be afraid that perhaps she might produce witnesses of Hainuma before this court and get her Kethuba paid and later she might produce other witnesses of Hainuma before another court and get her Kethuba paid a second time where it is not possible otherwise we certainly write acquaintance it is said above in the Beritha if they pass before her the cup of glad tidings what is the cup of glad tidings are added the son of Ahab said one passes before her a cup of wine. Of Terima as if to say this one is worthy of eating Terima our Papa demurred to this does not a widow eat Terima but said our Papa as if to say this one is first as Terima is first it has been taught our Judah says one passes before her a cask of wine our added the son of Ahab said if she was a virgin one passes before her a closed one and if she has had intercourse with a man one passes before her an open one why let us pass a cask of wine before a virgin and let us not pass a cask of wine at all before one who had intercourse it may happen sometimes that she has seized two hundred so and then says I was a virgin and they did not pass a cask of wine before me because they were prevented by an accident our rabbis taught how does one dance before the bride Beth Shammai say Talmud, Moskatha both of the bride as she is and Beth Hillel say beautiful and graceful bride Beth Shammai said to Beth Hillel if she was lame or blind does one say of her beautiful and graceful Bride, whereas the Torah said, Keep thee far from a false matter, said Beth Hillel to Beth Shammai, according to your words, if one has made a bad purchase in the market, should one praise it in his eyes or depreciate it? Surely one should praise it in his eyes. Therefore, the sages said, Always should the disposition of man be pleasant with people. When Ardini came, he said, Thus they sing before the bride in the west, no powder and no paint and no waving of the hair, and still a graceful gazelle when it. Rabbis ordained Arzera, they sang before him, Thus no powder and no paint and no waving of the hair, and still a graceful gazelle when the rabbis ordained RMI and RC, they sang before them, Thus such as these, such as these ordain unto us, but do not ordain unto us of the perverters or babblers, and some say of the half scholars or one third scholars when Arabab came from the academy to the court of the emperor, handmaids from the imperial house went out towards him and sang before him. Thus prince of his people, leader of his nation, shining light, blessed be thy coming in peace. They tell of our Judah Eli that he used to take a myrtle twig and dance before the bride and say beautiful and graceful bride. Our Samuel, the son of our Isaac, danced with three twigs. Our Zerah said the old man is putting us to shame when he died. A pillar of fire came between him and the whole of the rest of the world. And there is a tradition that a pillar of fire has made such a separation only either for one in a generation or for two in a generation only. Our Zerah said his twig benefited the old man and some say his habit benefited the old man and some say his folly benefited the old man. Our Aha took her on his shoulder and danced with her. The rabbi said to him, may we also do it. He said to them, if they are on you like a beam, then it is all right. And if not, you may not. Our Samuel be He said that our Jonathan said it is allowed to look intently at the face of the bride. All the seven. Days in order to make her beloved to her husband, but the law is not according to him. Our rabbis taught one causes a funeral procession to make way for a bridal procession, and both of them for the king of Israel. One tells of King Agrippa that he made way for a bride, and the sages praised him. They praised him from this. It would seem that he did well. Did not our Ashi say even according to him who says that if a king forgoes his honor, his honor is forgone. If a king forgoes his honor, his honor is not forgone. For a master said, Thou shalt set a king over thee. This means that his awe shall be over thee. It was at a crossroad. Our rabbis taught one interrupts the study of the Torah for the sake of a funeral procession and the leading of the bride under the bridal canopy. They tell of our Judah Eli that he interrupted the study of the Torah for the sake of a funeral procession and the leading of the bride under the bridal canopy. This applies only when there are not. Sufficient people at the funeral procession, but if there are sufficient people, one does not interrupt the study of the Torah. And how many are sufficient? Our Samuel, the son of Eni, said in the name of Rab, twelve thousand men and six thousand trumpets, and some say twelve thousand men, and among them six thousand trumpets. Ola said, for instance, when people form a line from the city gate to the burial place, Arshis hate, and some say are Yohanan said, its taking away is like its giving, as its giving was in the presence of sixty myriads of people. So has its taking away to be in the presence of sixty myriads of people. And this is the case only with regard to one who read the Bible and studied the Mishnah Talmud. Moscow both be, but for one who taught others, there is no limit. And if there are witnesses that she went out with a Hainum, etc., what is Hainum? Sir Habbi Papa said in the name of Ziri Myrtle Canopy, are Yohanan said, a veil under which the bride sometimes slumbers are. Yohanan the son of Berakah says etc. It was taught this was regarded as a proof in Judea. What is the proof in Babylonia? Rab said the dripping of oil on the heads of the scholars. Our Papa said to Abbe did the master speak of oil used for cleaning the head? He said to him Orphan did not your mother do the dripping of the oil on the heads of the scholars at the time of the event as that case when one of the scholars was occupied with the wedding of his son in the house of Rabbi Beulah. And some say Rabbi Beulah was occupied with the wedding of his son in the house of one of the scholars and he dripped oil on the heads of the scholars at the time of the event. What sign is there at the wedding of a widow? Our Joseph taught a widow has no roasted ears of corn distributed at her wedding and our Joshua admits that if one says to his fellow etc. But let him teach our Joshua admits that in the case when one says to his fellow this field belonged to you and I have bought it of you. He is believed because he would have to teach in the last clause if there are witnesses that it was his and he says I have bought it of you he is not believed and how shall we imagine this case if he ate the fruits of it during the years of Hezekiah why should he not be believed and if he did not eat the fruits of it during the years of Hezekiah it is self-evident that he is not believed if so with regard to his father also one could argue if he ate the fruits of it during the years of Hezekiah why should he not be believed and if he did not eat the fruits of it during the years of Hezekiah it is self-evident that he is not believed we grant you with regard to his father because there may be a case as for instance when he ate the fruits of it two years during the life of the father and one year during the life of his son and this would be according to Arhuna for Arhuna said one does not acquire the ownership of the property of a minor by the Undisturbed possession of it during the prescribed period, even if he continued in the possession after the minor had become of age. But Arhuna comes to let us hear what is already taught in our mission. If you wish, you may say Arhuna says what is to be derived from our mission by implication. And if you wish, you may say he lets us hear even if he had become of age. But let him after all teach with regard to himself and put the case when he ate the fruits of it two years in his presence and one year in his absence. And for instance, when he fled because of what did he flee? If he fled because of danger to his life, it is self evident that he is not believed since he cannot protest. And if he fled because of money matters, he ought to have protested because it is established for that a protest in his absence is a valid protest. For we have learned there are three countries with regard to Hezekiah, Judea, Transjordan, and Galilee. If he was in Judea and someone took Possession of his land in Galilee, or he was in Galilee, and someone took possession of his land in Judea. It is no Hezaka until he is with him in the same province, and we ask concerning it, what opinion does he hold? If he hol
Only as one who returns a lost thing and he is free and does not our Eliezer B. Jacob hold that one who returns a lost thing is free. Rap said it speaks here of a case when a minor claimed from him but did not a master say one does not take an oath because of a claim by a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor what is meant by minor a grown-up person and why does he call him minor because with regard to the affairs of his father he is regarded as a minor if so how can you say his own? Statement it is a claim made by others it is a claim made by others and also his own admission but all claims consist of a claim made by others and one's own admission they differ here with regard to an opinion of Rabbi for Rabbi said why did the Torah say that he who admits a part of the claim must take an oath because it is a presumption that no man is insolent in the face of his creditor he would indeed like to deny the whole debt but he does not do it because no. One is so insolent Talmud, Mosk hath both be indeed he would like to admit the whole of it only he does not do it in order to slip away from him for the present and he thinks as soon as I will have money I will pay it and therefore the divine law said impose an oath on him so that he should admit the whole of it now our Eliezer B. Jacob holds that he is not insolent against him nor against his son and therefore he is not regarded as one who returns a lost thing and the rabbis hold. That against him he is not insolent, but against his son he might be insolent, and since he is not insolent, he is regarded as one who returns a lost thing. Mishnah, if witnesses said this is our handwriting, but we were forced, we were minors, we were disqualified, witnesses they are believed, but if there are witnesses that it is their handwriting or their handwriting comes out from another place, they are not believed. Gemara Rami Bihava said they taught this only when they said we were forced by threats with regard to money, but if they said we were forced by threats with regard to our life, they are believed. Rabbi said to him, Is it so after he has once testified, he cannot again testify, and if he will say that this applies only to an oral testimony, but not to testimony in a document, did not Rashley say if witnesses are signed on a document, it is as if their testimony had been examined in court. No, if it has been said, it has been said with regard to the first clause where it is stated they are believed whereupon Rami Bihama said they taught this only when they said we were forced by threats with regard to our life but if they said we were forced by threats with regard to money they are not believed because no one makes himself out to be a wicked man or rabbis taught they are not believed to disqualify it this is the view of Armeir but the sages say that they are believed this is right according to the rabbis who follow their principle the mouth that bound is the mouth that loosened but what is the reason of Armeir I grant you with regard to disqualified witnesses because the creditor himself examines well the witnesses beforehand and then lets them sign with regard to minors also it can be explained according to our Simeon B. Lakish for Rush Lakish said Talmud, Mosk Hatha both it is a presumption that the witnesses do not sign a document unless everything was done by adults but what is the reason with regard to force are Hista said our mayor holds that if one said to witnesses sign a falsehood and you will not be killed they should rather be killed and not sign a falsehood. Rabbi said to him now if they would come to us to ask our advice we would say unto them go and sign and do not be killed for a master said there is nothing that comes before the saving of life except idolatry incest and bloodshed only now that they have signed can we say to them why have you signed but the reason of our mayor is in accordance with what Arhuna said in the name of Rab for Arhuna said that Rab said if he admits that he has written the bond there is no need to confirm it to revert to the main text Arhuna said that Rab said if he admits that he has written the bond there is no need to confirm it Arnam and said to him why do you go round about if you hold with our mayor say the halachah is according to our mayor he then said to him and how do you sir hold he said to him when they come before us in court we say to them Go and confirm your documents and then come to court. Rab Judah said that Rab said if one said this is a loan dash deed of trust he is not believed who said it. If the debtor said it it is plain why should he be believed if the creditor said it may a blessing come upon him and if the witnesses said it then if their handwriting comes out from another place it is plain that they are not believed and if their handwriting does not come out from another place why should they not be? Believe Nemonic Bash Rabbah said indeed the debtor said it and it is according to Arhuna for Arhuna said that Rab said if he admits that he has written the document there is no need to confirm it. Abbe said indeed the creditor said it and it is a case where he would injure others and this is according to our Nathan for it has been taught our Nathan says whence do we learn that if one has a claim of Amina against his fellow and that fellow against another fellow we take out the son of Amina from this one and give it to that one the writ says and he shall give it to whom he owes it or as she said indeed the witnesses said it and it is in a case where their handwriting does not come out from another place and as to your question why should they not be believed the answer is as stated by Arkahana for Arkahana said it is forbidden for a man to keep a loan dash deed of trust in his house because it is said let not unrighteousness dwell in thy tents Talmud, Mosketha both. B and Arshis hate the son of Aridi said from the words of Arkahana can be inferred that if witnesses said our words were regarding a matter of trust they are not believed for this reason since it is unrighteousness we say that they must not sign on what is unrighteousness or Joshua B. Levi said it is forbidden for a man to keep a paid bill of indebtedness in his house because it is said let not unrighteousness dwell in thy tents in the west they said in the name of Rabbi it said if Iniquity be in thy hand, put it far away. This is a loan dash deed of trust and a deed of goodwill, and it is said, and let not unrighteousness dwell in thy tents. This is a paid bill of indebtedness. He who says that it applies to a paid bill of indebtedness, how much more does it apply to a loan dash deed of trust? And he who says that it applies to a loan dash deed of trust would hold that it does not apply to a paid bill of indebtedness because sometimes they keep it on account of it. Scribes fees it has been stated in a book that is not corrected. Arami said until thirty days one is allowed to keep it from men, and further on it is forbidden to keep it because it is said, let not unrighteousness dwell in thy tents. Arnam and said if witnesses said our words were regarding a matter of trust, they are not believed. If they said our words were attended by declaration, they are also not believed. Mar the son of Arashi said if witnesses said our words were regarding a matter. Of trust they are not believed, but if they said our words were attended by declaration, they are believed for this reason this one was allowed to be written and that one was not allowed to be written. Rabbah asked of Arnam and how is it if witnesses say our words were subject to a condition, are they not believed in the case of declaration and trust because they invalidate the document and in this case of condition they also invalidate the document or is perhaps condition a different thing he said to him when they come before us in court we say to them go and fulfill your conditions and then come to court if one witness says that there was a condition and one witness says that there was no condition our papa said they both testify to a valid document and only one says that there was a condition and the words of one witness have no value where there are two witnesses are who not the son of our Joshua demurred to this if so even if they both say that there was a condition. Their words should also have no value, but we say that they come to uproot their testimony, and this one also comes to uproot his testimony, and the law is according to our the son of our Joshua, our rabbis taught if two witnesses were signed on a document and died, and two witnesses came from the street and said we know that it is their handwriting, but they were forced, they were minors, they were disqualified witnesses, they are believed, but if there are other witnesses that this is their handwriting or their handwriting comes out from another place, namely from a document, the validity of which was challenged and which was confirmed in court, they are not believed, and we collect with it as with a valid document why they are two and two said our she's hate this teaches that contradiction is the beginning of rebuttal Talmud, Mosque both and as witnesses can be rebutted only in their presence, so can they be contradicted only in their presence, Arnam and said to him if they had been before us and the other two witnesses had contradicted them it would have been a contradiction and we would not have paid any attention to them because it is a contradicted testimony now that they are not here when it could be maintained that if they had been before us they might even perhaps have admitted to them should they be believed no said Arnam and said the two witnesses against the two witnesses and leave the property in the possession of its master it is analogous to the case of the property of a certain madman a certain madman sold property two witnesses came and said that he sold the property when he was insane and two witnesses came and said that he sold the property when he was sane and Arashi said set the two witnesses against the two witnesses and leave the property in the possession of the madman and we say this only when he has the ownership right of his forefathers but if he has not the ownership right of his forefathers we say that he bought the property when he was insane and that he sold it when he was insane. Arabab said one rebuts wit
The words of Aryul had ended. If two persons know evidence and one of them has forgotten it, the other one may remind him of it. They asked in the case of himself, what is the law? Our habit said, even he himself may do so. Marbi Arashi said, he himself may not, and the law is he himself may not. Talmud, Moskath both be, but if he is a scholar, even he himself may remind the witness as the case of Arashi, he knew evidence for Arkahana, and he said to him, does the master remember? That evidence and he said to him no but was it not so and so he replied I do not know in the end Arashi reminded himself and he gave evidence for him he saw that Arkahana was surprised so he said to him do you think that I relied upon you all threw it upon my mind and I remembered it we learned elsewhere mounds which are near town or a road whether they are new or old are unclean those mounds which are distant if they are new they are clean and if they are old they are unclean what is near 50 cubits and what is old 60 years this is a view of Armaiur Arjuda says near denotes when there is none near old when one remembers it now what is meant by a town and what is meant by a road shall I say by a town is meant an ordinary town and by road is meant an ordinary road do we presume uncleanness out of doubt did not Rush Lakish say they found some pretext and declared the land of Israel unclean said Arzera by a town is meant a town which is near a Burial place and by road is meant a road leading to a burial place. I grant you in the case of a road leading to a burial place because sometimes it might happen that a funeral took place at twilight and it chanced that they buried it in the mound. But in the case of a town which is near a burial place, all go to the burial place said Arhana because women bring there their abortions and lepers bring there their arms and it is assumed that till fifty cubits she goes alone. But for a longer distance she takes a man with her and then she goes to the burial place. Therefore we do not presume uncleanness in Eretz Israel. Arhista said you may infer from the words of Armaiur that one remembers evidence till sixty years for a longer period than sixty years one does not remember. But it is not so for there he does not remember the evidence after sixty years because it is not his concern. But here since it is his concern even for a longer period he also. Remembers the evidence mission. If one witness says this is my handwriting and that is the handwriting of my fellow, and the other witness says this is my handwriting and that is the handwriting of my fellow, they are believed. If one says this is my handwriting and the other says this is my handwriting, they must join to themselves another person. This is the view of Rabbi, but the sages say they need not join to themselves another person, but a person is believed to say this is my handwriting. Gemara, if you should find that according to the view of Rabbi Talmud, Moskatha both they give evidence with regard to their handwriting, according to the sages they give evidence with regard to the mina and the deed. This is self-evident. You might have said that Rabbi was in doubt whether they testified to their signature or to the mina and the deed, and the difference would be when one of them died. Here we need two witnesses from the street to testify regarding it because. Otherwise the whole of the money less a quarter would go out by the mouth of one witness and both here and there the stricter rule would prevail therefore he teaches that it is clear to Rabbi whether the result is lenient or strict for Rab Judah said that Rab said if two witnesses are signed on a document and one of them died two persons from the street are required to give evidence with regard to him and this it would be lenient according to Rabbi and it is strict according to the rabbis. And if there are not two but there is only one what then said Abbe he shall write his signature on a piece of clay and place it before the court and the court confirms it and he need not testify to his own signature and he then goes with that one and they together testify to the signature of the other witness and only on a piece of clay but not a scroll lest a bad man may find it and write on it whatever he likes and we have learned if one person produces the handwriting of another. Person that he owes him money, he collects the debt from unmortgaged property. Rab Judah said that Samuel said the Halachah is according to the sages. This is obvious when there is a dispute between one authority and many authorities. The law is according to the many authorities. You might have said since the Halachah is according to Rabbi is against one of his fellow scholars, it is also against many of his fellow scholars. So he lets us hear otherwise. Nimad Nan Ad Had Arhai Nabi. I said to Ar Judah and some say that Arhunabi Judah said to Rab Judah and some say that Arhai Judah said to Rab Judah and did Samuel say so? Surely once a deed came out from the court of Mar Samuel and there was written in it whereas Arhai and Bihai came and testified to his own signature and to that of his fellow witness, namely Arhai and Bihai. And whereas Arhai and Bihai came and testified to his own signature and to that of his fellow witness, namely Arhai and Bihai. We have. Verified it and we have confirmed it as it is proper he said to him that deed belonged to orphans and Samuel was afraid of an erring court Samuel thought there might be someone who held that the Halachah is generally according to Rabbi as against one fellow scholar and not as against many of his fellow scholars but that in this the Halachah is according to Rabbi even as against many of his fellow scholars I will make relief so that the orphans should not suffer any loss Rab Judah said. That Samuel said witness and judge are joined together Rami Bihama said how excellent is this tradition said Rabbi what is the excellence what the witness testifies to the judge does not testify to and what the judge testifies to the witness does not testify to and indeed when Rami B. Ezekiel came he said do not heed those rules which my brother Judah laid down in the name of Samuel Talmud. Moskatha both be Rabbi the brother of Arhai B. Abba came to buy sesame and he said the Samuel said. Witness and judge are joined together. Amimar said, How excellent is this tradition? Said Arashi to Amimar, because the father of your mother praised it. You also praise it. Rabbah has already refuted it. Arsafra said that Arabah said that Ar Isaac B. Samuel B. Martha said that Arhuna said, and some say that Arhuna said that Rab said if three sit together to confirm a deed and two of them know the signatures of the witnesses and one does not know before they sign, they may testify before him and he then signs with them after they have signed, they may not testify before him and he may not sign, but do we write the attestation? Did not our poppy say in the name of Rabbah the judge's attestation which is written before the witnesses give evidence as to their signatures is invalid because it looks like a lie and here also it looks like a lie, but say before they have written the attestation, they may testify before him and he then signs with them after they have written it. Attestation they may not testify before him and he may not sign we may infer from this three things we may infer that a witness may be a judge we may also infer that if the judges know the signatures of the witnesses there is no need to testify before them and again we may infer that if the judges do not know the signatures of the witnesses it is necessary to give evidence before everyone are actually to this agreed that we may infer from it that a witness may be a judge but how can we infer from it that if the judges know the signatures of the witnesses there is no need to testify before them perhaps indeed I can say to you that this is necessary but it is different here because the telling has been fulfilled before one and further how can we infer from it that if the judges do not know the signatures of the witnesses it is necessary to give evidence before everyone perhaps indeed I can say to you that this is not necessary but it is different here because the Telling would not have been fulfilled at all. Our Abba sat and reported this law that a witness may be a judge. Our Safra then objected to our Abba. If three saw it and they are of the court, two shall stand up and set two of their fellows beside the one and they shall testify before them. And then they say, Hallowed is the new moon, hallowed for one person is not believed by himself. Now, if you assume that a witness may be a judge, what do we want all this for? Let them sit in their places and proclaim the new moon is hallowed. He said to him, That was also difficult to me. And I asked our Isaac, be Samuel, be Martha, and our Isaac asked Arhuna, and Arhuna asked Hibi Rab, and Hibi Rab asked Rab, and he said to them, Leave alone the testimony as to the new moon, for it is biblical and the confirmation of documents is Rabbi. Our Abba said that Arhuna said that Rab said, If three sit to confirm a document and an objection is raised against one of them, they may before they have signed. The attestation give evidence regarding him and he may then sign after they have signed they may not give evidence regarding him and he may not sign on what ground was that objection raised if the objection was on the ground of robbery Talmud, Moskatha both of there two and two and if it is a protest regarding family blemish then all that is required is merely a revealing of the matter indeed I will tell you it is a protest regarding robbery and he say we know of him that he has repented our Zara said this thing I have heard from our Abba and if not for our Abba Abako I would have forgotten it if three sit to confirm a document and one of them dies they must write we were in a session of three and one is no more our nom and B Isaac said and if it is written in it this document has been produced before us as a court of law more is not necessary but perhaps
This man to this man and not to the brother in law or rabbis taught if a woman says I am married and then she says I am unmarried, she is believed, but she made herself forbidden. Said Rabbi the son of Arunah when she has given a plausible reason for her words, we have also a to the same effect. If she says I am married and then she says I am unmarried, she is not believed, but if she gives a plausible reason for her words, she is believed. And so it once happened with a great woman who was great in beauty and men were eager to betroth her and she said to them I am betrothed after a time she became betrothed the sages said to her why have you chosen to do this she answered them at first when unworthy men came to me I said I am betrothed now that worthy men come to me I became betrothed and this law the prince of the castle brought before the sages in Isha and they said if she gives a plausible reason for her words she is believed Samuel asked Rab if a woman says I am unclean and then she says I am clean what is the law he answered him also in this case if she gives Talmud Mosk hath both be a plausible reason for her words she is believed he learned it from him forty times and still Samuel did not act accordingly with regard to himself our rabbis taught when two witnesses say that the husband of the woman has died and two witnesses say that he has not died or two witnesses say that she has been divorced and two witnesses say that she has not been divorced, she shall not marry again, but if she has married again, she shall not go out. Our menahem Jose says she shall go out. Our menahem Jose said, When do I say that she shall go out when witnesses came and then she married? But if she married and then came witnesses, she shall not go out. Now they are two and two, and he who has intercourse with her is liable to a doubtful guilt offering. Said Arshis, hey, when she married one of her witnesses, then she herself should bring a doubtful guilt offering. When she says, I am sure, are you had and said, When two witnesses say that the husband of the woman has died, and two witnesses say that he has not died, she shall not marry again, but if she has married again, she shall not go out. When two witnesses say that she has been divorced, and two witnesses say that she has not been divorced, she shall not marry again, and if she has married, she shall go out. What is the difference between the first case and the second case? Abbe? Said explained it that it speaks of one witness when one witness says that he has died the rabbis believe him as two witnesses and this is according to Allah for Allah said wherever the Torah makes one witness credible it is as if there are two whereas he who said that he has not died is one and the words of one have no validity against two if so she should be allowed to marry again from the beginning because of that saying of RC for RC said put away from the a forward mouth and perverse lips put far from me in the second case however one witness says that she has been divorced and one witness says that she has not been divorced they therefore both testify to a married woman and he who says that she has been divorced is one and the words of one have no validity against two rabbis said indeed they are two and two and are you and regards as right the words of our menahem Jose in the case of divorce but not in the case of death why in the case of death she cannot contradict him, but in the case of divorce, she can contradict him. But would she be as impudent as all that did not our hand on say if a woman says to her husband, Thou hast divorced me, she is believed, for the presumption is that a woman is not insolent before her husband. This is the case only when there are no witnesses who support her, but when there are witnesses who support her, she is indeed insolent. RC says when the witnesses say he has died just now, he has divorced her. Just now, death one cannot prove divorce, one can prove, for we say to her, if it is so, she was the document of divorce. Our rabbis taught if two witnesses say that she has been betrothed, and two witnesses say that she has not been betrothed, she shall not marry, and if she has married, she shall not go out. If two witnesses say that she has been divorced, and two witnesses say that she has not been divorced, she shall not marry, and if she has married, she shall go out. Talmud, Mosk, both. What is the difference between the first case and the second case? Abbe said explained it that it speaks of one witness when one witness says that she has been betrothed and one witness says that she has not been betrothed. They both testify to an unmarried woman and he who says that she has been betrothed is one and the words of one have no validity against two in the second case where one witness says that she has been divorced and one witness says that she has not been divorced. They both testify to a married woman and he who says that she has been divorced is one and the words of one have no validity against two are as she said indeed they are two and two and reverse it when two say we have seen that she has been betrothed and two say we have not seen that she has been betrothed she shall not marry another man and if she has married she goes out but this is obvious we have not seen is no evidence it is not so obvious as it is needed for the case when they dwelt in. One courtyard one might say if she had been betrothed it would have been known so he lets us hear that there are people who get betrothed quietly in the second case when two say we have seen that she has been divorced and two say we have not seen that she has been divorced she shall not marry again and if she has married she shall not go out what does he let us hear by this case although they live in the same courtyard but then this is the same one might say that with regard to betrothal it happens that people get betrothed quietly but with regard to divorce if she had been divorced it would have been known so he lets us hear that there are people who get betrothed and get divorced quietly and if witnesses come after she got married she shall not go out or Ashai refers it to the first clause Rabbi Abin refers it to the second clause he who refers it to the first clause how much more does he refer it to the second clause for in the case of a captive woman they have made it Lenient, but he who refers it to the second clause does not refer it to the first clause. Is it to say that they differ concerning the view of our Hamana that he who refers it to the first clause holds the view of our Hamana and he who refers it only to the second clause does not hold the view of our Hamana? No, all hold the view of our Hamana and here they differ in this one argues one was that of our Hamana said in his presence but in his absence she is impudent and one holds that in his absence. Also she is not impudent and if witnesses came after she got married etc. The father of Samuel said she got married does not mean she actually got married but as soon as they allowed her to get married even if she did not get married yet but it says she shall not go out this means she shall not go out from her first permission or rabbis taught when she says I was taken captive and I am pure and I have witnesses that I am pure they do not say we will wait until the witnesses come but they Allow her at once to marry if they allowed her to marry and then the witnesses came and said we do not know then she shall not go out but if witnesses of defilement came even if she has many children she shall go out certain women captives came once to Nehardia the father of Samuel placed watchmen with them said Samuel to him and who watched them till now said he to him if they had been thy daughters wouldst thou also have spoken of them so lightly it was as an error which proceedeth from before the ruler and the daughters of Mar Samuel were taken captive and they were brought to the land of Israel they let their captors stand outside and they went in into the school of Arhanna this one said I was taken captive and I am pure and that one said I was taken captive and I am pure so they allowed them and the captors entered Arhanna thereupon said they are the children of a scholar it then became known that they were the daughters of Mar Samuel Arhanna thereupon said to Ar Shaman be Abigo and take care of thy relative said he to our Hannah but there are witnesses in the country beyond the sea now however they are not before us witnesses are in the north and therefore she shall be forbidden to marry now the reason is because no witnesses came but if witnesses came she is forbidden but did not the father of Samuel say as soon as they allowed her to get married even if she did not get married or as she said it was stated witnesses of defilement Talmud, Moss. Ketha both be mission if two women were taken captive and now one says I was taken captive and I am pure and the other one says I was taken captive and I am pure they are not believed but when they testify to one another they are believed Gemara our rabbis taught if she says I am impure and my friend is pure she is believed I am pure and my friend is impure she is not believed I and my friend are impure she is believed as to herself and she is not believed as to her friend I and my friend are Pure she is believed as to her friend and she is not believed as to herself the master said if she says I am pure and my friend is impure she is not believed how shall we imagine this case if there are no witnesses why is she not believed as to herself she says I was taken captive and I am pure hence it is plain that there are witnesses now read the middle clause I and my friend are impure she is believed as to herself and she is not believed as to her friend but if there are witnesses why is she not believed hence it is plain that there are no witnesses now read the last clause L and my friend are pure she is believed as to her friend and she is not believed as to herself but if there are no witnesses why is she not believed as to herself hence it is plain that there are witnesses the first clause and the last clause when there are witnesses and the middle clause when there are no witnesses have they said yes the first clause and the last clause when there are witnesses and the middle clause when there are
Fifth, I might say that she is not believed, so he lets us hear that this is not so mission. And likewise, two men, if one says I am a priest and the other says I am a priest, they are not believed, but when they testify to one another, they are believed. Our Judah said one does not raise a person to the priesthood through the testimony of one witness. Our Eliezer said only then when there are people who object, but when there are no people who object, one raises a person to the priesthood through the testimony of one witness. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel says in the name of our Simeon, the son of the chief of the priests, one raises a person to the priesthood through the testimony of one witness. Gamara, what need is there for all these cases they are needed for? If he had stated only the case of our Joshua admits, I might have said that only in that case is that principle applied because there is a possible loss of money, but in the case of if witnesses say this is our handwriting where there is no possible loss of money I would not say so and if he had stated the case of if witnesses say this is our handwriting I might have said that only in that case does that principle apply because their statement concerns other people but where it concerns himself Talmud, Mosque Ketha Bothay I would not say so and if he would let us hear these two cases I might have said because both cases deal with money matters but in the case of a married woman which is a matter of sexual prohibition I would not say so what need is there for the case of I was taken captive and I am pure because he wants to teach but if witnesses came after she got married she shall not go out that is quite right according to him who refers this to the second clause but according to him who refers this to the first clause what is there to say because he wants to teach the case of if two women were taken captive and what need is there for the case of if two women were taken captive you might have said that we may be afraid that they favor one another so he lets us hear that we do not say so what need is there for the case of and likewise two men because he wants to teach the difference of opinion between our Judah and the rabbis our rabbis taught if one says I am a priest and my friend is a priest he is believed to the extent of allowing him to eat teramah but he is not believed to the extent of allowing him to marry a woman until there are three and two testify to one and two testify to the other our Judah says he is not believed even with regard to allowing him to eat teramah until there are three and two testify to one and two testify to the other is this to say that our Judah is afraid that they might favor one another and the rabbis are not afraid that they might favor one another surely from the following mission we understand just the reverse for we have learned when ascribers come to a town and one of them says mine is new and my friends is old mine is not prepared and my friends is prepared he is not believed our Judah says he is believed said our Adabi Ahab in the name of Rab the statement must be reversed Abbe said indeed there is no need to reverse it in the case of Dima they have made it lenient for most of the Amhara separate the tithes Rabbi said is a question only of our Judah against our Judah is there no question also of the rabbis against the rabbis no the answer there is no question of our Judah against our Judah as we have just explained and there is no question of the rabbis against the rabbis for the case is similar to that with regard to which our Hamabi Akbar said that it speaks of when he has his trade tools in his hand Talmud Mosk hath both be so here also we deal with when he has his trade tools in his hand and with regard to what was that of our Hamabi Akbar said with regard to what we have learned if a potter left his pots and went down to drink water from the river the inner ones are pure and the other ones are impure, but it has been taught that these and those are impure. Said our Hamabi Akbar. It speaks of a case when he had his trade tools in his hand, so that the hand of all touches them. But it has been taught these and those are pure. Said our Hamabi Akbar. When his trade tools are not in his hand, but then the case that we have learned the inner ones are pure and the other ones are impure. How is that possible when they are near the public road and they are impure because of border stones of the public road? And if you wish, you may say our Judah and the rabbis differ as to whether one raises a person from teramah to the status of a priest. The question was asked, what is the law? Does one raise a person from documents to the full status of a priest? How shall we imagine this case if we say that it is written in it? I so and so a priest have signed as witness who testifies to him. No, but it must be when it is written in it. I so and so a priest have borrowed a mina from. So and so and witnesses have signed the document. What then is the law? Do they testify only to the main mentioned in the document, or do they testify to the whole matter? Our and our his dogi opposing answers. One says one raises and one says one does not raise. The question was asked: What is the law? Does one raise a person from the lifting up of the hands to the status of a priest? This is asked according to him who says that one raises a person from teramah to the status of a priest, and this is asked according to him who says that one does not raise a person from teramah to the status of a priest. It is asked according to him who says that one raises one is the said in the case of teramah, which if eaten by one who is not a priest is a sin punishable with death. But in the case of lifting up the hands, which if one who is not a priest performs the pronouncing of the priestly blessing is only transgressing the prohibition of a positive command. I would say no, or perhaps there is no difference, and it is asked according to him who says that one does not raise one is the said in the case of teramah, which is eaten in privacy, but in the case of lifting up the hands, which is done in public, I might say that if he were not a priest, he would not have the impudence to act as a priest, or perhaps there is no difference. Our his and our Abba give opposing answers to this question. One says one raises, and one says one does not raise. Our nomin B. Isaac said to Rabba, What is the law? Does one raise a person from lifting up the hands to the full status of a priest? Said he to him, With regard to this, there is a difference of opinion between our his and our Abba. What is the adopted law? Said he to him, I know a very for it has been taught. Our Jose said, Great is presumption for it is said, and the children of the priests, the children of Habai, the children of Hakas, the children of Barzilla, who took a wife of the daughters of. Barzilla the Jalidite and was called after their name. They sought their register of those that were reckoned by genealogy, and they were not found. Therefore were they deemed polluted and put from the priesthood. And the tears hath said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and Thummim. He thus said to them, You remain in your presumptive state. What have you eaten in exile? The holy things of the country. So here also you shall eat the sacred things of the country. Now if we were to assume that one raises a person from lifting up the hands to the state of a priest, since these spread out their hands, one might raise them. It is different here for their presumption has been impaired. For if you will not say so, then according to him who says that one raises a person from Teramah, since they eat Teramah, one might raise them to the status of priest. Hence you must say it is because their presumption has been impaired. Talmud, Mosque hath so what do the words of our Jose mean great is the presumption till now they ate only rabbinical terima and now they ate biblical terima and if you wish you may say now also they ate rabbinical terima and did not eat biblical terima and when does one raise a person from terima to the status of a priest in the case of biblical terima but in the case of rabbinical terima one does not raise if so what is the meaning of the words great is the presumption although one might have forbidden rabbinical terima because of biblical terima this has not been forbidden but did they not eat biblical terima surely it is written that they should not eat of the most holy things implying the most holy things they did not eat but biblical terima they did eat no he means thus neither may they eat anything that is called holy things as it is written and no stranger shall eat of the holy thing nor anything which is called holy thing for it is written, and if a priest's daughter be married into a stranger, she shall not eat of the peace offering of the holy things. And a master said that this means that which has been set aside from the holy things, she shall not eat. Come and hear a presumption for the priesthood is constituted by the lifting up of the hands in Babylonia and the eating of the hell in Syria and taking a share in the priestly gifts in large cities. In any case, he mentions here the lifting up of the hands is it not with regard to the full status of the priest, no, with regard to teramah, but he teaches the ruling regarding teramah is analogous to the eating of hell, just as the eating of hell entitles a person to the full status of a priest. So does the lifting up of the hands entitle a person to the full status of a priest? No, the eating of the hell itself merely serves as evidence regarding teramah, for he holds that hell in our days is rabbinical and teramah is biblical and one. Raises a person from rabbinical hell to biblical terima, and it is as Arhuna the son of Arjashu reversed the words of the rabbis come and hear a presumption for the priesthood is constituted by the lifting up of the hands and taking a share at the distribution of the priestly gifts at the threshing floors in the land of Israel in Syria and in all places to which the messengers of the new moon come the lifting up of the hands is evidence but not taking a share at the threshing floors Babylonia is like Syria our Simeon B. Gamaliel says also Alexandria in
My think as soon as two or three spies had entered it therefore it is said in your coming I have spoken of the coming of all and not of the coming of a portion of you now when Ezra brought them up Talmud, Mosque Ketha both be not all of them went up come and hear a presumption for the priesthood is constituted by the lifting up of the hands and taking a share at the threshing floors and testimony now is testimony of presumption hence he means us the lifting up of the hands is like a testimony as a testimony raises one to the status of a priest so the lifting up of the hands raises one to the status of a priest know what it means is a testimony that comes on the strength of a presumption is like a presumption as when a man came once before our MI and said to him I am convinced that he is a priest so he said to him what have you seen and he answered him he read first in the synagogue as priest or as prominent man after him a Levite read and our MI raised him to the priesthood on the strength of his testimony someone came before our Joshua be Levi and said to him and convinced that he is a Levite he said to him what have you seen he answered him he read second in the synagogue as Levite or as a prominent man a priest read before him and our Joshua be Levi raised him to the status of Levite on the strength of his testimony someone came once before Reshlakish and said to him I am convinced that he is a priest he said to him what have you seen he answered him he read first in the synagogue he asked him have you seen him take a share at the threshing floor said our Eliezer to him and does the priesthood cease if there is no threshing floor there once they sat before our Yohanan and there came such a case before them Reshlakish asked him have you seen him take a share at the threshing floor so our Yohanan said to him and does the priesthood cease if there is no threshing floor there he turned round looked at our Eliezer with displeasure and said you have heard something from a smith's son and you did not say it to us in his name Rabbi and our high one raised a son to the priesthood on the testimony of his father and one raised a brother to the state of Levi on the testimony of his brother it can be proved that it was Rabbi who raised the son to the priesthood on the testimony of his father for it has been taught if one comes and says this is my son and he is a priest he is believed with regard to allowing him to eat terimah but he is not believed with regard to allowing him to marry a woman this is the opinion of Rabbi said our high to him if you believe him so as to allow him to eat terimah believe him also so as to allow him to marry a woman and if you do not believe him so as to allow him to marry a woman do not believe him also as to allow him to eat terimah he answered him I believe him so as to allow him to eat terimah because it is in his hands to let him eat terimah but I do not believe him so as to allow him to Marry a woman because it is not in his hands to let him marry a woman it is proved and since it was Rabbi who raised the son to the priesthood on the testimony of his father it follows that it was our high who raised the brother to the status of Levite on the testimony of his brother but according to our high why is the son different that he is not raised because he is related to his father a brother too is related to his brother Talmud, Mosketha both when he was talking in his simplicity as that story which Rab Judah related in the name of Samuel it happened that a man was talking in his simplicity and said I remember when I was a child and rode on my father's shoulder they brought me out from school and stripped me of my shirt and immersed me so that I could eat terimah in the evening and our high added and my friends held aloof from me and called me Yohan and the and Rabbi raised him to the priesthood on his testimony it has been taught our Simeon B. Eliezer says just as Teramah is a presumption for the priesthood so is the first tithe a presumption for the priesthood but he who takes a share at the threshing floors through the court this is not a presumption the first tithe belongs to the Levite. This is according to our Eliezer the son of Azariah for it has been taught Teramah belongs to the priest the first tithe to the Levite this is the view of our Akib our Eliezer the son of Azariah says the first tithe belongs also to the priest. But our Eliezer the son of Azariah says also to the priest does he say to the priest and not to the Levite yes after Ezra had punished them but perhaps it happened that they gave it to him said our Hisda here we treat of a case where we know that the father of that person is a priest and a rumor came out concerning him that he is the son of a divorced woman or a Haliza, and yet they gave him tithe at the threshing floor he could not be regarded as a Levite because he was not a Levite. What then could you say that he was the son of a divorced woman or the son of Ahaliza but as to this there is no question that according to him who says that the first tithe is forbidden to strangers they would not have given it to him for even according to him who says the first tithe is permitted to strangers it is only to sustain them but as a distribution due to him as of right they do not give it to him but he who takes a share at the threshing floors through the court this is not a presumption if it is not a presumption through the court when is it a presumption said Arshis Hadi means thus if one shares the terimah in the property of his father through the court it is not a presumption this is obvious you might have said that just as those get their share of terimah for eating this one also gets his share of terimah for eating so he lets us hear that those get the terimah for eating and this one for selling our Judah says one does not raise a person to the priesthood on the testimony of one witness etc. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel says the same as our Eliezer and if you will say that they differ with regard to an objection raised by one person and that our Eliezer holds that an objection may be admitted if cooling from one person and our Simeon B. Gamaliel holds that an objection must come from at least two persons did not our Yohanan say all agree that an objection must come from at least two persons but we treat here of a case where the father of this person is a priest and a rumor came out concerning him that he is the son of a divorced woman or the son of a Haliza and they put him down and one witness came and said I know that he is a priest Talmud, Mosque Ketha both be and they raised him again and then came two other witnesses and said that he is the son of a divorced woman or the son of a Haliza and they put him down again and then came one witness and said I know that he is a priest now all agree that they are joined into one testimony and they differ as to whether we are afraid of bringing contempt on the court the first tana holds since we put hill down we do not raise him again because we are afraid of bringing contempt on the court whereas our Simeon B. Gamaliel holds we have put him down and we can raise him again and we are not afraid of bringing contempt on the court our Ashi asked against this if so even when there are two and two also but said our Ashi they differ as to whether they are joined into one testimony and they have the same difference of opinion as these tana for it has been taught their testimonies are not joined together unless they have both seen at the same time our Joshua B. Korha says even when they have seal one after another their testimonies are not established in court until they both give evidence at the same time our Nathan says we hear the evidence of one today and when the other one comes tomorrow we hear his evidence Mishnah if a woman was Imprisoned by heathens if for the sake of money she is permitted to her husband and if for the purpose of taking her life she is forbidden to her husband Gemara our Samuel B. Isaac said that Rab said they have taught this only when the hand of Israel is strong over the heathens but when the hand of the heathens is strong over themselves even if for the sake of money she is forbidden to her husband Rab raised an objection our Hosea the priest and our Zechariah B. Hakazab testified regarding an Israelitish woman who was pledged in Ashkelon and her family put her away and her witnesses testified concerning her that she did not hide herself with a man and that she was not defiled by a man that the sages said to them if you believe the witnesses that she was pledged believe them also that she did not hide herself and that she was not defiled and if you do not believe them that she did not hide herself and that she was not defiled do not believe them that she was pledged. Now Ashkelon was a town in which the hand of the heathens was strong over themselves and he teaches Talmud, Mosketha both when she was pledged but not when she was imprisoned no the same applies also to the case if she had been imprisoned only it happened so some say Rabbah said we have also learned in a mission to the same effect our Hosea the priest and our Zechariah Bihakazab testified regarding an Israelitish woman who was pledged in Ashkelon and her family put her away and her witnesses testified concerning her that she did not hide herself with a man and that she was not defiled by a man that the sages said if you believe the witnesses that she was pledged believe them also that she did not hide herself and that she was not defiled and if you do not believe them that she did not hide herself and was not defiled do not believe them that she was pledged in Ashkelon it happened for the sake of money and yet the reason why the sages permitted her to her husband was because witnesses testified concerning her but if witnesses did not testify concerning her she would not have been permitted and is it not also to be supposed that there is no difference whether she was pledged or imprisoned no when she was pledged it is different some put this argument in the form of a contradiction we have learned it for the sake of money she is permitted to her husband but here is a contradiction our Jose testified etc now in
Town in time of peace the open casks of wine are forbidden and the closed ones are permitted in times of war both are permitted because they have no time to offer libations are Mari answered to have intercourse they have time to offer libations they have no time are Isaac B. Eliezer said in the name of Hezekiah there it speaks of a besieging troop of the same kingdom here it speaks of a besieging troop of another kingdom even in the case of a besieging troop of the same kingdom it is not possible that one of them does not run away from the rest of the troop Rab Judah answered in the name of Samuel when the guards see one another but it is not possible that one does not sleep a little our Levi answered when they placed around the town chains dogs trunks of trees and geese are Abba said with regard to this our Judah and the rabbis differ one said that there it speaks of a besieging troop of the same kingdom and here of a besieging troop of another kingdom and he found no difficulties whereas one raised all those questions and answered them by saying when they placed around the town chains dogs trunks of trees and geese are edb said in the name of our Isaac B. Ashi and if there is their one hiding place it protects all priests wives are Jeremiah asked the question what is the law if it holds only one do we say of each one this is the one or not but why should it be different from the following case there were two paths one was clean and one was unclean and someone walked in one of them and then prepared clean things and another person came and walked in the second path and then prepared clean things our Judah says if each one comes to ask separately they are declared clean but if they both come together they are declared unclean our Jose says in either case they are declared unclean we're on Rabbah and some say our Yohan and said if they come to ask at the same time all agree that they are declared unclean if they come one after another all agree that they are declared clean they differ only when one comes to ask for himself and for the other one one regards this as if it were at the same time and the other regards this as if it were one after another now here also since all women are declared permitted it is like the case where they came at the same time how is this so there there is certainly an impurity but here who says that anyone has been defiled or as she asked if she says I have not hidden myself and I have not been defiled what is the law do we say Talmud, Moscow both be why should she lie or do we not say it but why should this be different from the following case once someone hired out and asked to a person and he said to him do not go the way of Nihar Pekat where there is water go the way of Nourish where there is no water but he went the way of Nihar Pekat and the asked died he then came before Rabbah and said to him indeed I went the way of Nihar Pekat but there was no water. Said Rabbah, why should he lie if he wished he could say I went the way of Nourish and Abay said to him we do not say why should he lie where there are witnesses now is this so there there were witnesses that there certainly was water on the way of Nihar Pekat but here has she certainly been defiled it is only a fear and in the case of a fear we say why should he lie if there are witnesses even a slave even a handmaid they are believed and even her own handmaid is believed but there is a contradiction against this she must not be alone with him unless there are witnesses even a slave even a handmaid except her own handmaid because she is familiar with her own handmaid our poppy said in the case of a woman captive they have made it lenient our poppy said in the one case it speaks of her handmaid in the other case it speaks of his handmaid but her handmaid is not believed does he not teach that no one may testify as to himself this would imply that her handmaid is believed her handmaid is like herself or as she said in both cases it speaks of her handmaid but what we maintain is that the handmaid sees and is silent consequently there where her silence makes her permitted she is not believed but here where her silence makes her forbidden she is believed now also she may come and tell a falsehood two things she would not do as in the case of Mari B. Isaac or as some say of Hannah B. Isaac to him there came a brother from Behozi and said to him give me a share in the property of our father he answered him I do not know you he then came to our and he said to him I he answered you well for it is written and Joseph knew his brethren and they knew not him as teaches that he went away before he had grown a beard and he came back after growing a beard and he said to him I go and bring witnesses that you are his brother he answered him I have witnesses but they are afraid of him because he is a powerful man he then said to the other man go you and Bring witnesses that he is not thy brother he answered him is this the law surely he who claims must produce evidence he said to him so I rule for you and all who are powerful like you but they may also come and lie two things they will not do may we say that this difference is like that between these ten aim for it was taught in the very of this testimony a man and a woman a boy and a girl her father and her mother her brother and her sister may give but not her son and her daughter nor her slave and her handmaid and in another very it was taught all are believed to testify for her except herself and her husband now the views of our papa and our ashi are certainly according to the difference of the tenaim but is the view of our papa according to the tenaim our papa can answer you that very this speaks of a case when she talked in her simplicity as that which our Dini said when he came our of Carthagene told a story a case came before our Joshua B. Levi or as some say our Joshua B. Levi told a story a case came before Rabbi someone was talking in his simplicity and said I and my mother were taken captives among heathens when I went out to draw my water my mind was on my mother when I was out to gather wood my mind was on my mother and Rabbi allowed her to marry a priest by the words of his mouth mission our Zechariah B. Hakazab said by this temple her hand did not move out of my hand from the time that the heathens entered Jerusalem until they departed they answered him no one may testify concerning himself Gemara it has been taught and notwithstanding this he appointed for her a dwelling place in his courtyard and when she was out she went out at the head of her children and when she came in she came in at the head other children have asked may one do so with regard to one's divorced wife do I say there it was allowed because in the case of a captive woman they made it lenient but not here or is there no difference come and here it has been taught if someone has divorced his wife she shall not get married and live in his neighborhood Talmud, Moskath Abote and if he was a priest she must not live with him in the same alley if it was a small village such a case happened and they said a small village is considered a neighborhood who must give way before whom come and here it has been taught she must give way before him and not he before her but if the courtyard belonged to her he must give way before her the question was asked if the courtyard belonged to both what is the law come and here she must give way before him in what case if the courtyard belongs to him it is obvious and if the courtyard belongs to her has it not been taught if the courtyard belongs to her he gives way before her hence it must be in a such case no perhaps it deals with the case when they rented the courtyard how is it then come and here it is written the Lord will hurl you away violently as a man and rab said moving about is harder for a man than for a woman our rabbis taught if he borrowed from the property of her father she collects the payment only through another person our she's hate said and if they both come before us to court we do not deal with them our papa said we excommunicate them our who the son of our joshua said we even order them to be lashed our nom and said it is taught in evil rabbi this is said only when she was divorced after marriage but if she was divorced after betrothal she may collect the payments herself because he is not so familiar with her once a betrothed and his former fiance came before rabbi and our adabi matina sat before him rabbi placed a messenger between them our adabi matina said to him did not our nom and say it is taught in evil rabbi etc he answered him we see that they are familiar with one another some say rabbi did not place a messenger between them our adabi matina said to him let the master place a messenger between them he answered him did not Arnaman say it is taught in Ebel Rabbati etc. He said to him this only when they are not familiar with one another but as to these I see that they are familiar with one another. Mishnah the following are believed on testifying when they are grown up to what they have seen when they were small a person is believed on saying this is the handwriting of my father this is the handwriting of my teacher this is the handwriting of my brother remember that that woman went out with a hainama and uncovered head that that man used to go out from school to immerse in order to eat terima that he used to take a share with us at the threshing floor that this place was a beth hopper is that up to here we used to go on sabbath but a man is not believed when he says so and so had a way in this place that man had a place of standing up and lamentation in this place Gemara Arunabi Joshua said this is only when a grown up person is with him and it is necessary for if he had taught us with regard to his father I might say that is because he was always with him but with regard to his teacher he would not be believed and if he had taught us with regard to his teacher I might say that is because he had reverence for his teacher and if he had taught us these two cases I might say with regard to his father that is because he was always with him and with regard to his teacher because he had reverence for him but with regard to his brother in regard to whom there is neither this nor that ground I might say that he is not believed so he teaches us that since the confirm
treats him as a child to immerse in order to eat terima only with regard to rabbinical terima that he was taking a share with us at the threshing floor but perhaps he was a slave of a priest we have learned this according to him who says one does not distribute terima to a slave unless his master is with him for it has been taught one does not distribute terima to a slave unless his master is with him this is the view of Arjuna our Jose says he can say if I am a priest give me for my sake and if I am the slave of a priest give me for the sake of my master in the place of Arjuna they used to raise from terima to the status of a priest in the place of our Jose they would not raise from terima to the status of a priest it is taught our Eliezer the son of our Jose said I have never given testimony once I gave testimony and they raised a slave to the priest who through my evidence you say they raised do you indeed mean to say this now if the holy one blessed be he does not bring a stumbling through the animals of the pious men, how much less through the pious men themselves, but they wanted to raise a slave to the priesthood through my evidence. He saw it in the place of our Jose, and he went and testified in the place of our Judah that this place was a Beth Hapers. Why? Because the law of Beth Hapers is rabbinical for Rab Judah said in the name of Rab one blows away the dust from the Beth Hapers and goes there. Rab Judah BMI said in the name of Rab Judah A Beth Hapers, which has been trodden out, is clean. What is the reason? It is impossible that a bone of the size of a barley corn was not trodden down by the foot up to here. He used to go on Sabbath. He holds that the Sabbath limits are rabbinical. A man is not believed when he says that man had a way in this place, so and so had a place of standing up and lamentation in this place. What is the reason? Money we do not extract our rabbis taught a boy is believed when he says thus my father told me this. Family is clean, this family is unclean. You say clean and unclean. Do you indeed mean to say this? But say this family is fit and this family is unfit that we have eaten at the Kazaza on the occasion of the marriage of the daughter of so and so to so and so that we used to bring hala and priestly gifts to the priest so and so, but only through himself and not through someone else. In all these cases, if he was an even and he became a proselyte a slave and he was set free, he is not believed, but he is not believed when he says that man had a way in this place, that man had a place of standing up and lamentation in this place. Are Yohanan B. Baraka said he is believed to which clause does Are Yohanan B. Baraka refer? Shall I say to the last clause this is extracting money, but it refers to the first clause. In all these cases, if he was a heathen and he became a proselyte a slave and he was set free, he is not believed. Are Yohanan B. Baraka says he is believed in what principle do? They differ the first hand a hold since he was a heathen he would not pay special attention to it and our Yohanan B. Barak a hold since he had it in his mind to become a proselyte he would pay special attention to it what is kisses the rabbis taught in what manner does kisses take place if one of the brothers has married a woman who is unworthy of him the members of the family come together bring a cask full of fruit break it in the middle of the open place and say brethren of the house of Israel your brother so and so has married a woman who is not worthy of him and we are afraid lest his descendants will be united with our descendants come and take for yourselves a sign for future generations that his descendants shall not be united with our descendants this is kisses with regard to which a child is believed when he testifies Talmud Mosque Ketha Bothe Chapteriii Mishnah these are maidens to whom the fine is due if anyone had intercourse with Imams Rathay. Nathan Aikudian or with a proselyte maiden a captive or a slave woman who was redeemed converted or freed when she was under the age of three years and one day if one had intercourse with his sister with the sister of his father with the sister of his mother with the sister of his wife with the wife of his brother with the wife of the brother of his father or with a woman during menstruation he has to pay the fine for although these transgressions are punished through the transgressor being cut off there is not with regard to the death penalty inflicted by the court Gemara does it mean that only these blemished maidens get the fine but unblemished ones do not he means it thus these are blemished maidens who get the fine if anyone had intercourse with the moms of Rathay Nathan Aikudian etc only the Mishnah states a maiden receives a fine but not a small girl who is a tana who taught this Rab Judah said in the name of Rabbit is Armeir for it has been taught a small child from the age of one day until the time that she grows two hairs. Sale applies to her, but not the fine from the time that she grows two hairs until she becomes mature. The fine applies to her, but not sale. This is the view of Armeir for Armeir said wherever sale applies, the fine does not apply, and wherever the fine applies, sale does not apply. But the sages say a small child from the age of three years and one day until the time that she becomes mature. The fine applies to her. Does that mean only the fine and not sale? Say Talmud. Mosketha both be also the fine applies when sale applies. But are these maidens entitled to the fine? Why red here and she shall be his wife? That means one who is fit to be his wife. Said Rashlakish it is written maiden maiden the maiden once the word maiden is necessary for itself wants to include those maidens the marrying of whom involves the transgression merely of a plain prohibited law and wants to. Include those maidens the marrying of whom involves a transgression punishable with Karath our Papa said it is written virgin virgin the virgins once the word virgin is necessary for itself wants to include those virgins the marrying of whom involves a transgression merely of a plain prohibited law and wants to include those virgins the marrying of whom involves a transgression punishable with Karath why does our Papa not agree with Reshlakish that verse he requires for the same teaching is that of Abbe for Abbe said if he cohabited with her and she died he is free for it is said and he shall give unto the father of he maiden this means to the father of a maiden but not to the father of a dead person and why did not Reshlakish agree with our Papa that verse he requires for an analogy for it is taught he is written he shall pay money according to the Dario virgins this means that this shall be like the Dario virgins and the Dario virgins shall be like this, but Reshlakish also requires it for the same teaching as that of Abbe and our Papa also requires it for the analogy. Take therefore six words maiden, maiden, the maiden, virgin, virgins, the virgins, two are necessary for themselves, one for the teaching of Abbe and one for the analogy, and two remain over one to include those maidens, the marrying of whom involves the transgression of a plain prohibited law, and one to include those maidens, the marrying of whom involves a transgression punishable with Karath. This mission is to exclude the view of the Tana, for it has been taught it is written, and she shall be his wife. Simeon the Temanite says this means a woman who can become his wife, or Simeon Bimanasia says this means a woman who can remain his wife. What difference is there between them? Arzara said the difference between them is with regard to Imam Zareth and Anathan, according to him who says that there must be the possibility of her becoming. His wife here also there is the possibility of her becoming his wife and according to him who says that there must be the possibility of her remaining his wife here there is not the possibility of her remaining his wife but according to our Akiva who says marriage takes no effect when there is a prohibitory law against it what is the difference between them there is a difference between them in the case of a widow who marries a high priest and this according to our semi for it is taught our semi says of all our Akiva makes Mansurim except the issue of a widow and a high priest for the Torah says he shall not take and he shall not profane this teaches that he makes his issue profane but not Mansurim and according to our Yeshiva who says come and let us cry out against Akiva be Joseph who says whenever the marriage is forbidden in Israel the child of such marriage is a Mansur what is the difference between them the difference between them is Talmud Mosketha Bode with regard to the marriage with an Egyptian or an Edomite woman in which case there is a transgression merely of a positive law that is all right if our Yeshiva by his statement only came to exclude the view of our Semi but if his statement was his own whenever the marriage is forbidden in Israel the child of such a marriage is a monster it would include also a marriage with regard to which a positive law has been transgressed what is then the difference between them the difference between them is with regard to a girl who is no more a virgin who married a high priest and why is this different it is a law which does not apply to all our Histas and all agree that he who has intercourse with a woman during menstruation against her will has to pay the fine for according to him who holds that there must be the possibility of her becoming his wife there is with regard to her the possibility of her becoming his wife and according to him who holds that there must be the possibility of her Remaining his wife there is with regard to her the possibility of her remaining his wife our Mishnah likewise excludes the view of our Nihunya Bihakana for it is taught our Nihunya Bihakana made the day of atonement equal to the Sabbath with regard to payment as he who desecrates the Sabbath forfeits his life and is free from payment so he who desecrates the day of atonement forfeits his
delivered to the government or robbers come upon him he who would have been sentenced to strangulation is either drowned in the river or dies from suffocation but reverse it lions and thieves are by the hand of heaven and cold and he are by the hand of man robber said the reason for the view of our nihunya bihakana is derived from here it is written and if the people of the land do not all hide their eyes from that man when he giveth of his seat unto molech and put him not to death then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off with these words. The Torah says, My Gareth is like your death penalty, as in the case of your death penalty, one is free from payment. So, in the case of my Gareth, one is free from payment. What is the difference between Rabbah and Abbe? The difference is with regard to a stranger who ate Teramah. According to Abbe, he is free from payment, and according to Rabbah, he is bound to pay, but is he free from payment? According to Abbe, did not our Histah say, Our Nihunya Bihakana admits that he who stole forbidden fat belonging to his neighbor and ate it is bound to pay because he was guilty of stealing before he came to the transgression of the prohibition with regard to forbidden fat. Hence, you say that as soon as he lifted it up, he acquired it, but he did not become guilty of the transgression punishable with death until he had eaten it here. Also, when he lifted it up, he acquired it, but he did not become guilty of the transgression punishable with death until he had eaten it here we treat of a case where his friend stuck it into his mouth but even then as soon as he chewed it he acquired it but he is not guilty of the transgression punishable with death until he has swallowed it when his friend stuck it into his esophagus how shall we imagine this case if he can give it back let him give it back and if he cannot give it back why should he be guilty it speaks of a case when he can give it back only with an effort our papa said when his friend put liquids of terima into his mouth our ashi said it speaks of a case when a stranger ate his own terima talmud mosque at the and at the same time tore the silk garments of his neighbor the above text stated arista said arnihun yabihakana admits that if someone stole forbidden fat belonging to his neighbor and ate it he is bound to pay because he was guilty of stealing before he came to the Transgression of the prohibition with regard to forbidden fat is it to say that he differs from Arabin for Arabin said if someone threw an arrow on Sabbath from the beginning of four cubits to the end of four cubits and it tore silk garments in its passage he is free from payment for the taking up was necessary for the putting down now here also the lifting up was necessary for the eating now is this so there the putting down is impossible without the taking up but here the eating is possible without the lifting up for if he likes he can bend down and eat or there if he wants to take it back he cannot take it back but here he can put it back what is the practical difference between the one answer and the other answer the difference is when someone carried a knife in the public road and it tore silk garments in its passage according to the answer that the putting down is impossible without the taking up here also the putting down is impossible without the taking up and according to the answer that he cannot take it back here he can take it back the text stated above Arabin said if someone threw on Sabbath an arrow from the beginning of four cubits to the end of four cubits and it tore silk garments in its passage he is free from payment for the taking up was necessary for the putting down RBBB Abbe raised the following objection if someone stole a purse on Sabbath he is bound to pay because he was guilty of stealing before he came to the transgression of the prohibition which is punishable with stoning but if he dragged it along he is free from payment because the desecration of the Sabbath and the stealing come at the same time and why here also we should say the lifting up is necessary for the carrying out here we treat of a case when he lifted it up in order to hide it and changed his mind and carried it out but is he in this case guilty of desecrating the Sabbath did not our Simeon say that RMI said in the Name of Aryohanan if someone was removing objects from one corner to another corner and changed his mind and carried them out he is free of the transgression of the desecration of the Sabbath because the taking up was not from the outset for that purpose do not say in order to hide it but say in order to carry it out only it speaks here of a case when he paused and remained standing for a while for what purpose did he remain standing if to adjust the cord on his shoulder this is the usual way no we speak of a case where he stood still in order to rest but how would it be if he had remained standing in order to adjust the cord on his shoulder Talmud, Mosque Ketha both be he would be free from payment if so instead of teaching but if he dragged it along he is free from payment let him make the distinction in the same case when is this said if he stood still to rest but if he stood still to adjust the cord on his shoulder he is free from payment but answer thus Whose opinion is this? It is that of Benizé who says walking is like standing, but how would it be if he threw the purse? He would be free from payment. Let him then make the distinction in the same case. Thus, when is it said when he walked, but when he threw it, he is free. The case of dragging it along is necessary to be stated. You might have said that this is not the way of carrying out, so he lets us hear that it is not so. Of what kind of purse does it speak? If of a large purse, this is the ordinary way of carrying it out, and if of a small purse, this is not the ordinary way. In fact, it speaks of a middle sized purse, but where did he carry it to? If he carried it into the public road, there is desecration of the Sabbath, but no stealing, and if he carried it into private ground, there is stealing, but no desecration of the Sabbath. No, it is necessary to state it when he carried it out to the sides of the public road, according to whose view, if according to that of our Eliezer who says the sides of the public road are like the public road there is desecration of the Sabbath but no stealing and if it is according to the view of the rabbis who say the sides of the public road are not like the public road there is stealing but no desecration of the Sabbath indeed it is according to our Eliezer and when our Eliezer says the sides of the public road are like the public road it is only with regard to becoming guilty of the desecration of the Sabbath because sometimes through the pressure of the crowd people go in there but with regard to acquiring one does acquire there because the public is not often there are as she said we speak of a case when he lowered his hand to less than three handbreadths and received it and this is according to Rabba for Rabba said the hand of a person is regarded as a place of four by four handbreadths are aha taught so Rabbana however taught indeed when he carried it out into the public road for he acquires also in the public Ground and they differ with regard to a deduction from this mission for we have learned if he was pulling it out and it died in the domain of the owner he is free but if he lifted it up or brought it out from the territory of the owner and it died he is bound to pay Rubina makes a deduction from the first clause and Araha makes a deduction from the second clause Rubina makes a deduction from the first clause if he was drawing it out and it died in the domain of the owner he is free the reason for his being free is because it died in the domain of the owner but if he had brought it out from the domain of the owner and it died he would have been bound to pay Araha makes a deduction from the second clause but if he lifted it up or brought it out etc bringing out is like lifting up as lifting up is an act through which the object comes into his possession so bringing out must be an act through which the object comes into his possession according to Araha the first Clause is difficult and according to Rubin the second clause is difficult the first clause is not difficult according to our aha for as long as it has not come into his possession it is called in the domain of the owner the second clause is not difficult according to Rubin for we do not say that bringing out is like lifting up if one had intercourse by force with his sister or with the sister of his father etc there is a question of contradiction against this the following persons receive the punishment of lashes he who has intercourse with his sister with the sister of his father with the sister of his mother with the sister of his wife with the sister of his brother with the wife of the brother of his father or with a woman during menstruation Talmud Mosque at the and it is established that one does not receive lashes and Paola said there is no difficulty here it speaks of his sister who is a maiden and there it speaks of his sister who is a mature girl but in the case of his sister who is a mature girl too there are damages to be paid for the shame and deterioration it speaks of an idiot but there are still damages to be paid for the pain it speaks of a girl who was seduced now that you have come to this you can even say that it speaks of his sister who was a maiden and namely when she was an orphan and she was seduced consequently Allah holds the view that wherever there is money to be paid and the punishment of lashes to be inflicted he pays the money and does not receive the lashes whence does Allah derive this he derives it from the law with regard to one person who injures another person just as when one person injures another person in which case there is money to be paid and the punishment of lashes he pays the money and does not receive the lashes so whenever there are payment of money and the punishment of lashes he pays the money and does not receive the lashes but may it not be argued it is Different with the case of one person who injures another person because he is liable for five things and if you will say that the payment of money is lighter one
written there, I for I is there, he pays money and does not receive lashes. So wherever there are the payment of money and the punishment of lashes, he pays money and does not receive the lashes. Are Yohanan said, you can even say that it speaks of his sister who was a maiden. Only there it speaks of a case where they warned him, and here it speaks of a case where they did not warn him. Consequently, Are Yohanan holds the view that wherever there are the payment of money and the punishment of lashes, and they warned him, he receives the lashes and does not pay the money. Whence does Are Yohanan derive this? The verse says, according to his guilt from this, I infer that you punish him because of one guilt, but not because of two guilts, and immediately follow the words forty stripes he may give him. But behold, when one person injures another person, in which case there are the payment of money and the punishment of lashes, he pays money and does not receive the lashes. And if you will say that this is. Only when they did not warn him, but when they warned him, he receives the lashes and does not pay. Did not RMI say in the name of Aryohanan that if one person struck another person a blow for which no parata can be claimed as damages, he receives the lashes? How shall we imagine this case if they did not warn him? Why does he receive the lashes? Hence, it is clear that they warned him, and the reason why he receives the lashes and does not pay is because the damages do not amount to a parata. But if they amount to a parata, he pays the money but does not receive the lashes. It is as Aryohanan said. The Torah has expressly stated that the Zomemim witnesses have to pay money. So here also the Torah has expressly stated that the person who injures another person has to pay money. With regard to what has the teaching of Aryohanan been said with regard to the following, we testify that so and so owes his fellow two hundred zoos, and they were found to be Zomemim. They receive the lashes and. Pay for it is not the verse that imposes upon them the lashes which imposes upon them the payment of money. This is the view of our Meir and the sages say he who pays does not receive lashes and let us say he who receives lashes does not pay upon that. Our said the Torah has expressly stated that the Zomemim witnesses have to pay more money whereas the Torah stated this consider it is written and shall you do unto him as he had thought to do unto his brother. Why is it written further? Hand for hand this means a thing that is given from hand to hand and that is money and the same applies to the case of one person who injures another person consider it is written as he hath done so shall it be done to him. Why is it written further so shall it be rendered unto him this means a thing that can be rendered and that is money. Why does our Yohanan not say as well if so you would abolish the prohibitory law the nakedness of thy sister thou shalt not uncover Talmud, Moss. Kethabothe but could not one say also in the case of one person who injures another person if so you would abolish the prohibitory law he shall not exceed lest if he should exceed and in case of the Zomemim witnesses too one could say if so you would abolish the law then it shall be if the guilty man deserved to be beaten but you must say that in the case of the Zomemim witnesses it is possible to fulfill it when the witnesses testified falsely about someone that he was the son of a divorced woman or the son of a Hallie is similarly in the case of a person who injured another person it also is possible to fulfill it when he struck him a blow for which no parata can be claimed as damages and so you can say also with regard to his sister that it is possible to fulfill it in the case of his sister who was a mature girl or Yohanan can answer you the verse for he hath humbled her is required for the same teaching as of Abbe for Abbe said the verse says for he hath humbled her this he shall pay for he has humbled her from which we infer by implication that there are also to be paid damages for shame and deterioration and only he derives it from the teaching of Rabba for Rabba said the verse says then the man that lay with her shall give unto the father of the maiden at fifty shekel of silver this means that for the enjoyment of lying with the maiden he has to pay fifty shekel of silver and we infer by implication that there are also to be paid damages for shame and deterioration our Eliezer says the Zomemim witnesses pay money and do not receive lashes because they cannot be warned Rabba said you may know it from the following when shall we warn them shall we warn them at first they will then say we have forgotten shall we warn them during the deed they would then withdraw and not give any evidence shall we warn them at the end and what has been has been Abbe demur to this let us warn them immediately after they have Given their evidence, Araha, the son of Araha, demurred, let us warn them at first and gesticulate to them afterwards. Later, Abbe said what I said was nothing, for if one were to say that Zomemim witnesses require a warning, it would follow that if we have not warned them, we would not kill them. But then is it possible that who they wish to kill without a warning that they should require a warning? Surely it is necessary that the words be fulfilled, then shall you do unto him as he has thought to do unto his brother. And this would not be the case here to this Arsam, the son of our Jeremiah, demurred. But now, according to your argument, if the witnesses testify falsely about someone that he was the son of a divorced woman or the son of a Hallius, since this case is not included in as he had thought, etc., a warning should be required. The verse says, Ye shall have one manner of law. This means a law that is equal for you all. Arshisha, the son of Aridi, said that a person who injures. Another person pays money and does not receive the lashes is derived from this. It is written, and if men strive together and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart upon this, our Eliezer said the verse speaks of a striving with intent to kill, for it is written, but if any harm follow, then thou shalt give life for life. How shall we imagine this case if they did not warn him? Why should he be killed? Hence it is obvious that he was warned, and it is held when one is warned regarding a severe matter, one also is warned for a light matter, and yet the Torah says, and yet no harm follow, he shall be surely fine to this. Our Ashi demurred, whence do we know that when one is warned regarding a severe matter, one also stands warned for a light matter, perhaps it is not so, and even if we will say that it is so, whence do we know that the penalty of death is severe? Talmud, Moskatha both be Talmud, Moskatha both be perhaps the punishment with lashes is severe for Rab Sedipe. Had lashed Hanani Missal and Azariah, they would have worshipped the golden image. Our Sam the son of Arashi said to Arashi, and some say that Our Sam the son of Arashi said to Arashi, Do you not make a distinction between a beating that has a limit and a beating that has no limit? Our Jacob from Nihar Pekat also demurred that is all right according to the rabbis who hold that life actually means life, but according to rabbi who holds that it means money, what is there to say but said Ar? Jacob from Nihar Pekat in the name of Rabbi it is to be derived from the following verse. It is written, If he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff, then shall he that smote him be quick. Would it enter your mind that this one walks about in the street and that one should be killed, but it teaches that they imprison him. If he dies, they kill him, and if he does not die, he shall pay for the loss of his time, ere it shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. Now, how shall we imagine this case if they? Did not warn him why should he be killed? Hence it is plain that they warned him, and it is held one who was warned for a severe matter stands warned for the lighter matter, and yet the Almerciful says that if he does not die, he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed to this Arashi asked whence do you know that one who was warned for a severe matter stands warned for a lighter matter, perhaps not, and if you will even say that he does stand warned. For the lighter matter, whence do you know that death is severe, perhaps the punishment with lashes is severe for Rab said if they had lashed Hanani Missal and Ezra, they would have worshipped the golden image Arsam the son of Arashi said to Arashi, and some say that Arsam the son of Arashi said to Arashi, Do you not make a distinction between a beating that has a limit and a beating that has no limit? Armari also demurred whence do you know that one smote the other? Willfully and he shall be quit means from the penalty of death perhaps one smote the other inadvertently and he shall be quit means from exile the difficulty remains Resh Lakish said this is the opinion of Armadir who says he receives the lashes and pays the money if it is according to Armadir then one who violated his daughter should also pay the fine and if you will say that Armadir holds that one may receive the lashes and pay the money but does not hold that one may receive the death penalty and pay the money has it not been taught if he has stolen and slaughtered an animal on Sabbath or has stolen and slaughtered an animal for idolatry or has stolen an ox that is to be stoned and slaughtered it he shall pay fourfold or fivefold this is the view of Armadir but the sages declare him free from payment has it not been stated regarding this our Jacob said in the name of our Yohanan and some say that our Jeremiah said in the name of our Simeon Belakish our Abin and our Delay and the whole company of scholars said in the name of our Yohanan that it speaks of a case when he who stole the animal let it be slaughtered by another person but is it possible that one sins and another one is punished Rabbah said the divine
At the entrance of the house of the prince it is written, Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore for it is holy unto you from this we derive as what is holy is forbidden to be eaten, so what has been prepared on the Sabbath is forbidden to be eaten, if so you might say that as what is holy is forbidden to be enjoyed, so what has been prepared on the Sabbath should be forbidden to be enjoyed, it says unto you from this we learn it shall belong to you, you might think that it is forbidden to eat. Even what has been prepared on the Sabbath by mistake, therefore it is said everyone that profaneth it shall surely be put to death. This teaches that only when the act was done willfully have I told thee that it is forbidden as that which is holy, but not if it was done by mistake. Araha and Rabbin a different concerning this one says what has been prepared on Sabbath is forbidden according to the Bible, and one says only according to the rabbis, he who says according to the Bible as we have just explained, and he who says according to the rabbis, the verse says it is holy, that means it is holy, but what has been prepared on it is not holy according to him who says that the prohibition is only rabbinical. What is the reason of the rabbis who declare him free? The rabbis declare him free only with regard to other cases, but with regard to one who slaughtered for idolatry, one can ask as soon as he has cut a little, it has become forbidden, so when he continues it. Slaughtering he does not slaughter what is the owner's rabbi said it speaks of a case when he says that he worships it with the completion of the slaughtering but with regard to the ox that is to he stoned one can ask he does not slaughter what is his here we speak of a case when he handed it to a keeper and it caused the damage in the house of the keeper and it was sentenced in the house of the keeper and the thief stole it from the house of the keeper and our mayor holds the view of our Jacob and holds the view of our Simeon he holds the view of our Jacob who says if the keeper returned it even after the sentence had been pronounced it is regarded as returned and he holds the view of our Simeon who says that which causes a gain or loss of money is regarded as money rabbi said indeed it speaks of a case when he slaughtered it himself Talmud Mosque both be and our mayor holds the view that though generally one may receive the lashes and pay one cannot receive the death Penalty and pay, but these cases are different because the Torah has enacted something novel in the matter of fine, and therefore he has to pay, although he has to suffer the death penalty. And Rabbi follows his own principle. For Rabbi said, if he had a kid which he had stolen and he slaughtered it on Sabbath, he is bound, for he was already guilty of stealing before he came to the profanation of the Sabbath. But if he stole and slaughtered it on Sabbath, he is free, for if there is no stealing, there is no slaughtering and no selling. Rabbi said further, if he had a kid which he had stolen and had slaughtered it at the place he broke into, he is bound, for he was already guilty of stealing before he came to the transgression of breaking in. But if he stole and slaughtered it in the place he broke into, he is free, for if there is no stealing, there is no slaughtering and no selling. And it was necessary to state both cases, for if he had let us hear the case of the Sabbath, I would have. Said that he is free from payment because its prohibition is a perpetual prohibition, but in the case of breaking in, which is only a prohibition for the moment, I might say that it is not so. And if he had let us hear the case of breaking in, I would say that he is free from payment because his breaking in is his warning. But with regard to the Sabbath, in which case a warning is required, I might say that it is not so. Therefore, it is necessary to state both cases. Our Papa said, If one had a cow that he had stolen and he slaughtered it on Sabbath, he is liable for he was already guilty of stealing before he came to the profanation of the Sabbath. If he had a cow that he borrowed and he slaughtered it on Sabbath, he is free. Araha, the son of Rabbah said to Arashi, Does our Papa mean to tell us that the same rule applies to a cow? He answered him, Our Papa means to tell us that the same rules applies to a borrowed cow. You might possibly think that because our Papa said that he becomes responsible for its food from the time of his taking possession of the cow by pulling here also he becomes responsible for any unpreventable accident that may befall it from the time of borrowing so he lets us hear that it is not so Rabbi said if their father left them a borrowed cow they may use it during the whole period for which he borrowed it if it died they are not responsible for what happened if they thought that it belonged to their father and they slaughtered it and ate if they pay the value of the meat at the lowest price if their father left them an obligation of property they are bound to pay some refer it to the first case and some refer it to the second case he who refers it to the first case so much the more does he refer it to the second case and he differs from our papa and he who refers it to the second case does not refer it to the first case and he agrees with our papa it is all right that our Yohanan does not say according to Rush because he Wants to explain it according to the rabbis, but why does not Resh Lakish say according to our Yohanan? He will answer you since he is free if they warned him. He is also free even if they did not warn him and they follow their own principles. For when Ardimi came from Palestine, he said he who has committed inadvertently an act which if he had committed it willfully would have been punishable with death or with lashes and which is also punishable with something else. Our Yohanan says that he is bound and Resh Lakish says that he is free. Our Yohanan says that he is bound for they did not warn him. Resh Lakish says that he is free for since he is free if they warned him. So he is free also when they did not warn him. Resh Lakish raised an objection against our Yohanan. It is written if no harm follow he shall be surely fine. Talmud, Mosque Ketha now is not real harm meant no the law concerning harm is meant. Some say our Yohanan raised an objection against Resh Lakish it is. Written and if no harm follow he shall be surely fined is not the law concerning harm meant no real harm is meant Rabbi said is there anyone who holds that he who committed inadvertently an act which if he had committed it willfully would have been punishable with death and which is also punishable with the payment of money is bound to make the money payment has not the school of Hezekiah taught it is written he that smite the man he that smite the beast from which we infer as in the case of the killing of a beast you have made no distinction between it being done inadvertently and willfully intentionally and unintentionally by way of going down or by way of going up so as to free him from the payment but in any case make him liable to pay so also in the case of the killing of a man you shall make no distinction between it being done inadvertently and willfully intentionally and unintentionally by way of going down or by way of going up so as to make him Liable to pay money but to free him from paying money but when Rabin came from Palestine he said as to him who committed inadvertently an act which if he had committed it willfully would have been punishable with death and which is also punishable with the payment of money all agree that he is free from the payment of money they only differ when the act committed inadvertently would have committed willfully have been punishable with lashes and something else or Yohanan says that he is bound to make the money payment because only with regard to those who commit an act punishable with death the analogy is made but with regard to those who commit an act punishable with lashes the comparison is not made but Resh Lakish says that he is free from making the money payment because the Torah has expressly included those who commit an act punishable with lashes to be as those who commit an act punishable with death whereas the Torah included them have they said we infer it from the double occurrence of wicked man Rabbah said we infer it from the double occurrence of smiting our Papa said to Rabbah which smiting do you mean if you mean the verse and he that smite the beast shall pay for it and he that smite the man shall be put to death this speaks of the death penalty is it the smiting he that smite the beast shall pay for it life for life and next to it comes and if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor as he hath done so shall it be done to him but here the term smiting is not mentioned we mean the effect of smiting but this verse refers to one who injures his fellow and one who injures his fellow has to pay damages it does not refer to a smiting in which there is a value of a parata refer it to a smiting in which there is not the value of a parata Talmud Mosque both be anyhow he is not liable to pay damages it necessarily speaks of a case where while he smote him he tore his silk garment our high said to Rabbah and according to the Tana of the school of Hezekiah who says it is written he that smite the man he that smite the beast etc. Whence does he know that it refers to a weekday and there is no distinction to be made perhaps it refers to the Sabbath in which case there is a distinction to be made with regard to the beast itself this cannot be for it is written and he that smite the beast shall pay for it and he that smite the man shall be put to death how shall we imagine this case if they did not warn and why should he if he killed a man be put to death hence it is clear that they warned him and if it happened on a Sabbath would he if he smote a beast pay for it therefore it can only refer to a weekday our Papa said to Abbe according to Rabbah who says that the Torah has instituted something novel in the matter of fines and therefore he pays although he is killed according to whom does he put our mission if according to our mayor the law regarding his
Those with regard to which one is liable to the penalty of death at the hand of the court prohibitions of the second degree are those with regard to which there is correct but in the case of prohibitions with regard to which one trespasses a plain prohibitory law they receive the fine and whose opinion is it is that of Simeon the Temanite some say forbidden relations are those with regard to which one is liable to the penalty of death at the hand of the court or correct prohibitions of it. Second degree are those with regard to which one transgresses a plain prohibitory law whose opinion is this that of our Simeon Bemanesia it is said above a woman who refuses her husband by me has no claim to fine for outrage or to indemnity for seduction but any other minor has a claim to the fine whose opinion would this be that of the rabbis who say a minor receives the fine right now the other clause a barren woman has no claim to fine for outrage or to indemnity for seduction this is according to our mayor who says the minor does not receive the fine and this one came from her state as minor into the state of womanhood the first clause would then be according to the rabbis and the last clause according to our mayor and if you would say that all of it is according to our mayor but in the case of a woman who refuses her husband by me he holds like Arjuna does he indeed hold the view of Arjuna has it not been taught until when can the daughter exercise the right of me until she grows two hairs these are the words of our mayor Arjuna says until the black is more than the white but it is according to Arjuna and with regard to a minor he holds like our mayor but does he hold this view did not Rab Judah say that Rab said these are the words of our mayor now if it had been so he ought to have said these are the words of our mayor and Arjuna this tana holds according to our mayor in one thing and differs from him in one thing Raf Ram said what is meant by a woman who refuses her husband by me on one who is entitled to refuse let him then teach a minor this is indeed difficult it is said above a barren woman has no claim to fine for outrage or to indemnity for seduction a contradiction was raised against this a woman who is a deaf mute or an idiot or barren has a claim to fine for outrage and a suit can be brought by her husband against her concerning her virginity what contradiction is there the one Baritha is according to our mayor and the other Baritha is according to the rabbis but he who raised the questions how could he raise it at all he wanted to raise another contradiction against a woman who is a deaf mute or an idiot or has reached maturity or lost her virginity through an accident no suit can be brought concerning her virginity against a woman who is blind or barren a suit can be brought concerning her virginity Simica says in the name of our mayor against a blind woman a suit cannot be brought concerning her virginity Said Arshis hate this is not difficult but one Baritha is according to our Gamaliel and the other Baritha is according to our Joshua but say when does our Gamaliel hold this view when she pleads but does he hold this view when she does not plead yes since our Gamaliel holds that she is believed we apply in a case like this the verse opened thy mouth for the dumb and against a woman who has reached maturity one cannot bring a suit concerning her virginity did not rap say to a woman who has reached maturity one gives the whole first night Talmud Mosque hath both be if he raises the complaint with regard to the bleeding it is really so here we treat of a case where he raises the complaint of the open door it is said above Simicus says in the name of our Mayor against a blind woman a suit cannot be brought concerning her virginity what is the reason of Simicus Arzera said because she may have struck against the ground all the others may also have struck against the ground all the other see it and show it to their mothers this one does not see it and does not chew it to her mother it is said above and a woman who goes out because of an evil name has no claim to fine for outrage and to indemnity for seduction a woman who goes out because of an evil name is liable to be stoned Arshis hates said he means it thus if an evil name has gone out concerning her in her childhood she has no claim to fine for outrage or to indemnity for seduction our papa said infer from this that one does not collect a debt with an unsound document how shall we imagine this case if to say that a rumor has gone out that the document is forged and similarly here that a rumor has gone out that she has been unchanged asked did not rob say that if the rumor has gone out in the town that she is unchanged asked one does not pay any attention to it but the case is that two persons came and said that she asked them to commit with her a transgression and similarly here that too. Persons came and said that he said to them forge me the document it is all right there since there are many unrestrained men but here if he has been established have therefore all Israelites been established here also since he was going around searching for a forgery I can say that he himself has forged it and written admission and in the following cases no fine is involved if a man had intercourse with a female proselyte a female captive or a bond woman who was ransomed proselytized or manumitted after the age of three years and a day Arjuna ruled if a female captive was ransomed she is deemed to be in her virginity even if she be of age a man who had intercourse with his daughter his daughter's daughter his son's daughter his wife's daughter her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter incurs no fine because he forfeits his life the death penalties of such transgressors being in the hands of Beth Din and he who forfeits his life pays no monetary fine for it is said in scripture and yet no harm follow he shall be surely fine Gamara our Yohanan said both Arjuna and Ardosa taught the same thing as to Arjuna we have the ruling just mentioned as to Ardosa it was taught a female captive may eat Teramaso Ardosa what after all is it said Ardosa that that Arab has done to her has he rendered her unfit to be a priest's wife merely because he squeezed her between her breasts said Rabba is it not possible that there is really no agreement between them Arjuna may have laid down his ruling here only in order that the sinner may gain no advantage but there he may hold the same opinion as the rabbis is or else may not Ardosa have laid down his ruling only there where it concerns Terima which at the present time is only a rabbinical enactment but in the case of a fine which is a pentateuchal law he may well hold the same view as the rabbis have answered him is Arjuna's reason here that the sinner may gain no advantage surely it was Taught Arjuna ruled if a female captive was ransomed she is deemed to be in her virginity and even if she is ten years old her captive is two hundred zoos now how could the reason that the sinner shall gain no advantage apply there there also a good reason exists for Arjuna's ruling since otherwise men would abstain from marrying her could Arjuna however maintain the view that a female captive retains the status of a virgin when in fact it was taught a man who ransoms a female captive may marry her but he who gives evidence on her behalf may not marry her and Arjuna ruled in either case he may not marry her is not this however self-contradictory you said a man who ransoms a female captive may marry her and then it is stated he who gives evidence on her behalf may not marry her shall he not marry her it may well be asked because he gives also evidence on her behalf this is no difficulty it is this that was meant a man who ransoms a female captive and gives evidence on her Behalf may marry her, but he who merely gives evidence on her behalf may not marry her. In any case, however, does not the contradiction against Arjuna remain? Our papa replied, "Right, Arjuna ruled. In either case, he may marry her. Are who not the son of Arjuna replied? The reading may still be as it was originally given, but Arjuna was speaking to the rabbis in accordance with their own ruling. According to my view, he argued the man may marry her. In either case, but according to your view, it should have been laid down that in either case he may not marry her. And the rabbis, a man who ransoms a captive and gives evidence on her behalf, may marry her because no one would throw money away for nothing. But he who merely gives evidence on her behalf may not marry her because he may have fallen in love with her. Our papa B. Samuel pointed out the following contradiction to Arjuna's Talmud. Mosketha both could Arjuna hold the view that a female captive is deemed to have retained her virginity when it. Was in fact taught if a woman proselyte discovered some menstrual blood on the day of her conversion, it is sufficient Arjuna rule to reckon her Levitical uncleanness from the time she discovered it. Our Jose rule she is subject to the same laws as all other women and therefore causes uncleanness retrospectively for 24 hours or for the period intervening between her last examination and her previous examination. She must also wait three months, so Arjuna but our Jose permits her to be betrothed and married. And once the other replied, You are pointing out a contradiction between a proselyte and a captive who belong to totally different categories since a proselyte does not protect her honor while a captive does protect her honor. A contradiction, however, was also pointed out between two rulings in relation to a captive, for it was taught proselytes, captives, or slaves who were ransomed or proselytized or were monument must wait three months if they were. Older than three years and one day so Arjuna Arjose permits immediate betrothal and marriage the other remained silent have you he said to him heard anything on the subject thus the former replied said Arshis hate this is a case where people saw that the captive was seduced if so what could be Arjose's
Harm follow he shall be surely fined etc. is however the deduction made from this text is it not in fact made from the following text according to the measure of his crime which implies you make him liable to a penalty for one crime but you cannot make him liable at the same time for two crimes one text deals with the penalties of death and money and the other with the penalties of flogging and money and both texts were needed for if we had been told only of that which deals with the penalties of death and money it might have been assumed that the restriction applied only to the death penalty because it involves loss of life but not to the penalties of flogging and money where no loss of life is involved and if we had been told only of flogging and money it might have been assumed that the restriction applied only to flogging because the transgression for which flogging is inflicted is not very great but not to the penalties of death and money where the Transgression for which the death penalty is imposed is very grave, hence it was necessary to have both texts according to our measure. However, who ruled the man may be flogged and also ordered to pay what need was there for the two texts. One deals with the penalties of death and money Talmud, Mosketha both be and the other with those of death and flogging and both texts were needed for if we had been told only of that which deals with the penalties of death and money it might have been assumed. That the restriction applied to these two penalties only because we must not inflict one penalty upon one's body and another upon one's possessions but in the case of death and flogging both of which are inflicted on one's body it might have been assumed that the flogging is deemed to be but one protract death penalty and both may therefore be inflicted upon one man and if we had been told about death and flogging only the restriction might have been assumed to apply to these. Penalties only because no two corporal punishments may be inflicted on the same person but in the case of the penalties of death and money one of which is corporal and the other monetary it might have been assumed that both may be inflicted both texts were therefore necessary what need was there for the scriptural text moreover ye shall take no ransom for the life of a murderer the all merciful as here stated you shall take no monetary fine from him and thus exempt him from the death penalty what was the need for the scriptural text and ye shall take no ransom for him that is fled to his city of refuge the all merciful as here stated you shall take no monetary fine from him to exempt him from exile but why two texts one deals with unwitting and the other with intentional murder and both texts were required for if we had been told of intentional murder only it might have been assumed that the restriction applied to this case only because the transgression for which Death is inflicted is grave but not to the one of unintentional murder where the transgression is not so grave and if we had been told of unintentional murder is only it might have been assumed that the restriction applied to this case only because no loss of life is involved but not to intentional murder where a loss of life is involved both texts were consequently required what was the object of the scriptural text and no expiation can be made for the land for the blood that is shed. Therein but by the blood of him that shed it, it was required for the following deduction as it was taught once is it deduced that if the murderer has been discovered after the heifer's neck had been broken he is not to be acquitted from the scriptural text and no expiation can be made for the land for the blood that is shed therein etc. Then what was the need for the text so shalt thou put away the innocent blood from the midst of the it is required for the following deduction is it was taught once is it deduced that execution by the sword must be at the neck it was explicitly stated in scripture so shalt thou put away the innocent blood from the midst of the all who shed blood are compared to the atoning heifer as its head is cut at the neck so is the execution of those who shed blood at the neck if so should not the comparison be carried further as there its head is cut with an axe and at the nape of the neck so here too are not answered in the name of Rabbah. Bia scripture said but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself choose for him an easy death what need was there for the scriptural text non devoted that may be devoted of men shall be ransomed it is required for the following as it was taught once is it deduced that when a person was being led to his execution and someone said I vow to give his value to the temple his vow is null and void from scripture wherein it is said non devoted that may be devoted of men shall be redeemed. As it might have been presumed that the same law applied even before his sentence had been pronounced, it was explicitly stated of men, but not all men, according to our Hanani of Biyahibiyah, however, who ruled that the age value of such a person may be vowed because its price is fixed. What deduction does he make from the text of non devoted? He requires it for the following deduction, as it was taught our Ishmael, the son of our Yohanan, Biberica said, whereas we find that those who incur the penalty of death at the hand of heaven may pay a monetary fine and thereby obtain atonement, for it is said in Scripture, if there be laid down on him a sum of money, it might have been assumed that the same law applied also to those who are sentenced to death at the hands of men. Hence, it was explicitly stated in the Scriptures, non devoted of men shall be redeemed, thus we know the law only concerning severe death penalties, since they are imposed for offenses which cannot be atoned for if committed. Unwittingly once however is it inferred that the same law applies also to lighter death penalty seeing that they are for offenses that may be atoned for if committed unwittingly it was explicitly stated in scripture non devoted but could not this be inferred independently from ye shall take no ransom which implies you shall take no money from him to exempt him from death what need was there for non devoted Rami Bihama replied it was required since it might have been assumed Talmud. Mosketha both that this applied only where murder had been committed in the course of an upward movement because no atonement is allowed when such an act was committed unwittingly but that where murder was committed in the course of a downward movement which is an offense that may be atoned for if committed unwittingly a monetary fine may be received from him and thereby he may be exempted from the death penalty hence we were taught that in no circumstances may the death penalty be. Commuted for a monetary fine said Robert to him does not this follow from what Atana of the school of Hezekiah taught for Atana of the school of Hezekiah taught he that smite the man was placed in juxtaposition with any that smite the beast to indicate that just as in the case of the killing of a beast no distinction is made whether the act was unwitting or presumptuous whether intentional or unintentional whether it was performed in the course of a downward movement or in the course of an upward movement in respect of exempting him from a monetary obligation but in respect of imposing a monetary obligation upon him so also in the case of the killing of a man no distinction is to be made whether the act was unwitting or presumptuous whether intentional or unintentional whether it was performed in the course of a downward movement or in the course of an upward movement in respect of imposing upon him a monetary obligation but in respect of exempting him from any Monetary obligation but said Rami Bihama one of the texts was required to obviate the following assumption it might have been presumed that this applied only where a man blinded another man's eye and thereby killed him but that where he blinded his eye and killed him by another act a monetary fine must be exacted from him said Robert to him is not this also deduced from the statement of another tana of the school of Hezekiah for a tana of the school of Hezekiah taught I for I implies but not an eye and a life for an eye this however is the explanation said Arashi one of the texts was required to obviate the following assumption it might have been presumed that since the law of a monetary fine is an anomaly which the Torah has introduced a man must pay it even though he also suffers the death penalty hence we were told that even a monetary fine may not be imposed in addition to a death penalty but according to Rabbi who said that it is an anomaly that the Torah has introduced by the enactment of the law of a monetary fine and that therefore an offender must pay his fine even though he is also to be killed. What application can be made of the text non devoted? He holds the view of the first Tana who is in dispute with our Hanani of Biyahibi Mishnah, a girl who was betrothed and then divorced is not entitled, said our Jose the Galilean, to receive a fine from her violator. Our Akiba said she is entitled to receive the fine and moreover the fine belongs to her. Tomorrow, what is our Jose the Galilean's reason? Scripture said that is not betrothed is entitled to a fine. One therefore who was betrothed is not entitled to a fine and our Akiba in the case of a girl that is not betrothed, the fine is given to her father, but if she was betrothed, the fine is given to herself. Now then the expression a damsel implies, but not one who is adolescent could it here also be maintained that the fine is given to herself. Likewise, the expression. Virgin implies but not one who is no longer a virgin would it here also be maintained that the fine is given to herself must it not consequently be admitted that the exclusion in the last mentioned case is complete and so here also it must be complete our Akiba can answer you the text of not betrothed is required for another purpose as it was taught that is not betrothed excludes a girl that was betrothed and then divorced who has no claim to a fine so our Jose the Galilean our Akiba. However rule she has a claim to a fine and her fine is given to her father this is arrived at by analogy since her father is entitled to have the
Expression of virgin be applied for the Gazirishawa since a non virgin may still be described as one that is not betrothed. It stands to reason that our Akiva's first view is to be preferred since the body of the one had undergone a change while that of the other had not. As to our Jose the Galilean, whence does he draw that logical inference? He derives it from the following where it was taught he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins implies that this payment shall be the same sum as the dowry of the virgins and the dowry of the virgins shall be the same as this does not a contradiction arise between the two statements of our Akiva. The respective statements represent the opinions of two Tanaim who differ as to what was the ruling of our Akiva. The ruling of our Akiva in our Mishnah presents no difficulty since the Gazirishawa does not altogether deprive the scriptural text of its ordinary meaning according to our Akiva's ruling in the Beritha, however, does not. The Gazirisha will completely deprive the scriptural text of its ordinary meaning. Our Naman B. Isaac replied, read in the text that is not a betrothed maiden, but is not a betrothed maiden, one for the violation of whom the penalty of stoning but not fine is incurred. It might have been assumed that since it is an anomaly that the Torah had introduced by the enactment of the law of a monetary fine, an offender must therefore pay his fine even if he is also to be executed according to Rabbah. However, who said that it was an anomaly that the Torah had introduced by the enactment of the law of a monetary fine and that an offender must pay his fine even if he is also to be executed? What can be said in reply to the objection raised? He adopts the same view as that of our Akiva in our mission. Our rabbis taught to whom is the monetary fine of an outraged virgin to be given to her father. Others say to herself, but why to herself? Our Hisdor replied, we are dealing here with the case of a Virgin who was once betrothed and is now divorced, and they differ on the principles underlying the difference between the view of our Akiva in our mission and his view in the Beretha Abbey stated if he had intercourse with her and she died, he is exempt from the fine for in scripture it was stated that the man shall give unto the damsel's father but not unto a dead woman's father. This ruling, which was so obvious to Abbey, formed the subject of an inquiry by Rabba for Rabba inquired is the state of adolescence legally attainable in the grave or not is the state of adolescence attainable in the grave and the fine therefore belongs to her son or is perhaps the age of adolescence not attainable in the grave and the fine therefore belongs to her father Talmud, Moscata both but is she however capable of normal conception did not RBB reside in the presence of our Naman. Three categories of women may use an absorbent in their marital intercourse, a minor and an expectant end. Nursing mother the minor because otherwise she might become pregnant and die an expectant mother because otherwise she might cause her foetus to degenerate into a sandalane nursing mother because otherwise she might have to wean her child prematurely and this would result in his death and what is the age of such a minor from the age of 11 years and one day to the age of 12 years and one day one who is under or over this age must carry on her marital intercourse in a normal manner so. Our mayor but the sages said the one as well as the other carries on her marital intercourse in a normal manner and mercy will be vouchsafed from heaven for it is said in the scriptures the Lord preserveth the simple and should you reply that this is a case where she conceived when she was NAR and gave birth to a child when she was still NAR it could be objected does one give birth to a child within six months after conception did not Samuel in fact state the period between the age. Of NAR and that of Bagruth is only six months, and should you suggest that he meant to say that there were no less but more than six months, surely it could be retorted. He used the expression only it must be this then that he asked is the state of adolescence attainable in the grave, and her father consequently forfeits his right, or is perhaps the state of adolescence not attainable in the grave, and the father therefore does not forfeit his right. Mar son of Arashi raised it. Question in the following matter does death affect adolescence or not? The question stands undecided. Rabba inquired of Abbe what is the legal position if he had intercourse and became betrothed. The other replied, Is it written in scripture then the man shall give unto the father of the damsel who was not a betrothed woman? Following, however, your line of reasoning, the first retorted one can argue in respect of what was taught if the offender had intercourse with her and she married it. Fine belongs to herself is it written in scripture then the man shall give unto the father of the damsel who was not a married woman what a comparison there the following analogy may well be made since the state of adolescence liberates a daughter from her father's authority and marriage also liberates a daughter from her father's authority the two may be compared to one another as in the case of adolescence if she attains adolescence after he had intercourse with her the fine belongs to the girl herself so also in the case of marriage if she married after he had intercourse with her the fine belongs to the girl herself but as to betrothal does it completely liberate a daughter from her father's authority surely we learned in the case of a betrothed girl her father and her husband jointly may invalidate her vows mission of the seducer pays three forms of compensation and the violator for the seducer pays compensation for indignity and blemish and the statutory Fine white the violator pays an additional form of compensation in that he pays for the pain what I ask the difference between the penalties of a seducer and those of a violator the violator pays compensation for the pain but the seducer does not pay compensation for the pain the violator pays forthwith but the seducer pays only if he dismisses her the violator must drink out of his pot but the seducer may dismiss the girl if he wishes what is meant by must drink out of his pot even if she is lame even if she is blind and even if she is afflicted with boils he may not dismiss her if however she was found to have committed an immoral act or was unfit to marry an Israelite he may not continue to live with her for it is said in scripture and unto him she shall be for a wife implying a wife that is fit unto him tomorrow for the pain of what the father of Samuel replied for the pain he has inflicted when he thrust her upon the ground are zero demurred now then if he had Thrust her upon silk stuffs would he for a similar reason be exempt and should you say that the law is so indeed was it not it may be retorted taught our Simeon be Judah stated in the name of our Simeon a violator does not pay compensation for the pain he has inflicted because Talmud, Moskatha both be the woman would ultimately have suffered the same pain from her husband but they said to him one who is forced to intercourse cannot be compared to one who acts willingly the reference in fact. Said Arnaman in the name of Rabbi Abba is to the pain of opening the feet for so it is said in scripture and has opened thy feet to everyone that passed by but if so the same applies to one who has been seduced Arnaman replied in the name of Rabbi Abba the case of one who has been seduced may be compared to that of a person who said to his friend tear up my silk garments and you will be free from liability my are they not her fathers this however said Arnaman in the name of Rabbi Biabo is the explanation the smart women among them declare that one who is seduced experiences no pain but do we not see that one does experience pain? Abbe replied nurse told me like hot water on a bald head Rabbi said Arhistah's daughter told me like the prick of the blood letting Lancet our papa said the daughter of Abba of Surah told me like hard crust in the jaws the violator pays forthwith but the seducer pays only if he dismisses her etc. When he dismisses her is she then his wife Abbe replied right if he does not marry her so it was also taught although it was laid down that the seducer pays the statutory fine only if he does not marry her he must pay compensation for indignity and blemish forthwith and in the case of the violator as well as of the seducer she herself or her father may oppose as regards one who has been seduced this may well be granted because it is written in scripture if her father will refuse since from refusing I would only have known. That her father may refuse whence could it be deduced that she herself may also refuse it was therefore explicitly stated will refuse implying either of them but as regards a violator though one may well grant that she may refuse him since it is written in scripture and unto him she shall be which implies only if she is so minded whence however it may be objected is it deduced that her father may also object to the marriage of a replied her father was given the right to object. In order that the sinner might not gain an advantage robber replied it is deduced a minority ad majus if a seducer who has acted against the wish of her father alone may be rejected either by herself or by her father how much more so the violator who has acted both against the wish of her father and against the wish of herself robber did not give the same reply as Abbe because having paid the fine the offender can no longer be described as a sinner gaining an advantage Abbe does not give it. Same reply is Rabba because it may be argued in the case of a seducer since he himself may object to the marriage her father also may object to it but in the case of a violator since he himself may not object to the marriage her father also may have no right to object to it another very the top although it has been laid down that the violator pays forth which she has no claim upon him when he divorces her when he
Why should not the positive commandment supersede the negative one? And he replied to me, Where do we say that a positive commandment supersedes a negative one only in a case, for instance, like circumcision in leprosy, since otherwise it would be impossible to fulfill the positive commandment? But here, if she should say that she did not want the man for a husband, would the question of the performance of the positive commandment ever have arisen? Misha, if an orphan was betrothed and then divorced, any man who violates her said, Our Eliezer is liable to pay the statutory fine, but the man who seduces her is exempt. Amar Rabbi Barhanna stated in the name of our Yohan, and our Eliezer made his statement on the lines of the view of his master, our Akiva, who ruled she is entitled to receive the fine, and moreover, the fine belongs to her. How is this inferred as it was stated? If an orphan, any man who violates her said, Our Eliezer is liable to pay the statutory fine, but the man who seduces her is. Exempt the difficulty arises is not the case of an orphan self-evident consequently it must be this that we were taught a girl who was betrothed and then divorced has the same status as an orphan as the fine of an orphan belongs to the orphan herself so does that of a girl who was betrothed and then divorced belong to the girl herself our Zara said in the name of Rabbi Bishila who said it in the name of Arham the elder who had it from our Rabbi Ahabah who had it from Rabbi the in agreement with the ruling of our Eliezer Rab in fact designated our Eliezer as the happiest of the wise men Mishnah what is the compensation that is paid for indignity all depends on the status of the offender and the offended as to blemish she is regarded as if she were a bondwoman to be sold in the marketplace and it is estimated how much she was worth and how much she is worth now the statutory fine is the same for all and any sum that is fixed pentateuch Allah remains the same for al Gamara might it not be suggested that the Almerciful intended the fifty cellar to cover all the forms of compensation our Zara replied if that were so it would be said should one who had intercourse with the princess pay fifty and one who had intercourse with the daughter of a commoner also pay only fifty set of a to him if so the same might be argued in respect of a slave should compensation for a slave who perforates pearls be thirty and that for one who does Talmud, mosque hath a both be. Needlework also be thirty this however said our Zara is the proper explanation if two men had intercourse with her one in a natural and the other in an unnatural manner it would be argued should one who had intercourse with a sound woman pay fifty and one who had intercourse with a degraded woman also pay fifty set of a to him if so the same might be argued in respect of a slave should compensation for a healthy slave be thirty and that for one afflicted with boils also be thirty this. However, said Abbe is the explanation scripture said because he hath humbled her as if to say these must be paid because he hath humbled her thus it may be inferred that compensation for indignity and blemish must also be paid Robert replied scripture said and the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver for the gratification of lying he gives fifty thus it may be inferred that compensation for indignity and blemish must also be paid but say perhaps that compensation for indignity and blemish is paid to her scripture said being in her youth in her father's house implying that all advantages of her youth belong to her father consider however that which are who not said in the name of Rab once is it deduced that a daughter's handiwork belongs to her father from scripture where it is said and if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant as the handiwork of a maidservant belongs to her master so does the handiwork of a Daughter belong to her father now what need is there it may be asked for this text when the law can be deduced from the text of being in her youth in her father's house consequently it must be admitted must it not that the text was written in connection only with the annulment of vows and should you suggest that we might infer from it it could be retorted that monetary matters cannot be inferred from ritual matters and should you suggest that we might infer it from the law of fines it could be retorted could it not that monetary payments cannot be inferred from fines this however is the explanation it stands to reason that her compensation should belong to her father for if he wished he could have handed her over to an ugly man or to one afflicted with boils as to blemish she is regarded as if she were a bond woman to be sold how is she assessed the father of Samuel replied it is estimated how much more a man would pay for a virgin slave than for a non-virgin slave to attend upon him a non-virgin slave to attend upon him what difference does this make to him the meaning however is this how much more a man would pay for a virgin slave than for a non-virgin slave for the purpose of marrying her to his bondman but even if to his bondman what difference does this make to him we are dealing here with a bondman who gives his master satisfaction mission wherever the right of sale applies no fine is incurred and wherever a fine is incurred no right of sale applies in the case of a minor the right of sale applies but no fine is incurred in the case of a damsel a fine is incurred but no right of sale applies to a damsel who is adolescent the right of sale does not apply nor is a fine incurred through her Gemara Rab Judah stated in the name of Rab this is the ruling of our mayor but the sages rule a fine is incurred even where the right of sale applies for it was taught the right of sale applies to a minor from the age of one day until the time when she grows two hairs but no fine is incurred through her from the time she grows two hairs until she comes of age a fine is incurred through her but no right of sales applies so our mayor because our mayor has laid down wherever the right of sale applies no fine is incurred and wherever a fine is incurred no right of sale applies the sages however rule through a minor from the age of three years and one day until the time she becomes adolescent a fine is incurred only a fine you say but not the right of sale right a fine also where the right of sale applies our hista said what is our mayor's reason scripture said and unto him she shall be for a wife the text thus speaks of a girl who may herself contract a marriage and the rabbis rush lakish replied scripture said naar which implies even a minor our papa the son of our hand of Bikalah, heard this and proceeded to report it before our shimai b ashi when the latter said to him you apply it to that law we apply it to the following rush Lakish ruled the man who has brought an evil name upon a minor is exempt for it is said in scripture and give them unto the father of the damsel scripture express the term nar as plenamar at abiyah but demur is the reason then because the all merciful has written nar but otherwise it would have been said that even a minor was included surely it may be objected it is written in scripture but if this thing be true and the tokens of virginity be not found in the damsel then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house and the men of her city shall stone her while a minor is not is she subject to punishment the explanation however is that since nar has been written here it may be inferred that here only is a minor excluded but wherever scripture uses the expression of nar even a minor is included talmud mosque of the mission he who declares i have seduced the daughter of so and so must pay compensation for indignity and blemish on his own evidence but need not pay the statutory fine he who declares I have stolen must make restitution for the principal on his own evidence but need not repay double fourfold or fivefold he who states my ox has killed so and so or the ox of so and so must make restitution on his own evidence if he however said my ox has killed the bondman of so and so he need not make restitution on his own evidence this is the general rule whoever pays more than the actual cost of the damage he has done need not pay it on his own evidence Gamara why did not he include I have violated he implied that this was unnecessary it was unnecessary to state that if a man declared I have violated in which case he cast no reflection on the girl's character that he must pay compensation for indignity and blemish on his own evidence but if a man declared I have seduced in which case he does cast a reflection on her character it might have been assumed that he does not pay such compensation on his own evidence hence he informs us that he does our mission does not agree with the following tenet for it was taught our Simeon be Judah stated in the name of our Simeon compensation for indignity and blemish also a man does not pay on his own evidence because he cannot be trusted to tarnish the character of another man's daughter said our Papa to Abbe what is the ruling if she is satisfied it is possible that her father might not be satisfied and what if her father also is satisfied it is possible that the members of her family might not be satisfied what if the members of her family are also satisfied it is impossible that there should not be one somewhere who is not satisfied he who declares I have stolen must make restitution for the principal etc it was stated in respect of liability for half damages our Papa ruled it is a civil obligation but Arhuna the son of our Joshua ruled it is penal our Papa ruled it is a civil obligation for he is of the opinion that cattle as a rule cannot be presumed to be safe justice therefore demands that the owner should make full restitution but the all-merciful has shown mercy towards him because his cattle have not yet become you at Arhuna the son of our Joshua ruled it is penal for he is of the opinion that
not to a muad since in the latter case the owner has been duly warned and if only the statement relating to a muad had been made it might have been assumed to apply to that case alone because the owner pays full compensation but not to that of a tam both rulings were consequently required come and hear what is the difference in the case of compensation for damages between a tam and a muad in the case of a tam half damages are paid out of its own body while in the case of a muad full compensation is paid out of the best of the defendant's estate now if it were the case that liability for half damages penal why was it not also stated that in the case of a tam no compensation is paid merely on one's own evidence whereas in the case of a muad compensation is paid even on one's own evidence he recorded some distinctions and omitted others what else however did he omit that should justify the assumption that he omitted this distinction also he omitted also the payment of half kofarit. The only point not mentioned is that of half kofarit is no omission Talmud. Mosk hath both be since that Mishnah may represent the view of our Jose the Galilean who ruled that in the case of a tam half kofarit is paid. Come and hear a man who said my ox killed so and so or the ox of so and so must pay compensation on his own evidence. Now does not this statement deal with the tam? No, with a muad. What however would be the law in the case of a tam would no liability be established by one's own evidence? Then instead of stating in the final clause the bondman of so and so he need not make restitution on his own evidence. Could not a distinction have been drawn in the very same case? Thus this applies only to a muad. But in respect of a tam, no liability is incurred by one's own evidence. The entire Mishnah prefers to deal with a muad. Come and hear this is the general rule: whosoever pays more than the actual cost of the damage he has done need. Not pay on his own evidence from which it follows does it not that if the payment is less than the cost of the damage one must pay compensation even on one's own evidence do not infer but if payment is less than the cost of the damage one must pay on one's own evidence but infer if payment corresponds to the actual amount of the damage one must pay compensation even on one's own evidence what however would be the law if payment were less than the amount of the damage would no liability be established by one's own evidence then why was it not stated this is the general rule whoever does not pay an amount corresponding to the actual cost of the damage he has done pays no compensation on his own evidence which would imply that where compensation is less or more it is to be paid on one's own evidence this is indeed a refutation the law however is that the liability for half damage is penal a refutation of a ruling and yet it is a law yes for the sole basis of the refutation was that the statement did not run whoever does not pay an amount corresponding to the actual cost of the damage he has done but such a principle was not regarded by him as exactly accurate since there is a liability for half damages in the case of the damage done by pebbles concerning which there is in halachic tradition that the liability is civil on account of this consideration he did not adopt the form of the expression suggested now that you have laid down that liability for half damage is penal the case of a dog that devoured lambs or that of a cat that devoured big hens is one of unusual occurrence and no distress is executed in babylon if however they were small the occurrence is a usual one and distress is executed should the plaintiff however seize the chattels of the defendant they are not to be taken away from him furthermore if he pleads fix for me a date by which the defendant must come with me to the land of israel such date must be Fixed for him, and if the defendant does not go with him, he must be placed under the ban. In any case, however, the defendant is to be placed under the ban, for he is told to bid your nuisance in accordance with the dictum of our Nathan. For it was taught our Nathan said, Whence is it derived that a man may not breed a bad dog in his house, nor place a shaking ladder in his house from scripture, where it is said that thou bring not blood upon thine house? C H A P T E R I V Mishnah. If a girl was seduced, the compensation for her indignity and blemish, as well as the statutory fine, belong to her father, to whom belongs also the compensation for pain. In the case of one who was violated, if the girl's action was tried before her father died, all the forms of compensation are due to her father. If her father subsequently died, they are due to her brothers. If her father, however, died before her action was tried, they are due to her. If her action was tried before she became adolescent, all forms of Compensation are due to her father if her father subsequently died they are due to her brothers if however she became adolescent before her action could be tried they are due to her Arsimian ruled if her father died before she could collect the dues they belong to her Talmud, Moscow both her handiwork however and anything she finds even if she had not collected the proceeds belong to her brothers if her father died tomorrow what new law does he teach us have we not already? Learn the seducer pays three forms of compensation and the violator for the seducer pays compensation for indignity and blemish as well as the statutory fine and the violator pays an additional form of compensation in that he pays for the pain it was necessary to teach us that the compensation is due to her father but that the compensation is due to her father is also obvious since the seducer has to pay for it for if it were to be given to herself the objection could be raised. Why should the seducer pay to her when he acted with her consent? It was necessary to tell us of the case where her action was tried, which is a point in dispute between our Simeon and the rabbis. We have learned elsewhere if a man said to another, You have violated or seduced my daughter, and the other replied, I did not violate or seduce her, I adjure you, said the first, and the other responded, Amen, but afterwards admitted his guilt, he is liable. Our Simeon, however, exempts him for no fine is paid on one's own admission. They, however, said to him, Though no man pays a fine on his own admission, he nevertheless pays compensation for indignity and blemish on his own admission. Abbe inquired of Rabbi, What is the law according to our Simeon, where a man said to another, You have violated or seduced my daughter, and I have brought you to law, and you were ordered to pay me a stipulated son of money, and the other replied, I have neither violated nor seduced her, nor have you brought me to law, nor have I been ordered to pay you any money? And after he had taken an oath, he admitted his guilt is his liability since his action had been tried civil, and he consequently incurs thereby a sacrifice for having taken a false oath. Or is it possible that though his action had been tried, his liability is still regarded as penal? The other replied, It is a civil liability, and he incurs thereby the obligation to bring a sacrifice for a false oath. He pointed out to him the following objection: Our Simeon said, As it might have been presumed that if a man said to another, You have violated or seduced my daughter, and the other replied, I have neither violated nor seduced her. Or if the first said, Your ox has killed my bondman, and the other replied, He did not kill him. Or if a bondman said to his master, You have knocked out my tooth, or you have blinded my eye, and he replied, I have not knocked it out, or I have not blinded it, and the defendant took the oath, but afterwards admitted his liability. It might have been presumed that he is liable hence it was explicitly stated in scripture and he deal falsely with his neighbor a matter of deposit or a pledge or of robbery or have oppressed his neighbor or have found that which was lost and deal falsely therein and swear to a lie as these are distinguished by the characteristics of being civil cases so must all other cases where similar liabilities may be incurred be distinguished by the characteristics of being civil these therefore are excluded from liability since they are penal talmud moskatha both be does not this ruling refer to a man whose action had already been tried no it deals with one whose action had not yet been tried but surely since the first clause deals with the case of a man whose action had been tried would not the final clause also deal with such a case for in the first clause it was stated i only knew that liability is incurred in cases where compensation is paid for the actual value only whence However, is it deduced that such liability is also incurred in cases where the payment is double fourfold or fivefold and in those of the violator, the seducer and the calumniator from scripture which explicitly stated and committed trespass implying that all such are included now how is the statement to be understood if it is one referring to a man whose action had not yet been tried the objection could be raised as double compensation payable in such circumstances it is obvious. Therefore that the reference is to one whose action had already been tried and since the first clause deals with one whose action had been tried the final clause also must deal must it not with one whose action had already been tried the other replied I could have answered you that the first clause deals with one whose action had already been tried and the final clause with one whose action had not yet been tried and that the entire barrier represents the view of our simian, but I would not. Give you forced interpretations for were I to do so you might retort then either the first clause should begin with Arsimian said or the final clause should conclude with these are the words of Arsimian the fact however is that the entire varith refers to one whose action had already been tried the first clause being the view of the rabbis and the final clause that of Arsimian and I must agree with you in regard to the sacrifice for taking a false oath for the
Father to write a possession before the money had actually been handed to him when Rabbah however said it is a civil liability in respect of being transmitted as an inheritance to his sons he was referring to other penal liabilities but then in the case of abundant it is written in scripture he shall give into their master thirty shekels of silver would it here also be maintained that the Torah has not conferred upon the master the right of possession before the money had actually been handed to him the Yidin cannot be compared with Nathan if so instead of deducing the exemption from sacrifice from the scriptural text and he deal falsely should not the deduction rather be made from and shall give Rabbah replied the text of and he deal falsely was required in a case for instance where the girl's action had been tried and then she became adolescent and died in which case when the father receives the fine he inherits it from her if so however how could it be said? These therefore are excluded from liability since they are in fact penal when they are in fact civil are nomin b. Isaac replied the meaning is these are excluded since they were originally penal he pointed out to him another objection are Simeon however exempts him for no fine is paid on one's own admission the reason then is because his action had not been tried but if it had been tried in which case he does pay even on his own admission he would incur also would he not the obligation of bringing a sacrifice for swearing a false oath are Simeon argues with the rabbis on the lines of their own view according to my own view he argued the all-merciful has exempted the man even after he had been tried as may be deduced from the text and deal falsely according to your view however you must at least admit that the man is exempt if he has not yet been tried since the claim advanced against him is penal Talmud, Moskatha both a and one who makes a voluntary admission in a penal. Case is exempt, but the rabbis are of the opinion that the claim is mainly in respect of compensation for indignity and blemish. On what principle do they differ? Our papa replied, Our Simeon is of the opinion that a man would not leave that which is fixed to claim that which is not fixed, while the rabbis hold the view that no man would leave a claim from which the defendant could not be exempt, even if he made a voluntary admission and advance a claim from which he would be exempt if he made a voluntary admission. Our Evan inquired of Arshis, hate to whom belongs the handiwork of a daughter who is maintained by her brothers. Are they in loco parentis? And as in that case, her handiwork belongs to her father, so here also it belongs to her brothers. Or is it more reasonable that they should not be compared to their father? For in his case, she is maintained out of his own estate, but here she is not maintained out of their estate. He replied, You have learned about such a case, a widow is to be. Maintained out of the estate of her deceased husband's orphans and her handiwork belongs to them, but are the two cases in every way alike? It may not be any satisfaction to a man that his widow should be liberally provided for, but he might well be pleased, might he not that his daughter should does this imply that a man has preference for his daughter than for his widow? Surely our Abba said in the name of our Jose, the relationship between a widow and her daughter in the case of a small estate has been put on the same level as that of the relationship between a daughter and her brothers, as in the case of the relationship between a daughter and her brothers, the daughter is maintained while the brothers can go begging at people's doors. So also in the case of the relationship between a widow and her daughter, the widow is maintained and the daughter can go begging at people's doors, which shoes does it not that the widow is given preference as regards provision against? Degradation a man gives preference to his widow as regards liberal provision he gives preference to his daughter our Joseph objected her handiwork however and anything she finds even if she has not collected the proceeds belong to her brothers if her father died the reason then is that they originated during the lifetime of their father but if they originated after his death they would belong to herself does not this refer to a daughter who is maintained no this is a case of one who is not maintained if she is not maintained what need is there to state such a case for even according to him who ruled that a master is entitled to say to his bondman work for me and I will not maintain you the ruling applies only to a Canaanite bondman concerning whom with thee was not written in scripture but not to a Hebrew slave concerning whom with thee was written in scripture how much less then would such a ruling apply to one's daughter Rabbi Beola replied it was only required in the case of a surplus and Rabbah did not such a great man as our Joseph know that sometimes there may be a surplus when he raised his objection the fact however is Rabbah explained that our Joseph raised his objection from our very mission for it was stated her handiwork however and anything she finds even if she has not collected the proceeds but from whom it may be asked is she to collect anything she finds consequently it must be conceded that it is this that was meant her handiwork is like anything she finds as anything she finds belongs to her father if she finds it during his lifetime and to herself if she finds it after his death so also in the case of her handiwork if it was done during the lifetime of her father it belongs to her father but if it was done after his death it belongs to herself thus it may be concluded that the ruling of our she's hate stands refuted so it was also stated Rab Judah ruled in the name of Rab the handiwork of a daughter who was maintained by her brothers belongs to herself said Arkahana what is the reason because it is written in scripture and you make them an inheritance for your children after you implying them you may make an inheritance for your children but not your daughters for your children this tells us that a man may not transmit his authority over his daughter to his son to this rabbi demurred it might be suggested that the scriptural text speaks of payments in connection with the seduction of one's daughter fines and mayhem and so did our Hannah to learn the scriptural text speaks of payments in connection with the seduction of one's daughter fines and mayhem is not mayhem injury involving bodily pain our Jose B. Hannah replied Talmud Moskatha both be the wound may be supposed to have been made in her face Rab Zara stated in the name of our Matina who had it from Rab others assert that it was Rab Zara who stated in the name of our Matina who had it from Rab the handiwork of a daughter who was maintained by her brothers belongs to herself for it is written in scripture and you make them an inheritance for your children after you implying them you may make an inheritance for your children but not your daughters for your children this tells us that a man may not transmit his authority over his daughter to his son said Abimi be poppy to him Shakud made the statement who is Shakud Samuel but surely was it not Rab who made the statement Red Shakud also made the statement Mar the son of Amimar said to Arashi thus the Nihardians have laid down the law is in agreement with the ruling of Arshi's hate Arashi however said the law is in agreement with Rab and the law is to be decided in agreement with the view of Rab Mishnah if a man gave his daughter in betrothal and she was divorced and then he gave her again in betrothal and she was left a widow her Kethuba belongs to him if he gave her in marriage and she was divorced and then he gave her again in marriage and she was left a Widow her Kethuba belongs to her. Our Judah said the first belongs to her father. They however said to him her father as soon as he gives her in marriage loses all control over her. Gemara the reason is that when he gave her in marriage the first time she was divorced and that when he gave her again in marriage she was left a widow for the first time. But if she had been left a widow twice she would not have been fit to marry again. The Tana has thus indirectly laid down an anonymous ruling. In agreement with Rabbi who holds that if a thing has happened twice presumption is established. Our Judah said the first belongs to her father. What is our Judah's reason? Both Rabbi and our Joseph explained since her father has acquired the right to it at the time of the betrothal. Rabbi objected. Our Judah ruled that the first belonged to her father. Our Judah nevertheless admitted that if a father gave his daughter in betrothal while she was still a minor and she married after she had attained. Adolescence he has no authority over her but why might it not here also be argued since her father has acquired the right to it at the time of the betrothal the fact however is that if any statement in the nature mentioned has at all been made it must have been made in the following terms both Rabbi and our Joseph explained because it was written while she was still under his authority as to the recovery of a cathedral from which date made a strain be affected Arhuna replied the hundred or the two hundred from the date of the betrothal and the additional jointure from that of the marriage RC however replied the former as well as the latter may be dis tyrained upon only from the date of the marriage but could Arhuna however have given such a ruling has it not been stated if a wife produced against her husband two cathedral both one for two hundred and one for three hundred zoos she may set Arhuna dis tyrained from the earlier date if she wishes to collect the two hundred zoos but if she desires to collect the 300 zoos she may dis tyrain from the later date only now if the ruling were as stated she should be entitled should she not to dis tyrain to the extent of 200 zoos from the earlier date and to that of 100 from the later date but even according to your conception it might equally be objected why should she not dis tyrain for all the 500 zoos 200 from the earlier date and 300 from the later
Former no for has it not been stated in connection with the statement that our Papa said Arnaman nevertheless admits that if the man has added one palm the insertion was intended as an additional privilege and here also surely the husband has added something to turn to the original text Arnaman laid down that if two deeds were issued one after the other the latter cancels the former said our Papa Arnaman nevertheless admits that if the man has added one palm the insertion was intended as an additional privilege it is obvious that the reason why both deeds are valid where the first was a deed of sale and the second a deed of gift is because the action of the owner was intended to improve the other's rights as a safeguard against the law of preemption and much more is this obvious where the first was for a gift and the second for a sale for it may then be presumed that the latter was written in that manner in order to safeguard the other against the creditor's rights. What however is the reason why the second cancels the first where both deeds were for a sale or both for a gift Rafram replied because it may be presumed that the holder of the deeds has admitted to the other the invalidity of the first deed Araha replied because it might be presumed that the holder of the deeds has surrendered his security of tenure what is the practical issue between them the disqualification of the witnesses payment of compensation for unsuffrucked and land tax what is the decision in respect of the Kethu become and here what Rab Judah laid down in the name of Samuel who had it from our Eliezer the son of our Simeon the statutory Kethu of Amena or two hundred zoos may be dist reigned for from the date of the betrothal but the additional jointer only from the date of the marriage the sages however rule the one as well as the other may be dist reigned for only from the date of the marriage the law is that the one as well as the other may be Dist reigned only from the date of the marriage mission of the daughter of a proselyte woman who became a proselyte together with her mother and then played the harlot is subject to the penalty of strangulation but not to stoning at the door of her father's house nor does her husband pay the hundred cell if she was conceived in unholiness but her birth was in holiness she is subject to the penalty of stoning but not he that of bringing her out to the door of her father's house nor does her husband pay the hundred cell if she was both conceived and born in holiness she is regarded as a daughter of Israel in all respects one who had a father but no door of her father's house or a door of her father's house but no father is nevertheless subject to the penalty of stoning for the regulation to the door of her father's house was only intended as an independent precept Talmud Mosque both be tomorrow whence is this deduced Rush Lakish replied since scripture said that she died Included also her who was conceived in unholiness but her birth was in holiness if so should not her wrongful accuser also be flogged and condemned to pay the hundred cell scripture stated that she die implying that she was included in respect of death but not in respect of the fine might it not be suggested that scripture intended to include one who was both conceived and born in holiness such a person is a proper Israelite woman but can it not be said that scripture intended to include one conceived and born in unholiness if this were so what purpose would be served by the expression in Israel our Jose B had in a rule the man who brought an evil name upon an orphan girl is exempt for it is said in scripture and give them unto the father of the damsel which excludes this girl who has no father our Jose B Abin, or it might be said our Jose B Z, but raised an objection if her father utterly refused was meant to include an orphan girl in respect of the fine so our Jose the Galilean. Why then should the orphan in this case be excluded? He raised the objection and he himself supplied the answer. This is a case of a girl who became an orphan after the man had intercourse with her rubber rule. He is guilty once did he infer this from that which am I taught a virgin of Israel but not a proselyte virgin. Now if you assume that in a case of this nature in Israel guilt is incurred one can well see why it was necessary for a scriptural text to exclude proselytes of you. However assume that in a case of this nature in Israel the offender is exempt. The difficulty would arise now that we know that the offender is exempt even if he sinned against Israelites was it any longer necessary to mention exemption if the offense was against proselytes rush Lakish rule the man who has brought an evil name upon a minor is exempt for it is said in scripture and give them unto the father of the damsel scripture express the term nar as plenum to this arahavi Abba. Demert is the reason then because in this case the NAR was written in scripture but otherwise it would have been said that even a minor was included surely it may be objected it is written in scripture but if the things be true and the tokens of virginity be not found in the damsel then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house and the men of the city shall stone her while a minor is not is she subject to punishment the explanation however is that since NAR has been written here it may be inferred that only where NAR is used is a minor excluded but wherever scripture uses the expression NAR even a minor is included Sheila taught there are three modes of execution in the case of a betrothed damsel who played the harlot if witnesses appeared against her in the house of her father-in-law testifying that she had played the harlot in her father's house Talmud, Mosque Ketha, both she is stoned at the door of her father's house. As if to say see the plant that you have reared if witnesses came to testify against her in her father's house that she played the harlot in his house she is stoned at the entrance of the gate of the city of having committed the offense she eventually attained adolescence she is condemned to strangulation this then implies that wherever there occurred a change in one's person one's mode of execution also must be changed but is not this contradicted by the following of a betrothed damsel. Played the harlot and her husband brought upon her an evil name after she had attained adolescence he is neither to be flogged nor is he to pay the hundred cell but she and the witnesses who testified falsely against her are hurried to the place of stoning she and the witnesses who testified falsely against her can this be imagined but this is the meaning she or her witnesses are hurried to the place of stoning Robert replied you speak of the law relating to a husband who brought up an Evil name but this law is different from the others because it is an anomaly for elsewhere if a girl entered the bridal chamber though no intercourse followed she is condemned to strangulation if she committed adultery but a woman upon whom a husband brought an evil name is condemned to stoning said Arhuna the son of our Joshua to Rabbah is it not possible that the Almerciful created the anomaly only where no constitutional change had taken place but where a constitutional change had occurred. The Almerciful has created no anomaly the fact however is explained Arnaman B. Isaac that the question whether a change in status involves or does not involve a change in the penalty is a point in dispute between Tanaim for we have learned if they committed a sin before they were appointed to their respective offices and then were appointed they are regarded as Laman our Simeon ruled if their sin came to their knowledge before they were appointed they are liable but if after they were appointed there exempt Talmud, Mosque Ketha both be but is it not to be maintained that our Simeon was heard to be guided by the time of the awareness also did you however hear that he was guided by the time of awareness alone and not also by that of the commission of sin for were that so should they not have brought an offering in accordance with their present status the high priest the bullock and the ruler he go surely are you had and said to the Tanner she is to be condemned to stoning but why did not the all-merciful speak of a betrothed damsel and this one is adolescent Arlay replied scripture said the damsel implying her who was a damsel before said our Hanania to Arlay if so should not the husband also be flogged and pay the hundred cell may the all-merciful the other replied save us from such an opinion on the contrary the first retorted may the all-merciful save us from such an opinion as yours what however is the reason our Isaac B. Abin, or as some say are Isaac B. Abba replied in her case it was her behavior that brought about her punishment but in his case it was his the inclination of his lips that brought about his penalties in her case it was her behavior that brought about her punishment and when she played the harlot she was still in error but in his case it was the inclination of his lips that brought about his penalty and when does he incur his guilt obviously at that time and at that time she was already adolescent or rabbis. Taught a betrothed damsel who played the harlot is to be stoned at the door of her father's house if she had no door of her father's house she is stoned at the entrance of the gate of that city but in a town which is mostly inhabited by idolaters she is stoned at the door of the court similarly you may say a man who worships idols is to be stoned at the gate of the city where he worshipped and in a city the majority of whose inhabitants are idolaters he is stoned at the door of the court. Whence are these rulings derived from what our rabbis have taught by the expression thy gates was meant the gate of the city wherein the man has worshipped you say the gate of the city wherein the man has worshipped might it not mean the gate where he is tried since the expression thy gates is used below and also above an analogy is to be made as thy gates mentioned above refers to the gate of the city wherein he worshipped so does thy gates that was mentioned below refer to the gate of the city wherein the man had worshipped another inter
This that each of the former group meant a husband who brought an evil name upon his wife is flogged and he must also pay a hundred sela whether he had intercourse or did not have intercourse with her this being in agreement with the rabbis Arjuna ruled as to flogging a husband is flogged in all circumstances as to the hundred sela however where he had intercourse with her he pays them but if he did not have intercourse with her he does not pay in agreement with our Eliezer B. Jacob. Another reading all the statement is in agreement with the opinion of our Eliezer B. Jacob and it is this that each of the former group meant a husband who brought an evil name upon his wife is flogged and he must also pay the hundred sela only where he had intercourse with her Arjuna ruled as to flogging a husband is flogged in all circumstances can Arjuna however maintain that as to flogging a husband is flogged in all circumstances when it was taught Arjuna ruled if he had Intercourse he is flogged but if he did not have intercourse he is not flogged. Arnaman B. Isaac replied by the ruling of Arjuna that the husband is flogged was meant chastisement which is a rabbinical penalty Talmud. Mosketha both A.R. Papa replied by the expression if he had intercourse he is flogged which was used there the monetary fine was meant but could one describe a monetary fine as flogging yes and so indeed we have learned if a man said I vow to pay half of my valuation he must pay half of his valuation Our Jose the son of Arjuna ruled he is flogged and must pay his full valuation and in reply to the question why should he be flogged our Papa explained he is flogged by having to pay his full valuation what is the reason the ruling in the case of a vow for a half of one's valuation is a preventive measure against the possibility of a vow for the value of half of one's body such a half being an organic part on which one's life depends our rabbis taught and they shall find him refers to a monetary fine and chastise him refers to flogging one can readily understand why and they shall find refers to a monetary payment since it is written and they shall find him a hundred shekels of silver and give them unto the father of the damsel whence however is it deduced that and chastise him refers to flogging Araban replied we deduce shall chastise from shall chastise and shall chastise from son and son from son occurring in the scriptural text and it shall be if the wicked man deserve to be beaten whence is the warning against bringing up an evil name upon one's wife deduced our Eliezer replied from thou shalt not go up and don as a tail bearer our Nathan replied from and thou shalt keep thee from every evil thing what is the reason that our Eliezer does not make his deduction from the latter text the text he requires for the same deduction as that made by our Phinehas Bijahir from the text and thou shalt keep thee from every evil thing are Phinehas B. Jahir deduced that a man should not indulge in morbid thoughts by day that might lead him to uncleanness by night. What then is the reason why our Nathan does not make his deduction from the former text? The text is a warning to the court that it must not be lenient with one of the litigants and harsh to the other. If a husband did not tell the witnesses come and give evidence for me and they volunteered to give it, he is not to be flogged nor is he to pay the hundred selishi. However, and the witnesses who testify falsely against her are hurried to the place of stoning. She and the witnesses who testify against her can this be imagined, but this is a meaning she or her witnesses are hurried to the place of stoning. Now the reason then is because he did not even tell them to give their evidence. Had he however told them he would have been subject to the prescribed penalties even though he did not hire them. This ruling thus serves the purpose of excluding. The view of Arjuna concerning whom it was taught Arjuna ruled the husband incurs no penalties unless he has hired the witnesses what is Arjuna's reason Araban replied an analogy is drawn between the two forms of the root to lay here it is written and lay wanton charges against her and elsewhere it is written neither shall ye lay upon him interest as there the offense is committed through the giving of money so here also it can be committed only by the giving of money Arnaman B. Isaac said and so did our Joseph the Zadnian recite at the school of Arsimian B. an analogy is drawn between the two forms of the root to lay our Jeremiah raised the question what is the ruling where the husband hired them with a piece of land what if he hired them for a sum less than a parata what if both witnesses were hired for one parata or as she inquired what is the ruling where a husband brought an evil name upon his wife in respect of their first marriage what if a lover brought of an evil name in respect of his brother's marriage you may at all events solve one of these questions for Arjuna taught I gave my daughter unto this man only unto this man but not to a lover what is the ruling of the rabbis and what is that of our Eliezer B. Jacob it was taught what constitutes the bringing up of an evil name against one's wife if a husband came to the Beth Din and said I so and so found not in thy daughter the tokens of virginity if there are witnesses that she committed adultery while living with him she is entitled to a kathuga for Amena if there are witnesses that she committed adultery while living with him you say she is entitled to a kathuga for Amena but is she not in that case subject to the penalty of stoning it is this that was meant if there are witnesses that she committed adultery while she was living with him she is to be stoned if however she committed adultery before her marriage she is entitled to a kathuga for Amena if it was ascertained that the evil name had no foundation in fact the husband is flogged and he must also pay a hundred sela irrespective of whether he had intercourse with her or whether he did not have intercourse with her or Eliezer B. Jacob said these penalties apply only where he had intercourse with her according to our Eliezer B. Jacob one can well understand why scripture used the expressions and go in unto her and when I came nigh to her but according to the rabbis what could be the meaning of and go in unto her and when I came nigh unto her and go in unto her with wanton charges and when I come nigh to her with words according to our Eliezer B. Jacob one can well see why scripture used the expression I found not in thy daughter the tokens of virginity but according to the rabbis what could be the sense of the expression I found not in thy daughter the tokens of virginity I found not far thy daughter witnesses to establish her claim to tokens of virginity it was quite Correct for scripture according to our Eliezer B. Jacob to state and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity but according to the rabbis what could be the sense of the expression and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity and yet these are the witnesses who establish the tokens of my daughter's virginity one can well understand according to our Eliezer B. Jacob why scripture wrote and they shall spread the garment but according to the rabbis what could be the sense of it. Instruction and they shall spread the garment Araban replied they explain the charge which he submitted against her as it was taught and they shall spread the garment teaches that the witnesses of the one party and those of the other party come and the matter is made as clear as a new garment our Eliezer B. Jacob said the words are to be taken in their literal sense they must produce the actual garment our Isaac son of our Jacob B. G. Uri sent this message in the name of our Yohanan although we do not find anywhere in the Torah that scripture draws a distinction between natural and unnatural intercourse in respect of flogging or other punishments. Such a distinction was made in the case of a man who brought an evil name upon his wife, for he is not held guilty unless having had intercourse with her. Even in an unnatural manner, he brought up an evil name upon her in respect of a natural intercourse in accordance with whose view of it be said to be in accordance with the view of it. Rabbis, the husband, it could be retorted, should have been held guilty even if he had no intercourse with her, if it be said to be in agreement with the view of our Eliezer B. Jacob Talmud. Mosketha both be must not the intercourse in both cases be in a natural manner. The fact, however, is said Arkahana in the name of our Yohanan that the husband is not held guilty unless he had intercourse in a natural manner and he brought up an evil name upon her in respect of a natural intercourse mission. Father has authority over his daughter in respect of her betrothal whether it was affected by money deed or intercourse he is entitled to anything she finds and to her handiwork he has the right of annulling her vows and he receives her bill of divorce but he has no use of fruct during her lifetime when she marries the husband surpasses him in his rights and that he has use of fruct during her lifetime but he is also under the obligation of maintaining and ransoming her and to provide for her. Burial Arjuna ruled even the poorest man in Israel must provide no less than two flutes and one lamenting woman Gemara by money whence is this deduced Rav Judah replied scripture said and shall she go and for nothing without money which implies that this master receives no money but that another master does receive money and who is he her father but might it not be suggested that it belongs to her since it is her father who contracts her betrothal as it is written in scripture I gave my daughter unto this man would she take the money but can it not be suggested that this applies only to a minor who has no legal right to act on her own behalf but that an heir who has such rights may herself contract her betrothal and she herself receives the money scripture stated being in her youth in her
Bows and should you suggest that we might infer this from it? It could be retorted that monetary matters cannot be inferred from ritual matters. And should you suggest that we might infer it is from the law of fine? It could be retorted. Could it not that monetary payments cannot be inferred from fines? And should you suggest that it is might be inferred from the law of compensation for indignity and blemish? It could be retorted that indignity and blemish are different since the rights of her father are also are they not involved in it? This, however, is the explanation. It is logical to conclude that when the all merciful excluded another going out, the exclusion was meant to be understood in a manner similar to the original. But one going out surely is not like that of the other. For in the case of the master, the maid servant goes entirely out of his control, while in the going out from the control of her father, the daughter's transfer to the bridal chamber is still. Lacking in respect of the annulment of vows at any rate she passes out of his control for we have learned in the case of a betrothed damsel it is her father and her husband who jointly annul her vows deed or intercourse whence do we deduce the scripture said and begometh another man's wife is from which it may be inferred that the various forms of betrothal are to be compared to one another he is entitled to anything she finds Talmud, Mosque Ketha both in order to avert ill feeling to her handiwork whence do we deduce this from that which are who not quoted in the name of Rav whence is it deduced that a daughter's handiwork belongs to her father from scripture where it is stated and if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant as the handiwork of a maidservant belongs to her master so does the handiwork of a daughter belong to her father but may it not be suggested that this applies only to a minor whom he may sell but the handiwork of an heir whom he cannot sell belongs to herself it is but logical to assume that it should belong to her father for should it be imagined that her handiwork does not belong to him the objection could well be advanced against the right which the all-merciful has conferred upon the father to consign his daughter to the bridal chamber how could he consign her when he thereby prevents her from doing her work or might it not be suggested that he pays her compensation for the time she is taken away from her work or else that he consigns her during the night or else that he might consign her on sabbaths or festivals the fact however is that in the case of a minor no scriptural text was necessary for since he may even sell her was it at all necessary to state that her handiwork belongs to him if a scriptural text then was at all necessary it must have been in respect of an to an her vows whence do we deduce this from scripture where it is written being in her youth in her Father's house and he receives her bill of divorce whence is this deduced from scripture where it is written and she departeth and Becometh departure being compared to becoming but he has no use of during her lifetime or rabbis taught a father has no use of during the lifetime of his daughter our Jose the son of our Judah ruled the father is entitled to use of in the lifetime of his daughter on what principle do they differ the first tana is of the opinion that the rabbis were well justified in allowing use of to a husband since otherwise he might refrain from ransoming his wife what however can be said in respect of the father that he would refrain from ransoming her it is certain that he would ransom her in any case our Jose the son of our Judah however is of the opinion that a father also might refrain from ransoming his daughter for he might think she is carrying a purse about her let her proceed to ransom herself when she marries the husband surpasses him in his Writes in that he has used a fruct, etc. Our rabbis taught if a father promised his daughter in writing free clothes or other movable objects that she might take with her from her father's house to that of her husband and she died, her husband does not acquire these objects in the name of our Nathan. It was stated the husband does acquire them, must it be assumed that they differ on the same principles as those on which our Eliezer B. Ezra and the rabbis differed? For we learned a woman who was widowed or divorced either after betrothal or after marriage is entitled to collect all that is due to her. Our Eliezer B. Ezra ruled only a woman widowed or divorced after her marriage recovers all that is due to her, but if after a betrothal a virgin recovers only 200 zoos and a widow only one maid Talmud, Mosque Ketha both be for the man wrote the additional joint for her with the sole object of marrying her, must it then be assumed that he ruled that her husband does not acquire. Upholds the same principle as our Eliezer B. Ezra while he ruled that the husband does acquire upholds the same principle as the rabbis know all may in fact hold the same view as our Eliezer B. Ezra for he ruled her husband does not acquire is obviously in agreement with our Eliezer B. Ezra and as to him who ruled the husband does acquire it may be explained that only in respect of undertakings from him towards her did our Eliezer B. Ezra maintain his view for the reason that the man wrote the additional jointure for her with the sole object of marrying her but in respect of undertakings from her towards him even our Eliezer B. Ezra may admit that betrothal has the same force as marriage since undertakings of such a nature are due to a desire for matrimonial association and such association surely had taken place he is also under the obligation of maintaining her etc. Our rabbis taught maintenance was provided for a wife in return for her handiwork. And her burial in return for her ketubah, a husband is therefore entitled to use a fruct, use a fruct who mentioned it, a clause is missing, and this is the proper reading. Maintenance was provided for a wife in return for her handiwork, her ransom in return for use a fruct, and her burial in return for her ketubah, a husband therefore is entitled to use a fruct, what was the need for, therefore it might have been presumed that a husband must not consume the fruits but should rather leave them since. Otherwise he might refrain from ransoming her, hence we were informed that that course was preferable for sometimes the proceeds of the fruit might not suffice and he would have to ransom her at his own expense, might I not transpose the sequence of a reply, they ordained the common for the common and the uncommon for the uncommon, said Robert the following tana is of the opinion that maintenance is a pentatical duty for it was taught she refers to maintenance for so it is said in. Scripture who also eat the shear of my people her rhyme is to be understood according to its ordinary meaning only refers to the time for conjugal duty prescribed in the Torah for so it is said in scripture if then shall afflict my daughters our Eliezer said shear refers to the prescribed time for conjugal duty for so it is said in scripture none of you shall approach to any that is near akin to him to uncover their nakedness her rhyme is to be taken according to its literal meaning only refers to maintenance for so it is said in scripture and he afflicted thee and suffered thee to hunger Talmud Mosque Ketha both A. R. Eliezer B. Jacob interpreted the expression shear Kesatha imply provide her with rhyme according to her age viz that a man shall not provide his old wife with the rhyme of a young one nor his young wife with that of an old one the expressions Kesatha we Onatha imply provide her with rhyme according to the season of the year viz that he shall not give her new raiment in the summer nor worn out raiment in the winter. Our Joseph learned her flesh implies close bodily contact is that he must not treat her in the manner of the Persians who perform their conjugal duties in their clothes. This provides support for a ruling of Arhuna who laid down that a husband who said I will not perform conjugal duties unless she wears her clothes and I mind must divorce her and give her also her ketubah. Our Judah ruled even the poorest man in Israel etc. This then implies that the first tana is of the opinion that these are not necessary but how is one to imagine the case if these were required by the woman's status what it may be objected could be the reason of the first tana who ruled that these were not required and if these were not required by the woman's status what it may be objected could be the reason of our Judah the ruling was necessary only in a case for instance where these were demanded by his status. But not by hers. The first tana is of the opinion that the principle that she rises with him but does not go down with him is applied only during her lifetime, but not after her death. While Arjuda maintains that the principle applies even after her death, Arhista laid down in the name of Marakba that the Halacha is in agreement with Arjuda. Arhista further stated in the name of Marakba if a man became insane, Beth didn't take possession of his estate and provide food and clothing for his wife, sons, and daughters, and for anything else, said Rabbanu to Arashi, why should this be different from that concerning which it was taught if a man went to a country beyond the sea and his wife claimed maintenance, Beth didn't take possession of his estate and provide food and clothing for his wife, but not for his sons and daughters, or for anything else? The other replied, Do you not draw a distinction between one who departs deliberately and one who departs without knowing it what is meant by anything? Else our Hista replied cosmetics were meant our Joseph explained charity according to him who replied cosmetics the ruling would apply with even greater force to charity he however who explained charity restricts his ruling to this alone but cosmetics he maintains must be given to her for her husband would not be pleased that she shall lose her comeliness our high be
Talmud, Mosk hath both be under the authority of her husband by going into the bridal chamber at marriage if her father delivered her to the agents of the husband she passes under the authority of her husband if her father went with her husband's agents or if the father's agents went with the husband's agents she remains under the authority of her father if her father's agents delivered her to her husband's agents she passes under the authority of her husband tomorrow what is the purport of remains to exclude the ruling of an earlier mission where we learned if the respective periods expired and they were not married they are entitled to maintenance out of the man's estate and if he is a priest may also eat terima therefore remains was used if her father delivered her to the agents of the husband she passes under the authority of her husband etc rab ruled her delivery is regarded as entry into the bridal chamber in all respects except that of terima but rc ruled in respect of terima also are not or as some say high be rab raised an objection against rc she remains under the authority of her father until she enters the bridal chamber did i not tell you said rab to them that you should not be guided by an ambiguous statement he can answer you that her delivery is regarded as her entry into the bridal chamber samuel however ruled her delivery has the force of entry into the bridal chamber only in respect of her inheritance rush ruled only in Respect of her kethugal what is meant by her kethugal if it means that should the woman die he inherits it then this ruling is is it not the same as that of Samuel Rabbin reply the meaning is that her statutory kethugal from a second husband is only a main of both our Yohanan and our Hanan ruled her delivery is regarded as entry into the bridal chamber in all respects even that of Terima an objection was raised if the father went with the agents of the husband or if the agents of it father went with the agents of the husband or if she had a courtyard on the way and she entered it with him to rest there for the night her father inherits from her if she died although her kethugal is already in the house of her husband if however her father delivered her to her husband's agents or if her father's agents delivered her to her husband's agents or he had a courtyard on the way and she entered it with him with an intention to matrimony her husband is her heir if she died. Although her kethugal was still in her father's house this ruling applies only in respect of her inheritance but in respect of terima the law is that no woman is allowed to eat terima until she enters the bridal chamber does not this represent a refutation of all this is indeed a refutation but is not this however self-contradictory you said she entered it with him to rest for the night the reason why such an act is not regarded as entry into the bridal chamber is because the entrance was made specifically for the purpose of resting for the night had it however been made with no specified intention it would be deemed to have been made with an intention to matrimony read however the final clause she entered it with him with an intention to matrimony from which it follows does it not that if the entrance was made with no specified intention it would be deemed to have been made just in order to rest there for the night or as she replied both entrances mentioned are such as were made with no specified intention but any unspecified entrance into a courtyard of hers is presumed to have been made in order to rest there for the night while any unspecified entrance into a courtyard of his is presumed to have been made with an intention to matrimony a tanda taught if the father delivered his daughter to the agents of her husband and she played the harlot her penalty is that of strangulation whence is this ruling deduced rmib have replied scripture stated to play the harlot in her father's house thus excluding one whom the father had delivered to the agents of the husband might it not be suggested that this excludes one who entered her bridal chamber but with whom no cohabitation had taken place robber replied am i told me that a woman who entered her bridal chamber was explicitly mentioned in scripture if there be a damsel that is a virgin betrothed unto a man a damsel but not a woman who is adolescent a virgin but not a woman with whom Intercourse took place betrothed but not one married now what is meant by one married if it be suggested one actually married it can be objected that stick a deduction would be practically the same as that of a virgin but not one with whom intercourse took place consequently it must be concluded that by married was meant one who entered into the bridal chamber but with whom no intercourse took place Talmud, Mosk hath both of but might not one suggest that if she returned to her parental home she resumes her former status Rob replied a tana of the school of our Ishmael has long ago settled this difficulty for a tana of the school of our Ishmael taught what need was there for scripture to state but the vow of a widow or of her that is divorced even everything where which she bath bound her soul shall stand against her is she not free from the authority of her father and also from that of her husband the fact however is that where her father had delivered her to the agents of her husband or where the agents of her father had delivered her to the agents of her husband and on the way she became a widow or was divorced one would not know whether she was to be described as of the house of her father or as of the house of her husband hence the need for the text to tell you that as soon as she has left her father's authority even if only for a short while he may no longer annul her vow said our papa we also learned a similar ruling a man who has intercourse with a betrothed girl incurs no penalties unless she is an ar a virgin betrothed and in her father's house now one can well see that an ar excludes one who is adolescent virgin excludes one with whom a man has had intercourse and betrothed excludes one who married by entry into the bridal chamber what however could the expression in her father's house exclude obviously this the case where her father delivered her to the agents of the husband Arnaman B. Isaac said we also learned a similar Ruling should one have intercourse with a married woman the latter provided she entered under the authority of her husband although no intercourse had taken place is to be punished by strangulation she entered under the authority of her husband implies in any form whatever this is conclusive proof mission a father is under no obligation to maintain his daughter this exposition was made by our Eliezer B. Ezra in the presence of the sages in the vineyard of Jabna since it was enacted that the sons shall be heirs to their mother's kethuba and the daughters shall be maintained out of their father's estate the two cases may be compared as the sons cannot be heirs except after the death of their father so the daughters cannot claim maintenance except after the death of their father Gamara since it has been said that he is under no obligation to maintain his daughter only it follows that he is under an obligation to maintain his son and in the case of his daughter also since he is only exempt from legal obligation he is obviously still subject to a moral duty who then it may be asked is the author of our mission is it neither our Meir nor our Judah nor our Yohanan be Baraka for it was taught it is a moral duty to feed one's daughters and much more so one's sons since the latter are engaged in the study of the Torah so our Meir our Judah ruled it is a moral duty to feed one's sons and much more so one's daughters in order to prevent their degradation our Yohanan be Baraka ruled it is a legal obligation to feed one's daughters after their father's death but during the lifetime of their father neither sons nor daughters need be fed now who could be the author of our mission if our Meir he surely it may be objected ruled that the maintenance of sons was only a moral duty if our Judah he surely ruled that also the maintenance of sons was only a moral duty and if our Yohanan be Baraka should be suggested the objection would be is not his opinion that one is not even subject to a moral duty if you wish I might say that the author is our mayor if you wish I might say our Judah and if you prefer I might say our Yohanan be Baraka if you wish I might say that the author is our mayor and it is this that he meant the father is under no obligation to maintain his daughter and the same law applies to his son maintenance however is a moral duty in the case of his daughter and much more so in the case of his sons and the reason why his daughter was mentioned was to teach us this Talmud, Mosk hath both be that even in the case of his daughter he is only exempt from a legal obligation but is nevertheless subject to a moral duty if you wish I might say our Judah and it is this that he meant the father is under no obligation to maintain his daughter and much more so his son it is however a moral duty to maintain one son and much more so one's daughters and the only reason why his daughter was mentioned was to teach us this that even the maintenance of one's daughter is no legal obligation and if you prefer I might say are Yohanan be Baraka and what was meant is this he is under no obligation to maintain his daughter and the same law applies to his son and this furthermore means that such maintenance is not even a moral duty only because the maintenance of daughters after their father's death is a legal obligation the expression he is under no obligation was used here also already stated in the name of Resh Lakish who had it from our Judah B. Hannah Adishah it was ordained that a man must maintain his sons and daughters while they are young the question was raised is the law in agreement with his statement or not come and here when people came before Rab Judah he used to tell them the yard bears progeny and throws them upon the tender mercies of the townspeople when people came before Arhisda he used to tell them turn the mortar for him upside down in public and let one stand on it and say the raven cares for its young but that
to state that such maintenance is allowed to the man himself and his wife for Rabin had sent in his letter if a man died and left a widow and a daughter his widow is to receive her maintenance from his estate if the daughter married his widow is still to receive her maintenance from his estate if the daughter died Rab Judah the son of the sister of our Jose Bihanana said I had such a case and it was decided that his widow was to receive her maintenance from his estate in view of this ruling we ask was it necessary to give a similar ruling in respect of the man himself and his wife it might have been assumed that the law applies only there because there is no one else to provide for her but here it might well be argued let him provide for himself and for her hence we were taught that here also the same ruling applies the question was raised is the law in agreement with his view or not come and here our Hannah and our Jonathan were once standing together when a man approached the man bending down kissed Arjanathan upon his foot. What is the meaning of this? Said Arjanathan to him. This man, the other replied, assigned his estate to his sons in writing Talmud, Moskatha Bothay, and I compelled them to maintain him. Now, if it be conceded that this was not in accordance with the strict law, one can well understand why he had to compel them. But if it be contended that this is a law, would it have been necessary for him? It may be objected to compel them. Early stated it was ordained at a shot that if a man wishes to spend liberally, he should not spend more than a fifth. So it was also taught if a man desires to spend liberally, he should not spend more than a fifth, since by spending more he might himself come to be in need of the help of people. It once happened that a man wished to spend more than a fifth, but his friend did not allow him. Who was it? Our Yeshiva Others say that the man who wished to spend was our Yeshiva, but his friend did not allow him. And who? Was it our Akiba our Naman, or as some say our Ahabi Jacob said, What is the proof from scripture and of all that thou shalt give me? I will surely give a tenth into thee, but the second tenth surely is not like the first one. Our Ashi replied, I will give a tenth of it implies I will make the second like the first said our Shai be Ashi. The number of those who report these traditions steadily diminishes, and your mnemonic is the young assigned in writing and spend liberally. Our Isaac stated it was ordained at a shot that a man must bear with his son until he is twelve years of age. From that age onwards he may threaten his life, but could this be correct? Did not Rab in fact say to our Samuel B. Shalath, Do not accept a pupil under the age of six, a pupil of the age of six, you shall accept and stuff him like an ox, yes, stuff him like an ox, but he may not threaten him until after he has reached the age of twelve years, and if you prefer, I may say this is no difficulty since one may have. Referred to scripture and the other to Mishnah for Abbe stated nurse told me that a child of six is right for scripture one of ten for Mishnah one of thirteen for a full twenty four hours fast and in the case of a girl one who is of the age of twelve Abbe stated nurse told me a child of the age of six whom a scorpion has bitten on the day on which he has completed his sixth year does not survive as a rule what is his remedy the gall of a white stork in beer this should be rubbed into the wound and the patient be made to drink it a child of the age of one year whom a bee has stung on the day he has completed his first year does not survive as a rule what is his remedy the creepers of a palm tree in water this should be rubbed in and the patient be made to drink it said our katna whosoever brings his son to school under the age of six will run after him but never overtake him others say his fellows will run after him but will never overtake him both statements However, our correct he is feeble but learned if you prefer I might say the former applies to one who is emaciated the latter to one who is in good health. Our Jose B. Hanan stated at a shot it was ordained that if a woman had sold usufruct property during the lifetime of her husband and then died the husband may seize it from the buyers. Our Isaac B. Joseph found our about standing among a crowd of people who he said to him is the author of the traditions of a shot. Our Jose B. Hanan the other informed him. He learned this from him forty times and then it appeared to him as if he had it safely in his bag. Happy are they that keep justice that do righteousness at all times. Is it possible to do righteousness at all times? This explained our rabbis of Jabna or as others say our Eliza refers to a man who maintains his sons and daughters while they are young. Our Samuel B. Namani said this refers to a man who brings up an orphan boy or orphan girl in his house and enables them to marry wealth and riches. Are in his house and his merit endureth forever. Our Huna and our Hista expounded the text in different ways. One said it applies to a man who studies the Torah and teaches it to others, and the other said it applies to a man who writes the Pentateuch, the prophets, and the Hagiographer, and lends them to others. And see thy children's children, peace be upon Israel. Our Joshua Beloved said, As soon as your children have children, there will be peace upon Israel, for they will not be subject to Elizabeth or Levi. Right marriage, our Samuel B. Namani said, As soon as your children have children, there will be peace for the judges of Israel, for doubtful claimants will not come to quarrels. This exposition was made by our Eliezer B. Ezra in the presence of the sages, etc. Talmud, Moskatha, both B. Our Joseph sat before our Hamnana while our Hamnana was sitting and discoursing as sons may obtain their inheritance only from landed property, so may one's daughters obtain their maintenance only from landed property. All. Shouted at him, is it only from a man who leaves land that sons inherit, while from him who leaves no land his sons do not inherit? Said our Joseph to him, might not the master have been speaking of the Kathu, but that is due to male children? The other replied, the master who is a great man understood precisely what I meant. Our high B. Joseph stated, Rab allowed maintenance to daughters from Weed of Aliyah. The question was raised, was Rab's allowance made for a marriage outfit and by Aliyah's? Meant in accordance with her father's Jean Rand's disposition, his ruling being in agreement with that of Samuel, who laid down that in respect of marriage outfit, the assessment is determined by the disposition of the father, or was it rather for actual maintenance? And by Aliyah was meant in accordance with the chivalrous enactments made in an upper chamber for our Isaac B. Joseph stated, in an upper chamber it was enacted that daughters shall be maintained even out of movable property. Come and here Arbanay the brother of our high B. Abba had in his possession orphans movable property and when he and the daughters of the deceased came before Samuel the latter said to him go and provide maintenance for them does not maintenance refer to actual maintenance he being of the same opinion as our Isaac B. Joseph no there the claim was in respect of marriage outfit and Samuel acted in accordance with his own view since he laid down that in respect of marriage outfit the assessment is determined by the disposition of the father such a case occurred at Nihartia and the Nihartian judges issued an order in favor of the daughters at Pamadai also our Hanabi business allowed daughters to collect for their maintenance our Naman however said to them proceed to withdraw your orders otherwise I shall order the seizure of your mansions our MI and RC intended to allow maintenance out of movable property said our Jacob B. E. D. to them in a matter concerning which are Yohanan and Reshlakish hesitated to act. Would you venture to act? Our Eliezer intended to allow maintenance out of movable property. Said our Simeon Beliakim to him, Master, I know that in your decision you are not acting on the line of justice but on the line of mercy. But the possibility ought to be considered that the students might observe this ruling and fix it as an halacha for future generations. A similar case was once submitted to our Joseph Giver. He ordered of the dates that are spread on it. Read Matt said Abbe to him, even if she were a creditor, would the master have allowed her a privilege of such a nature? What I mean is the other said to him, dates that are suitable for spreading on the Read Matt Talmud. Moscata both after all, however, it may be objected is not all that is ripe for cutting regarded as already cut. I mean dates that are still dependent on the palm tree, a boy orphan and girl orphan once came before Rabbi Grant a bigger maintenance allowance to the boy. Said Rabba for the sake of the girl said the rabbis to Rabba did not the master himself lay down that payment may be exacted from landed property but not from movable property whether in respect of a daughter's maintenance a wife's kathubah or a daughter's marriage outfit he answered them had he desired to have a handmaid to attend on him would we not have granted him an increased allowance for the purpose how much more then should the allowance be increased here where it serves to purposes our rabbis taught both landed property and movable property may be seized for the maintenance of a wife or daughter so Rabbi our Simeon B. Eliezer ruled landed property may be seized for daughters from sons for daughters from daughters and for sons from sons for sons from daughters where the estate is large but not where it is small movable property may be seized for sons from sons for daughters from daughters and for sons from daughters but not for daughters from sons although we have an established rule that the Halachah is in agreement with Rabbi where he differs from his colleague the Halachah here is in ag
Capable letter heal herself, he is allowed to act in accordance with his desire. Gamara, whose view is represented in our Mishnah, it is obviously that of our Meir who ruled that the intercourse of any man who undertakes to give a virgin less than 200 zoos or a widow less than a mina is an act of prostitution. For if it be suggested that it is a view of our Judah, he surely it can be objected ruled that if a husband wished, he may write out for a virgin a deed for 200 zoos. And she writes acquittance I have received from you a mina, and for a widow he may write out a deed for a mina, and she writes acquittance I received from you 50 zoos. Read, however, the final clause if he assigned to her in writing a field that was worth one mina instead of the 200 zoos, and did not write in her favor all property that I possess is surety for your Kathuba, he is nevertheless liable for the full amount because the clause mentioned I as a condition laid down by. Bethin does not this obviously represent the view of Arjuna who laid down that the omission from a bond of the clause pledging property is regarded as the scribe's error for if it be suggested that it represents the view of our Meir he surely it can be objected ruled that the omission of the clause pledging property is not regarded as the scribe's error for we have learned if a man found notes of indebtedness Talmud, Mos Kethaboth B he must not restore them if they contain a clause pledging property because the court would exact payment from such property but if they do not contain the clause pledging property he must return them because the court will not exact payment from the property so our Meir the sages however ruled in either case he must not return them because the court will exact payment from the property in any case would then the first clause represent the view of our Meir and the final clause that of Arjuna and should you suggest that both clauses Represent the view of our mayor and that he draws a distinction between the Kethuba and notes of indebtedness. It could be retorted, does he indeed draw such a distinction? Has it not been taught for five classes of claims made a strain be made only on free assets? They are as follows a claim for produce for amelioration, shewing profits for an undertaking to maintain the wife's son or the wife's daughter for a note of indebtedness wherein no lien on property had been entered and for a woman's Kethuba from which the clause pledging security was omitted. Now, what authority have you heard laying down that the omission from a deed of a record of a lien on property is not regarded as the scribe's error? Obviously, it is our mayor, and yet it was stated, was it not a woman's Kethuba? If you wish, I might reply, our mission represents the view of our mayor, and if you prefer, I might reply, it represents the view of our Judah. If you prefer, I might reply, it represents the view of our Judah for there. She specifically wrote in the man's favor in acquittance I received, but here she did not write in his favor I received. If you wish I might reply, our mission represents the view of our mirror for by the expression he is nevertheless liable was meant liability to pay out of his free assets if he did not write in her favor, etc. Samuel's father ruled the wife of an Israelite who had been outraged is forbidden to her husband since it may be apprehended that the act begun under compulsion may have terminated with her consent. Rab raised an objection against Samuel's father. Have we not learned if you are taken captive I will ransom you and take you again as my wife? The other remained silent. Rab thereupon applied to Samuel's father the scriptural text. The princes refrained talking and laid their hand on their mouth. What however could he have replied that the law was relaxed in the case of a captive according to Samuel's father's ruling? How is it possible to conceive a case of outrage? Which the all merciful deemed to be genuine, where for instance witnesses testified that she cried from the commencement to the end. This ruling, however, differs from that of Rabba, for Rabba laid down any woman the outrage against whom began under compulsion, though it terminated with her consent, and even if she said leave him alone, and that if he had not made the attack upon her, she would have hired him to do it as permitted to her husband. What is the reason he plunged her into an uncontrollable passion? It was taught in agreement with Rabba, and she be not seized only then is she forbidden, from which it follows that if she was seized, she is permitted, but there is another class of woman who is permitted, even if she was not seized, and who is that any woman who began under compulsion and ended with her consent, another very the taught, and she be not seized only then is she forbidden, from which it follows that if she was seized, she is permitted, but there is another. Class of woman who is forbidden even though she was seized and who is that the wife of a priest Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel who had it from our Ishmael and she be not seized and only is she forbidden but if she was seized she is permitted there is however another class of woman who is permitted even if she was not seized and who is that a woman whose betrothal was a mistaken one and who may even if her son sits riding on her shoulder make a declaration of refusal against her husband and go away Rab Judah ruled women who are kidnapped are permitted to their husbands but said the rabbis to Rab Judah do they not bring bread to them they do this out of fear do they not however hand them their arrows they do this also out of fear it is certain however that they are forbidden if the kidnappers release them and they go to them of their own free will our rabbis taught royal captives have the status of ordinary captives but those that are kidnapped by highwaymen are not regarded as ordinary captives was not the reverse however taught there is no contradiction between the rulings concerning royal captives since the former refers for example to the kingdom of Ahasuerus while the latter refers to the kingdom of one like Ben Nezer there is also no contradiction between the two rulings concerning captives of highwaymen since the former refers to a highwayman like Ben Nezer while the latter refers to an ordinary highwayman as to Ben Nezer could he be called their king and here is highwayman yes in comparison with Ahasuerus he was a highwayman but in comparison with an ordinary robber he was a king or in the case of a priest's wife I will restore you to your parental home etc Abbe ruled if a widow was married to a high priest it is the latter's duty to ransom her since one may apply to her or in the case of a priest's wife I will restore you to your parental home Talmud Mosque both but if a bastard or an was married to an Israelite, the latter is under no obligation to ransom her since one cannot apply to her and take you again as my wife. Rabba ruled wherever the captivity causes a woman to be forbidden to her husband, it is his duty to ransom her, but where some other circumstance causes her to be forbidden to him, it is not his duty to ransom her. Must it be assumed that they differ on the same principles as the following Tanaim? For it was taught if a man forbade his wife by a vow from deriving any benefit from him and she was taken captive, he must set our Eliza ransom her and give her also her Kethuba. Our Joshua said he must give her her Kethuba, but need not ransom her, said our Nathan. I asked Simicus when our Joshua said he must give her her Kethuba, but need not ransom her. Did he refer to a case where her husband first made his vow against her and she was then taken captive, or even to a case where she was first taken captive and he made his vow against her subsequently and he told me I did? Not hear what he exactly said, but it seems that he referred to a case where the husband made the vow against her first and the woman was taken captive afterwards. For should you suggest that the ruling applied also to a woman who was taken captive first and the man made his vow against her afterwards, the objection could be raised that in such a case he might make use of a trick. Do not they then differ in the case of one who made a vow against the wife of a priest of a upholding it? View of our Eliza while Rabbi is maintaining that of our Joshua. No, here we are dealing with the case of a woman who, for instance, made the vow herself and her husband confirmed it. Our Eliza being of the opinion that it was he who put his finger between her teeth, while our Joshua maintains that it was she herself who put her finger between her teeth. But if she herself put her finger between her teeth, what claim can she have to her kethuba? And furthermore, it was stated, said our Nathan, I asked. Simicus when our Joshua said he must give her her Kethuba but need not ransom her did he refer to a case where her husband first made his vow against her and she was then taken captive or even to a case where she was first taken captive and he made his vow against her subsequently and he told me I did not hear what he exactly said now if this is a case where she herself had made the vow what difference is there it may be asked whether he made the vow first against her and she was taken captive afterwards or whether she was first taken captive and he then made the vow the fact is that here it is a case where the husband made the vow against her but Abbe explains the dispute on the lines of his view while Rabbi explains it on the lines of his view Abbe explains the dispute on the lines of his view thus if a widow was married to a high priest no one disputes the ruling that it is the husband's duty to ransom her if a bastard or a nethino was married to him. Israelite, no one disputes the ruling that it is not his duty to ransom her. If also one made a vow against the wife of a priest, no one disputes the ruling that it is his duty to ransom her. Since the principle in this case is identical with that of a widow who was married to a high priest, they differ only in respect of him who made a vow against the wife of an Israelite.
Death of her husband it is not the duty of his orphans to ransom her and furthermore even if she was taken captive during the lifetime of her husband but he died subsequently the orphans are under no obligation to ransom her since one cannot apply to her the clause in her ketubah and I will take you again as my wife our rabbis taught if a woman was taken captive and a demand was made upon her husband for as much as ten times her value he must ransom her the first time subsequently however. He ransoms her only if he desired to do so but need not ransom her if he does not wish to do so our Simeon B. Gamaliel ruled Talmud, Mos Ketha both be captives must not be ransomed for more than their value in the interests of the public this then implies that they must be ransomed for their actual value even though the cost of a captive's ransom exceeds the amount of her ketubah has not however the contrary been taught if a woman was taken captive and a demand was made upon her husband for as much as ten times the amount of her ketubah he must ransom her the first time subsequently however he ransoms her only if he desires to do so but need not ransom her if he does not wish to do so our Simeon B. Gamaliel ruled if the price of her ransom corresponded to the amount of her ketubah he must ransom her if not he need not ransom her our Simeon B. Gamaliel upholds two lenient rules if she sustained an injury it is his duty to provide for her medical treatment our rabbis taught a widow is to be maintained from her husband's orphan's estate and if she requires medical treatment it is regarded as maintenance our Simeon B. Gamaliel ruled medical treatment of a limited liability may be deducted from her ketubah but one which has no limited liability is regarded as maintenance said our Yohanan bloodletting in the land of Israel was regarded as medical treatment of no limited liability our Yohanan's relatives had to maintain their father's wife who required daily medical treatment when they came to our Yohanan he told them proceed to arrange with a medical man an inclusive fee later however our Yohanan remarked we have put ourselves in the unenviable position of legal advisors what however was his opinion at first and why did he change it in the end at first he thought of the scriptural text and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh but ultimately he realized that the position of a noted personality is different from that of the general public mission. Husband who did not give his wife in writing the following undertaking the male children that will be born from our marriage shall inherit the money of the ketubah in addition to their shares with their brothers is nevertheless liable because this clause is a condition laid down by Beth Din though he did not give his wife in writing the undertaking the female children that will be born from our marriage shall dwell in my house and be maintained out of my estate until they shall be taken. In Makrach he is nevertheless liable because this clause is a condition laid down by Beth Din similarly if he did not give his wife the written undertaking you shall dwell in my house and be maintained therein out of my estate throughout the duration of your widowhood he is nevertheless liable because this clause also is a condition laid down by Beth Din so did the men of Jerusalem write the men of Galilee wrote in the same manner as the men of Jerusalem the men of Judea however used to. Right until the heirs may consent to pay you your ketubah, the heirs consequently may if they wish to do it pay her her ketubah and dismiss her. Gemara our Yohanan stated in the name of our Simeon B.O.H.Y. was the ketubah for male children instituted in order that any man might thereby be encouraged to give to his daughter as much as to his son but is such a regulation found anywhere else seeing that the Almerciful ordained that a son shall be heir a daughter shall not with the rabbis. Proceed to make a provision whereby a daughter shall be the heir this also has scriptural sanction for it is written take your wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands now the advice to take wives for one's sons is quite intelligible since such marriages are within a father's power but as to the giving of one's daughters the difficulty arises is such giving within his power consequently it must be this that we were taught. That a father must provide for his daughter clothing and covering and must also give her a dowry so that people may be anxious to woo her and so proceed to marry her and to what extent both Abbe and Rabba ruled up to a tenth of his wealth but might it not be suggested that the sons should inherit what their mother received from her father but not that which was due to her from her husband if that were so a father also would abstain from assigning a liberal dowry for his daughter may it then be suggested that where her father had assigned a dowry her husband must also enter the clause but where her father did not assign any dowry her husband also need not enter the clause the rabbis drew no distinction but should not then a daughter among sons also be here the rabbis have treated the ketubah like an inheritance but should not then a daughter among the other daughters be here the rabbis made no distinction why then is not the ketubah recoverable from movables also the Rabbis treated it like the statutory ketubah. Why then should not distraint be made unsold or mortgaged property? The expression we learned was shall inherit. May it then be suggested that it is recoverable even if there was no surplus of a dinar. The rabbis have made no enactment where the Pentateuch law of inheritance would thereby be uprooted. Our papa was making arrangements for his son to be married into the house of Abba of Surah. He went there to write the ketubah for the bride. When Judah Bimir heard of his arrival, he went out to welcome him. When, however, they reached the door of the bride's father's house, he asked leave to depart. When our papa said to him, "Will the master come in with me?" Talmud, Mos Ketha, both observing, however, that it was distasteful to him to enter, he addressed him thus: "What is it that you have on your mind? Are you reluctant to enter?" Because Samuel said to Rab Judah, "Shine to keep away from transfers of inheritance, even though they be." From a bad son to a good son because one never knows what issue will come forth from him and much more so when the transfer is from a son to a daughter this also I may point out is an enactment of the rabbis as our Yohanan stated in the name of our Simeon B.O.H. the other reply this enactment applies only to one who acts willingly does it also imply that one should be compelled so to act it I tell you said our papa to him to come in and coerce him what I meant was come in but exercise. No pressure upon him by entrance the other replied would amount to compulsion as our papa however urged him he entered but having sat down remained silent Abba thought that he was vexed and consequently assigned to his daughter as dowry all that he possessed finally however he said to him will not the master speak even now by the life of the master I have left nothing for myself as far as I am concerned the other replied even the amount you have assigned has given me no pleasure this being. The case the first said I will withdraw I did not suggest the other said that you should make a rogue of yourself or Yamar the elder inquired of Arnaman does a woman who sold her ketubah to her husband retain the right to the ketubah for her male children or not said Rabbi to him why do you not raise the same question in the case of a woman who surrendered her claim to her ketubah now the other replied that I found it necessary to inquire concerning a woman who sold her ketubah. Though in that case it might well be assumed that her need for money compelled her to the sale and furthermore it might be said that she is like a person who was struck a hundred blows with a hammer was it then necessary to raise the same question in respect of a woman who voluntarily surrendered her claim to her ketubah Rabbi stated I have no doubt that a woman who sells her ketubah to strangers retains the right to the male children's ketubah what is the reason it is her need. For money that has compelled her to sell a woman on the other hand who surrenders her claim to her ketubah in favor of her husband does not retain the right to the male children's ketubah what is the reason she has lightheartedly surrendered her claims is however a woman Rabbah inquired who sells her ketubah to her husband treated as one who sells it to strangers or as one who renounces it in favor of her husband after he raised the question he himself solved it the law concerning. A woman who sells her ketubah to her husband is the same as that of one who sells it to strangers or edb Avin raised an objection we learned if she died neither the heirs of the one husband nor the heirs of the other are entitled to inherit her ketubah and in considering the difficulty how does the question of a ketubah at all arise our papa replied the ketubah of the male children was meant but why could not one argue here also her passion has overpowered her there the loss of her. Ketubah is a penalty that the rabbis have imposed upon her. Rabin Bihanana once sat at his studies before our and in the course of the session he laid down in the name of our Eliezer a woman who surrenders her ketubah to her husband is not entitled to maintenance. The other said to him, Had you not spoken to me in the name of a great man, I would have told you who so rewardeth evil for good evil shall not depart from his house. Our and Enola and Abimi son of our papi once sat at their studies and our high BMI was sitting with them when there came before them a man whose betrothed wife had died. Go and bury her, they said to him, or pay her ketubah on her account. Said our high to them, We have a teaching in the case of a betrothed wife. The husband is subject neither to the laws of
married or where she was married though she did not attain adolescence no one disputes the ruling that she is not entitled to maintenance they differ only on the question of a daughter who was betrothed but did not attain adolescence so also did Levi teach in his burial until they shall attain adolescence and the time for their marriages arrives both what was meant is this either they shall attain adolescence or the time for their marriage shall arrive they differ on the same principles as the following Tanaim, how long is a daughter to be maintained until she is betrothed in the name of our Eliezer? It was stated until she attains adolescence, our Joseph learned daughters must be maintained until they become wives. The question was raised, does this mean becoming wives at marriage or becoming wives at betrothal? The question must stand unanswered, said Arhistah to our Joseph. Did you ever hear from Rab Judah whether a betrothed orphan is entitled to maintenance or not the other? Replied, I have not actually heard it, but it may logically be concluded that she is not entitled because her future husband having betrothed her would not allow her to be degraded. If you have not actually heard this, our Arhistah retorted, it may logically be concluded that she is entitled for her intended husband not being sure of her would not throw his money away for nothing. Another reading, he replied, I have not actually heard it, but it may logically be concluded that she is entitled to. Maintenance for her intended husband not being sure of her would not throw his money away for nothing the other retorted if you have not actually heard this it may logically be concluded that she is not entitled to maintenance because her future husband having betrothed her would not allow her to be degraded mnemonic of the Menshak Zaraf subjects she refused and a sister in law of the second degree is betrothed and he outraged her Arshi's hate was asked is a minor who exercised her right of refusal entitled to maintenance or not you replied Arshi's hate have learned as a widow in her father's house a divorced woman in her father's house or a woman who was awaiting the decision of a lover in her father's house is entitled to maintenance Arjuda ruled only a woman who is still in her father's house is entitled to maintenance but a woman who is no longer in her father's house is not entitled to maintenance now is not Arjuda's ruling exactly the same as that of the first Tana consequently it may be concluded that the difference between them is the case of a minor who had exercised her right of refusal the first Tana being of the opinion that she is entitled to maintenance while Arjuda upholds a view that she is not entitled to it. Reshlakish inquired is the daughter of a sister-in-law entitled to maintenance or not has she no claim to it since the master said her kethuba is a charge on the estate of her first husband or is it possible that she is entitled to it since the rabbis have enacted that whenever she is unable to collect her kethuba from the estate of the first she may recover it from that of the second the question must remain unanswered. Our Eliezer inquired is the daughter of a forbidden relative of the second degree of incest entitled to maintenance or not Talmud. Mas kethuba has she no claim to maintenance since her mother is not entitled to a kethuba or is it likely that the rabbis have imposed a penalty only upon her mother who had committed a transgression but not upon her who had committed no transgression this remains unanswered Rabbah asked is the daughter of a betrothed wife entitled to maintenance or not is she entitled to maintenance since her mother is entitled to a kethuba or is it possible that she is not entitled to maintenance since the rabbis have not ordained the writing of the kethuba until the time of the marriage the question must stand unanswered our papa asked is the daughter of an outraged woman entitled to maintenance or not according to the ruling of our Jose the son of Arjuda who has laid down that her mother is entitled to recover a kethuba for one main the question does not arise it arises only according to the ruling of the rabbis who have laid down that the fine is regarded as a quittance for her kethuba when it may be asked is a decision has she no claim to maintenance since her mother is not entitled to a kethuba or might it possibly be argued Thus what is the reason why a kethuba has been instituted for a wife in order that the man might not find it easy to divorce her but this man surely cannot divorce her this must stand unanswered you shall dwell in my house etc. Our Joseph learned in my house but not in my hovel she is entitled however to maintenance Mar son of Arashi rule she is not entitled even to maintenance the law however is not in agreement with Mar son of Arashi Arnaman stated in the name of Samuel if marriage was proposed to her and she accepted she is no longer entitled to maintenance this is to imply that if she did not accept she would not be entitled to maintenance Arain and replied this was explained to me by Mar Samuel if she said El cannot accept the proposal out of respect for the memory of so and so my husband she is entitled to maintenance but if she said because the men are not suitable for me she is not entitled to maintenance Arhist ruled if she played the harlot she is not entitled to Maintenance our Joseph ruled if she painted her eyes or dyed her hair she is not entitled to maintenance he who ruled if she played the harlot would even more so deprive her of maintenance if she paints her eyes or dyes her hair he however who ruled if she painted her eyes or dyed her hair would allow her maintenance if she played the harlot what is the reason her passions have overpowered her the law however is not in agreement with any of these reported rulings but with that which Rab Judah laid down in the name of Samuel she who claims her kethuba at court is not entitled to maintenance but is she not entitled surely it was taught if she sold her kethuba pledged it or mortgaged the land that was pledged for her kethuba to a stranger she is not entitled to maintenance does not this imply that only such acts deprive a widow of her maintenance but not the act of claiming her kethuba at court these acts deprive her of her maintenance whether she appeared at court or not but the act of claiming her kethuba deprives her of maintenance only if she appeared in court but does not deprive her of it if she did not appear at court so did the men of Jerusalem etc. It was stated Rab ruled the Halachah is in agreement with the practice of the men of Judea but Samuel ruled the Halachah agrees with the practice of the men of Galilee Babylon and all its neighboring towns followed a usage in agreement with the ruling of Rab Nehardia and all its neighboring towns followed a usage agreeing with the ruling of Samuel a woman of Mahuza was once married to a man of Nehardia when they came to Arnaman and he observed from her voice that she was a native of Mahuza he said to them the decision must be in agreement with Rab for Babylon and all its neighboring towns have adopted a usage in agreement with the ruling of Rab when however they pointed out to him but surely she is married to a man of Nehardia he said to them if that is the case the Decision will be in agreement with Samuel for Nihardia and all its neighboring towns followed a usage agreeing with the ruling of Samuel. How far does the usage of Nihardia extend as far afield as the Nihardian cab is in use? It was stated when a kethuba is being paid to a widow said Rab assessment is made of what she wears but Samuel said that which she wears is not assessed said Arhai Biav and their opinions are reversed in the case of retainer Arkahana taught and so are their opinions in the case of retainer and Rab had laid down this mnemonic strip the widow and the orphan and go out Arnaman said although we have learned in a mission in agreement with the view of Samuel the law is in agreement with that of Rab for we learned whether a man has consecrated his estate or whether he has consecrated the valuation of himself the temple treasurer has no claim either upon the clothes of that man's wife or upon the clothes of his children or the colored articles. That were dyed for them or any new sandals that their father may have bought for them, said Rabbi to Arnaman. Since, however, we have learned in a mission in agreement with the view of Samuel, why does the law agree with that of Rab? The other replied, At first sight, it might appear to run parallel to the principle of Samuel, but if you examine it carefully, you will find that the law, in fact, must be in agreement with the view of Rab, for this is the reason when he bought the clothes for her, he did so on the assumption that she would live with him. He did not, however, buy them for her on the assumption that she should take them and depart. A daughter in law of the house of Bar Elisha was claiming her kethuba from orphans when she summoned them to court, and they said, It is degrading for us that you should come with us in such clothes. She went home and dressed and wrapped herself in all her garments when they came before Rabbi, and he told them the law is in agreement with the ruling of. Rab who laid down that when a kethuba is being paid to a widow assessment is made of what she wears a man once said let a bride's outfit be provided for my daughter and the price of an outfit was subsequently reduced the benefit ruled R.E.D.B. Avin belongs to the orphans a man once said Talmud, Mas kethuba be 400 zoos of the value of this one shall be given to my daughter and the price of one rose the prophet ruled R. Joseph belongs to the orphans relatives of R. Yohanan had the responsibility of maintaining their father's wife who was in the habit of consuming much food when they came to R. Yohanan she told them go and ask your father that he should assign a plot of land for her maintenance when they subsequently
which is he may write out for a virgin a deed for 200 zuz and she writes acquittance I have received from you Amina and for a widow he may write out a deed for Amina and she writes acquittance I have received from you 50 zuz are may your rule the intercourse of any man who undertakes to give a virgin less than 200 zuz or a widow less than Amina is an act of prostitution Gemara is not this obvious it might have been presumed that the rabbis have fixed a limit in order that the man who has no means might not be put to shame hence we were taught that there was no limit if he wishes to add etc it was not stated if he wishes to write but wishes to add this then provide support for a ruling which Arab was stated in the name of Arjane for Arab was stated in the name of Arjane the supplementary provisions that are included in a Kethuba are subject to the same regulations as the statutory Kethuba in what respect can this matter in respect of a Woman who sells or surrenders her kethuba or one who rebels, one who impairs or claims her kethuba or one who transgresses the law Talmud, Mos Ketha both in respect of amelioration and oath and the sabbatical year in respect of him who assigned all his property to his sons or the recovery of payment out of real estate and from the worst part of it also in respect of the law of a widow while in her father's house and of the kethuba for male children and was stated the kethuba for the male children the scholars of Pumadai ruled may not be collected from sold or mortgaged property for we have learned they shall inherit and the scholars of Matha Mahaj ruled it may be collected from sold or mortgaged property for we have learned they shall take the law however is that it may not be collected from sold or mortgaged property since we have learned they shall inherit movables which are available may be collected without an oath but if they are not available the kethuba. May the scholars of Pumadai the rule be collected without an oath and the scholars of Matha Mahaj ruled only with an oath the law is that they may be collected without an oath if her husband has set aside for her a plot of land defining it by its four boundaries she may collect from it without an oath but if he only defined it by one boundary the scholars of Pumadai the rule that collection may be made from it without an oath but the scholars of Matha Mahaj ruled only with an oath the law however is that collection may be effected without an oath if a man said to witnesses write out a deed sign it and give it to a certain person and they took from him symbolic possession there is no need to consult him if however no symbolic possession was taken the scholars of Pumadai the rule there is no need to consult him but the scholars of Matha Mahaj ruled it is necessary to consult him the law is that it is necessary to consult him Rla's or Bsri etc it was Stated Rabbi and Nathan differed one maintained that the Halachah was in agreement with Rla's or Bsri and the other maintained that the Halachah was not in agreement with Rla's or Bsri you may conclude that it was Arnathan who maintained that the Halachah was in agreement with Rla's or Bsri since Arnathan was heard elsewhere to follow the rule of assumption he having stated that the Halachah was in agreement with Arsimian Chizuri in the case of a man dangerously ill. Talmud, Mos Ketha both B and Anet of Terimah of the tithe of D may produce but does not Rab however follow the rule of assumption surely it was stated as to the gift of a dying man in the deed of which was recorded symbolic acquisition the school of Rab in the name of Rab reported that the testator has thereby made him ride on two harnessed horses but Samuel said I do not know what decision to give on the matter the school of Rab in the name of Rab reported that the testator has Thereby made him ride on two harnessed horses for it is like the gift of a man in good health and it is also like the gift of a dying man it is like the gift of a man in good health in that if he recovered he cannot retract and it is like the gift of a dying man in that if he said that his loan shall be given to X his loan is to he given to X but Samuel said I do not know what decision to give on the matter since it is possible that he decided not to transfer possession to him except through the deed and no possession by means of a deed may be acquired after the testator's death Talmud, Mos Ketha both of the fact however is that both follow the rule of assumption and he who stated that the Halachah was so was well justified while in respect of him who stated that the Halachah was not so it may be explained that here also the ruling is based on an assumption that the man's object it is assumed was the formation of a mutual attachment and such attachment. Has indeed been formed our Hanna once sat in the presence of Arjane when he stated the Halachah is in agreement with our Eliezer B. Ezrai. The master said to him, Go out, read your biblical verses outside the Halachah is not in agreement with our Eliezer B. Ezrai. Our Isaac B. of Dimi stated in the name of our master the Halachah is in agreement with our Eliezer B. Ezrai. Our Naman stated in the name of Samuel the Halachah is in agreement with our Eliezer B. Ezrai. Our Naman in his own name, however, stated that the Halachah was not in agreement with our Eliezer B. Ezrai. While the Nehardian stated in the name of our Naman that the Halachah was in agreement with our Eliezer B. Ezrai. And though our Naman uttered a curse proclaiming such and such a fate shall befall every judge who gives a ruling in agreement with the opinion of our Eliezer B. Ezrai. The Halachah is nevertheless in agreement with our Eliezer Bazrai. And the Halachah in practice is in accordance with the opinion of our Eliezer B. Ezrai. Rabin. Inquired what is the law where the bride only entered the bridal chamber but there was no intercourse is the kanyan affected by the affectionate attachment in the bridal chamber or is the kanyan affected by the affectionate attachment of the intercourse come and hear what our Joseph learned because he assigned it to her only on account of the affectionate attachment of the first night now if you grant that it is the affectionate attachment in the bridal chamber that affects the kanyan it was correct for him to state the first night if however you contend that it is the affectionate attachment of the intercourse that affects the kanyan does this it may be objected first take place on the first night only and not subsequently what then do you suggest the affectionate attachment in the bridal chamber is the bridal chamber it may be retorted entered in the night only and not in the daytime but according to your argument does intercourse take place at night and not in the day Time surely Rabba stated if one was in a dark room intercourse is permitted this is no difficulty he may have taught us that it is proper conduct that intercourse should be at night but if it is maintained that it is the affectionate attachment in the bridal chamber that affects the kanyan the difficulty arises the assumption that kanyan is affected in the bridal chamber also presents no difficulty since usually the bridal chamber is a prelude to intercourse he taught us that it was proper that it should be entered at night Arashi inquired what is the law where a bride entering the bridal chamber became menstruous if you should find some reason for saying that it is the affectionate attachment in the bridal chamber that affects the kanyan all the question still remains whether this applies only to a bridal chamber that is a prelude to intercourse but not to a bridal chamber that is no prelude to intercourse or is there perhaps no difference this remains unanswered are Judah said if a husband wishes he may write out for a virgin etc. Does our Judah hold the opinion that acquittance is written? Surely we learned if a person repaid part of his debt. Our Judah said he must exchange the bond for another. Our Jose said he must write acquittance for him. Our Jeremiah replied here it is a case where the acquittance is written within. Have a replied you may even say that here it is a case where the acquittance is not written within. There it is quite correct to disallow the use of acquittance since the debtor had undoubtedly repaid him and it is possible that the acquittance might be lost and that he would produce the bond and thus collect the paid portion of the debt a second time here. However did he indeed give her anything? It is a mere statement that she addressed to him if then he preserved the acquittance well and good and if he did not preserve it well it is he himself who is the cause of his own loss. One can well understand why Abe did not give it. Explanation as our Jeremiah since it was not stated that the quittance was entered within but why did not our Jeremiah give the same explanation as Abbe the quittance here is forbidden as a preventive measure against the erroneous permitting of acquittance elsewhere the reason for the husband's exemption is apparently because she gave him a quittance in writing if however she had surrendered a portion of her kethuba by word of mouth only he would not have been exempt but why this surely is a monetary matter and our Judah was heard to rule that in a monetary matter one stipulation is valid for was it not taught if a man said to a woman behold thou art consecrated unto me on condition that thou shalt have no claim upon me for food rhyme or conjugal rights she is consecrated but the stipulation is also our Meir our Judah however said in respect of monetary matters his stipulation is valid our Judah is of the opinion that the kethuba is a rabbinical enactment and it Sages have applied to their enactments higher restrictions than to those of the Torah, but what of the case of Yusufruct, which is a rabbinical law, and the rabbis nevertheless did not apply any restriction to it, for we learned our Judah said he may
Remain a mere stipulation thus it follows that he is of the opinion that the man's stipulation is void and that the woman receives her full ketubah yet since the man had said to her you will have but a main her mind is not at ease and his intercourse is regarded as an act of prostitution but surely Armeyer was heard to rule that any stipulation which is contrary to what is written in the Torah is null and void from which it may be inferred may it not that if it is but against the law of the rabbis it is valid Armeyer holds of you that the ketubah is a pentacle institution it was taught Armeyer ruled if any man assigns to a virgin a sum less than two hundred zoos or to a widow less than a mina his marriage is regarded as an act of prostitution Our Jose ruled one is permitted to contract such a marriage Arjuda ruled if the man wished he may write out for a virgin a bond for two hundred zoos while she writes for him I have received from you a mina and he may write a bond. For a widow for a while she writes for him I have received from you fifty zoos is our Jose then of the opinion that one is permitted to contract such a marriage that surely is contrary to the following a woman's catholic may not be made a charge on movable property as a social measure said our Jose what social measure is this their price surely is not fixed and they deteriorate in value now did not the first tanda also say that a catholic may not be made a charge on movable property. Must he not consequently have meant to say this applies only where he accepted no responsibility but where he accepted responsibility the catholic may be made a charge upon them thereupon came our Jose to question even if he did accept responsibility how could the catholic be made a charge upon them when their price surely is not fixed and they deteriorate in value now if there were the diminution in value of the movables is only a possibility our Jose provides against it would he not? Even more so adopt a similar course here where the diminution of the Ketubah is a certainty how now there she did not know it to think of surrendering her rights but here she was well aware of the fact and has definitely surrendered her rights the sister of Rami Bihama was married to Arui Talmud, Mas Ketubah Bothay and her Ketubah was lost when they came before our Joseph he said to them thus said Rab Judah in the name of Samuel this is the opinion of Armeyer but the sages ruled that a man may live with his wife without a Ketubah for two or three years said Abay to him but did not Arnaman state in the name of Samuel that the Halachah is in agreement with Armeyer in his preventive measures if so the other replied go and write one for her when Ardimi came he stated in the name of Arsimian because he in the name of Arjashua Levi who had it from Barkapur the dispute refers to the beginning but at the end she cannot according to the opinion of all surrender any portion of her Ketubah Ar Yohanan, however, stated that their dispute extended to both cases. Said Arabab, the following was explained to me by Ar Yohanan. I and Ar Joshua B. Levi do not dispute with one another. The beginning of which Ar Joshua B. Levi spoke means the beginning of the meeting in the bridal chamber, and by the end was meant the termination of the intercourse. And when I stated that the dispute extended to both cases, I meant the beginning of the meeting in the bridal chamber and the end of that meeting, which is the beginning of the intercourse. When Rabin came, he stated in the name of Ar Simeon B. in the name of Ar Joshua B. Levi, who had it from Barkapur, the dispute refers only to the end, but at the beginning she may so is the opinion of all renounce any portion of her Ketubah Ar Yohanan, however, stated that their dispute extended to both cases. Said Arabab, this was explained to me by Ar Yohanan. I and Ar Joshua B. Levi do not dispute with one another. The end of which are. Joshua B. Levi spoke meant the end of the meeting in the bridal chamber and by the beginning was meant the beginning of the meeting in the bridal chamber and when I stated that the dispute extended to both cases I meant the beginning and the termination of the intercourse said our Papa had not our Abab stated this was explained to me by our Yohanan I and our Joshua B. Levi do not dispute with one another I would have submitted that our Yohanan and our Joshua B. Levi were in dispute while our Dimi and Rabin were not in dispute the end of which Rabin spoke might mean the end of the meeting in the bridal chamber and the beginning of which our Dimi spoke might mean the beginning of the intercourse what does he teach us thereby it is this that he teaches us it is preferable to assume that two Amram differ in their own opinions rather than that two Amram should differ as to what was the view of another Amora mission a virgin is allowed 12 months from the time her intended husband Claimed her in which to prepare her marriage outfit and as such a period I as allowed for the woman so is it allowed for the man for his outfit for a old out thirty days are allowed if the respective periods expired and they were not married they are entitled to maintenance out of the man's estate and if he is a priest may also eat terimah or tarfan said all the sustenance for such a woman may be given of terimah or akiba said one half of unconsecrated food and one half of terimah lover who is a priest does not confer upon his sister-in-law the right of eating terimah if she had spent six months wth her husband and six months wth the lebr or even if she spent all of them with her husband less one day with the lover or all of them with the lover less one day with her husband she is not permitted to eat terimah this was the ruling according to an earlier mission of the court however that succeeded rule Talmud Moscow both be a woman may not eat terimah until she has. Entered the bridal chamber tomorrow whence is this derived our histor reply from scripture which states and her brother and her mother said let the damsel abide with us yamam at the least ten now what could be meant by yamam if it be suggested two days two people it might be retorted speak in such a manner if when they suggested to him two days he said no would they then suggest ten days yamam must consequently mean a year for it is written yamam shall he have the right of redemption but might it not be said that yamam means a month for it is written but a month of yamam I will tell you the meaning of an undefined expression of yamam may well be inferred from another undefined expression of yamam but no undefined expression of yamam may be inferred from one in connection with which month was specifically mentioned Arzara stated that a tanda taught in the case of a minor either she herself or her father is empowered to postpone her marriage one can well understand why she is empowered to postpone the marriage but why also her father if she is satisfied what matters it to her father he might think this now she does not realize what marriage implies but tomorrow she will rebel against her husband leave him and come back to and fall a burden upon me or Abba I stated no arrangements may be made for marrying a minor while she is still in her minority arrangements may however be made while she is a minor for marrying her when she becomes of age is not this obvious it might have been suggested that this should not be allowed as a precaution against the possibility of her beginning to feel anxiety at once and so becoming ill hence we were taught that no such possibility need be considered Arhuna stated if on the day she became adolescent she was betrothed she is allowed 30 days like a widow an objection was raised one who has attained adolescence is like one who has been claimed by her intended husband in marriage does not this Imply like a virgin who was claimed, no like a widow who was claimed, come and here if a woman who is adolescent had waited for twelve months, her husband said, Arlizer, since he is liable for her maintenance, may also annul her vows, read a woman who is adolescent or one who waited twelve months, come and here if a man betrothed the virgin, whether he claimed her and she held back or whether she claimed him and he held back, she is allowed twelve months from the time of the claim, but not from the time of the betrothal, and one who is adolescent is like one who has been claimed. How is this to be understood? If she was betrothed on the day she became adolescent, she is allowed twelve months, while one betrothed is sometimes allowed thirty days, is not this a refutation against Arhuna? It is a refutation what was meant by while one betrothed is sometimes allowed thirty days, our papa replied, it is this that was meant if an adolescent woman was betrothed after twelve months of her. Adolescence have elapsed, she is allowed 30 days like a widow if the respective periods expired and they were not married. Hula stated the daughter of an Israelite who is betrothed to a priest is according to Pentateuchal law permitted to eat terimah for it is written in scripture. But if a priest by any soul the purchase of his money and that woman also is the purchase of his money, what then is the reason why the rabbis ruled that she is not permitted to eat terimah because it might happen that when a cup of terimah will be offered to her in the house of her father, she might give her brother or sister to drink from it. If so, the same reason should apply also where the respective periods expired and they were not married. In that case, he appoints for her a special place now. Then no hired harvest cleaner working for an Israelite should be allowed to eat terimah since it is possible that the household of the Israelite would come to eat with him if they feed him. From their own vittles with the eat of his our Samuel son of Rab Judah explained owing to a bodily defect that might subsequently be detected LF so should not the same reason also be applicable to a woman who had entered the bridal
Sustenance for such a woman may be given of Terumah etc. Abbe stated the dispute applies only to the daughter of a priest who was betrothed to a priest but with respect to the daughter of an Israelite who was betrothed to a priest all agree that she is supplied with one half of unconsecrated food and one half of Terumah. Abbe further stated their dispute relates to one who was only betrothed but in respect of a married woman all agree that she is supplied with one half of unconsecrated food and one half of Terumah. So it was also taught Artarfan said all the sustenance for such a woman is given of Terumah. Arakiba said one half of consecrated food and one half of Terumah. This applies only to the daughter of a priest who was betrothed to a priest but with respect to the daughter of an Israelite who was betrothed to a priest all agree that she is supplied with one half of unconsecrated food and one half of Terumah. This furthermore applies only to one who was only betrothed. But in respect of a married woman, all agree that she is supplied with one half of unconsecrated food and one half of terima. Arjuda Bibathera said she is supplied with two thirds of terima and one third of unconsecrated food. Arjuda said all her sustenance is given to her in terima and she sells it and purchases unconsecrated food out of the proceeds. Arsimian Bigamaliel said wherever terima was mentioned, the woman is to be given a supply equal to twice the quantity of unconsecrated. Vittles, what is the practical difference between them? The difference between them is the question of the woman's trouble. A lover who is a priest does not confer upon his sister in law the right of eating terima. What is the reason the all merciful said the purchase of his money while she is the purchase of his brother if she had spent six months with her husband? Now that you stated that even if she spent the full twelve months less one day with the husband, she is not permitted to. Terima, is there any need to mention also with the lover this is a case of anticlimax this and there is no need to say that this was the ruling according to an earlier mission etc what is the reason Ola or some say our Samuel be Judah replied owing to a bodily defect that might subsequently be detected according to Ola one can well understand the respective rulings of the earlier and the later rulings the former being due to the possibility that a cup of terima might be offered to her in the house of her father and the latter to the possibility of the detection of a bodily defect Talmud Mosque hath both be according to our Samuel be Judah however the earlier ruling of the mission is due to the possible detection of a bodily defect and the later is also due to the possible detection of a bodily defect what then is the reason for their difference the principle underlying the difference is the efficacy of an examination by outsiders one master is of it Opinion that an examination by others is regarded as effective while the other master holds the opinion that an examination by others is not regarded as effective mission. If a man consecrated his wife's handiwork, she may nevertheless continue to work and to consume the proceeds herself. If, however, he consecrated the surplus, only Armeyer ruled it is duly consecrated. Our Yohanan Hasandler ruled it remains unconsecrated. Gemara Arhuna stated in the name of Rabbi, woman is entitled to say to her, Husband, I do not wish either to be maintained by you or to work for you. He holds the opinion that when the rabbis regulated the relations of husband and wife, her maintenance was fundamental while the assignment of the proceeds of her handiwork to her husband was due only to their desire for preventing ill feeling. If, therefore, she said, I do not wish either to be maintained by you or to work for you, she is entitled to do so. An objection was raised, maintenance for a wife was provided in. Return for her handiwork read her handiwork was assigned to her husband in return for her maintenance may it be suggested that our mission provides support for his view it stated if a man consecrated his wife's handiwork she may nevertheless continue to work and to consume the proceeds herself does not this refer to a wife for whom her husband is able to provide maintenance no it is a case where the husband is unable to provide her maintenance if however her husband is unable to provide her maintenance what need was there to state such an obvious case even according to him who holds that a master has the right to say to his slave work for me but I will not maintain you such a rule applies only to a Canaanite slave concerning whom scripture has not written with thee but not to a Hebrew slave concerning whom it is written in scripture with thee how much less than would this apply to his wife it was necessary as an introduction to the final clause if however he Consecrated the surplus only Armeyer ruled it is duly consecrated our Yohanan Hasandler ruled it remains unconsecrated now Arhunaz ruling is in disagreement with that of Reshlakish for Reshlakish stated you must not assume that Armeyer's reason is because he is of the opinion that a man may consecrate that which has not yet come into existence but this is Armeyer's reason since a husband has the right to compel her to work his consecration is regarded as if he had said to her Mayor. Hence be consecrated to him who created them but surely he did not use such an expression since Armeyer was heard to state that a man does not utter his words to no purpose the expression the husband used here may be regarded as if he had actually said to her Mayor. Hence be consecrated to him who created them but is Armeyer of the opinion that a man cannot consecrate anything that is not yet in existence surely it was taught if a man said to a woman be thou betrothed unto me after I shall. Have become a proselyte, or after thou shalt have become a proselyte, after I shall have been set free, after thou shalt have been set free, after thy husband will have died, after thy sister will have died, or after thy brother in law shall have submitted to Eliza from the Shi Armeyer ruled is legally betrothed from that very though the inference may indeed be drawn from this our mission, however, it cannot be inferred if however he consecrated the surplus only Armeyer ruled it is duly. Consecrated when does it become consecrated? Both Rab and Samuel stated the surplus becomes consecrated only after the wife's death are at a Biagab stated the surplus is consecrated while she is still alive in considering the statement our papa argued in what circumstances if it be suggested where the husband allows her maintenance and also allows her a silver my offer her other requirements, what it may be retorted is the reason of those who stated that it becomes consecrated only after. The wife's death if however it is a case where the husband does not allow her maintenance and does not allow her a silver ma offer her other requirements what it may be objected is the reason of him who stated that it is consecrated while she is still alive this is a case indeed where he does allow her maintenance but does not allow her a silver ma offer her other requirements Rab and Samuel are of the opinion that the rabbis have ordained Talmud, Mosk hath both a maintenance for a wife in return for her handiwork and a silver ma in return for the surplus and since the husband does not give her the silver ma the surplus remains hers are at a biagaba however is of the opinion that maintenance was ordained in return for the surplus and the silver ma in return for her handiwork and since the husband supplies her maintenance the surplus is his on what principle do they differ the masters hold that the usual is for the usual and the master holds that the fixed sum is for the fixed quantity an objection was raised maintenance for a wife was provided in return for her handiwork read in return for the surplus of her handiwork come and here if he does not give her a silver ma offer her other requirements her handiwork belongs to her read the surplus of her handiwork belongs to her but surely in connection with the statement it was taught what is the quantity of work that she must do for him the weight of five cellars of warp in Judea etc it is this that was meant what is the quantity of work that she must do in order that we might determine how much is her surplus the weight of five cellars of warp in Judea which is ten cellars in Galilee Samuel stated the Halajah is in agreement with our Yohanan Hasandler but could Samuel have made such a statement have we not learned if a woman said to her husband Konam if I do offer your mouth he need not annul her power Akiva however said he must annul it since she might do more work then is due to him or Yohanan Binuri said he must annul her vow since he might happen to divorce her and she would owing to her vow be forbidden to return to him and Samuel stated the Halachah is in agreement with our Yohanan Binuri when Samuel stated the Halachah is in agreement with our Yohanan Binuri he referred only to the surplus then let him specifically state the Halachah is in agreement with our Yohanan Binuri in respect of the surplus or else the Halachah is not in agreement with the first Tana or else the Halachah is in agreement with our Akiva but replied our Joseph you speak of Konamoth Konamoth are different for as a man may forbid to himself the fruit of his fellow so may he also consecrate that which is not yet in existence said Abbe to him it is quite logical that a man should be entitled to forbid the use of the fruit of his fellows to himself since he may also forbid his own fruit to his fellow should he however have the right to forbid something that is not yet in Existence seeing that no man has the right to forbid the fruit of his fellow to his fellow but replied Arhuna son of Arjashua that is a case where the woman said my hands shall be consecrated to him who created them such consecration being valid since her hands are in
Edie Demert are these cases similar there it is in his power to redeem it but here she has no power to divorce herself this is rather similar to the case of a man who said to his fellow this field which I have mortgaged to you for 10 years shall be consecrated when I shall have redeemed it where it becomes consecrated are Ashi Demert are these cases similar there he has the power to redeem it at least after 10 years but here she has never the power to divorce herself but replied are Ashi you. Speak of Konamoth Konamoth are different from ordinary vows since they affect the consecration of the body itself and the reason here is the same as that of Rabba for Rabba stated consecration love and food and manumission cancel a mortgage they should then become consecrated forthwith the rabbis have imparted force to a husband's rights over his wife so that they shall not become consecrated forthwith mission the following are the kinds of work which a woman must perform for her husband. Grinding corn baking bread washing clothes cooking suckling her child making ready his bed and working in wool if she brought him one bond woman she need not do any grinding or baking or washing if she brought two bond women she need not even cook or suckle her child if three she need neither make ready his bed nor work in wool if four she may lounge in an easy chair our Eliza said even if she brought him a hundred bond women he may compel her to work in wool for idleness leads to unchastity R. Simeon B. Gamaliel said even if a man forbade his wife under a vow to do any work he must divorce her and give her kethu but to her for idleness leads to idiocy Gamara grinding corn how could you imagine this read attending to the grinding and if you prefer I might say with the hand mill our mission does not agree with the view of our high for our high taught a wife should be taken mainly for the sake of her beauty mainly for the sake of children and our high further taught a wife is mainly for the Wearing of a woman's finery and our high further taught he who wishes his wife to look graceful should clothe her in linen garments he who wishes his daughter to have a bright complexion let him on the approach of her maturity feed her with young cows and give her milk to drink suckling her child must it be assumed that our mission does not agree with the view of Beth Shammai for was it not taught if a woman vowed not to sickle her child she must said Beth Shammai pull the breast out of its mouth and Beth Hillel said her husband may compel her to suckle it if she was divorced he cannot compel her but if the child knows her her husband pays her the fee and may compel her to suckle it in order to avert danger it may be said to be in agreement even with the view of Beth Shammai but here we are dealing with such a case for instance where the woman made a vow and her husband confirmed it Beth Shammai being of the opinion that he has thereby put his finger between her teeth. While Beth Hillel hold that it is she that has put her finger between her teeth, then let them express their disagreement as regards a kethu. But generally, furthermore, it was taught Beth Shammai said she need not suckle her child. But clearly, our mission is not in agreement with the view of Beth Shammai. If the child knows her Talmud, Mas Ketha both had one age Rabba in the name of our Jeremiah B. Abba who had it from Rab replied three months. Samuel, however, said thirty days. While our Isaac stated in the name of our Yohanan fifty days, our Shammai B. Abba stated the Halachah is in agreement with the statement of our Isaac, which was made in the name of our Yohanan. One can well understand the respective views of Rab and our Yohanan since they are guided by the child's keenness of perception. According to Samuel, however, is such precocity at all possible? When Rami B. Ezekiel came, he said, Pay no regard to those rules which my brother Judah laid down in the name of Samuel for the said Samuel as soon as. The child knows her a divorced woman once came to Samuel declaring her refusal to suckle her son go he said to our Dimi B. Joseph and test her case he went and placed her among a row of women and taking hold of her child carried him in front of them when he came up to her the child looked at her face with joy but she turned her eye away from him lift up your eyes he called to her come take away your son how does a blind child know its mother are as she said by the smell and the taste are rabbis taught a child must be breastfed for 24 months from that age onwards he is to be regarded as one who sucks an abominable thing these are the words of our Eliza our Joshua said he may be breastfed even for four or five years if however he ceased after the 24 months and started again he is to be regarded as sucking an abominable thing the master said from that age onwards he is to be regarded as one who sucks an abominable thing but I could point out a contradiction as it might have been presumed that human milk is forbidden since such prohibition may be deduced from the following logical argument if in the case of a beast in respect of which the law of contact has been relaxed the use of its milk has nevertheless been restricted how much more should the use of his milk be restricted in the case of a human being in respect of whom the law of contact has been restricted hence it was specifically stated the camel because it shook the cut it is unclean. Unto you only it is unclean human milk however is not unclean but clean as it might also have been presumed that only human milk is excluded because the use of milk is not equally forbidden in all cases but that human blood is not excluded since the prohibition of eating blood is equally applicable in all cases hence it was specifically stated it only it is forbidden human blood however is not forbidden but permitted and in connection with this teaching our has stated even. A rabbinical ordinance of abstinence is not applicable to it. This is no difficulty. The latter refers to milk that has left the breast, whereas the former refers to milk which has not left the breast. This law, however, is reversed in the case of blood, as it was taught. Human blood which is found upon a loaf of bread must be scraped off, and the bread may only then be eaten, but that which is between the teeth may be sucked without any scruple. The master stated, Our Joshua said he may be breastfed even for four or five years, but was it not taught that Our Joshua said even when he carries his bundle on his shoulders, both represent the same age. Our Joseph stated the Halachah is in agreement with Our Joshua. It was taught, Our Marina said a man suffering from an attack on the chest may suck milk from a beast on the Sabbath. What is the reason sucking is an act of unusual unloading against which where pain is involved? No preventive measure has been enacted by the rabbis. Our Joseph. Stated the Halachah is in agreement with our Marinus. It was taught Nahum the Galatians stated if rubbish was collected in a gutter it is permissible to crush it with one's foot quietly on the Sabbath and one need have no scruples about the matter what is the reason such repair is carried out in an unusual manner against which when loss is involved the rabbis enacted no preventive measure our Joseph stated the Halachah is in agreement with the ruling of Nahum the Galatian if he ceased however after the twenty four months and started again he is to be regarded as one who sucks an abominable thing and for how long our Judah Behabal replied in the name of Samuel for three days others read our Judah Behabal recited before Samuel for three days our rabbis taught a nursing mother whose husband died within twenty four months of the birth of their child shall neither be betrothed nor married again Talmud Mosketha both be until the completion of the twenty four months so our Meir our Judah however Permits remarriage after 18 months said our Nathan B. Joseph those surely are the very words of Beth Shammai and these are the very words of Beth Hillel for Beth Shammai ruled 24 months while Beth Hillel ruled 18 months our Simeon B. Gamaliel replied I will explain according to the view that a child must be breastfed for 24 months a nursing mother is permitted to marry again after 21 months and according to the view that it is to be breastfed for 18 months she may marry again after 15 months because a nursing mother's milk deteriorates only 3 months after her conception Ola stated the Halachah is in agreement with the ruling of our Judah and Marakba stated our Hannah permitted me to marry a nursing woman 15 months after the birth of her child Abbe's Medea once came to Abbe and asked him is it permissible to betroth a nursing woman 15 months after her child's birth the other answered him in the First place, whenever there is disagreement between our Meir and our Judah, the Halachah is in agreement with the view of our Judah, and furthermore, in a dispute between Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel, the Halachah is in agreement with the view of Beth Hillel, and Walula said the Halachah is in agreement with our Judah. Marakba stated, Our Hannah permitted me to marry a nursing woman 15 months after the birth of her child. How much more then is there no need for you to wait the longer period? Since you only intend betrothal when he came to our Joseph, the latter told him both Rab and Samuel ruled that a nursing woman must wait 24 months exclusive of the day on which her child was born and exclusive of the day on which she is betrothed. Thereupon he ran three parasangs after him, some say one parasang along sand mounds, but failed to overtake him, said Abbe the statement made by the rabbis that even a question about the permissibility of eating an egg with Katha man shall. Not decide in a district which is under the jurisdiction of his master was not due to the view that this might appear as an act of irreverence
Betrothal or marriage forthwith and in connection with this Arnaman stated in the name of Samuel the Halachah is in agreement with Armayur in respect of his restrictive measures as they answered him did not occur to us the law is that if the child died remarriage by his mother is permitted forthwith but if she has weaned him her remarriage is forbidden Marsan of Arashi ruled even if the child died the remarriage of the mother is forbidden it being possible that she has killed it. So as to be in a position to marry it once actually happened that a mother strangled her child this incident however is no proof that woman was an imbecile for it is not likely that same women would strangle their children our rabbis taught if a woman was given a child to suckle she must not suckle together with it either her own child or the child of any friend of hers if she agreed to a small allowance for board she must nevertheless eat much whilst in charge of the child she must not eat. Things which are injurious for the milk now that you said that she must not suckle her own child was there any need to state nor the child of any friend of hers it might have been assumed that only her own child must not be suckled because owing to her affection for it she might supply it with more than the other child but that the child of a friend of hers may well be suckled because if she had no surplus of milk she would not have given any at all hence we were taught that even the child of a friend must not be suckled if she agreed to a small allowance for board she must nevertheless eat much where from our she's hate replied from her own whilst in charge of the child she must not eat things which are injurious what are these Arkahana replied for instance cuscuta like in small fishes and earth have said even pumpkins and quinces are papa said even a palm's heart and unripe dates are as she said even come and fish hash some of these cause the flow of the milk to stop while others cause the milk to become turbid, a woman who couples in a mill will have epileptic children, one who couples on the ground will have children with long necks, a woman who treads on the blood of an ass will have scabby children, one who eats mustard will have intemperate children, one who eats cress will have blear-eyed children, one who eats fish brine will have children with blinking eyes, one who eats clay will have ugly children, one who drinks intoxicating liquor will have ungainly. Children, one who eats meat and drinks wine will have children, Talmud, Mosque have both a robust constitution, one who eats eggs will have children with big eyes, one who eats fish will have graceful children, one who eats parsley will have beautiful children, one who eats coriander will have stout children, one who eats ethric will have fragrant children, the daughter of King Shipper whose mother had eaten ethric while she was pregnant with her used to be presented before her father as his. Principal perfume Arhuna related Arhuna behind and attested us with the following question if she says that she wishes to suckle her child and he says that she shall not suckle it her wishes to be granted for she would be the sufferer what however is the lower he says that she shall suckle the child and she says that she will not suckle it whenever this is not the practice in her family we of course comply with her wish what however is the lower this is the practice in her family but not in his do we follow the practice of his family or that of hers and we solved his problem from this she rises with him but does not go down with him what said Arhuna is a scriptural proof for she is a man's wife she is to participate in the rise of her husband but not in his descent our Eliezer said the proof is from here because she was the mother of all living she was given to her husband to live but not to suffer pain if she brought him one bond woman etc her other duties however she must obviously perform but why let her say to him I brought you a wife in my place because he might reply that bond woman works for me and for herself who will work for you if she brought two bond women she need not even cook or suckle etc her other duties however she must obviously perform but why let her say to him I brought you another wife who will work for me and for her while the first one will work for you and for herself because he might reply who will do the work for our guests and occasional visitors if three she need neither make ready his bed or other duties however she must perform but why let her say to him I brought you a third one to attend upon our guests and occasional visitors because he might reply the more the number of the household the more the number of guests and occasional visitors if so the same plea could also be advanced even when the number of bond women was four in the case of four bond women since their number is considerable they assist one another our Hannah or some say our Samuel bin Amani stated she brought does not mean that she had actually brought but wherever she is in a position to bring even though she has not brought any attendant taught a wife is entitled to the same privileges whether she brought a bond woman to him or whether she saved up for one out of her income before she may lounge in an easy chair our Isaac Bihanani is stated in the name of Arhuna although it has been said she may lounge in an easy chair she should nevertheless fill for him his cup make ready his bed and wash his face hands and feet our Isaac Bihanani further stated in the name of Arhuna all kinds of work which a wife performs for her husband immense true and also may perform for her husband with the exception of filling his cup making ready his bed and washing his face hands and feet as to the making ready of his bed Rabbi explained that the prohibition applies only in his presence but if it is done in his absence it does not matter with regard to the filling of his cup Samuel's wife made a change by serving him with her left hand the wife of Abbe placed it on the edge of the wine cask Rob's wife placed it at the head side of his couch and our papa's wife put it on his footstool our Isaac Bihanania further stated all foodstuffs may be held back from the waiter except meat and wine said our his this applies only to fat meat and old wine Rob said fat meat throughout the year but old wine only in the Tamu season our and Bitalafar related I was once standing in the presence of Samuel when they brought him a dish of mushrooms and had he not given me some of it I would have been exposed to danger I related our Ashi was once standing before our Kahana when they brought him slices of turnips in vinegar and had he not given me some I would have been exposed to danger our papa said even a fragrant date if not tasted may expose one to danger this is the rule any food stuff that has a strong flavor or an acrid taste will expose a man to danger if he is not allowed to taste of it both Abu Abihi and Benjamin Bihi shoot consideration for their waiter the one giving him a portion of every kind of dish while the other gave him a portion of one kind only with the former Elijah conversed with the latter he did not it was related of two pious men and others say of Armari and Arfinehas the sons of Arhista that one of them gave a share to his waiter first while the other gave him last with the one who gave the waiter his share first Elijah conversed with the one however who gave his waiter last Elijah did not converse Amimar Marzitra and Arashi were once sitting at the gate of King Yazdijerd when the king's table steward passed them by Arashi observing that Marzitra Talmud, Moskatha both be Talmud, Moskatha both be turned pale in the face took up with his finger some food from the dish and put it to his mouth you have spoiled the king's meal the table steward Cried, why did you do such a thing? He was asked by the king's officers. The man who prepared that dish, he replied, has rendered the king's food objectionable. Why they asked him, I noticed he replied, a piece of leper swine flesh in it. They examined the dish, but did not find such a thing. Thereupon he took hold of his finger and put it on it, saying, Did you examine this part? They examined it and found it to be as Arashi had said. Why did you rely upon a miracle? The rabbis asked him, I saw he replied, the demon of leprosy hovering over him. A Roman once said to a woman, Will you marry me? No, she replied, Thereupon he brought some pomegranates, split them open, and ate them in her presence. She kept on swallowing all the saliva that irritated her, but he did not give her any of the fruit until her body became swollen. Ultimately, he said to her, If I hear you, will you marry me? Yes, she replied again. He brought some pomegranates, split them, and ate them in her presence, spit out at once, and Again and again he said to her all saliva that irritated you she did so until the matter issued forth from her body in the shape of a green palm branch and she recovered and working in wool only in wool but not in flax whose view that is represented in our mission it is that of our Judah for it was taught her husband may not compel her to wait upon his father or upon his son or to put straw before his beast but he may compel her to put straw before his herd our Judah said nor may he compel her to work in flax because flax causes one's mouth to be sore and makes one's lips stiff this refers however only to Roman flax our Eliezer said even if she brought him a hundred bond women our Machio stated in the name of our Abbe Ahab the Halachah is in agreement with our Eliezer said our Hannah the son of our Ika the rulings concerning a spit bond women and follicles were laid down by our Machio but those concerning a four lockwood ash and cheese were laid down by our Machia our Papa however said if the statement is made on a Mishnah or a Barry that the author is Armachia, but if on a reported statement the author is Armachio and your mnemonic is a Mishnah is queen, what is the practical difference between them? The statement on bond women are Simeon, Bigamaliel said, etc. is not this the same
Fact is that Bethel derived their ruling from the law of the menstruant on what principle do they differ one is of the opinion that the usual is to be inferred from the usual and the other is of the opinion that what a husband has caused should be derived from that which he has caused Rab stated they differ only in the case of one who specified the period of abstention but where he did not specify the period it is the opinion of both that he must divorce her forthwith and give her. The Kethub Samuel however stated even where the period had not been specified the husband may delay his divorce since it might be possible for him to discover some reason for the remission of his vow but surely they once disputed this question for have we not learned if a man forbade his wife by vow to have any benefit from him he may for thirty days appoint a steward but if for a longer period he must divorce her and give her the Kethub and in connection with this Rab stated this. Ruling applies only where he specified the period but where he did not specify it he must divorce her forthwith and give her the Kethub while Samuel stated even where the period had not been specified the husband may also postpone his divorce since it might be possible for him to discover some grounds for the annulment of his vow both disputes are required for if their views had been stated in the former only it might have been assumed that only in that case did Rab maintain his View since the appointment of a steward is not possible but that in the second case where the appointment of a steward is possible he agrees with Samuel and if the second case only had been stated it might have been assumed that only in that case did Samuel maintain his view but that in the former case he agrees with Rab hence both statements were necessary students may go away to study etc for how long may they go away with the permission of their wives for as long as they desire. Talmud, Mosque Hathabo what should be the usual periods Rab said one month at the college and one month at home for it is said in the scriptures in any matter of the courses which came in and went out month by month throughout all the months of the year are Yohanan however said one month at the college and two months at home for it is said in the scriptures a month they were in Lebanon and two months at home why does not Rab also derive his opinion from this text the building of the holy Temple is different from the study of the Torah since it could be carried on by others then why does not our Yohanan derive his opinion from the former text there the conditions were different because every man was in receipt of relief Rab said aside breaks down half of the human constitution for it is said in scripture sigh therefore thou son of man with the breaking of thy loins and with bitterness shalt thou sigh our Yohanan however said even all the human constitution for it is said in scripture and it shall be when they say unto thee wherefore sighest thou that thou shalt say because of the tidings for it cometh and every heart shall melt and all hands shall be slack and every spirit shall faint and all knees shall drip with water as to our Yohanan is it not also written with the breaking of thy loins the meaning of this is that when the breaking begins it does so from the loins and as to Rab is it not also written and every heart shall melt and all hands shall be slack and every spirit shall be faint. The report of the holy temple is different since the calamity was very severe in Israelite and an idolater were once walking together on the same road and the idolater could not keep pace with the Israelite reminding him of the destruction of the holy temple. The latter grew faint and sighed but still the idolater was unable to keep pace with him. Do you not say the idolater asked him that a sigh breaks half of the human body this applies only the other. Reply to a fresh calamity but not to this one with which we are familiar as people say a woman who is accustomed to bereavements is not alarmed when another occurs men of independence every day what is meant by Tayel and Robert replied day students said obey to him these are the men of whom it is written in scripture it is vain for you that ye rise early and sit up late yet and eat of the bread of toil so he giveth unto those who chase their sleep away and these are Isaac explained are they? Wives of the scholars who chase the sleep from their eyes in this world and achieve thereby the life of the world to come, and yet you say, day students, the explanation, however, said Abbe is in agreement with the statement of Rab who said, A man of independence is one, for instance, like our Samuel Bishalath, who eats of his own, drinks of his own, and sleeps in the shadow of his mansion, and a king's officer never passes his door when Rabin came, he stated, A man of independence is one, for instance. Like the pampered men of the West Arab was once standing in the bathhouse, two slaves supporting him when the floor of the bathhouse collapsed under him by chance, he was near a column upon which he climbed, taking up the slaves with him, or Yohanan was once ascending a staircase, RMI and RC supporting him when the staircase collapsed under him, he himself climbed up and brought them up with him, said the rabbis to him, Since your strength is such, why do you require support otherwise? He replied, What strength will I reserve for the time of my old age for laborers twice a week? Was it not, however, taught laborers once a week? Our Jose, the son of our Hannah, replied, This is no difficulty. The former speaks of laborers who do their work in their own town, while the latter speaks of those who do their work in another town. So it was also taught laborers perform their marital duties twice a week. This applies only to those who do their work in their own town, but for those who do their work in another town, the time is only once a week for ass drivers. Once a week, Rab Hassan of Arhanan said to Abbe, Did the Tana go to all this trouble to teach us merely the law relating to the man of independence and the laborer? The other replied, No Talmud, Mosque hath both be to all, but was it not stated once in six months one who has bread in his basket is not like one who has no bread in his basket? Said Rab Hassan of Arhanan to Abbe, What is the law where an ass driver? Becomes a camel driver. The other replied, A woman prefers one cab with frivolity to ten cab with abstinence for sailors. Once in six months, these are the words of our Eliezer. Our Baron is stated in the name of Rab. The Halacha follows our Eliezer. Our Adabi Ahaba, however, stated in the name of Rab. This is the view of our Eliezer only, but the sages ruled students may go away to study Torah without the permission of their wives. Seven for two or three years, Rab is stated the rabbis relied on our Adabi Ahaba and act accordingly at the risk of losing their lives. Thus, our Rehumi, who was frequenting the school of Rab at Mahuza, used to return home on the eve of every day of atonement. On one occasion, he was so attracted by his subject that he forgot to return home. His wife was expecting him every moment, saying, He is coming soon, he is coming soon. As he did not arrive, she became so depressed that tears began to flow from her eyes. He was at that moment sitting on a roof, the roof collapsed under him. And he was killed. How often are scholars to perform their marital duties? Rab Judah in the name of Samuel replied every Friday night that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. Rab Judah and some say are who not or again as others say are not and stated this refers to the man who performs his marital duty every Friday night. Judah the son of Arhai and son-in-law of Arjane was always spending his time in the schoolhouse but every Sabbath he came home whenever he arrived the people saw a pillar of light moving before him once he was so attracted by his subject of study that he forgot to return home not seeing that sign Arjane said to those around him lower his bed for had Judah been alive he would not have neglected the performance of his marital duties. This remark was like an error that proceeded from the ruler for in consequence Judah's soul returned to its eternal rest. Rabbi was engaged in the arrangements for the marriage of his son into the family of Arhai but when the Ketubah was about to be written, the bride passed away, is there God forbid, said Rabbi, any taint in the proposed union and inquiry was instituted into the genealogy of the two families, and it was discovered that Rabbi descended from Shephesha the son of Abidal, while Arhai descended from Shimei, a brother of David. Later he was engaged in preparations for the marriage of his son into the family of Arhose B. Zimmer. It was agreed that he should spend twelve years at the academy when the girl was led before him. He said to them, Let it be six years when they made her pass before him a second time. He said he would rather marry her first and then proceed to the academy. He felt abashed before his father, but the latter said to him, My son, you have the mind of your creator, for in scripture it is written, First thou bringest them in and plantest them, and later it is written, and let them make me a sanctuary that I made well among them. After the marriage he departed and spent twelve. Years at the academy by the time he returned his wife had lost the power of procreation what shall we do said rabbi should we order him to divorce her it would be said this poor soul waited in vain were he to marry another woman it would be said the latter is his wife and the other his mistress he prayed for mercy to be vouchsafed to her and she recovered our hanani abihak and ai was about to go away to the academy towards the conclusion of our simian bio his wedding wait for me the latter said to him until i am able to join you he however did not wait for him but went away alone and spent twelve years at the academy by the time he returned the streets of the town were altered and he was unable to find the way to his home going down to the river bank and sitting down there he heard a girl
And the threefold court is not quickly broken is a reference to Arashai son of Arhani, son of Bisar Akiba, was a shepherd of Ben Kalbis the latter's daughter. Seeing how modest and noble the shepherd was said to him, Were I to be betrothed to you, would you go away to study at an academy? Yes, he replied, She was then secretly betrothed to him and sent him away when her father heard what she had done. He drove her from his house and forbade her by a vow to have any benefit from his estate. R. Akiba departed and spent twelve years at the academy. When he returned home, he brought with him twelve thousand disciples. While in his hometown, he heard an old man saying to her, How long Talmud, Moskatha Botha, will you lead the life of a living widowhood? If he would listen to me, she replied, He would spend and study another twelve years. Said Arakiba, It is then with her consent that I am acting. And he departed again and spent another twelve years at the academy. When he finally returned, he brought with him twenty four thousand disciples. His wife heard of his arrival and went out to meet him. When her neighbor said to her, Borrow some respectable clothes and put them on, but she replied, A righteous man regarded the life of his beast. On approaching him, she fell upon her face and kissed his feet. His attendants were about to thrust her aside. When Arakiba cried to them, Leave her alone, mine and yours are hers. Her father, on hearing that a great man had come to the town, said, I shall. Go to him, perchance he will invalidate my vow. When he came to him, Arakiba asked, Would you have made your vow if you had known that he was a great man? Had he known the other replied, Even one chapter or even one single halacha, I would not have made the vow. He then said to him, I am the man. The other fell upon his face and kissed his feet and also gave him half of his wealth. The daughter of Arakiba acted in a similar way towards Ben This is indeed an illustration of the proper view. Follows you, a daughter's acts are like those of her mother. Arjoseph, the son of Rabba, was sent by his father to the academy under Arjoseph, and they arranged for him to stay there for six years. Having been there three years and the eve of the day of atonement approaching, he said, I would go and see my family. When his father heard of his premature arrival, he took up a weapon and went out to meet him. You have remembered, he said to him, Your mistress, another version, he said to him, You have. Remembered your dub, they got involved in a quarrel, and neither the one nor the other ate of the last meal before the fast mission. If a wife rebels against her husband, her kathuba may be reduced by seven denarii a week. Arjuda said seven tropaics for how long may the reduction continue to be made until a sum corresponding to her kathuba has accumulated. Our Jose said reductions may be made continually until such time when should an inheritance fall to her from elsewhere, her husband will be in a position to collect from her the full amount. Do similarly, if a husband rebels against his wife, an addition of three denarii a week is made to her kathuba. Arjuda said three tropaics Amara rebels in what respect Arhuna replied in respect of conjugal union. Our Jose, the son of Arhana, replied in respect of work. We learn similarly if a husband rebels against his wife. Now, according to him who said in respect of conjugal union, this ruling is quite logical and intelligible, but According to him who said in respect of work is he it may be objected under any obligation at all to work for her yes rebellion being possible when he declares I will neither sustain nor support my wife but did not rap state if a man says I will neither sustain nor support my wife he must divorce her and give her the kathuba is it not necessary to consult him before ordering him to divorce her an objection was raised the same law is applicable to a woman betrothed or married even to a man's true and even to a sick woman and even to one who was awaiting the decision of the lover now according to him who said in respect of conjugal union it is quite correct to mention the sick Talmud Mos both be but according to him who said in respect of work is a sick woman it may be objected fit to do work the fact however is that in respect of conjugal union all agree that a wife who refuses is regarded as a rebellious woman they differ only in respect of work one Master is of the opinion that for a refusal of work a wife is not to be regarded as rebellious and the other master holds the opinion that for a refusal of work also a wife is regarded as rebellious to turn to the main text if a wife rebels against her husband her kathuba may be reduced by seven denarii a week Arjuda said seven tropaics our masters however took a second vote and ordained that an announcement regarding her shall be made on four consecutive sabbaths and that then the court shall send her the following warning be it known to you that even if your kathuba is for a hundred mena you have forfeited it the same law is applicable to a woman betrothed or married even to a menstruant even to a sick woman and even to one who is awaiting the decision of the lover said our high be Joseph to Samuel is a menstruant capable of conjugal union the other replied one who has bread in his basket is not like one who has no bread in his basket Rami Biham stated that Announcement concerning her is made only in the synagogues and the houses of study said Rabbi this may be proved by a deduction it having been taught four Sabbaths consecutively this is decisive Rami Bihani further stated the warning is sent to her from the court twice once before the announcement and once after the announcement Arnam and Bihar Hista stated in his discourse the Halacha is in agreement with our masters Rabbi remarked this is senseless said Arnam and Bihar Isaac to him wherein lies its senselessness I in fact told it to him and it was in the name of a great man that I told it to him and who is it our Jose the son of Arhana whose view then is he following the first of the undermentioned for it was stated Rabbi said in the name of Arshis hate the Halacha is that she is to be consulted while Arhuna Bijuda stated in the name of Arshis hate the Halacha is that she is not to be consulted what is to be understood by rebellious woman Amimar said one who says I like him but wish to torment him if she said however he is repulsive to me no pressure is to be brought to bear upon her Marzitra rule pressure is to be brought to bear upon her such a case once occurred and Marzitra exercised pressure upon the woman and as a result of the reconciliation that ensued Arhanan of Surah was born from the reunion this however was not the right thing to do the successful result was due to the help of Providence Arzibit's daughter-in-law rebelled against her husband and took possession of her silk cloak Amimar Marzitra and Arashi were sitting together and Argamda sat beside them and in the course of the session they laid down the law of a wife rebel she forfeits her worn out clothing that may still be in existence said Argamda to them is it because Arzibit is a great man that you would flatter him surely Arkahana stated that Rabba had only raised this question but had not solved it another version in the course of their session they decided if a wife Rebel, she does not forfeit her worn out clothing that may still be in existence, said Argamda to them. Talmud, Moskatha both is it because Arzibit is a great man that you turn the law against him. Surely Arkahana stated that Rabba had only raised the question but had not solved it now that it has not been stated what the law is. Such clothing is not to be taken away from her if she has already seized them, but if she has not yet seized them, they are not to be given to her. We also make her wait. Twelve months a full year for her divorce, and during these twelve months she receives no maintenance from her husband. Artobi Bikis has stated in the name of Samuel a certificate of rebellion may be written against the betrothed woman, but no such certificate may be written against one who is awaiting the decision of the lover. An objection was raised. The same law is applicable to a woman betrothed or married, even to a menstruant, even to a sick woman, and even to one who is awaiting the decision. Of the lover, this is no contradiction. The one refers to the case where the man claimed her, the other to that where she claimed him. For our Talafa Biyabami stated in the name of Samuel, if he claimed her, he is attended to. If she claimed him, she is not attended to. To what case did you explain the statement of Samuel as referring to the one where she claimed him? But if so, instead of saying a certificate of rebellion may be written against a betrothed woman, it should have been said on behalf of a betrothed woman. This is no difficulty. Read on behalf of a betrothed woman, wherein does a woman awaiting the decision of the lover differ from the man that no certificate of rebellion should be issued on her behalf? Obviously, because we tell her, go, you are not commanded to marry. But then a betrothed woman also should be told, go, you are not commanded to marry again. Should it be explained to be one where she comes with the plea saying, I wish to have a staff in my hand and a spade for? My burial this then should also apply to a woman awaiting the decision of the lover if she comes with such a plea the proper explanation then must be this both statements refer to the case where the man claimed and yet there is no difficulty since one may refer to the performance of Eliza and the other to that of the Levirate marriage for our pet stated in the name of our Yohanan if the lover claimed her for the performance of Eliza his request is to be attended to but if he claimed her for the Levirate marriage his request is disregarded why is he not attended to when he claims her for the Levirate marriage naturally because
respect is he different from his wife that he is allowed a reduction for the Sabbath and in what respect is she different from him that she is not allowed an addition for the Sabbath in her case since it is a reduction that is made the seventh trope eight, the husband gains does not have the appearance of Sabbath pay in his case however since it is additions that are made Talmud, Mosque have both be another addition for the seventh day would have the appearance of Sabbath pay are high be. Joseph further asked of Samuel what is the reason for the distinction between a man who rebels against his wife and a woman who rebels against her husband. The other replied, Go and learn it from the market of the harlots who hires whom another explanation. The manifestation of his passions is external. Hers is internal mission. If a man maintains his wife through a trustee, he must give her every week not less than two kbs of wheat or four kbs of barley. Said our Jose only our Ishmael who lived near Edom granted her a supply of barley. He must also give her half a kb of pulse and half a log of oil and a kb of dried figs or a mana of pressed figs. And if he has no such fruit, he must supply her with a corresponding quantity of other fruit. He must also provide her with a bed, a mattress, and a rush mat. He must also give her once a year a cap for her head and a girdle for her loins. Shoes. He must give her each major festival and clothing of the value of fifty zuz every year. She is not to be given new clothes in the summer or worn out clothes in the winter but must be given the clothing of the value of 50 ZUZ during the winter and she clothes herself with them when they are worn out during the summer and the worn out clothes remain her property he must also give her every week a silver ma'af for her other requirements and she is to eat with him on the night of every Sabbath if he does not give her a silver ma'af for her other requirements her handiwork belongs to her and what I ask the quantity of work that she must do for him the weight of 5 cellars of warp in Judea which amounts to 10 cellars in Galilee or the weight of 10 cellars of wolf in Judea which amounts to 20 cellars in Galilee if she was nursing her child her handiwork is reduced and her maintenance is increased all this applies to the poorest in Israel but in the case of a member of the better classes all is fixed according to the dignity of his position Gamara whose view is represented in our mission. It seems to be neither that of our Yohanan be Barakin nor that of our Simeon, for we learned and what must be its size food for two meals for each. The quantity being the food one eats on weekdays and not on the Sabbath. So our Mayor, our Judah said, is on the Sabbath and not as on weekdays, and both intended to give a lenient ruling. Our Yohanan be Barakin said, a loaf that is purchased for a Japantian when the cost of wheat is at the rate of four se off for a seller. Our Simeon said, two thirds of a loaf, three of which are made from a cab. Half of this loaf is the size prescribed for a leper's house, and half of its half renders one's body unfit, and half of the half of its half to be susceptible to levitical uncleanness. Now, whose view is that expressed in our mission? If it be suggested that it is that of our Yohanan be Barakin, the prescribed two kbs would only be sufficient for eight meals, and if the suggestion is that it is that of our Simeon, the two kbs would be. Sufficient even for 18 meals, our mission may in fact represent the view of our Yohanan B. Baraka, but as our Hizda said elsewhere, deduct a third of them for the profit of the shopkeeper, so here also take a third and add to them, but do not the meals still amount only to 12. She eats with him on Friday nights. This is satisfactory according to him who explained to eat in our mission as actual eating, what however can be said according to him who explained eating to mean. Intercourse furthermore would not her total number of meals still be only 13. The proper answer is really this as our Hizda said elsewhere, deduct a half for the profit of the shopkeeper, so here also take a half and add to them. Does not a contradiction arise between the two statements of our Hizda? There is no contradiction. One statement refers to a place where the sellers of the wheat supply also would, while the other refers to a place where they do not supply the wood, if so, the number. Of meals is 16 with whose view then would our mission agree with our Hitka who ruled a man must eat on the Sabbath four meals it may be said to represent even the view of the rabbis for one meal is to be reserved for guests and occasional visitors now that you have arrived at this position our mission may be said to represent even the view of our Simeon for according to the rabbis three meals should be deducted for guests and occasional visitors and according to our Hitka two only are to be deducted for guests and occasional visitors said our Jose only granted a supply of barley etc do they eat barley at Edom only and throughout the world none I has eaten it is this that he meant only our Ishmael who lived near Edom granted a supply of barley equal to twice the quantity of wheat because the Edomian barley was of an inferior quality the man must also give her half a cab of pulse wine however is not mentioned this provides support for a view of our Eliezer for our Eliezer stated Talmud. Mosque both the Talmud, Mosque both no allowance for wine is made for a woman and should you point out the scriptural text I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water my wool and my flax my oil and my drink it may be replied that the reference is to things which a woman desires and what are the jewelry are Judah of Farnabri others say of Farnabri made the following exposition whence is it derived that no allowance for wines is made for a woman from scripture in which it is said so Hannah rose up after she had eaten in Shiloh and after drinking only he had drunk but she did not drink now then would you also interpret she had eaten that he did not eat what we say is that the deduction may be made because the text has deliberately been changed for consider it was dealing with her why did it change the form consequently it may be deduced that it was he who drank and that she did not drink an objection was raised if a woman is Accustomed to drink, she is given an allowance of drink where she is accustomed to drink. The case is different for our Hina Nabi Kahana stated in the name of Samuel. If she was accustomed to drink, she is given an allowance of one cup. If she was not accustomed to it, she is given an allowance of two cups. What does he mean? Abe replied, It is this that he means if she was in the habit of drinking two cups in the presence of her husband, she is given one cup in his absence. If she is used to drink in the presence of her husband, only one cup, she is given none at all in his absence. And if you prefer, I might say, If she is used to drink, she is allowed some wine for her puddings. Only for our Abbas stated in the name of our Yohanan, it happened that when the sages granted the daughter in law of Nakim and Gigorian a weekly allowance of two SEAHS of wine for her puddings, she said to them, May you grant such allowances to your daughters. Atana taught she was a woman awaiting the decision of. The lover hence they did not reply amen after her attended taught one cup is becoming to a woman two are degrading and if she has three she solicits publicly but if she has four she solicits even an ass in the street and cares not Rabbah said this was taught only in respect of a woman whose husband is not with her but if her husband is with her the objection to her drinks does not arise but surely there is the case of Hannah whose husband was with her with a guest it is different for our who not stated whence is it inferred that a guest is forbidden marital union from scripture in which it is said and they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Rama and Elkanah knew Hannah his wife and the Lord remembered her only then but not before home Abbe's wife came to Rabbah and asked him grant me an allowance of board and he granted her the allowance grant me she again demanded an allowance of wine I know he said to her that Namani did not drink wine by the life of the master I swear she replied that he gave me to drink from horns like this as she was showing it to him her arm was uncovered and a light shone upon the court Robber Rose went home and solicited Aristas daughter who has been today at the court inquired Aristas daughter home of the wife of Abbe he replied thereupon she followed her striking her with the straps of a chest until she chased her out of all Mahusa you have she said to her already killed three men and now you come to kill another man the wife of our Joseph the son of Rabba came before our Nehemiah the son of our Joseph and said to him grant me an allowance of board and he granted her grant me also an allowance of wine she demanded and he granted her I know he said to her that the people of Mahusa drink wine the wife of our Joseph the son of Armanish Abdul came before our Joseph and said to him grant me an allowance of board and he granted her grant me she said an allowance of Wine and he granted her grant me she said again an allowance of silks why silks he asked for your sake she replied and for the sake of your friend and for the sake of your associates he must also provide her with a bed a mattress etc why should he give her a mattress and a rush mat our papa replied this is done only in a place where it is a practice to girt the bed with ropes which would hurt her our rabbis taught she is not given a cushion and a bolster in the name of our Nathan it was stated she is given a cushion and a bolster how is this to be understood if it is a case where she is used to it what it may be objected is the reason of the first tana and if it is a case where she is not used
Objected would a poor man obtain fifty zoos consequently it must be concluded that the meaning is fifty small zoos she is not to be given new etc. Our rabbis taught any surplus of food belongs to the husband while any surplus of worn out clothes belongs to the woman you said any surplus of worn out clothes belongs to the woman of what use are they to her of a reply for putting on during the days of her menstruation so that she may not by the constant wearing of the same clothes become repulsive to her husband have a stated we have a tradition that the surplus of the worn out clothes of a widow belongs to her husband's heirs for the reason in the former cases that she shall not become repulsive to her husband but in this case let her be ever so repulsive he must also give her every week a silver ma etc. What is meant by she is to eat our nomin replied actual eating our ashi replied intercourse we have learned she is to eat with him on the night of every sabbath now. According to him who said actual eating it is quite correct to use the expression she is to eat according to him however who said intercourse why it may be asked was the expression she is to eat used it is a euphemism as it is written in scripture she eat and wipe her mouth and said I have done no wickedness an objection was raised our Simeon B. Gamaliel said she is to eat with him on the night of the Sabbath and on the Sabbath day now according to him who said actual eating it is correct to state and on the Sabbath day according to him however who said intercourse is there any intercourse on the Sabbath day did not our who not state the Israelites are holy and do not have intercourse in the daytime but surely Rabbah stated it is permitted in a dark room if she was nursing her child Arlo the great mate at the prince's door the following exposition although it was said a man is under no obligation to maintain his sons and daughters when they are minors he must maintain then while they are very young how long until the age of six in accordance with the view of R.C. for R.C. stated a child of the age of six is exempt by the Arab of his mother whence is this derived from a statement if she was nursing her child her handiwork is reduced and her maintenance is increased what can be the reason surely because he must eat together with her but is it not possible that the reason is because she ailing if that were the case it should have been stated if she was ailing why then was it stated if she was nursing but is it not possible that it was this that we were taught that nursing mothers are commonly ailing it was stated what is the addition that he makes for her R. Joshua B. Levi said she is given an additional allowance for wine because wine is beneficial for lactation C.H.A.P.T.E.R.B. I mission a wife's find and her handiwork belong to her husband and of her inheritance he has the use of during her lifetime any compensation for an Indignity or blemish that may have been inflicted upon her belongs to her Arjuna B. But they were ruled when in privacy she receives two thirds of the compensation while he receives one third. But when in public he receives two thirds and she receives one third, his share is to be given to him forthwith. But with her his land is to be bought and he enjoys the use of rock tomorrow. What does he teach us? This surely was already learned. The father has authority over his daughter in respect of her betrothal. Whether it was affected by money, by deed, or by intercourse, he is entitled to anything she finds and to her handiwork. He has the right of invalidating her vows and he receives her letter of divorce. But he has no use of rock during her lifetime. When she marries, the husband surpasses him in his rights and that he has use of rock during her lifetime. He regarded this as necessary on account of the law relating to indignity or blemish that may have been inflicted upon her, which is the subject of. A dispute between our Judah Bibathera and the Rabbi Zaytana resided in the presence of Rabbi A. Wife's find belongs to herself, but our Akiva ruled it belongs to her husband. The other said to him now that in respect of the surplus Talmud, Mosketha Botha, which is her handiwork, our Akiva ruled that it belongs to herself. How much more so her find? For we learned if a woman said to her husband, Konam, if I do offer your mouth, he need not invalidate her vow. Our Akiva, however, said he must invalidate it. Since she might do more work than is due to him, reverse that a wife's find belongs to her husband, but our Akiva ruled that it belongs to herself. But surely when Rabin came, he stated in the name of our Yohanan, in respect of a surplus obtained through no undue exertion, all agree that it belongs to the husband, and they only differ in respect of a surplus obtained through undue exertion. The first tan of being of the opinion that even this belongs to her husband, while our Akiva maintains that. It belongs to herself. Our Papa replied, A find is like a surplus gain through undue exertion concerning which there is a difference of opinion between our Akiva and the rabbis. Our Papa raised the question, What is the law where she performed for him two kinds of work simultaneously? Rabbin raised the question, What is the ruling where she did three or four kinds of work simultaneously? These must remain undecided. Any compensation for indignity or blemish that may have been inflicted upon her Rabbi son of Arhinan demurred now that if a man insulted his fellow's mirror, would he also have to pay him compensation for the indignity? But is a horse then susceptible to insult this? However, is the objection if a man spat on his fellow's garment, would he also have to pay him compensation for this indignity? And should you say that the ruling is really so surely it can be retorted? We have learned if a man spat so that the spittle fell upon another person or uncovered the head of a Woman or remove the cloak from a person he must pay 400 zoos and our papa explained this has been taught to apply only where it touched him but if it touched his garment only the offender is exempt an insult to his garment involves no indignity to him but an insult to his wife does involve an indignity to him said Rabbanu to Arashi now then if a man insulted a poor man of a good family where all the members of the family are involved in the indignity must he also pay compensation for indignity to all the members of the family the other replied there it is not their own persons that are insulted here however one's wife is like one's own body mission if a man undertook to give a fixed sum of money to his son in law and his son in law died he made the sages rule say I was willing to give the mentioned sum to your brother but I am unwilling to give it to you if a woman undertook to bring her husband 1000 denarii he must assign to her a Corresponding sum of 15 mina as a corresponding sum for appraised goods, however, he assigns one fifth less if a husband is requested to enter in his wife's catu the goods assessed at one mina, and these are in fact worth a mina, he can have a claim for one mina only otherwise. If he is requested to enter in the catu the goods assessed at a mina, his wife must give him goods of the assessed value of 31 cellars and a dinar, and if at 400 ZUZ, she must give him goods. Valued at 500 ZUZ, whatever Talmud, Mosketha both be Talmud, Mosketha both be a bridegroom assigns to his wife in her catu, but he assigns at one fifth less than the appraised value. Gamara, our rabbis taught there was no need to state that where the first was a scholar and the second an am higher as the father in law can say, I was willing to give the mentioned sum to your brother, but I am unwilling to give it to you, but even where the first was am higher as and the second a scholar. He may also say so if a woman undertook to bring to her husband 1,000 denarii etc. Are not these the same as the case in the first clause? He taught first concerning a large assessment and then he taught also about a smaller assessment. He taught about his assessment and he also taught about her assessment. M-I-S-H-N-A-H If a woman undertook to bring to her husband ready money every cell of hers counts as 6 denarii. The bridegroom must undertake to give his wife 10 denarii for her. Perfume basket in respect of each main. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel said in all matters the local usage shall be followed. Gamara this surely is exactly the same ruling as he must assign to her a corresponding sum of 15 main. He taught first about a major transaction and then taught about a minor transaction and both rulings were necessary for head that of a major transaction only been taught it might have been assumed that it applied to this only because the profit it brings in is large. But not to a minor transaction the profit from which is small hence it was necessary to state the letter and had we been informed of that of the minor transaction only it might have been said to apply to this only because the expenses and responsibility are small but not to a large transaction where the expenses and responsibility are great hence it was necessary to state the former the bridegroom must undertake to give his wife ten denarii for her basket what is meant by basket are Ashi replied the perfume basket are Ashi further stated this ruling applies to Jerusalem only are Ashi inquired is the prescribed perfume allowance made in respect of each main valued or each main for which obligation has been accepted and even if you could find some reason for stating in respect of each main for which obligation has been accepted the question arises is the allowance to be made only on the first day or every day should you find some ground for deciding every day the question still remains whether this applies only to the first week or to every week should you find some authority for stating every week it may be asked whether this applies only to the first month or to every month and should you find some argument for saying every month it may still be
When you signed my Ketubah, I remember he said to his disciples that when I signed the Ketubah of this unfortunate woman, I read therein a million gold denarii from her father's house besides the amount from her father-in-law's house thereupon are Yohan and Vizakai wept and said how happy are Israel when they do the will of the omnipresent. No nation nor any language-speaking group has any power over them, but when they do not do the will of the omnipresent, he delivers them into the hands of a low people and not only in the hands of a low people but into the power of the beast of a low people did not Nakdim and Begorian however practice charity surely it was taught it was said of Nakdim and Begorian that when he walked from his house to the house of study woolen clothes were Talmud, Mosketha both spread beneath his feet and the poor followed behind him and rolled them up if you wish I might reply he did it for his own glorification and if you prefer I might reply he did not act as he should have done as people say in accordance with the camel is the burden and was taught our Eliezer the son of Arzadok said may I not behold the consolation of Zion if I have not seen her picking barley grains among the horses who said on seeing her plight I applied to her the scriptural text if thou know not O thou fairest among women go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids read not thy kids but thy bodies are shaman be abastated in the name of our Yohan and if a wife brought to her husband the bar of gold it is to be assessed and entered in her ketubah according to its actual value an objection was raised broken pieces of gold are like vessels does not this imply like silver vessels which wear out no like gold vessels which do not wear out if so the expression should have been like vessels made thereof and furthermore it was taught a bar of gold is like vessels golden area are like ready money our simian begamaliel said where the usage is not to change them they are valued and are to be entered in the ketubah at the rate of their actual value now to what is our simian begamaliel referring if it be suggested that he refers to the final clause the inference it may be pointed out would be that the first tana maintains his opinion even when the usage is not to change them but surely it may be objected they cannot be used as currency it must consequently be assumed that he referred to the first clause and that it is this that was meant a bar of gold is like vessels and what is meant by vessel silver vessels and our simian begamaliel said it is like gold in area where the usage is not to change them no he may still refer to the final clause but it is a case where with difficulty they can be used as currency and the principles on which they differ is this one master holds of you that since they can be used as currency we allow her the increase and the other master is of the opinion that since they can be used as currency only with difficulty she is not to have the increase if you prefer i might reply all the statement is that of our simian begamaliel but a clause therein is missing and the proper reading is as follows a bar of gold is like vessels gold in area are like ready money this is a case only where it is the usage to change them but where it is the usage not to change them they are to be valued and entered in the ketubah at the rate of their actual value so our simian begamaliel for our Simeon B. Gamaliel holds of you that where it is the usage not to change them they are to be valued and entered in the ketubah at the rate of their actual value but the difficulty nevertheless remains that the expression should have been like vessels made thereof this is indeed a difficulty and if you prefer I might reply we are here dealing with a case of broken pieces of gold are as she said we deal here with gold leaf Arjan a stated the spices of Antioch are like ready money are Samuel B. Namani stated in the name of Aryohan and a woman is entitled to seize Arabian camels in settlement of her ketubah or poppy stated a woman may seize clothes manufactured at B. Mike's for her ketubah or poppy further stated a woman may seize sacks made at Rodia and the ropes of Camunia for her ketubah Rabba stated at first I said a woman is entitled to seize money bags of Mahusa for her ketubah what was my reason because women relied upon them when I observed however that they took the men went out with them into the market and as soon as a plot of land came their way they purchased it with this money I formed the opinion that they rely only upon land mission if a man gave his daughter in marriage without specifying any conditions he must give her not less than 50 ZUZ if the bridegroom agreed to take her in naked he may not say when I have taken her into my house I shall clothe her with clothes of my own but he must provide her with clothing while she is still in her father's house similarly if an orphan is given in marriage she must be given not less than 50 ZUZ if charity funds are available she is to be fitted out in accordance with the dignity of her position Gamara Abbe stated by 50 ZUZ small coins were meant once is the statement inferred from the statement in the final clause if charity funds are available she is fitted out in accordance with the dignity of her position concerning which when it was asked what was meant by funds Rehub explained charity funds now if we should imagine that by 50 ZUZ the actual coins were meant how much it may be asked we to give her even if charity funds are available consequently it must be inferred that by 50 ZUZ small coins were meant our rabbis taught if an orphan boy and an orphan girl applied for maintenance the girl orphan is to be maintained first and the boy orphan afterwards because it is not unusual for a man to go begging but it is unusual for a woman to do. So if an orphan boy and an orphan girl Talmud, Mosque both be applied for a marriage grant the girl orphan is to be enabled to marry first and the boy orphan is married afterwards because the shame of a woman is greater than that of a man our rabbis taught if an orphan applied for assistance to marry a house must be rented for him a bed must be prepared for him and he must also be supplied with all household objects required for his use and then he is given a wife in marriage for it is. Set in scripture sufficient for his need and that which he wanteth sufficient for his need refers to the house and that which wanteth refers to a bed and a table he refers to a wife for so it is said in scripture I will make him help me unto him our rabbis taught sufficient for his need implies you are commanded to maintain him but you are not commanded to make him rich and that which he wanteth includes even a horse to ride upon and a slave to run before him it was related about Hillel. The elder that he bought for a certain poor man who was of a good family a horse to ride upon and a slave to run before him on one occasion he could not find a slave to run before him so he himself ran before him for three miles our rabbis taught it once happened that the people of Upper Galilee bought for a poor member of a good family of Sephoris a pound of meat every day a pound of meat what is the greatness in this Arhuna replied it was a pound of fowl's meat and if you prefer I might. Say they purchased ordinary meat for a pound of money. Arashi replied, The place was a small village, and every day a beast had to be spoiled for his sake. A certain man once applied to our Nehemiah for maintenance. What do your meals consist of? The rabbi asked him of fat meat and old wine. The other replied, Will you consent? The rabbi asked him to live with me on lentils. The other consented, lived with him on lentils, and died. Alas, the rabbi said, For this man whom Nehemiah has killed on the contrary, he should have said, Alas, for Nehemiah who killed this man. The fact, however, is that the man himself was to blame, for he should not have cultivated his luxurious habits to such an extent. A man once applied to rabbi for maintenance. What do your meals consist of? He asked him of fat chicken and old wine. The other replied, Did you not consider the rabbi asked him the burden of the community? Do I? The other replied, Eat of theirs, I eat the food of the all merciful, for we learned it. Eyes of all wait for thee and thou givest them their food in due season this since it is not said in their season but in his season teaches that the Holy One blessed be he provides for every individual his food in accordance with his own habits meanwhile there arrived Rabbi's sister who had not seen him for thirteen years and brought him a fat chicken and old wine what a remarkable incident Rabbi exclaimed and then he said to him I apologize to you come and eat our Rabbi's taught if a man has no means and does not wish to be maintained out of the poor funds he should be granted the sum he requires as a loan and then it can be presented to him as a gift so our Meir the sages however said it is given to him as a gift and then it is granted to him as a loan as a gift he surely refuses to take gifts Rabbi replied it is offered to him in the first instance as a gift if he has a means but does not want to maintain himself at his own expense he is given what he needs as a gift and then he is made to repay it if he is made to repay it he would surely not take again our papa replied repayment is claimed after his death our simeon said if he has the means and does not want to maintain himself at his own expense no one need feel any concern about him if he has no means and does not wish to be maintained out of the poor funds he is told bring a pledge and you will receive a loan in order to raise thereby his drooping spirit our rabbis taught to lend refers to a man who has no means and is unwilling to receive his maintenance from the poor funds to whom the allowance must be given as a loan and then presented to him as a gift thou shalt lend him refers to a man who has the means and does not wish to maintain
Man thrown himself into a fiery furnace and publicly put his neighbor to shame. Whence do we derive this from the action of Tamar? For it is written in scripture when she was brought forth, she sent to her father in law Marakba had a poor man in his neighborhood to whom he regularly sent four hundred zoos on the eve of every day of atonement. On one occasion, he sent them through his son who came back and said to him, He does not need your help. What have you seen? His father asked, I saw. The son replied that they were spraying old wine before him as he so delicate. The father said, And doubling the amount, he sent it back to him when he was about to die. He requested, Bring me my charity accounts, finding that seven thousand of Sijin gold denarii were entered therein. He exclaimed, The provisions are scanty and the road is long, and he forthwith distributed half of his wealth. But how could he do such a thing? Has not already stated it was ordained at a shot that if a man wishes to. Spend liberally he should not spend more than a filth this applies only during a man's lifetime since he might thereby be impoverished but after death this does not matter our Abba used to bind money in his scarf sling it on his back and place himself at the disposal of the poor he cast his eye however sideways as a precaution against rogues our Hannah had a poor man to whom he regularly sent four zoos on the eve of every Sabbath one day he sent that some through his while who came back and told him that the man was in no need of it what our Hannah asked her did you see she replied I heard that he was asked on what will you dine Talmud, Moscow both on the silver colored cloths or on the gold colored ones it is in view of such cases our Hannah remarked that our Eliezer said come let us be grateful to the rogues for were it not for then we would have been sitting every day for it is said in scripture and he cried unto the Lord against thee and it be still unto thee. Furthermore, our high Rabbi of Dipti taught our Joshua B. Korha said, Anyone who shuts his eye against charity is like one who worships idols, for here it is written, Beware that there be not a base thought in thy heart, etc., and thine eye will be evil against thy poor brother, and there it is written, Certain base fellows are gone out, as there the crime is that of idolatry, so here also the crime is like that of idolatry. Our rabbis taught if a man pretends to have a blind eye, a swollen belly, or a shrunken leg, he will not pass out from this world before actually coming into such a condition. If a man accepts charity and is not in need of it, his end will be that he will not pass out of the world before he comes to such a condition. We learned elsewhere he may not be compelled to sell his house or his articles of service, may he not indeed was it not taught if he was in the habit of using gold articles, he shall now use copper ones. Arzibid replied, This is no difficulty, the one refers to it. Bed and table the other two cups and dishes what difference is there in the case of the cups and dishes that they are not to be sold obviously because he can say the inferior quality is repulsive to me but then in respect of a bed and table also he might say the cheaper article is unacceptable to me rather the son of rabbi replied this refers to a silver strigil our papa replied there is no difficulty one refers to a man before he came under the obligation of repayment and the other refers to a man after he had come under the obligation of repayment mission if an orphan was given in marriage by her mother or her brothers even if with her consent and they assigned to her a hundred or fifty zuz she may when she attains her majority recover from them the amount that was due to her arjuda ruled if a man had given his first daughter in marriage the second must receive as much as the father had given to the first the sages however said sometimes a man is poor and becomes Rich or rich and becomes poor, the estate should rather be valued and she be given the share that is her due. Mara Samuel stated in respect of the marriage outfit, the assessment is to be determined by the disposition of the father. All objection was raised. The daughters are to be maintained and provided for out of the estate of their father. In what manner it is not to be said, had her father been alive, he would have given her such and such a sum, but the estate is valued and she is given. Her due share does not provide for refer to the marriage outfit. Arnam and B. Isaac replied, No, it refers to her own maintenance, but surely it was stated are to be maintained and provided for. Does not one of the expressions refer to the marriage outfit and the other to her own maintenance? No, the one as well as the other refers to her own maintenance, and yet there is no real difficulty for one of the expressions refers to food and drink and the other to clothing and bedding. We learned it. Sages, however, said sometimes a man is poor and becomes rich, or rich and becomes poor. The estate should rather be valued, and she be given the share that is her due. Now, what is meant by poor and rich? If it be suggested that poor means poor in material possessions, and rich means rich in such possessions, the inference should consequently be that the first Tana holds the opinion that even when a man was rich and became poor, she is given as much as before. But surely it may be objected he has none to give. Must it not then be concluded that poor means poor in mind, and rich means rich in mind? And yet it was stated the estate should rather be valued, and she be given the share that is her due. From which it clearly follows that we are not guided by the assumed disposition of her father. And this presents an objection against Samuel. He holds the same view as our Judah, for we learned our Judah ruled if a man had given his first daughter in marriage, the second should receive as much as. The father had given to the first why then did he not say the Halachah is in agreement with Arjuda? If he had said the Halachah is in agreement with Arjuda, it might have been assumed to apply only where her father had actually given her in marriage, since in that case he has revealed his disposition, but not to a case where he had not given her in marriage. Hence he taught us that Arjuda's reason is that we are guided by our assumption as to what was her father's disposition. There being no difference whether he had already given her in marriage or whether he had not given her in marriage, the only object he had in mentioning the case where a father gave her in marriage was to let you know the extent of the ruling of the rabbis who maintained that although he had already given her in marriage and had thereby revealed his disposition, we are nevertheless not to be guided by the assumption as to what may have been the father's disposition, said Rabbi Duarhis Dainar. Discourse we stated in your name the Halachah is in agreement with Arjuda the other replied may it be the will of providence that you may report in your discourses all such beautiful sayings in my name but could Rabbah however have made such a statement surely it was taught Rabbi said a daughter who is maintained by her brothers is to receive a tenth of her father's estate and Rabbah stated that the law is in agreement with Rabbi this is no difficulty the former is a case where we have formed some opinion about him the latter is one where we have not formed any opinion about him this explanation may also be supported by a process of reasoning for our Abbi Ahab stated it once happened that Rabbi gave her a twelfth of her father's estate are not the two statements contradictory consequently it must be inferred that the one refers to a father of whom some opinion had been formed while the other refers to one of whom we have formed no opinion this is conclusive proof too. Turn to the main text Rabbi said a daughter who is maintained by her brothers is to receive a tenth of her father's estate they said to Rabbi according to your statement if a man had ten daughters and one son the son should receive no share at all on account of the daughters he replied what I mean is this the first daughter receives a tenth of the estate the second receives a tenth of what the first had left and the third gets a tenth of what the second had left and then they divide again all that they had received into equal shares Talmud, Mosk hath above thee but did not each one receive what was hers it is this that was meant if all of them wish to marry at the same time they are to receive equal shares this provides support for the opinion of Armatina for Armatina has said if all of them wish to marry at the same time they are to receive one tenth one tenth can you imagine such a ruling the meaning must consequently be that they are to receive their tenths. At the same time our rabbis taught the daughters whether they had attained their adolescence before they married or whether they married before they had attained their adolescence lose their right to maintenance but not to their allowance for marriage outfits so Rabbi Ar Simeon B. Eliezer said if they also attained their adolescence they lose the right to their marriage outfit how should they proceed they hire for themselves husbands and exact their outfit allowance Arnam and stated who not told me. The law is in agreement with Rabbi Rabbi raised an objection against Arnam and if an orphan was given in marriage by her mother or her brothers even if with her consent and they assigned to her a hundred or fifty zuz she may when she attains her majority recover from them the amount that was due to her the reason then is because she was a minor had she however been older her right would have been surrendered this is no difficulty the one is a case where she protested the other where she did. Not protest this explanation may also be supported by a process of reasoning for otherwise there would arise a contradiction between two statements of rabbi for it was taught rabbi said a daughter who is maintained by her brothers is to receive a tenth of her father's estate which implies only when she is maintained but not when she is not maintained must it not in consequence be concluded that one statement deals with one who protested
Well as the other movable objects may be seized for it was taught both landed property and movable property may be seized for the maintenance of a while or daughter so rabbi what then is meant by the right to marriage outfit is not the same as that conferred by a condition in a ketubah as it was taught if a man said that his daughters must not be maintained out of his estate he is not to be abated however he said that his daughters shall not receive their marriage outfit out of his estate he is obeyed because the right to marriage outfit is not the same as that conferred by a condition in a ketubah Talmud. Mosque Ketha both Ra inserted the following inquiry between the lines of a communication he sent to rabbi what is the law where the brothers have encumbered the estate they inherited from their father when the inquiry reached him Arhai who was sitting before him asked does he mean they sold it or pledged it what difference call this make the other? Retorted whether they sold it he continued or pledged that the estate may he cease to meet the obligation of marriage outfit but may not be ceased for that of maintenance Esther Rab however if his inquiry related to brothers who sold the estate he should have written to him sold and if his inquiry related to brothers who pledged that he should have written to him pledged Rab wished to ascertain the law concerning both cases and he thought if I write to him sold I shall get satisfaction if he were to send in reply that the estate may be ceased since the same ruling would apply with even greater force to the case where they pledged the estate if however he were to send me in reply that it may not be ceased question in respect of brothers who pledged the estate would still remain if again I were to write to him pledged and if he sent in reply that the estate may not be ceased this ruling would apply with even greater force to the case where they sold. It should he however send a reply that it may be seized the question in respect of brothers who sold it would still remain I will therefore write to him encumbered which might mean the one as well as the other are Yohanan however ruled an estate may not be seized either to meet the obligation of the one or of the other the question was raised did not are Yohanan hear the ruling of rabbi but if he had heard it he would have accepted it or is it possible that he heard it and did not accept it. Come and hear what has been stated if a man died and left two daughters and one son and the first forestalled the others and took a tenth of the estate while the other did not manage to collect her share before the son died are Yohanan ruled the second has surrendered her right said Arhanan is something that is even more striking than this has been said is that an estate may be seized to meet the obligation of a marriage outfit though it may not be seized for that of maintenance and you. Nevertheless, state the second has surrendered her right now. If that were the case, he should have asked him who said it. But is it not possible that he in fact did not hear it at first? And when he finally heard, he accepted it. But there, the circumstances are different. Since the house of the second daughter has now ample provision, said Aryamar to Arashi. Now, then, if she found anything at all, so that her house is amply provided for, would we in such a case also not give her a tenth of it? Is state the other replied, I said, a house amply provided for from the same estate. Amimar ruled the daughter has a legal status of an heiress. Said Arashi to Amimar, should it be desired to settle her claim by means of a money payment? Such a settlement cannot be effected for the same reason. Yes, the other replied, should it be desired? The first asked to settle her claim by giving her one plot of land. Such a settlement cannot be effected for the same reason. Yes, the other replied, Arashi. However, ruled a daughter has a legal status of a creditor, and Amimar also withdrew his former opinion for Arminia, my son of Arnaumi, stated I was once standing before Amimar, and a woman who claimed a tenth of her deceased father's estate appeared before him, and I observed that it was his opinion that if her brothers desired to settle with her by means of a money payment, he would have agreed to the settlement, for he heard the brothers say to her, If we had the money, we would settle with you by a cash payment, and he remained silent and told them nothing to the contrary. Now that it has been said that a daughter in her claim to her tenth has a legal status of a creditor, the question arises whether she is the creditor of the father or of the brothers. In what respect can this matter in respect of allowing her to collect her tenth either from their medium land and without an oath or of their worst land with an oath? Now, what is the law come and hear of the decision of? Rabbanah he allowed the daughter of Arashi to collect her tenth from Mar the son of Arashi out of his medium land without an oath but from the son of Arsama the son of Arashi out of his worst land with an oath Arniamai the son of Ar Joseph sent the following message to Rabbi the son of Arhunazud of Nihardia when this woman presents herself to you authorize her to collect a tenth part of her deceased father's estate even from the casing of handbills Arashi stated when we were at the College of Arkahana we authorized the collection of a daughter's tenth from the rent of houses also Arain and sent this communication to Arhunazud to our colleague who not greetings when this woman presents herself before you authorize her to collect a tenth part of her father's estate when the communication arrived Arshi's hate was sitting before him go Arhuna said to him and convey to him the following message and he who does not deliver the message to him shall fall under the ban Anan. Anan is the collection to be made from landed or from movable property and who presides at the meal in the house of mourning Arshi's hate went to Arainan and said to him the master is a teacher and Arhuna is a teacher of the teacher and he pronounced the ban against anyone who would not convey his message to you and had he not pronounced the ban I would not have said Anan Anan is the collection to be made from landed or movable property and who presides at the meal in the house of mourning. Thereupon Arainan went to Marakba and said to him see master how Arhuna addressed me as Anan Anan and furthermore I do not know what he meant by the message he sent me on Marzi the other said to him tell me now Talmud, Mas Ketha both be how the incident actually occurred the incident the first replied happened in such and such a way Amen the other exclaimed who does not know the meaning of Marzi should scarcely presume to address Arhuna as our colleague Huna what is the meaning of Marziha morning for it is written in scripture thus saith the Lord enter not into the house of mourning etc. Our vow stated whence is it deduced that a mourner sits at the head of the table from scripture wherein it is said I chose out their way and sat at the head and dwelt as a king in the army as one that comforteth the mourners but does not yet him mean one who comforts others are nom and be Isaac replied the written form is Y N H M Marzitra said the deduction is made from here we sar. Marzia Sirahim he who is in bitterness and distracted becomes the chief of those that stretch themselves Rabba stated the law is that payment may be exacted from landed property but not from movable property whether in respect of maintenance Kathuba or marriage outfit mission if a man deposited a sum of money for his unmarried daughter with a trustee and after she was betrothed she says I trust my husband the trustee must act in accordance with the condition of his trust so our are. Jose, however, said, were the trust actually a field and she wished to sell it, would it not be deemed sold forthwith? This applies to one who is of age in the case of a minor, however, there is no validity at all in the act of a minor. Gemara, our rabbis taught if a man deposited for his son in law with a trustee a sum of money wherewith to buy a field for his daughter, and she says, Let it be given to my husband, she is entitled to have her wish fulfilled if it was expressed after her marriage, but if only after her betrothal, the trustee must act according to the conditions of his trust. So our Meir, our Jose, however, said, A woman who is of age has a right to obtain her desire whether it was expressed after her marriage or only after betrothal, but in the case of a minor, whether her wish was expressed after marriage or after betrothal, the trustee must act in accordance with the conditions of his trust. What is the practical difference between them if it be suggested that the practical Difference between them is the case of a minor after her marriage are mayor holding the opinion that even she is entitled to have her wish and our Jose comes to state that even after marriage it is only a woman who is of age that is entitled to have her wish but not a minor in that case what of the final clause in the case of a minor however there is no validity at all in the act of a minor who it might be asked could have taught this if it be suggested that the author was our Jose it could be objected this surely could be inferred from the first clause for since our Jose said were the trust actually a field and she wished to sell it would it not be deemed sold forthwith it follows that only one that is of age who is eligible to effect a sale was meant but not a minor who is ineligible to effect a sale consequently it must be our mayor who was the author of it and a clause is in fact missing from our mission of the proper reading being as follows the trustee must act in Accordance with the conditions of his trust this applies only to a woman whose desire was expressed after her betrothal but if after her marriage she is entitled to have her wish this furthermore applies to one who is of age in the case of a minor however there is no validity at all in the act of a minor the fact however is that the practical difference between them is the case of one who is of age whose wish was expressed after her betrothal it was stated Rab Judah said in the name
They need and in limiting their allowance his object was to encourage them we learned elsewhere with regard to little children their purchase is a valid purchase and their sale is a valid sale in the case of movable objects Rafram explained this has been taught in the case only where no guardian had been appointed but where a guardian had been appointed neither their purchase nor their sale has any legal validity whence is this inferred from the expression there is no validity at all in the act of a minor but might not the case where a trustee had been appointed be different if so it should have been stated in the case of a minor however a trustee must act in accordance with the conditions of his trust what then was the purpose of the expression there is no validity at all in the act of a minor hence it may be inferred that the same law is applicable in all cases chapterbi mission if a man forbade his wife by vow to have any benefit from him he may if it Prohibition is to last not more than 30 days appoint a steward but if for a longer period he must divorce her and give her the Kethuba Arjuda rule if he was an Israelite he may keep her as his wife if the prohibition was for one month but must divorce her and give her the Kethuba if it was for two months if he was a priest he may keep her as his wife if the prohibition was for two months but must divorce her and give her the Kethuba if it was for three if a man forbade his wife by vow that she should not taste a certain fruit he must divorce her and give her the Kethuba Arjuda rule if he was an Israelite he may keep her as his wife if the vow was for one day but if for two days he must divorce her and give her the Kethuba if however he was a priest he may keep her as his wife if the vow was for two days but if for three he must divorce her and give her the Kethuba if a man forbade his wife by vow that she should not make use of a certain adornment he must divorce her and give her the Kethuba Jose rule. This applies to poor women if no time limit is given and to rich women if the time limit is 30 days. Gamara, since however he is under an obligation to maintain her, how can he forbid her by a vow to have any benefit from him? Has he then the power to cancel his obligation? Surely we have learned if a woman said to her husband, Konam, if I do offer your mouth, he need not annul her vow from which it is evident that as she is under an obligation to him, she has no right to cancel her obligation. Similarly, here since he is under an obligation to maintain her, he should have no right to cancel his obligation. This, however, is the right explanation as he is entitled to say to her, deduct the proceeds of your handiwork for your maintenance. Talmud, Mas Kethubot be he in making his vow is regarded as having said to her, deduct the proceeds of your handiwork for your maintenance. If however one is to adopt the ruling. Arhuna gave in the name of Rav or Arhuna stated in the name of Rav a wife may say to her husband I would neither be maintained by nor work for you why should there be no need to annul her vow when she said Konam if I do offer your mouth let it rather be said that as she is entitled to say I would neither be maintained by nor work for you she in making her vow might be regarded as having said I would neither be maintained by nor work for you the fact however is that the explanation is not that he is regarded but that he actually said to her deduct your handiwork for your maintenance if so what need has she of a steward she needs one where the proceeds of her handiwork do not suffice if however her handiwork does not suffice our original question arises again Arashi replied this is a case where her handiwork suffices for major requirements but does not suffice for minor requirements how is one to understand these minor requirements if the woman is in the habit of having them they are surely a part of her regular requirements and if she is not used to them what need has she for a steward the law concerning a steward is required only where she was used to them in her father's house but consented to dispense with them when with her husband in such a case she can say to him hitherto before you forbade me by a vow to have any benefit from you I was willing to put up with your mode of living but now that you have forbidden me to enjoy any benefit from you I am not able to put up any longer with your mode of living and wherein lies the difference between a vow for more and one for not more than 30 days within a period of not more than 30 days people would not become aware of it and the matter would be no degradation to her but after a longer period people would hear of it and the matter would be degrading to her if you prefer I might reply his vow is valid only if he vowed while she was merely betrothed to him but as a betrothed woman however any claim to maintenance yes if the time for the celebration of the marriage arrived and she was not married for we have learned if the respective periods expired and they were not married they are entitled to maintenance out of the man's estate and if he is a priest may also eat terra mawar and then lies the difference between a vow for more and one for not more than 30 days during a period of not more than 30 days an agent performs his mission for a longer period no agent performs his mission and if you prefer I might reply the husband's vow is valid when he made it while she was betrothed to him and she was afterwards married but if she was married afterwards she must obviously have understood her position and accepted it it is a case where she pleaded I thought I shall be able to bear it but now I cannot bear it but granted that such a plea is properly admissible in respect of bodily defects is it admissible However in respect of maintenance clearly then we can only explain as we explained at first he may if the prohibition is to last not more than 30 days appoint a steward does not the steward however act on his behalf Arhuna replied our mission refers to one who declared whoever will maintain my wife will not suffer any loss but even if he spoke in such a manner is not the steward acting on his behalf have we not learned if a man who was thrown into a pit cried that whosoever should hear his voice should write a letter of divorce for his wife the hearers may lawfully write and deliver it to his wife how now there the man said should write but did the man here say should maintain all he said was whoever will maintain but surely our I said in the case of a fire breaking out on the Sabbath permission was given to make the announcement whosoever shall extinguish it will suffer no loss now what does the expression in a fire exclude does it not exclude a case of this kind no it was meant to exclude other acts that are forbidden on the Sabbath rabbi raised an objection if a man is forbidden by a vow to have any benefit from another man and he has nothing to eat the other may go to a shopkeeper with whom he is familiar and say to him so and so is forbidden by a vow to have any benefit from me and I do not know what to do for him the shopkeeper may then give to the one and recover the cost from the other only such a suggestion is permitted but not that of whoever will maintain my wife will not suffer any loss the formula there is no question is here implied there is no question that a man may announce whoever will maintain my wife will not suffer any loss since he is speaking to no one in particular but even in this case where since he is familiar with him and goes and speaks to him directly it might have been thought that his mere suggestion is the same as if he had expressly told him you go and give him hence we were Taught that this also is permitted to revert to the main text if a man is forbidden by a vow to have any benefit from another man and he has nothing to eat the other may go to a shopkeeper with whom he is familiar and say to him so and so is forbidden by a vow to have any benefit from me and I do not know what to do for him the shopkeeper may then give to the one and recover the cost from the other if his house is to be built his wall to be put up or his field to be harvested the other may go to laborers with whom he is familiar and say to them so and so is forbidden by a vow to have any benefit from me and I do not know what to do for him they may then work for him and recover their wages from the other if they were going on the same journey and the one had with him nothing to eat the other may give some food to a third person as a gift and the first may take it from that person and eat it if no third person is available he may put the food upon a stone or a wall and Say behold this is free for all who desire to take it and the other may take it and eat it our Jose however forbids this Rabbah said what is our Jose's reason it is forbidden as a preventive measure against Talmud, Mas a repetition of the incident of Beth Haran Rajuda said if he was an Israelite he may keep her as his wife if the prohibition was for one month etc is not this the same ruling as that of the first ten Abbe replied he came to teach us the law concerning a priest's wife Rabbah replied the difference between them is a full month and a defective month Rab stated this was taught only in the case of a man who specified the period of the prohibition but where he did not specify he must divorce her immediately and give her the Kethuba Samuel however stated even where the period was not specified the husband need not divorce her since it is possible that he might discover some reason for the remission of his vow but surely they had once been in Dispute upon this principle for have we not learned if a man forbade his wife by vow to have intercourse Beth Shammai ruled she must consent to the deprivation for two weeks Beth Hillel ruled only for one week and Rab stated they differ only in the case of a man who specified the period of abstention but where he did not specify the period he must divorce her forthwith and give her the Kethuba and Samuel stated even where the period had not been specified the husband need not divorce her. Since it might be possible for him to discover some reason for the annulment of his vow both disputes were necessary
Between her teeth, therefore, if the husband wishes to annul her vow, he may do so. But if he said, I do not want a wife who is in the habit of vowing, she may be divorced without receiving her kathu. Bar Jose and R. Eliezer said he has put his finger between her teeth. Therefore, if the husband wishes to annul her vow, he may do so. But if he said, I do not want a wife who is in the habit of vowing, he may divorce her, but must give her the kathu. Reverse abuse. Our mayor and our Judah said he has put. And our Jose and our Eliezer said she has put. But is our Jose of the opinion that it is she who put? Have we not learned our Jose rule? This applies to poor women. If no time limit is given, read our mayor and our Jose said he has put. Our Judah and our Eliezer said she has put. But does our Judah uphold the principle of she put? Have we not learned our Judah rule? If he was an Israelite, he may keep her as his wife. If the vow was for one day, read our mayor and our Judah and our Jose said he put. And our Eliezer said she put. And should you find some ground for insisting that the names must appear in peers then read our mayor and our Eliezer said she put and our Judah and our Jose said he put and this anonymous mission is not in agreement with our mayor is our Jose however of the opinion that this applies to poor women if no time limit is given from which it is evident that a husband has the right to annul such vows this surely is incongruous with the following these are the vows which a husband may annul vows which involve an affliction of soul as for instance if a woman said I vow not to enjoy the pleasure of bathing should I bathe or I swear that I shall not bathe or again I vow not to make use of adornments should I make use of an adornment or I swear that I shall not make use of any adornments our Jose said these are not regarded as vows involving an affliction of soul and the following are vows that involve an affliction of soul I swear that I shall not eat meat or that I shall not drink wine or that I shall not adorn myself Talmud, mosque hath both be with colored garments here we are dealing with matters affecting their intimate relations this explanation is satisfactory according to him who maintains that a husband may annul vows on matters affecting their intimate relations what however can be said in explanation according to him who maintains that a husband may not annul such vows for it was stated as to vows on matters affecting their intimate relations are who ruled a husband may annul them or at a bi ruled a husband may not annul them for we do not find that a fox should die of the dust of his den the fact however is that we are here dealing with a case for instance where she made her marital intercourse dependent upon her use of adornments by saying the enjoyment of your intercourse shall be forbidden to me should I ever make use of any adornment this explanation is in agreement with the ruling of Arkahana for Arkahana ruled if a woman said to her Husband, the enjoyment of my intercourse shall be forbidden to you. He may compel her to such intercourse. If, however, she vowed the enjoyment of your intercourse shall be forbidden to me, he must annul her vow because no person is to be fed with a thing that is forbidden to him. But let her not adorn herself and consequently not be forbidden to him. If so, she would be called the ugly woman. But then let her adorn herself and be forbidden intercourse either for two weeks according to Beth Shammai or for one week according to Beth Hillel. These apply only to a case where he, the husband, has forbidden her by vow to have intercourse with him because in such circumstances she thinks he may have been angry with me and will later calm down here. However, since she has made the vow and he remains silent, she comes to the conclusion since he remains silent, he must indeed hate me. Our Jose rule this applies to poor women. If no time limit is given, what is the time limit, Rab Judah? Citing Samuel replied 12 months Rabbi Barhana citing Aryohanan replied 10 years Arhista citing Abami replied a festival for the daughters of Israel adorn themselves on a festival and to rich women if the time limit is 30 days why just 30 days Abbe replied because a prominent woman enjoys the scent of her cosmetics for 30 days Mishnah if a man forbade his wife by vow that she shall not go to her father's house and he lives with her in the same town he may keep her as his wife if the prohibition was for one month but if for two months he must divorce her and give her also the kathuba where he however lives in another town he may keep her as his wife if the prohibition was for one festival but if for three festivals he must divorce her and give her also her kathuba if a man forbade his wife by vow that she shall not visit a house of mourning or a house of feasting he must divorce her and give her also her kathuba because thereby he has closed People's doors against her if he pleads however that his action was due to some other cause he is permitted to forbid her if he said to her there shall be no vow provided that you tell so and so what you have told me or what I have told you or that you shall fill and pour out on the rubbish heap he must divorce her and give her also her kathu gemara this surely is self-contradictory you said he may keep her as his wife if the prohibition was for one festival which implies that if it was for two festivals he must divorce her and give her also her kathu but read the concluding clause if for three festivals he must divorce her and give her also her kathu from which it follows does it not that if it was for two only he may keep her as his wife have a replied the concluding clause refers to a priest's wife and it represents the view of our Judah Rabbi said there is no contradiction for one refers to a woman who was anxious to visit her parents home and it other applies to one who was not anxious then was I in his eyes as one that found peace or Yohanan interpreted like a bride who was found faultless in the house of her father-in-law and she is anxious to go and tell of her success at her paternal home and it shall be at that day saith the Lord that thou shalt call me as she and shalt not call me B.A.L.E. or Yohanan interpreted like a bride in the house of her father-in-law and not like a bride in her paternal home if a man forbade his wife by vow etc. One can well understand that in respect of her prohibition to enter a house of feasting Talmud, Mosque Ketha, both of the reason he has closed people's doors against her is applicable. What point, however, is there in the reason he has closed people's doors against her in the case of a house of mourning? A tanda taught tomorrow she might die and no creature would mourn for her others read and no creature would bury her. It was taught our mayor used to say what is meant by the scriptural text. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men and the living will lay it to his heart. What I say is meant by and the living will lay it to his heart. The matters relating to death let him realize that if a man mourns for other people, others will also mourn for him. If he buries other people, others will also bury him. If he lifts up his voice to lament for others, others will lift up their voices to lament for him. If he escorts others to the grave, others will also escort him. If he carries others to their last resting place, others will also carry him. If however he pleads that his action was due to some other cause, he is permitted. What is meant by some other cause? Rab Judah citing Samuel replied on account of dissolute men who frequent that place said Arashi, this applies only where the place has gained such a reputation, where however it has not gained such a reputation, it is not within the power of the husband. To be though it if he said to her there shall be no vow provided that you tell etc. Why indeed should she not tell it? Rab Judah citing Samuel replied this refers to abusive language or that you shall fill and pour out on the rubbish heap. Why indeed should she not do it? Rab Judah citing Samuel replied because the meaning of his request is that she shall allow herself to be filled and then scatter it in a very that it was taught the man's request is that she shall fill ten jars of water and empty them onto the rubbish heap. Now according to the explanation of Samuel one can well see the reason why he must divorce her and give her also her kathub according to the barita. However the difficulty arises what matters it to her if she does it? Rab B. Barhanna citing our Yohanan replied she cannot be expected to do it because she would appear like an imbecile. Arkahana stated if a man placed his wife under a vow that she shall neither borrow nor lend a window a sieve. Mill or an oven, he must divorce her and give her also her kathubal because should she fulfill the vow, he would give her a bad name among her neighbors. So it was also taught in the Berita if a man placed his wife under a vow that she shall neither borrow nor lend a window, receive a mill or an oven, he must divorce her and give her also her kathubal because should she comply with his desire, he would give her a bad name among her neighbors. Similarly, if she vowed that she shall neither borrow nor lend a window, receive a mill or an oven, or that she shall not weave beautiful garments for his children, she may be divorced without a kathubal because by acting on her wishes, she gives him a bad name among his neighbors. Mission of these are to be divorced without receiving their kathubal, a wife who transgresses the law of Moses or one who transgresses Jewish practice and what is regarded as a wife's transgression against the law of Moses, feeding her husband with untithed food, having Intercourse with him during the period of her menstruation, not setting apart her dough offering or making vows and not fulfilling them, and what I esteem to be a wife's transgression against Jewish practice,
When her husband went and asked him it was found that her statement was untrue if you prefer I might reply on the lines of a ruling of Rab Judah who said if a woman was known among her neighbors to be a menstruant her husband is flogged on her account for having intercourse with a menstruant not setting apart the dough offering how is this to be understood if the husband was aware of the fact he should have abstained from the food if he was not aware of it at the time how does he know? It now the ruling is to be understood as required in the case only where she said to him so and so the baker has ritually prepared the dough for me and when the husband went and asked him her statement was found to be untrue or making vows and not fulfilling them for the master stated once children die on account of the sin of making vows as it is said in scripture suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin etc wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine. Hence and what is the work of a man's hands you must say his sons and his daughters are not and said it may be inferred from the following in vain have I smitten your children in vain implies on account of vain utterances it was taught our mayor said any man who knows that his wife makes vows and does not fulfill them should impose vows upon her again you say should impose vows upon her again whereby would he reform her but say he should provoke her again in order that she should make her. Thou in his presence and he would thus be able to annul it they however said to him no one can live with a serpent in the same basket it was taught our Judah said any husband who knows that his wife does not properly set apart for him the dough offering should set it apart again after her they however said to him no one can live with a serpent in the same basket he who taught it in connection with this case would apply it with even greater force to the other case he however who taught it in connection with the other case applies it to that case only but not to this one because it might sometimes happen that he would eat and what I esteem to be a wife's transgression against Jewish practice going out with uncovered head is not the prohibition against going out with an uncovered head pentacle for it is written and he shall uncover the woman's head and this it was taught at the school of our Ishmael was a warning to the daughters of Israel that they should not go out with Uncovered head pentateuch Galai Talmud, Mosque Hatha Bothi it is quite satisfactory if her head is covered by her work basket according to traditional Jewish practice however she is forbidden to go out uncovered even with her basket on her head R.C. stated in the name of Aryohan and with a basket on her head a woman is not guilty of going about with an uncovered head in considering the statement R. Zero pointed out this difficulty where is a woman assumed to be if it be suggested in the street it may be objected that this is already forbidden by Jewish practice but if she is in a courtyard the objection may be made that if that were so you will not leave our father Abraham a single daughter who could remain with her husband Abbe or it might be said Arkahana replied the statement refers to one who walks from one courtyard into another by way of an alley spinning in the street Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel the prohibition applies only where she Exposed her arms to the public Arista stated in the name of Abami this applies only where she spins rose-colored materials and holds them up to her face conversing with every man Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel this refers only to one who jests with young men Rabbi Barhan related I was once walking behind Arakba when I observed an Arab woman who was sitting casting her spindle and spinning a rose-colored material which she held up to her face when she saw she detached the spindle from the thread threw it down and said to me young man hand me my spindle referring to her Arakba made a statement what was that statement Rabbi replied he spoke of her as a woman spinning in the street the Rabbi said he spoke of her as one conversing with every man Abbas said such transgressions include also that of a wife who curses her husband's parents in his presence Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel this includes also one who curses his parents in the presence. Of his offspring and your mnemonic sign is Ephraim and Manasseh even as Reuben and Simeon shall be mine Rabbi explained when she said in the presence of her husband's son may a lion devour your grandfather Artarfan said also one who screams what is meant by a screamer Rab Judah replied in the name of Samuel one who speaks aloud on marital matters in a very it was taught by screams was meant a wife whose voice during her intercourse in one court can be heard in another court but should not this then have been taught in the Mishnah among defects clearly we must revert to the original explanation Mishnah if a man betrothed a woman on condition that she was not subject to any vows and she was found to be under a vow her betrothal is invalid if he married her without making any conditions and she was found to be under a vow she may be divorced without receiving her ketub if a woman was betrothed on condition that she has no bodily defects and she was found to have such Defects her betrothal is invalid if he married her without making any conditions and she was found to have bodily defects she may be divorced without a ketuba all defects which disqualify priests disqualify women also tomorrow we have in fact learned the same mission also in the tractate kiddushin but here the laws were required in respect of ketuba and the laws concerning betrothal were stated on account of those of the ketuba there the laws in respect of betrothal were required and those concerning ketuba were stated on account of those of betrothal are Yohanan said in the name of our Simeon B. Jehozadak they spoke only of the following vows that she would not eat meat that she would not drink wine or that she would not adorn herself with colored garments so it was also taught elsewhere they spoke of such vows as involve an affliction of the soul namely that she would not eat meat that she would not drink wine or that she would not adorn herself with Colored garments in dealing with this subject are proper raised this difficulty what does it refer to if it be suggested that it refers to the first clause it might be retorted that since the husband objects to vows even other kinds of vows should also be included it refers only to the final clause or as she said it may in fact refer to the first clause but in respect of the vows to which people usually take exception his objection is valid respect of vows to which people do not as a rule. Take exception his objection has no validity it was stated if a man betrothed a woman on condition that she was under no vow and married her without attaching any conditions it is necessary Rab ruled that she shall obtain from him a letter of divorce and Samuel ruled it is not necessary for her to obtain a letter of divorce from him said Abbe Talmud, Mosque Ethabot it must not be suggested that Rab's reason is that because a man has married her without attaching any conditions he has. Entirely dispensed with his former condition Rab's reason rather is that no man treats his intercourse as a mere act of prostitution surely they once disputed on such a principle for it was stated where an orphan minor who did not exercise her right of meon and who when she came of age left her husband and married another man Rab ruled she requires no letter of divorce from her second husband and Samuel ruled she requires a letter of divorce from her second husband both disputes were necessary for if the latter only had been stated it might have been assumed that Rab adhered to his opinion in that case only because no condition was attached to the betrothal but that in the former case where a condition was attached to the betrothal he agrees with Samuel and if the former case only had been stated it might have been assumed that in that case only did Samuel maintain his view but that in the latter he agrees with Rab hence both were required we have learned if he Married her without making any condition and she was found to be under a vow she may be divorced without receiving her ketuba which implies that it is only her ketuba that she cannot claim but that she nevertheless requires a letter of divorce now does not this refer to one who has betrothed a woman on condition that she was under no vow and married her without making any condition this then represents an objection against Samuel Talmud, Mosque Ketha both be no this refers to one who betrothed her without attaching a condition and also married her without attaching a condition if however one betrothed a woman on a certain condition and subsequently married her without attaching a condition which she according to our mission indeed require no divorce if so then instead of stating if a man betrothed a woman on the condition that she was not subject to any vows and she was found to be under a vow her betrothal is invalid it should rather have been stated if a man married a Woman without attaching a condition and she was found to be under a vow her betrothal is invalid and it would be evident would it not that this applies even more so to the former it is really this reading that was meant if a man betrothed a woman on the condition that she was not subject to any vows and then he married her without making any conditions and she was found to be under a vow her betrothal is invalid if however he betrothed her without making any conditions and also married her. Without making any conditions she may be divorced without receiving her ketuba it is only her ketuba that she cannot claim but it is necessary for her to obtain a divorce but why has she no claim to her ketuba because apparently he could plead I do not want a wife that is in the habit of making vows but if that is the case there should be no need for her to obtain a divorce either Rab replied it is only according to rabbinical law that she requires a divorce so also said Aristot is only in accordance with the rabbin
A minor betrothed a woman even if any of them has subsequently sent presents to the woman her betrothal is invalid because he has sent these gifts on account of the original betrothal if however they had intercourse they have thereby affected legal Kanyan Arsimi and Bijuta in the name of Arish male said even if they had intercourse they affect no Kanyan now you surely it is an error affecting only one woman and they nevertheless differ would you not admit that by error is meant an error. In respect of vows know what was meant is an error in respect of that which was worth less than a paratata was not less than that a parata explicitly mentioned if a man betrothed a woman in error or with something worth less than a paratata the latter part is really an explanation of the former what is meant by if a man betrothed a woman in error if for instance he betrothed her with something worth less than a paratata on what principle do they differ one master holds of you that everyone is aware that with less than the value of a parata no betrothal can be affected and consequently any man having intercourse after such an invalid act determines to do so for the purpose of betrothal the other master however holds of you that not everyone is aware that with less than the value of a parata no betrothal can be affected and when a man has intercourse after such an act he does so in reliance on his first betrothal he raised another objection against him if a Man said to a woman, I am having intercourse with you on the condition that my father will consent. She is betrothed to him, even if his father did not consent. Arsimian Bijuta, however, stated in the name of Arsimian, if his father consented, she is betrothed. But if his father did not consent, she is not betrothed. Now, here surely it is a case similar to that of an error affecting one woman, and they nevertheless differ. They differ in this case on the following points. One master holds the opinion that the expression on the condition that my father consents implies on condition that my father will remain silent, and the betrothal is valid because surely his father remained silent. And the other master holds the opinion that the meaning of the expression is that his father will say yes, and the betrothal is invalid because his father, in fact, did not say yes. He raised a further objection against him. The sages agree with our Eliza in respect of a minor whom her father had given in. Marriage and who was divorced in consequence of which she is regarded as an orphan in her father's lifetime and who was then remarried that she must perform Elizabeth may not contract the Levi marriage because her divorce was a perfectly legal divorce but her remarriage was not a perfectly legal remarriage this however applies only where he divorced her while she was a minor and remarried her while she was still a minor but if he divorced her while she was a minor and remarried her while she was still a minor and she became of age while she was still with him and then he died she must either perform Elizabeth or contract the Levi marriage Talmud Mosketha both in the name of Eliza however it was stated she must perform Elizabeth may not contract the Levi marriage now here surely it is a case similar to that of an error affecting nearly one woman and they nevertheless differ in that case also it may be said that they differ on the following principles one Master maintains that everyone is aware that there is no validity in the betrothal of a minor and consequently any man having intercourse after such an invalid act determines that his intercourse shall serve the purpose of a betrothal. The other master however maintains that not everyone is aware that there is no validity in the betrothal of a minor and when a man has intercourse after such an act he does so in reliance on his original betrothal so it was also stated our Ahabi Jacob stated in the name of our Yohan and if a man betrothed a woman on a certain condition and then had intercourse with her she it is the opinion of all requires no letter of divorce from him or Ahab the son of Rika his sister's son raised an objection against him Ahaliza under a false pretext is valid and what is Ahaliza under a false pretext Rush Lakish explained where a lover is told submit to her Ahaliza and you will thereby wed her said our Yohan and to him I am in the habit of repeating a barita. Whether he had the intention of performing the commandment of Eliza and she had no such intention or whether she had such intention and he had not her Eliza is invalid it being necessary that both shall at the same time have such intention and you say that her Eliza is valid but said are you had and this is the meaning when a lover is told submit to her Eliza on the condition that she gives you 200 zoos thus it clearly follows that as soon as a man has performed an act he has thereby dispensed with his condition why then should it not be said here also that as soon as a man has intercourse he has thereby dispensed with his condition the other replied young hopeful do you speak sensibly consider whence do we derive the law of the validity of any condition obviously from the condition in respect of the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben hence it is only a condition that may be carried out through an agent as was the case there that is regarded as a valid condition but one which cannot be carried out through an agent as was the case there is not regarded as a valid condition but is not intercourse an act which cannot be performed through an agent as was the case there and yet a condition in connection with it is valid the reason there is because the various forms of betrothal were compared to one another are all in the name of all in the name of our Eliezer stated if a man betrothed a woman by alone and then had intercourse with her or on a certain condition and then had intercourse with her or with less than the value of a parata and then had intercourse with her she it is the opinion of all requires from him a letter of divorce or Joseph Eva in the name of our Menahem in the name of our I stated if a man betrothed a woman with something worth less than a parata and then had intercourse with her she requires a letter of divorce from him it is only in this case that no one could be mistaken but in the case of the others a man May be mistaken Arkahana stated in the name of Ola if a man betrothed a woman on a certain condition and then had intercourse with her she requires a divorce from him such a case once occurred and the sages could find no legal ground for releasing the woman without a letter of divorce this is meant to exclude the ruling of the following tenet for Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel in the name of Arishmael and she be not seized only then is she forbidden if however she was seized she is permitted there is however another kind of woman who is permitted even though she was not seized and who is she a woman whose betrothal was a mistaken one and who may even if her son sits riding on her shoulder Talmud Mosketha both be make a declaration of refusal against her husband and go away or rabbis taught if she went to a sage after her betrothal and he disallowed her vow her betrothal is valid if one went to a physician who cured her her betrothal is invalid what is it? Difference between the act of the sage and that of the physician. A sage and also vow retrospectively while a physician affects the cure only from that moment onwards. But was it not, however, taught that if she went to a sage and he disallowed her vow or to a physician and he cured her, her betrothal is invalid? Rabbi replied, There is no contradiction. The former represents the view of Armeir, the latter represents that of Arleazer. The former represents the view of Armeir who holds that a man does not mind his wife's being exposed to the publicity of a court of law. The latter represents that of Arleazer who holds that no man wants his wife to be exposed to the publicity of a court of law. What is the source of these statements? The following, where we learned if a man divorced his wife on account of a vow she had made, he may not remarry her, nor may he remarry his wife if he divorced her on account of a head name. Arjuda ruled in the case of a vow that was made in the presence. Of many people he may not remarry her, but if it was not made in the presence of many people he may remarry her. Armeir ruled in the case of a vow the disallowance of which necessitates the investigation of a sage. Her husband may not remarry her, but if it does not require the investigation of a sage, he may remarry her. Our Eliezer said the prohibition against remarriage where the disallowance of the vow required the investigation of a sage was ordained only on account of a vow which requires no such investigation. What is our Judah's reason? Because it is written in Scripture Talmud, Mosketh of and the children of Israel smote them not because the princes of the congregation had sworn unto them, and what is considered many are nominated be Isaac said three men for the expression of days implies two days, and many three are Isaac replied ten for the term congregation was applied to them. Now Armeir ruled in the case of a vow the disallowance of which necessitates the Investigation of a sage he may not remarry her and our Eliezer said the prohibition against remarriage where the disallowance of the vow required the investigation of a sage was ordained only on account of a vow which required no such investigation on what principles do they differ our mayor holds of you that a man does not mind his wife's being exposed to the publicity of the court of law and our Eliezer holds of you that no man wants his wife to be exposed to the publicity of the court of Laura replied here we are dealing with the case of a woman from a noted family in which case the man could say I have no wish to be forbidden to marry her relatives if so consider the final clause where it is stated but if he went to a sage who disallowed his vow or to a physician who cured him his betrothal of a woman is valid why it may be asked was it not stated the betrothal is invalid and explained here we are dealing with the case of
No contradiction. The former refers to perspiration that can be removed. The latter to perspiration that cannot be removed. Rashi said in reply, you are pointing out a contradiction between perspiration and one who is filthy, which in fact are not alike. For there, in the case of priests, it is possible to remove the perspiration by the aid of sour wine, and it is also possible to remove an offensive breath by holding pepper in one's mouth and thus performing the temple service. But in the case of a wife, such devices are for all practical purposes impossible. What kind of a mole is here meant? If one overgrown with hair, it would cause disqualification in both cases. If one with no hair, then again, if it is a large one, it causes disqualification in both cases. And if it is a small one, it causes no disqualification in either. For it was taught a mole which is overgrown with hair is regarded as a bodily defect. If with no hair, it is only deemed to be a bodily defect when large, but when small. It is no defect, and what is meant by large are Simeon B. Gamaliel explained the size of an Italian is Sar Jose, the son of Arhanna, said one which is situated under for it. If it was under for it, he must have seen it and acquiesced. Our papa replied, It is one that was situated under her bonnet and is sometimes exposed and sometimes not. Our his said, I heard the following statement from a great man and who is he or Sheila if a dog bit her and the spot of the bite turned into a scar, such a scar is considered a bodily defect. Our further stated, A harsh voice in a woman is a bodily defect since it is said in scripture, For sweet is thy voice and thy countenance is comely. Our Nathan of Byro learned the space of one hand breadth between a woman's breasts. Our Aha, the son of Rabba, intended to explain in the presence of Arashi that the statement meant that the space of a hand breadth is to a woman's advantage, but Arashi said to him, This was taught in connection with bodily defects and what? Space is deemed normal. Abbe replied, a space of three fingers. It was taught. Our Nathan said, it is a bodily defect if a woman's breasts are bigger than those of others. By how much Armeisha, the grandson of our Joshua B. Levi, replied, in the name of our Joshua B. Levi, by one hand breadth is such a deformity, however possible. Yes, for Rabbi B. Barhan related, I saw an Arab woman who flung her breast over her back and nursed her child, but of Zion it shall be said, this man and that was born in her end. The Most High himself doth establish her. Armeisha, grandson of our Joshua B. Levi, explained, both he who was born therein and he who looks forward to seeing it said, Abbe, and one of them is as good as two of us. Said Rabbi, when one of us, however, goes up there, he is as good as two of them. For you have the case of our Jeremiah, who while here did not understand what the rabbis were saying, but when he went up there, he was able to refer to us as a stupid Babylonian's mission if she was afflicted with. Bodily defects while she was still in her father's house, her father must produce proof that these defects arose after she had been betrothed, and that consequently it was the husband's field that was inundated. If she came under the authority of her husband, the husband must produce proof that these defects were upon her before she had been betrothed, and that consequently his bargain was made in error. This is the ruling of our Meir. The sages, however, rule this applies only to concealed bodily defects. Talmud, Mosque hath both be, but in respect of defects that are exposed, he cannot advance any valid plea. And if there was a bathhouse in the town, he cannot advance any valid plea even against concealed bodily defects because he is assumed to have had her examined by his women relatives. Kamara, the reason then is because the father produced proof, but if he produced no proof, the husband is believed whose view consequently is here expressed obviously that of our Joshua who stated our life. Is not dependent on her statement. Now read the final clause. If she came under the authority of the husband, the husband must produce proof. The reason then is because the husband produced proof. But if he produced no proof, the father is believed. The ruling which expresses the view of our Gamaliel, who stated that the woman is believed, our Eliezer replied. The contradiction is evident. He who taught the one did not teach the other. Rabbi said it must not be assumed that our Joshua is never guided by the principle of the presumptive soundness of the body. For the fact is that our Joshua is not guided by that principle only where it is opposed by the principle of possession. Where, however, the principle of possession is not applicable, our Joshua is guided by that of the soundness of the body. For it was taught if the bright spot preceded the white hair, he is unclean. If the reverse, he is clean. If the order is in doubt, he is unclean. But our Joshua said it darkened. What is meant by it darkened, Rabbi? Replied, it is as though the spot darkened, and therefore he is clean. Rabbi explained the first clause is a case of here they were found, and here they must have arisen, and so is the final clause here they were found, and here they must have arisen. Abbe raised an objection against him if she came under the authority of the husband. The husband must produce proof that these defects were upon her before she had been betrothed, and that consequently his bargain was made in error. Thus, only if she had the defects before she had been betrothed is the husband's plea accepted, but if they were seen upon her only after she had been betrothed, his plea would not be accepted. But while let it be said here they were found, and here they must have arisen. The other replied, the principle cannot be applied if the defects were discovered after she had been betrothed, because it may be taken for granted that no man drinks out of a cup unless he has first examined it, and this man must. Consequently, I've seen the defects and acquiesced. If so, the same principle should apply also to one who had defects prior to her betrothal. Since, however, it is not applied, the presumption must be that no man is reconciled to bodily defects. Why then is it not presumed here also that no man is reconciled to bodily defects? This, however, is the explanation. The principle cannot be applied to defects discovered after she had been betrothed because two principles are opposed to it: the presumptive soundness of the woman's body and the presumption that no man drinks out of a cup unless he has first examined it, and that this man must consequently have seen the defects and acquiesced. What possible objection can you raise? Is it the presumption that no man is reconciled to bodily defects? But this is only Talmud. Mosketha, both the one principle against two principles and one against two cannot be upheld. But where the defects were discovered before betrothal, the principle of the presumptive soundness of her body cannot be applied, and all that remains is the presumption that no man drinks out of a cup unless he has first examined it, and that this man must consequently have seen the defects and acquiesce. But to this it can be retorted. On the contrary, the presumption is that no man is reconciled to bodily defects, and consequently the money is to remain in the possession of its holder. Arashi explained the claim in the first clause is analogous to the claim you. Oh, my father, Amina, but that in the final clause is analogous to the claim you owe me, Amina, Araha, the son of Arawi, raised an objection against Arashi. Our admits that in respect of bodily defects likely to have come with her from her father's house, it is the father who must produce the proof. But why is not this analogous to the claim you owe me, Amina? Here we are dealing with the case of a woman who had a superfluous limb, but if she had a superfluous limb, what proof could be? Brought proof that the man has seen it and acquiesced. Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel if a man exchanged a cow for another man's ass and the owner of the ass pulled the cow, but the owner of the cow did not manage to pull the ass before the ass died. It is for the owner of the ass to produce proof that his ass was alive at the time the cow was pulled. And the tanda of our Mishnah who taught about a bride supports this ruling, which ruling concerning the bride, if it be suggested. Talmud, Mosketha, both be the one concerning the bride in her father's house are the two cases it may be objected alike. There it is the father who produces the proof and receives the cathedral from the husband, while here it is the owner of the ass who produces the proof and retains the cow. Our replied the ruling concerning a bride in her father in law's house, but the two cases are still unlike, for there it is the husband who produces the proof and thereby impairs the presumptive right. Of the father, while here it is the owner of the ass who produces the proof and thereby confirms his presumptive right. Arnaman B. Isaac replied, The support is derived from the case of the bride in her father's house in respect of her token of betrothal. And furthermore, it need not be said that this applies only in accordance with him who holds that a token of betrothal is not unreturnable, but it holds good even according to him who maintains that a token of betrothal is unreturnable. Since his ruling relates only to certain betrothal but not to doubtful betrothal, where the father may retain the token only if he produces proof, but not otherwise, an objection was raised if a needle was found in the thick walls of the second stomach of a ritually killed beast and it protrudes only from one of its sides, the beast is fit for human consumption, but if it protruded from both sides, the beast is unfit for human consumption. If a drop of blood was found on the needle, it is. Certain that the wound was inflicted before the ritual killing if no drop of blood was found on it, it is certain that the wound was made after the killing if the
A categorical statement be made it is the usual practice that so long as one man does not pay the price the other does not give his beast the sages however rule this applies only to concealed bodily defects are nominated stated Talmud, mosque hath both epilepsy is regarded as one of the concealed bodily defects this however applies only to attacks which occur at regular periods but if they are irregular epilepsy is regarded as one of the exposed bodily defects mission a man in whom bodily defects have arisen cannot be compelled to divorce his wife Arsimian B. Gamaliel said this applies only to minor defects but in respect of major defects he can be compelled to divorce her Gamara Rab Judah resided have arisen Hayabi Rab resided where he who resided have arisen holds that the ruling applies with even more force where the defects were since in the latter case the woman was aware of the facts and acquiesced he however who resided where holds that the ruling does not apply. Where the defects have arisen, we learned our Simeon B. Gamaliel said this applies only to minor defects, but in respect of major defects, he can be compelled to divorce her. Now, according to him who reads have arisen, it is quite proper to make a distinction between major defects and minor defects. According to him, however, who reads were what it may be asked is the difference between major defects and minor ones. Was she not in fact aware of their existence and acquiesced? She may have thought that she would be able to tolerate them, but now she finds that she is unable to tolerate them. These are Simeon B. Gamaliel explained our major defects. If, for instance, his eye was blinded, his hand was cut off, or his leg was broken, it was stated our Abu B. Jacob said in the name of our Yohanan the Halachah is in agreement with our Simeon B. Gamaliel. Rabbi said in the name of our Naman the Halachah is in agreement with the sages, but could our Yohanan, however, have made such a statement? Surely Rabbi B. stated. In the name of our Yohanan, wherever our Simeon B. Gamaliel taught in our mission of the Halachah is in agreement with his ruling, except in the cases of Garanters and the latter proof, there is a dispute of Amram as to what was our Yohanan's view. Mission of the following are compelled to divorce their wives a man who is afflicted with boils or has a polypus or gathers objectionable matter or is a coppersmith or a tanner, whether they were in such conditions or positions before they married or whether they arose after they had married. And concerning all these, our Mayor said, although the man made a condition with her that she acquiesces in his defects, she may nevertheless plead, I thought I could endure him, but now I cannot endure him. The sages, however, said she must endure any such person despite her wishes, the only exception being a man afflicted with boils because she by her intercourse will enter him. It once happened at Zadan that there died a tanner who had a brother who was. Also a tanner the sages rule she may say I was able to endure your brother but I cannot endure you Gamar what is meant by one who has a polypus Rab Judah replied in the name of Samuel one who suffers from an offensive nasal smell in the very day was taught one suffering from offensive breath R.C. learned in the reverse order and supplied the mnemonic Samuel did not see studying all our chapter with his mouth who gathers what is meant by one who gathers Rab Judah replied one who gathers dogs excrements an objection was raised one who gathers means a tanner but even according to your own view would not a contradiction arise from our mission which specifies or gathers or is a coppersmith or a tanner one may well explain why our mission presents no contradiction because the latter refers to a great tanner whilst the former refers to a small tanner but according to Rab Judah the contradiction remains the definition is a matter in dispute between tanning for it was taught one who gathers means a tanner and others say it means one who gathers dogs excrements or is a coppersmith or a tanner what is meant by a coppersmith Rashi replied a kettlesmith Rabbi Barhana explained one who digs copper from the mine it was taught in agreement with Rabbi Barhana what is meant by a coppersmith one who digs copper from the mine Rab stated if a husband says I will neither maintain nor support my wife he must divorce her and give her also her kethu bar. Eliezer went and told this reported statement to Samuel who exclaimed make Eliezer eat barley rather than compel him to divorce her let him be compelled to maintain her and Rab no one can live with a serpent in the same basket when our zero went up he found our Benjamin B. Japheth sitting at the college and reporting this in the name of our Yohanan for the statement he said to him Eliezer was told in Babylon to eat barley Rab Judah stated in the name of R.C. we do not compel divorce except in the case of those who are tainted when I mentioned this in the presence of Samuel he remarked as for instance a widow who was married to a high priest a divorced woman or a Haliza to a common priest a bastard or a Nathan to an Israelite or the daughter of an Israelite to a Nathan or a bastard but if a man married a woman and lived with her ten years and she bore no child he cannot be compelled to divorce her or Talafah Biyabami however stated in the name of Samuel even the man who married a woman and lived with her ten years and she bore no child may be compelled to divorce her we learn the following are compelled to divorce their wives a man who is afflicted with boils or has a polypus this is quite justified according to R.C. since only rabbinically forbidden cases were enumerated whilst those which are Pentateuch ally forbidden were omitted according to our Talafah Biyabami however our mission should also have stated if a man married a woman and lived with her for ten Years and she bore no child, he may be compelled to divorce her or Naman replied, This is no difficulty, for in the latter case compulsion is exercised by words. In the former cases, by whips our Abba demurred a servant will not be corrected by words. The fact, however, explained our Abba is that in all these cases compulsion is exercised by means of whips Talmud, Mosque hath both be, but in the former, if she said I wish to be with him, she is allowed to live with him, whilst in the latter, even if she said I wish to be with him, she is not allowed to continue to live with him. But behold the case of the man who was afflicted with boils with whom the woman is not allowed to live, even if she said I wish to be with him, for we learned the only exception being a man afflicted with boils because she by her intercourse will enter him, and this case was nevertheless enumerated there. If she were to say I will live with him under the supervision of witnesses, she would be allowed to remain. With him, but here, even if she were to say, I will live with him under the supervision of witnesses, she would not be allowed to do so. It was taught our Jose related an old man of the inhabitants of Jerusalem told me there are twenty four kinds of skin disease, and in respect of all these, the sages said intercourse is injurious, but most of all is this the case with those afflicted with our eighth, and what is the cause of it? As it was taught, if a man had intercourse immediately after being bled, he will have feeble children. If intercourse took place after the man and the woman had been bled, they will have children afflicted with our eighth, and our papa stated this has been said only in the case where nothing was tasted after the bleeding, but if something was tasted, there can be no harm. What are the symptoms? His eyes tear, his nostrils run, spittle flows from his mouth, and flies swarm about him. What is the cure? Abbe said, Pilal Adam, the rind of a nut tree, the shavings of a dressed hide, and the calyx of a red date tree these must be boiled together and carried into a house of marble and if no marble house is available they may be carried into a house the walls of which are of the thickness of seven bricks and a half three hundred cups of the mixture must then be poured upon his head until his cranium is softened and then his brain is cut open four leaves of myrtle must be brought and each foot in turn lifted up and one leaf placed beneath it, it is then grasped with a pair of tweezers and burned for otherwise it would return to him or you had and issued the announcement beware of the flies of the men afflicted with our eighth and our zera never sat with such a sufferer in the same draft our Eliezer never entered his tent rmi and rc never ate any of the eggs coming from the alley in which he lived our joshua believe i however attached himself to these sufferers and studied the torah for he said a lovely hind and a graceful doe if the torah bestows grace upon those who studied would it not also protect them when he was about to die the angel of death was instructed go and carry out his wish when he came and shoot himself to him the latter said shoot me my place in paradise very well he replied give me your knife the other demanded since otherwise you may frighten me on the way he gave it to him on arriving there he lifted him up and shoot him his place the latter jumped and dropped on the other side of the wall he seized him by the corner of his cloak but the other exclaimed i swear that i will not go back there upon the holy one blessed be he said if he ever had an oath of his and he must return but if not he need not return return to me my knife he said to him but the other would not return it to him a bath coal went forth and said to him return the thing to him for it is required for the mortals elijah heralded him proclaiming make room for the son of levi make room for the son of levi as he proceeded on his way he found our Simeon Biohe sitting on thirteen stools of gold, are you the latter? asked
His generation R. Alexandria approached him and said do it for the honor of the sages but he disregarded him do it he said for the honor of your father's house but he again disregarded him do it he finally requested for your own honor's sake and the pillar of fire departed Abay remarked the purpose of the pillar of fire was to keep away anyone who had failed to observe even a single letter of the Torah said R. Abay Matina to him this then would also exclude the master since he has no battlement to his roof the fact however was that he did have one but the wind had thrown it down at that moment R. Hanan said why are there no sufferers from R. Aethan in Babylon because they eat beet and drink beer containing cuscuta of the Hizmishra Bar Yohanan stated why are there no lepers in Babylon because they eat beet drink beer and bathe in the waters of the Euphrates Talmud Mosque at both A-C-H-A-P-T-E-R-B-I-I-I Mishnah if a woman came into the possession of property before she was betrothed Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel agreed that she may sell it or give it away and her act is legally valid if she came into the possession of the property after she was betrothed Beth Shammai said she may sell it and Beth Hillel said she may not sell it but both agreed that if she had sold it or given it away her act is legally valid Arjuda stated the sages argued before Argamaliel since the man gains possession of the woman does he not also gain possession of her property he replied we are embarrassed with regard to the problem of her new possessions and do you wish to involve us in the problem of her old ones also if she came into the possession of property after she was married both agreed that even if she had sold it or given it away the husband may seize it from the buyers if she came into possession before she married and subsequently married Argamaliel said if she had sold it or given it away her act is legally valid Arhan and stated they argued before Argamaliel since a man gained possession of the woman should he not also gain possession of her property he replied we are embarrassed with regard to the problem of her new possessions and do you wish to involve us in the problem of her old ones also our Simeon draws a distinction between one kind of property and another property that is known to the husband the wife may not sell and if she has sold it or given it away her act is void property however which is unknown to the husband she may not sell but if she has sold it or given it away her act is legally valid tomorrow what is the essential difference between the first clause in which they do not differ and the succeeding clause in which they differ the school of Arjana replied in the first clause it was into her possession that the property had come in the succeeding clause the property came into his possession if however it is maintained that the property came into his possession why is her act legally Valid when she had sold the property or given it away this then is the explanation in the first clause the property has beyond all doubt come into her possession in the succeeding clause however the property might be said to have come either into her or into his possession hence she may not properly sell the property but if she had sold it or given it away her act is legally valid Arjuda stated the sages argued before Argamaliel the question was raised does Arjuda refer to the case of direct permissibility or also to one of ex post facto Talmud Mosk hath above become and here what was taught in the following Arjuda stated they argued before Argamaliel since the one woman is his wife and the other is his wife just as a sale by the former is invalid so also should a sale by the latter be invalid he replied we are in an embarrassed condition with regard to the problem of her new possessions and you wish to involve us in the problem of her old ones also thus it may be inferred that he referred to a case of ex post facto also this is conclusive it was taught Arhan and said it was not such a reply that Argamaliel gave to the sages but it was this that he replied there is no comparison if you say the ruling is to apply to a married woman whose husband is entitled to her fines to her handiwork and to the annulment of her vows will you say it also applies to a betrothed woman whose husband is not entitled either to her fines or to her handiwork or to the annulment of her vows master they said to him this is quite feasible if she effected a sale before she married what however will be a ruling where she was married and effected the sale subsequently this woman also he replied may sell or give away and her act is valid since however they argued he gained possession of the woman should he not also gain possession of her property we are quite embarrassed he replied about the problem of her new possessions and you wish to Involve us in the problem of her old ones also but surely we learned if she came into possession before she married and subsequently married Argamaliel said if she had sold it or gave it away her act is legally valid Arzibid replied read she may sell or give away and her act is valid Arpapa replied there is no difficulty for one is the view of Arjuna on Argamaliel's opinion whilst the other is the view of Arhan of Biyahidi on Argamaliel's opinion is Arhan of Biyahidi then in agreement with Beth Shammai it is this that he meant Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel did not differ at all on this point both Rab and Samuel stated whether a woman came into the possession of property before she was betrothed or whether she came into possession after she was betrothed her husband may if she sold it after she married take it away from the buyers in agreement with whose view is this ruling which is neither in agreement with that of Arjuna nor with that of Arhan of Biyahidi they adopted the ruling of our masters for it was taught our masters took a recount of votes and decided that whether a woman came into the possession of property before she was betrothed or whether she came into its possession after she was betrothed her husband may if she sold it after she married take it away from the buyers after she was married both agree may it be suggested that here we are learning of the enactment of the Shah for our Jose the son of our Hanimus stated it was enacted at a Shah that if a woman sold during the lifetime of her husband Melik property and died the husband may seize it from the buyers our mission deals with the seizure during the woman's lifetime for the purposes of usufruct only the enactment of the Shah refers to the seizure of the capital after her death our Simeon draws a distinction between one kind of property etc which kind is regarded as known and which is unknown our Jose the son of our Hanimus replied known means landed property unknown movable property but our Yohanan said both are regarded as known but the following is classed as unknown whenever a woman lives in a certain place and comes into the possession of property in a country beyond the sea so it was also taught elsewhere the following is classed as unknown wherever a woman lives in a certain place and comes into the possession of property in a country beyond the sea a certain woman wishing to deprive her intended husband of her estate assigned it in writing to her daughter after she married and was divorced Talmud, Mosque Hatha both as she came before Arnaman to claim the return of her estate Arnaman tore up the deed Arain and thereupon went to Marakba and said to him see master how Naman the board tears up people's deeds tell me the other said to him how exactly the incident occurred it occurred he replied in such and such a manner do you speak the other exclaimed of a deed a woman intended as a means of evasion thus said Arhan Alabi in the name of Samuel Iaman. Officially recognized judge and should a deed which a woman intended as a means of evasion come into my hand I would tear it up said Rabba to Arnam and what in fact is the reason obviously because no man would neglect himself and give his property away to others but this would apply to strangers only whilst to a daughter one might well give even in the case of a daughter a woman gives preference to her own person an objection was raised if a woman desires to keep her property from her husband. How is she to proceed she writes out a deed of trust to a stranger so our Simeon be Gamaliel but the sages said if he wishes he may laugh at her unless she wrote out for him you shall acquire possession from this day whenever I shall express my consent the reason then is because she wrote out for him in the manner prescribed but had she not done so the fictitious buyer would have acquired would he not possession of it Arzera replied there is no difficulty one ruling refers to a woman who has assigned to the stranger all her property the other to a woman who assigned to a stranger a part of her property but if the buyer does not acquire her property the husband should acquire it Abbe replied it was treated as property which is unknown to the husband in accordance with the view of our Simeon Mishnah if a married woman came into the possession of money land should be bought there with and the husband is entitled to the usufruct if she came into the possession of produce that was detached from the ground land should be bought there with and the husband is entitled to the usufruct if it was produced attached to the ground the land our rule is to be valued as to how much it is worth with the produce and how much without the produce and with the difference land should be bought and the husband is entitled to its usufruct the sages however ruled all produce attached to the ground belongs to the husband and only that which is detached from it belongs to the wife with the proceeds of the latter land is to be bought and the husband is entitled to the usufruct our Simeon said in respect of that wherein the husband is at an advantage when he marries his wife he is at a disadvantage when he divorces her and in respect of that wherein he is at a disadvantage when he marries her he is at an advantage when he divorces her how so
Man steals Talmud, Mosque hath both be the young of a Melik beast, he must pay double its value to the woman in accordance with whose view has this ruling been laid down. Is it in agreement with neither that of the rabbis nor with that of Hanani? For it was taught the young of a Melik beast belongs to the husband, the child of a Melik bond woman belongs to the wife, but Hanani, the son of Josiah's brother, ruled the child of a Melik bond woman has been given the same legal status as the young of a Melik beast. It may be said to agree even with the opinion of all, for it is the produce alone that the rabbis in their enactment have assigned to the husband, but not the produce that accrues from this produce. The view of Hanani is quite logical on the assumption that death is not to be taken into consideration, but what principle is followed by the rabbis if they do take into consideration the possibility of death, even the young of a Melik beast also should not belong to the husband and if they do not take the possibility of death into consideration, then even the child of a bond woman also should belong to the husband. They do in fact take the possibility of death into consideration, but the case of the beast is different from that of a bond woman since its skin remains are who not be high stated in the name of Samuel. The Halachah is in agreement with Hanani said Rabbah in the name of Arnaman. Although Samuel said the Halachah is in agreement with Hanani, Hanani admits that if the woman is divorced, she may pay the price of the bond woman's children and take them because they constitute the pride of her paternal house, which she is entitled to retain. Rabbah stated in the name of Arnaman, if a woman brought to her husband a goat for milking a ewe for shearing a hen for laying eggs or a date tree for producing fruit, he may go on eating the yield of any of these until the capital is consumed. Arnaman stated if a woman brought to her husband a cloak, its use is to be regarded as produce and he may continue to use it as a covering until it is worn out in accordance with whose view has the statement been made in agreement with the following tana for it has been taught salt or sand is regarded as produce a sulfur quarry or an alumine is regarded armadier said as capital but the rabbi said as produce arsimian said in respect of that wherein the husband is at an advantage is not this view of arsimian identical with that of the first tana rabbi replied the difference between them is the case of produce that was attached at the time of the divorce mission if h bondman or bondwoman fell to her as an inheritance they must be sold and land purchased with the proceeds and the husband can enjoy the use of fruct thereof arsimian begamaliel said she need not sell them because they are the pride of her paternal house if she came into the possession of old olive trees or vines they must be sold and land purchased with the proceeds and it Husband can enjoy the usufruct thereof. Arjuda said she need not sell them because they are the pride of her paternal house. Gemara Arkahana stated in the name of Rab they differ only where the olive trees or vines fell to the woman in her own field, but if they were in a field that did not belong to her, she must, according to the opinion of all, sell them because otherwise the capital would be destroyed to the Sarjos of Demert are not bondmen or bondwomen the same as trees in a field that does not belong to her, and there is nevertheless a dispute. The fact is, if the statement has at all been made, it must have been made in the following terms. Arkahana stated in the name of Rab they differ only where the olive trees and vines fell to the woman in a field that did not belong to her, but if they were in her own field, it is the opinion of all that she need not sell them because she is entitled to retain the pride of her paternal house. Mishnah, he who incurred expenditure. In connection with his wife's Melik property, whether he spent much and consumed little or spent little and consumed much, what he has spent, he has spent, and what he has consumed, he has consumed. If he spent but did not consume, he may take an oath as to how much he has spent and receive compensation. Gemara, how much is considered little? RC replied, even one dry fig, but this applies only where he ate it in a dignified manner, said Talmud. Mosque Ketha, both A. Araba at the school of Rabbit was stated, even the refuse of dates RB be inquired what is the ruling in respect of a mash of pressed dates. The stance undecided what is the ruling if he did not eat it in a dignified manner. Ola replied on this, there is a difference of opinion between two Amram in the West. One says the value of an Isar and the other says the value of a dinar. The judges of Pamadai, the stated Rabjuda, gave a practical decision in a case where the husband used up some bundles of vanchutes, Rabjuda. Acting here in accordance with his own principle for Rabjuda ruled if he ate thereof during one of the three years only uncircumcised produce the produce of the sabbatical year or the produce of mingled seed this counts towards the three years of Hezakah. Jacob stated in the name of Arhistah if a man has incurred expenses on the Melik property of his wife who was a minor he is in the same legal position as one who incurred expenses on the property of a stranger what is the reason it? Rabbis have enacted this measure in order that he should not allow her property to deteriorate a woman once came into the possession of 400 zoos at Behozi her husband went to there spent 600 on his journey and brought with him the 400 while he was on his way back he required one zoos and took it out of these when he came before RMI the latter ruled what he has spent he has spent and what he used he has used said the rabbis to RMI does not this apply only where he consumes the produce whilst here he used up the capital which constituted a part of the expenditure. If so, he replied, He is one who spent but did not consume, then he may take an oath as to how much he has spent and receive his compensation. He may take an oath as to how much he has spent and receive compensation. Said RC, this applies only where the appreciation corresponds to the expenditure. What exactly is the object of this law? They replied that if the appreciation exceeded the expenditure, he receives the sum of his outlay without an oath. Said Rabba to him, If so, one might be induced to act cunningly. The object of the law, however, said Rabba, was that if the outlay exceeded the appreciation, he is only entitled to receive that amount of his outlay which corresponds to the appreciations, and even this can be obtained only by an oath. The question was raised, What is the legal position where a husband has sent down a in his place? Does an heiress go down into Melg? Fields in his reliance on the rights of the husband and consequently when the husband forfeits his claim they also lose theirs or does an heiress possibly go down into the Melik fields in his reliance on the yield of the land and land surely is usually entrusted to arise into this rabbi son of Arhain and the murder wherein does this case essentially differ from that of a man who went down into a neighbor's field and planted it without the owner's authority where an assessment is made and he is at a disadvantage in that case there was no other person to take the trouble but here there is the husband who should have taken the trouble but then is the decision on the matter Arhuna the son of Ar Joshua replied we must observe the conditions of each case if the husband is an heiress the arise and lose all claim to compensation wherever the husband loses his claim if the husband is not an heiress they are entitled to compensation since all land is usually entrusted to arise and the question was Raised what is the ruling where a husband sold his wife's melic land for usufruct? Do we say that whatever he possesses he may transfer to others, or is it possible that the rabbis have by their enactment granted the usufruct to the husband only Talmud? Mosque hath both be in order to provide for the comfort of his home, but not so that he should sell it to Judah Marbimir Mar replied in the name of Rabba, whatever he has done is done. Our Papi in the name of Rabba replied his act has no validity, said R. Papa the ruling reported by Judah Marbimir Mar was not explicitly stated but was arrived at by inference for a woman once brought to her husband two bond women and the man went and married another wife and assigned to her one of them when the first wife came before Rabba and cried he disregarded her one who observed the incident formed the opinion that Rabba's inaction was due to his view that whatever the husband did is valid, but in fact it is not so usufruct has been allowed to a husband. In order to provide for the comfort of his house and here surely comfort was provided and the law is that if a husband sold his wife's melic field for its use of fruct his act has no legal validity what is the reason of a reply provision must be made against the possible deterioration of the land Rabba explained in order to safeguard the comfort of his house what is the practical difference between them the practical difference between them is the case of land that was adjoining a town or elsewhere the husband himself was acting as heiress or elsewhere the husband receives money and trades there with mission if a woman awaiting the decision of the lover came into the possession of property Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel agree that she may sell it or give it away and that her act is legally valid if she died what shall be done with her ketubah and with the property that comes in and goes out with her Beth Shammai ruled the heirs of her husband are to share it with the heirs of her father and Bethilel ruled the Zonbarzal property is to remain with those in whose possession it is the Kethubah is to remain in the possession of the heirs of the husband and the property which goes in and comes out with her remains in the possession of the heirs of her father if his brother left
is entitled only to her kefubah if he subsequently remarried her she is to enjoy the same rights as all other wives and is entitled only to her kefubah Gemara the question was raised if a woman awaiting the decision of a lover died who is to bury her are her husband's heirs to bury her because they inherit her kefubah or is it possibly the heirs of her father who must bury her because they inherit the property that comes in and goes out with her arm room reply come and hear what was taught if a woman awaiting the decision of a lover died Talmud mosque kefubah it is the duty of her heirs even those who inherit her kefubah to bury her said Abbe we also have learned a similar mission a widow is to be maintained out of the estate of her deceased husband's orphans and her handiwork belongs to them it is not their duty however to bury her it is the duty of her heirs even those who inherit her kefubah to bury her now what widow is it that has two kinds of heirs Obviously she who is awaiting the decision of a lover said Rabba but could he not plead I am only heir to my brother it is not my duty to bury his wife Abbe replied such a plea would be untenable because he is approached by two alternative demands if he is heir to his brother he should bury his wife if he does not bury his wife he should return her kefu Rabba retorted it is this that I mean might he not plead I am only heir to my brother it is not my duty to bury his wife and if I am expected to bury her on account of the kefubah I may point out that a kefubah is not payable during a husband's lifetime who is it that was heard to admit the kefubah as a text for legal exposition Bet Shammai of course but Bet Shammai have also been heard to lay down the rule that a note of indebtedness which is due for payment is regarded as repaid for we have learned if their husbands died before they drank Bet Shammai rule that they are to receive their kefubah and that they Need not drink and Bethilel rule that they either drinks or they do not receive their kefubah. Now how could it be said they either drink when the Almerciful said then shall the man bring his wife to the priest and he is not there the meaning must consequently be as they do not drink they are not to receive their kefubah. Again Bet Shammai rule that they are to receive their kefubah and that they need not drink but why should they receive their kefubah is not their claim of a doubtful nature it being uncertain whether she had committed adultery or not then how could an uncertainty override a certainty Bet Shammai must consequently hold the view that a note of indebtedness that is due for payment is regarded as repaid but is it not required that the proviso when thou wilt be married to another man thou wilt receive what is prescribed for thee be complied with which is not the case here Arashi replied a lover is also regarded as another man Rabba addressed it. Following message to Abbe through Arshime Abizera is a kefuba indeed payable during the lover's lifetime has it not in fact been taught or abbasted I asked Simicus how is a man who desires to sell his brother's property to proceed and he replied if he is a priest he should prepare a banquet and use persuasive means if he is an Israelite he may divorce her and then marry her again Talmud, Mosque Kefa both be now if it could be assumed that a kefuba is payable during the lifetime of the lover why should he not set aside exclusively for her some property equal in value to the amount of the kefuba and then sell the rest but according to your argument it might be asked why should not the same objection be raised from our mission where it was stated he cannot say to her behold your kefuba lies on the table but all his property is pledged for her kefuba there we might merely have been given a piece of good advice for were you not to admit this how would you Read the final clause where it is stated so too a man must not say to his wife behold your kefubah lies on the table but all his property is pledged for her kefubah would he here also it may be asked not be able to sell if he wished to do so consequently it must be agreed that he was there merely giving a piece of good advice and similarly here also we might merely be given a piece of good advice the statement of our Abba however does present an objection our Abba's statement also does not give rise to any objection because the restrictions on the man's liberty to sell are due to the desire of avoiding hatred a sister-in-law once fell to the lot of a man at Pumadiva and his younger brother wanted to cause her to be forbidden to marry him by forcing upon her a letter of divorce what is it the eldest brother said to him that you have in your mind are you troubled because of the property that I all to inherit I will share the property with you or Joseph in. Considering this case said since the rabbis have laid down that he may not sell his sale is invalid even if he had already sold it for it was taught if a man died and left a widow who was awaiting the decision of a lover and also left a bequest of property of the value of a hundred mana the lover must not sell the property although the widow's kefubah amounts only to one mana because all his property is pledged to her kefubah said Abbe to him is it so that wherever the rabbis ruled that one must not sell the sale is invalid even after it had taken place did we not in fact learn Beth Shammai said she may sell it and Beth Hillel said she may not sell it but both agree that if she had sold it or given it away her act is legally valid the case was sent to our Hanabi Papi who sent the same reply as that of our Joseph on this Abbe remarked as our Hanabi Papi for Sifhan jewels upon it it was then sent to our Minyamai the son of our Nahume who sent the same reply as Abbe and Added should our Joseph give a new reason reported to me or Joseph thereupon went out investigated and discovered that it was taught if a man who had a monetary claim against his brother died and left a widow who had to await the decision of a lover the latter is not entitled to plead since I am here I have acquired the amount of the debt but it must be taken from the lover and spent on the purchase of land and he is only entitled to its usufruct but is it not possible said Abbe to him. That provision was made in his own interest the Tana stated the other replied that it must be taken from him and you say that provision was made in his own interest the case was again sent to our Minyamai the son of our Nahume who said to them thus said our Joseph be Minyamai in the name of our nom, and this is not an authentic teaching what is the reason if it be suggested because money is a movable thing and movables are not pledged to a kefuba is it not possible it might be retorted that the Statement represents the view of our Meir who holds that movables are pledged to a kefubah should it be suggested however because he could say to her you are not the party I have to deal with Talmud, Mos Kefubah is it not possible it might be retorted that the statement represents the view of our Nathan since it was taught our Nathan stated once is it deduced that if a man claims a mana from another and this one claims a similar sum from a third the sum is to be collected from the last named and handed over to the first from scripture which stated and give unto him against whom he hath trespassed this however is the reason we find nowhere a Tana who imposes two restrictions in the matter of a kefubah we only find agreement either with our Meir or with our Nathan Robert remarked if so I can well understand what Abbe meant when I heard him say this is not an authentic teaching and at the time I did not understand what his reason was a sister-in-law at Matha Mahaja once. Fell to the lot of a man whose younger brother wanted to cause her to be forbidden to marry him by forcing upon her a letter of divorce. What is it? The eldest brother said to him that you have in your mind if it is on account of the property that you are troubled will share the estate with you. I am afraid the other replied that you will treat me as a pumadai and rogue has treated his brother if you wish. The first said to him take your half at once said Marson of Arashi although when Ardimi came he stated in the name of our Yohanan if a man said to another go and pull this cow but it shall pass into your legal possession only after 30 days he legally acquires it after 30 days even if it stands at the time in the meadow in this case the younger brother cannot acquire possession of the promised chair for there it was in his power to transfer possession at once but here it is not in his power to transfer immediate possession but surely when Rabin came be stated in the name of our Yohanan that he does not acquire possession this is no difficulty one refers to a case where the seller said acquire possession from now the other where he did not say acquire from now Allah was asked what is the ruling where Levirate marriage was consummated first and the division of the property took place afterwards the act is null and void he replied what is the ruling he was asked if the division took place first and the Levirate marriage afterwards the act he replied is null and void Arshis hate the now that it has been said that where Levirate marriage took place first and the division afterwards the act is null and void was it at all necessary to ask the question where the division took place first and the Levirate marriage afterwards the respective inquiries related to two independent incidents that occurred at different times when Rabin came he stated in the name of Reshlakish whether Levirate marriage was consummated first and it Division took place afterwards, or whether the division took place first and the Levirate marriage afterwards, the act is null and void, and in fact the law is that the act is null and void. The sages, however, ruled what is still attached to the ground belongs to him, but why is not all his landed estate a pledge and a guarantee for her Kathu Bresh Lakish replied red belongs to her if the LEDL are married her, she is
Taken her, she becomes his wife in all respects save that her kathugal remains a charge on her first husband's estate. What is the reason a wife has been given to him from heaven? If, however, she is unable to obtain her kathugal from her first husband, provision was made by the rabbis that she receives it from the second in order that it may not be easy for Ben to divorce her. He cannot say to her, Behold, your kathugal, etc. What need was there for stating so? Though it might have been suggested that the restriction mentioned applies only in the former case because the lover does not insert in her kathugal the clause that which I possess and that which I will acquire, but that in the latter case where he does insert the pledge clause that which I possess and that which I will acquire, she relies upon this guarantee. Hence, we were told that the ruling applies in both cases. If he divorced her, she is entitled only to her kathugal, only if he divorced her, may he sell the property, but. If he did not divorce her, he may not. Thus, we were informed in agreement with the ruling of our Abba. If he subsequently remarried her, she is to enjoy the same rights as all other wives and is entitled only to her kathuba. If he subsequently remarried her, what does he thereby teach us? Have we not learned if a man divorced his wife and then remarried her? His second marriage is contracted on the terms of her first kathuba. It might have been assumed that the law applied only to his wife since it was he himself who wrote the kathuba in the case of his sister in law. However, since it was not he who wrote the kathuba for her, it might well have been assumed that where he divorced and then remarried her, the kathuba must come from himself. Hence, we were taught that in this case also she is entitled only to the first kathuba. Rab Judah stated at first they used to give merely a written undertaking in respect of the kathuba of a virgin for 200 zoos and in respect of that of a widow for Amina and consequently they grew old and could not take any wives when Simeon Bishada took the initiative and ordained that all the property of a husband is pledged for the kathuba of his wife so it was also taught elsewhere at first they used to give merely a written undertaking in respect of the kathuba of a virgin for 200 zoos and in respect of that of a widow for Amina and consequently they grew old and could not take any wives it was then ordained that the amount of the kathuba was to be deposited in the wife's father's house at any time however when the husband was angry with her he used to tell her go to your kathuba it was ordained therefore that the amount of the kathuba was to be deposited in the house of her father-in-law wealthy women converted it into silver or gold baskets while poor women converted it into brass tubs still whenever the husband had occasion to be angry with his wife he would say to her take your kathuba and go it was then that Simeon Bishayta ordained that the husband must insert the pledging clause. All my property is mortgaged to your Kathuba Talmud. Mos Kathuba both A-C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-X Mishnah. If the husband gives to his wife a written undertaking, I have no claim whatsoever upon your estates. He may nevertheless enjoy its usufruct during her lifetime, and when she dies, he is her heir. If so, what was his object in giving her the written undertaking? I have no claim whatsoever upon your estates that if she sold them or gave them away, her act might be valid. If he wrote, I have no claim whatsoever upon your estates and upon their produce, he may not enjoy their usufruct during her lifetime, but when she dies, he is her heir. Our Judah ruled, he may in all cases enjoy the yield of the produce unless he wrote out for her the following undertaking. I have no claim whatsoever upon your estates and upon their produce and the produce of their produce and so on without end. If he wrote, I have no claim upon your estates. Their produce and the produce of their produce during your lifetime and after your death he may neither enjoy their produce during her lifetime nor can he be her heir when she dies. Our Simeon be Gamaliel ruled when she dies he is her heir because by his declaration he is making a condition which is contrary to what is enjoined in the Torah and whenever a man makes a condition which is contrary to what is written in the Torah his condition is null and void. Gamar our high taught if a husband said to his wife and if he gave her such an undertaking in writing what does it matter was it not taught if a man says to another I have no claim whatsoever on this field I have no concern in it and I entirely dissociate myself from it his statement is of no effect at the school of Arjane it was explained we are dealing here with the case of a man who gave the undertaking to his wife while she was still only betrothed to him the ruling being in agreement with that of Arkahana that a man is at. Liberty to renounce beforehand an inheritance which is likely to accrue to him from another source, and this ruling furthermore is in agreement with the dictum of Rabbah that if anyone says I do not desire to avail myself of a regulation of the rabbis of this kind, his desire is granted. What is meant by the expression of this kind is that referred to in the statement made by Arhu not in the name of Rabbi woman is entitled to say to her husband, I do not wish either to be maintained by you or to work for you. If so, should not the same ruling apply to a married woman? Also, Abbe replied, in the case of a married woman, the husband's rights have the same force as the wife's. Rabbah said his rights are superior to hers. This is of practical significance. In the case of a woman who was awaiting the decision of the lover, the question was raised, What is the ruling if symbolic kanyan was executed at the time of the renunciation? Our Joseph replied, The kanyan is invalid since it related to an Abstract renunciation Arnaman replied the Kanyan is valid because it related to land itself said Abay Joseph's statement is reasonable Talmud, Mos Kathaboth be Talmud, Mos Kathaboth be where the partner lodged his protest forthwith but if he delayed the Kanyan must be regarded as relating to the land itself Amimar said the law is that the Kanyan is taken to refer to the land itself said Arashi to Amimar do you speak of one who lodged his protest forthwith or of one who delayed it in? What respect the other asked does this matter in respect of determining whether the law is in agreement with the view of our Joseph I did not hear this the other replied by which I mean that I do not accept it if so what was his object in giving her the written undertaking etc but why should she not be able to say to him you have renounced all your claims Abay replied the holder of a deed is always at a disadvantage but might it not be suggested that he renounced his claim upon it? Yusufruct Abbe replied a young pumpkin in hand is better than a full-grown one in the field but may it be suggested that his renunciation related to his heirship Abbe replied death is a common occurrence but the sale of property by a wife is not common and whenever a person renounces his claims he does so in respect of what is not a common occurrence but he does not do it in respect of that which is a common occurrence Arashi replied the husband's renunciation was upon your estates but not upon their produce upon your estates but not after your death Arjuna ruled he may in all cases enjoy the yield of the produce etc. Our rabbis taught the following are regarded as produce and the following as the yield of the produce respectively if a woman brought to her husband a plot of land and it yielded produce such yield is regarded as produce if he sold the produce and purchased land with the proceeds and the land yielded produce such yield is regarded as the yield of the produce the question was raised according to our Judah is the expression the produce of their produce the essential element or is rather without end the essential element or is it possible that both expressions are essential but should you find some ground for deciding that the expression the produce of their produce is the essential element what need was there it might be asked for the mention of without end it is this that we were taught so long as he renounced in her favor in writing the yield of the produce it is as if he had expressly written in her favor without end but should you find some reason for deciding that without end is the essential element what need was there it might be asked for the mention of the produce of their produce it is this that we were taught although he renounced in her favor in writing the yield of the produce the renunciation is valid only if he also wrote without end but is invalid if he did not write it but if you should Find some argument for giving the decision that both expressions are essential. It could he ask what need is there for the specification of both both are necessary for if only the yield of the produce had been written in her favor and without end had been omitted it might have been assumed that he loses thereby his right to the enjoyment of the yield of the produce only but that he is still entitled to enjoy the produce of the yield of that produce hence it is necessary for the expression without end to be included in the renunciation and if only without end had been written in her favor and the yield of the produce had not been specified it might have been assumed that without end referred to the first produce only hence it is necessary to specify also the yield of the produce the question was raised may a husband who wrote in favor of his wife the renunciation I have no claim whatsoever upon your estates and upon the yield of their produce enjoy the produce itself has he Renounce the yield of their produce only but not the produce itself or is it possible that he renounced all his claim but it is quite obvious that he has renounced all his claims for should you suggest that he only renounced his claim upon the yield of the produce but not upon the produce itself whence it might be objected would arise a yield of the produce if the man had consumed the produce
and Boyd Rab holds that such a condition is valid and his acceptance of the ruling is solely due to his opinion that a husband's right of inheritance is a rabbinical enactment and that the sages have imposed upon their enactments greater restrictions than upon those of the Torah Talmud. Mos Ketha both a good rab however it may be retorted hold the opinion that one's condition though contrary to what is written in the Torah is valid has it not in fact been stated if a man says to another. I sell you this object on condition that you have no claim for overreaching against me. The buyer Rab ruled has nevertheless a claim for overreaching against him, and Samuel ruled he has no claim for overreaching against him. It is this then that was meant the Halachah is in agreement with the ruling of our Simeon B. Gamaliel who laid down that if a man makes a condition which is contrary to what is written in the Torah, his condition is null and void, but not because of the reason he gave for. Whereas our Simeon B. Gamaliel is of the opinion that when she dies, he is her ear. Rab maintains that when she dies, he is not her ear, but is not this in agreement with his reason and not with his ruling. This then it is that was meant the Halachah is in agreement with the ruling of our Simeon B. Gamaliel who laid down that when she dies, he is her ear, but not because of the reason he gave for. Whereas our Simeon B. Gamaliel is of the opinion that only a condition that is contrary to a Pentateuch law. Is null, but one that is contrary only to a rabbinic law is valid. Rab maintains that even a condition contrary to a rabbinic law is also null, but this would be in agreement with it, not with both his reason and his ruling. Rab only adding greater force to it. This then it is that was meant the halachah is in agreement with our Simeon B. Gamaliel who laid down that when she dies he is her heir, but not because of the reason he gave for. Whereas our Simeon B. Gamaliel holds that a husband's right of heirship is pentacle and that it is invalid because wherever a man makes a condition which is contrary to what is written in the Torah, his condition is null and void. Rab maintains that a husband's right of heirship is only a rabbinic enactment and that the condition is nevertheless null because the sages have imparted to their enactments the same force as that of pentacle laws. But could it be said that Rab is of the opinion that a husband's right of heirship is only rabbinical? When in fact we have learned our Yohanan B. Baraka ruled if a husband is the heir of his wife he must when the jubilee year arrives return the inheritance to the members of her family and allow them a reduction of price and in considering the statement the objection was raised what is really his opinion if he holds that a husband's right of heirship is pentacle why it may be asked should he return the inheritance at all and if he holds it to be only rabbinical why it may be objected should even a part of its price be paid and Rab explained he holds in fact the opinion that a husband's right of heirship is pentacle but here it is a case of a man for instance whose wife bequeathed to him a family graveyard and it is in order to avoid a family taint that the rabbis have ruled let him take the price and return it and by allow them a reduction in price was meant a deduction of the cost of his wife's grave the return of a family graveyard being in Agreement with what was taught if a person has sold his family grave the path to this grave is halting place or his place of mourning the members of his family may come and bury him perforce in order to avert a slight upon the family rap spoke here in accordance with our Yohanan B. Barak's point of view but he himself does not uphold admission if a man died and left a wife a creditor and heirs and he also had a deposit or a loan in the possession of others this our Tarfan rule shall be given to the one who is under the greatest disadvantage our Akiva said no pity is to be shown in a matter of law and it shall rather be given to the heirs for whereas all the others must take an oath the heirs need not take any oath if he left produce that was detached from the ground and whoever seizes it first acquires possession if the wife took possession of more than the amount of her ketubah or credit or of more than the value of his debt the balance our Tarfan rule shall be given to the one who is under the greatest disadvantage our Akiva said no pity is to be shown in a matter of law and it shall rather be given to the heirs for whereas all the others must take an oath the heirs need not take any oath tomorrow what was the object of specifying both a loan and a deposit both were required for if a loan only had been mentioned it might have been presumed that only in that case did our Tarfan maintain his view because a loan is intended to be spent but that in the case of a deposit which is in existence he agrees with our Akiva and if the former only had been mentioned it might have been assumed that only in that case did our Akiva maintain his view but that in the other case he agrees with our Tarfan hence both were necessary what is meant by to the one who is under the greatest disadvantage our Jose the son of Arhan replied to the one who is under the greatest disadvantage in respect of proof our Yohanan replied the references to the Ketubah of the wife who was given this privilege in order to maintain pleasantness between her and her husband this dispute is the same as that between the following Tanaim our Benjamin said to the one who is under the greatest disadvantage in respect of proof and this is the proper course to take our Eliezer said the references to the Ketubah of the wife who was given this privilege in order to maintain pleasantness between her and her husband if he left produce that was detached as to our Akiba what was the point in discussing the balance when the entire estate belongs to the heirs the law is so indeed but since our Tarfan spoke of the balance he also mentioned the balance Talmud Mosque Ketha both be but would our Akiba maintain that seizure is never legally valid Rab replied in the name of our Naman seizure is valid where it took place during the lifetime of the deceased now according to our Tarfan where must the produce be kept both Rab and Samuel replied it must be heaped up and lie in the public domain but if it was kept in an alley, no seizure is valid. Both our Yohanan and Reshlakish, however, said even if the produce lay in an alley, seizure is valid. Certain judges once gave their decision in agreement with our Tarfan and Reshlakish reversed their verdict. Said our Yohanan to him, You have acted as if our Akiva's ruling were a law of the Torah. May it be assumed that they differ on this principle. One master upholds a view that if in giving a decision a law cited in a mission had been overlooked, the decision must be reversed, and the other master upholds a view that if a law cited in a mission had been overlooked, the decision need not be reversed. No, all agree that if in giving a decision a law cited in a mission had been overlooked, the decision must be reversed. But this is the point at issue between them. One master holds that the Halachah is in agreement with the opinion of our Akiva only when he differs from a colleague of his, but not from his master, while the other. Master holds that the Halachah is in agreement with him even if he differs from his master if you prefer I might say all agree that the Halachah agrees with our Akiva only when he differs from a colleague of his but not from his master here however the point at issue is this one master holds our Tarfan to have been his master and the other master holds him to have been his colleague alternatively it might be said all agree that he was his colleague but the point at issue between them is this one master maintains that the statement was that the Halachah agrees with our Akiva and the other master maintains that the statement was that one should be inclined in favor of a ruling of our Akiva our Yohanan's relative seized in an Aliyah cow that belonged to orphans when they appeared before our Yohanan he said to them your seizure is quite lawful our Simeon be Lakish however before whom they subsequently appeared said to them go and return it what can I do said our Yohanan to whom they came Again, when one of equal authority differs from me, a creditor one seized an ox from the herdsman of his debtor's orphans. The creditor said, I seized it during the lifetime of the debtor, and the herdsman said he seized it after the debtor's death. They appeared before Arnaman, who asked the herdsman, Have you witnesses that the creditor has seized it? No, the other replied, Arnaman thereupon said to him, Since he could have said it came into my possession through purchase, he is also entitled to say, I seized it during the lifetime of the debtor, but did not rush like state. The law of presumptive possession is inapplicable to living creatures. The case of an ox that was entrusted to a herdsman is different from that of other living creatures. The people of Anasai's household one seized in an alley woman belonging to orphans at a session held by Arabah, Arhan, Abi, Papi, and our Isaac Napaha, in whose presence said also Arabah, they were told, Your seizure is quite. Lawful is it said our Abba to them because these people are of the Nasai's household that you are favoring them surely when certain judges once gave a decision in agreement with our Tarfan Reshlakish reversed their decision Yamar Bihashu had a money claim against a certain person who died and left the boat go he said to his agent and seized it the latter went and seized it but our Papa and Arhuna the son of our Joshua met him and told him you are seizing the ship on behalf of a creditor and thereby you are causing loss to others and our Yohanan ruled he who seizes a debtor's property on behalf of a creditor and thereby causes loss to others Talmud Mosketha both it does not legally acquire it thereupon they seized it
Rabbi Abel he duly went there and paid them, but when he asked them return to me the bond, they replied this payment was made in settlement of some other claims. He came before our Abel to complain, and the latter asked him, Have you witnesses that you have paid them? No, he replied, since the former said to him they could plead that the payment was never made, they are also entitled to plead that the payment was made in settlement of some other claims. What is the law in respect of the agents? Liability to refund our Ashi replied, We have to consider the facts. If he said to him, Secure the bond and pay the money, he must refund it. But if he said, Pay the money and secure the bond, he is under no obligation to refund it. The law, however, is not so. He must refund it in either case because the other may well say, I deputed you to improve my position, not to make it worse. There was a certain woman with whom a case of bonds was once deposited, and when the heirs of the depositor came to claim it, from her she said, I seized them during the depositor's lifetime. Our nomin to whom she came said to her, Have you witnesses that it was claimed from you during the depositor's lifetime and that you refused to return it? No, she replied, If so, he said to her, Your seizure is one that took place after the owner's death, and such a seizure is invalid. A woman was once ordered to take an oath at the court of Rabba, but when Arhista's daughter said to him, I know that she is suspected of taking false. Oath Rabba transferred the oath to her opponent on another occasion. Our Papa and our Adabi Matina sat in his presence when a bond was brought to him. Said our Papa to him, I know that this bond is paid up. Is there Rabba? Asked him any other man with the master to confirm the statement. No, he replied, although the other said to him, the master is present to give evidence. There is no validity in the testimony of one witness. Said our Adabi Matina to him, should not our Papa be deemed as reliable as the daughter of Arhista is to the daughter of Arhista? He replied, I am certain of her. I am not sure, however, about the master. Said our Papa, now that the master has stated that a judge who can assert I am certain of a person may rely upon that person's evidence, I would tear up a bond on the evidence of my son Abumara, whose reliability I am certain I would tear up is such an act conceivable. He rather meant to say I would impair a bond on his evidence. A woman was once ordered to take an oath. At the court of RBB Abe, when her opponent suggested to them let her rather come and take the oath in our town where she might possibly feel ashamed of her action and confess right out, said she to them the verdict in my favor so that after I shall have taken the oath it may be given to me right it out for her ordered RBB Abe because said our poppy you are descendants of short-lived people you speak frail words surely Rabba stated an attestation by judges that was written before the witnesses have identified their signatures is invalid from which it is evident that such an attestation has the appearance of a false declaration and so here also the verdict would appear to contain a false statement this conclusion however is futile as may be inferred from a statement of our nomin who said our mayor ruled that even if a husband found it on a rubbish heap and then signed and gave it to her it is valid and even the rabbis differ from our mayor only in respect of letters of Divorce where it is necessary that the writing shall be done specifically in her name but in respect of other legal documents they agree with him for R.C. stated in the name of our Johanna a man may not borrow again on a bond on which he has once borrowed and which he has repaid because the obligation incurred by the first loan was cancelled the reason then is because the obligation was cancelled but that the contents of the document have the appearance Talmud, Mosketha both be of a false. Statement is a matter which need not be taken into consideration a certain man once deposited seven pearls wrapped in a sheet with Armayasha the son of the son of our Joshua H. Levi as Armayasha died I and he state they came to Armayasha in the first instance he said to them I know that Armayasha the son of the son of our Joshua B. Levi was not a wealthy man and secondly does not the man indicate the marks this ruling however applies only to a man who was not a frequent visitor at the Billy's house but if he was a frequent visitor there the marks he indicates are no evidence of ownership since it might well be assumed that another person has made the deposit and he happened to see it a certain man once deposited a silver cup with Nasa and Hasa died INTE state Arnaman before whom the ears appeared said to them I know that Hasa was not a wealthy man and furthermore does he not indicate the mark this however applies only to a man who was not an habitual visitor at the Billy's house but if he was a frequent visitor there the mark he indicates is no valid proof since it might be said that another person had deposited the cup and he happened to see it a certain man once deposited a silk cloth with Ardimi the brother of our Safra and Ardimi died INTE state Arabba to whom the depositor came to submit his claim said to them in the first place I know that Ardimi was not a wealthy man and secondly the man is here indicating the distinguishing mark this however applies only to a man who was not a frequent visitor at the Billy's house but if he was a frequent visitor there the indication of the mark is no valid proof since it might well be suggested that another man deposited the object and he happened to see it a man once said to those around him let my estate be given to Tobia and then he died a man named Tobia came to claim the estate behold said our Johan and Tobia has come now if he said Tobia and our Tobia came the latter is not entitled to the estate since he said to Tobia but not to our Tobia if he however was on familiar terms with him the estate must be given to him since the omission of title might have been due to the fact that he was on intimate terms with him if two Tobias appeared one of whom was a neighbor and the other a scholar the scholar is to be given precedence if one of the Tobias is a relative and the other a scholar the scholar is given precedence the question was asked what is the position where one is a neighbor and the other relative come and here better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off if both our relatives or both our neighbors or both our scholars the decision is left to the discretion of the judges come said Robert to the son of our high Abin I will tell you a fine saying of your fathers although Samuel said if a man sold a bond of indebtedness to another person and then he released the debtor the latter is legally released and moreover even a creditor's heir may release it. Debtor Samuel nevertheless admits that where a wife brought into her husband a bond of indebtedness and then remitted it the debt is not to be considered remitted because her husband's rights are equal to hers a relative of our and once sold her cathedral for the goodwill she was divorced and then died thereupon the buyers came to claim the amount of the cathedral from her daughter is there no one said our to those around him who contender her advice Talmud Mosketha Bothashi might remit her mother's cathedral in favor of her father and then she may inherit it from him when she heard that she went and remitted it in her father's favor thereupon our and said we have put ourselves in the unenviable position of legal advisors what was the opinion that he held at first and what made him change it afterwards at first he thought of the scriptural text and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh but ultimately he realized that the position of a noted personality is different from that of the general public reverting to the main text Samuel said if a man sold a bond of indebtedness to another person and then he released the debtor the latter is released and moreover even a creditor's heir may release the debtor said Arunah the son of Arjashua but if he is clever he rattles some coins in his face and the latter writes the bond in his name Amimar said he who adjudicates liability in an action for damage caused indirectly would here also a judge damages to the amount recoverable on a valid bond but he who does not adjudicate liability in an action for damage caused indirectly would here a judge damages only to the extent of the value of a mere scrap of paper such an action was once tried when through Raphram's insistence our Ashi was compelled to order the collection of damages in the manner of a beam that is fit for decorative moldings of Mimar stated in the name of Arhamma if a man has against him the claim of his wife's cathedra and that of a creditor and he owns a plot of land and has also ready money the creditor's claim is settled by means of the ready money while the woman's claim is settled by means of the land the creditor being treated in accordance with his rights and the wife in accordance with her rights if however he owns only one plot of land and it suffices to meet the claim of one only it is to be given to the creditor it is not to be given to the wife what is the reason more than it? Man's desire to marry is a woman's desire to be married, said our Papa to our Hama. Is it a fact that you have stated in the name of Rabba if a man against whom there was a monetary claim owned a plot of land and who when his creditor approached Hainai with the claim for repayment replied collect your loan from the land he is to be ordered by the court you must yourself go and sell it bring the net proceeds and deliver it to him no the other replied tell me then the first said to him how the incident had actually occurred the debtor the other replied alleged that his money belonged to an idolater and since he acted in an improper manner he was similarly treated in an improper manner said Kekahana to our Papa according to the statement you made that the repayment of a debt to a creditor is a religious act
Meadow presumably has has it not the same status as the sides of a public domain. Noah Meadow has a status of its own, and the sides of a public domain do have a status of their own. Another version he said to him, she is divorced by reason of a ruling of Arnam, and the sides of a public domain having the same status as a meadow. On the contrary, she should not be regarded as divorced by reason of a ruling of Rab and Samuel, for have not the sides of a public domain the same status as a public domain. No public domain has a status of its own, and the sides of a public domain do have a status of their own mission. If a husband set up his wife as a shopkeeper or appointed her as his administratrix, he may impose upon her an oath whenever he desires to do so. Our Eliezer said such an oath may be imposed upon her even in respect of her spindle and her dogamar. The question was asked, does our Eliezer mean that the oath is to be imposed by implication, or does he mean that it may be imposed? Directly come in here, they said to our Eliezer, no one can live with a serpent in the same basket. Now, if you will assume that our Eliezer meant the imposition of a direct oath, one can well understand the argument, but if you were to suggest that he meant the oath to be imposed by implication only, what it may be objected could this matter to her? She might tell him, since you are so particular with me, I am unable to live with you. Come in here if a man did not exempt his wife from a vow and from. An oath and set her up as his saleswoman or appointed her as his administratrix he may impose upon her an oath whenever he desires to do so if however he did not set her up as his saleswoman and did not appoint her as his administratrix he may not impose any oath upon her our Eliezer said although he did not set her up as his saleswoman and did not appoint her as his administratrix he may nevertheless impose upon her an oath wherever he desires to do so because there is no woman who was not administratrix for a short time at least during the lifetime of her husband in respect of her spindle and her dough thereupon they said to him no one can live with a serpent in the same basket thus you may infer that our Eliezer meant that the oath may he impose directly this is conclusive mission if a husband gave to his wife an undertaking in writing I have no claim upon you for either vow or oath he cannot impose an oath upon her he may however impose an oath upon her ears and upon her Lawful successors, if he wrote, I have no claim for either vow or oath either upon you or upon your ears or upon your lawful successors, he may not impose an oath either upon her or upon her ears or upon her lawful successors, his ears, however, may impose an oath upon her upon her ears or upon her lawful successors, if the written undertaking read, neither I nor my ears nor my lawful successors shall have any claim upon you or upon your ears or upon your lawful successors for either vow or oath, neither he nor his ears nor his lawful successors may impose an oath either upon her or upon her ears or upon her lawful successors, if she went from her husband's grave to her father's house or returned to her father-in-law's house but was not made administratrix, ears are not entitled to impose an oath upon her, but if she was made administratrix, ears may impose an oath upon her in respect of her administration during the subsequent period but not in respect of the past Kamara. What is the nature of the oath? Rab Judah replied in the name of Rab Talmud. Mosketh Abu it is one that is incumbent upon a woman who during the lifetime of her husband was made administratrix of his affairs. Arnaman replied in the name of Rab Abu it is one that is incumbent upon a woman who impairs her Kethub. Armordike went to Arashi and submitted to him this argument. One can well imagine the origin of the exemption according to him who holds that the oath is one. Incumbent upon a woman who impairs her Kethub by assuming that it occurred to the woman that she might sometime be in need of money and withdraw it from her Kethub and would therefore tell her husband, Give me an undertaking in writing that you will impose no oath upon me according to him. However, who holds that the oath is one incumbent upon a woman who during the lifetime of her husband was made administratrix of his affairs? Did she know it may be objected that he would set her? Up as administratrix that she should say to him give me a written undertaking that you will impose no oath upon me the other replied you taught this statement in connection with that clause we teach it in connection with this if she went from her husband's grave to her father's house or returned to her father-in-law's house but was not made administratrix ears are not entitled to impose an oath upon her but if she was made administratrix ears may impose an oath upon her in respect of her administration during the subsequent period but not in connection with the past and in reply to the question as to what exactly was meant by the past Rab Judah stated in the name of Rab the period during the lifetime of her husband for which she was made administratrix of his affairs but in respect of the period intervening between death and burial an oath may be imposed upon her Armatina however maintained that no oath may be imposed upon her even in respect of the period between death and burial for the Nihardians laid down for poll tax maintenance and funeral expenses and estate is sold without public announcement said Rabbah in the name of Arhai in giving exemption to his wife a husband wrote neither vow nor oath it is only he who cannot impose an oath upon her but his ears may impose an oath upon her if he wrote however free from vow free from oath neither he nor his ears may exact an oath from her since by this expression he meant to say to her be free from the obligation of an oath our Joseph however stated in the name of Arhai in giving exemption to his wife a husband writes neither vow nor oath it is only he who cannot impose an oath upon her but his ears may but if he wrote free from vow free from oath both he and his ears may exact an oath from her since by such an expression he thus meant to say to her clear yourself by means of an oath Arzakai sent to Marak by the following message whether the husband wrote Neither oath or free from oath or whether he wrote neither vow or free from vow and he used the expression in respect of my estates he cannot impose an oath upon her but his heirs may if he wrote however in respect of these estates neither he nor his heirs may exact an oath from her Arnaman stated in the name of Samuel in the name of Abbasal the son of Imamiriam whether the husband wrote neither oath or free from oath whether he wrote neither vow or free from vow or whether he used the expression in respect of my estates or in respect of these estates neither he nor his heirs may exact an oath from her but what can I do in view of a ruling of the sages that anyone who comes to exact payment out of the property of orphans is not to be paid unless he first takes an oath others read this as a very Abbasal the son of Imamiriam stated whether the husband wrote neither oath or free from oath whether he wrote neither vow or free from vow or whether he used the expression in respect of my estates or in respect of these estates neither he nor his heirs may impose an oath upon her but what can I do in view of a ruling of the sages that anyone who comes to exact payment out of the property of orphans need not be paid unless he first takes an oath it was in connection with this very that Arnaman said in the name of Samuel the Halachah is in agreement with the ruling of the son of Imamiriam Mishnah a woman who impairs her Kethubah is not paid unless she first takes an oath if one witness testifies against her that her Kethubah has been paid she is not be paid unless she first takes an oath from the property of orphans from assigned property and from the property of an absent husband she may not recover the payment of her Kethubah unless she first takes an oath how are we to understand the statement a woman who impairs her Kethubah if her Kethubah was for 8000 CUZ and her husband said to her you have already received the full amount of your Kethubah and she says I received only a mina she is not paid the balance unless she takes an oath what is meant by if one witness testifies against her that her Kethubah has been paid if her Kethubah was for 8000 CUZ and when her husband said to her you have received the full amount of your Kethubah she replied I have not received it while one witness testifies against her that the Kethubah has been paid she is not paid unless she first takes an oath. What is meant by the expression from assigned property if her husband had sold his property to others and she seeks to recover payment from the buyer she is not paid unless she first takes an oath what is the explanation of the expression from the property of orphans if her husband died and left his estate to his orphans and she seeks to recover payment from the orphans she is not paid unless she first takes an oath what is to be understood by an absent husband if her husband went to a country beyond the sea and she seeks to recover payment in his absence she is not paid unless she first takes an oath Talmud, Mos Ketha both be our Simeon ruled whenever she claims her Kethubah the ears may impose an oath upon her but where she does not claim her Kethubah the ears cannot impose an oath upon her Gemara Rami Bihama wished to assume that the oath was pentacle since it is a case where one of two persons claims 200 zoos and the other admits 100 the defense. Being an admission of a part of the claim and whoever admits part of a claim must take an oath said Rabbah there are two objections to this assumption in the first place all who take an oath in accordance with Pentateuch law take the oath and do not pay while she takes the oath and receives payment
Installment was paid in the absence of witnesses but not where it was paid in the presence of witnesses This is a case of there is no question there is no question that when the first installment was paid in the presence of witnesses she must take an oath when however it was paid in the absence of witnesses it might be assumed that she has the same privilege as one who restores a lost object to its owner and should therefore receive payment without taking an oath it was therefore taught that the oath is nevertheless not to be dispensed with the question was raised what if a woman impaired her cathedral by including in the amount she admitted sums amounting to less than the value of a parrot is it assumed that since she is so careful in her statements she must be speaking the truth or is it possible that she is merely acting cunningly this remains unsolved the question was raised what if a woman declares her original cathedral to have been less than the amount Recorded in the written document is it assumed that such a woman is in the same position as the woman who impaired her kathuba or is it possible that the two cases are unlike since the woman who impairs her kathuba admits a part of the sum involved while this one does not admit a part of the sum involved come and here a woman who declares that her original kathuba was less than the amount recorded in the document receives payment without an oath how is this to be understood? If her kathuba was for a thousand sous and when her husband said to her you have already received your kathuba she replies I have not received it but the original kathuba was only for one main she is to receive payment without an oath wherewith however does she collect the amount she claims obviously with that document but is not that document Amir Potts heard Rabba the son of Rabba replied this is a case where she states there was an arrangement of mutual trust between me and him if one witness testifies against her that her kathuba has been paid etc. Rami B. have a wish to assume that the oath was pentatical for it is written in scripture one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin it is only for ally iniquity or for any sin that he may not rise up but he may rise up to cause the imposition upon one of the obligation of an oath and furthermore a master has laid down in all cases where two witnesses render a man liable to pay money. One witness renders him liable to take an oath said Rabba there are two objections to this assumption in the first place all who take an oath in accordance with pentatical law do so and do not pay while she takes an oath and receives payment and secondly no oath may be imposed in respect of the denial of a claim that is secured on landed property the fact however is said Rabba that the oath is only rabbinical having been enacted to appease the mind of the husband our papa said Talmud. Mas Kathuba, if he is clever, he may bring her under the obligation of a pentacle oath. He pays her the amount of her Kathuba in the presence of one witness, associates the first witness with the second, and then treats his first payments as a loan. Arshisha, son of R.E.D. Demert, how can one associate the first witness with the second one? But said Arshisha, the son of R.E.D., he might proceed in this manner. He pays her the amount of her Kathuba in the presence of the first witness, and a second one, and then treats his first payments as a loan. Arshisha, Demert, might she not still assert that there were two Kathubas? But said Arshisha, he might inform them of the facts from assigned property elsewhere. We have learned, and so also orphans cannot exact payment unless they first take an oath from whom, if it be suggested from a borrower, it may be objected, since their father would have received payment without an oath. Should they require an oath, it is this, however, that was meant, and so also orphans cannot exact payment from orphans unless they first take an oath. Our Zerika stated in the name of Rab Judah this has been taught only in the case where the orphan stated father told us I have borrowed and paid up. If however they said father told us I have never borrowed the others cannot exact payment even if they take an oath. Rabba demurred on the contrary wherever a man says I have not borrowed it is as if he had said I have not paid the fact however is that if such a statement was at all made it was made in these terms. Our Zerika stated in the name of Rab Judah this has been taught only in the case where the orphan stated father told us I have borrowed and paid up. If however they said father told us I have never borrowed the orphans of the creditor may exact payment from them without an oath because to say I have not borrowed is equivalent to saying I have not paid and from the property of an absent husband a woman may not recover the payment of her. Kathuba, unless she first takes an oath, Araha, the governor of the castle, stated a case was once brought before our Isaac Napaha at Antioch, and he made the statement. This has been taught only in respect of the Kathuba of a woman who receives preferential treatment in order to maintain pleasant relations between her and her husband, but not in respect of the creditor. Rabba, however, stated in the name of Arnam, and even a creditor has been given the same privilege in order that every person shall not take his friend's money and abscond and settle in a country beyond the sea and thus cause the creditor's door to be shut in the face of intending borrowers. Our Simeon ruled whenever she claims her Kathuba, etc. What is our Simeon referring to? Our Jeremiah replied to this, and from the property of an absent husband, a woman may not recover the payment of her Kathuba unless she first takes an oath, which implies that there is no difference between the claim for maintenance and one for. A Kathuba and in opposition to this ruling, our Simeon came to lay down the rule that whenever she claims her Kathuba, the heirs may impose an oath upon her Talmud, Mas Kathuba both be, but where she does not claim her Kathuba, the heirs cannot impose an oath upon her, and they in fact differ on the same principles as those on which Hanan and the sons of the high priest differed. For we learned if a man went to a country beyond the sea and his wife claimed maintenance, she must Hanan rule taken. Oath at the end, but not at the beginning, the sons of the high priest, however, differed from him and said that she must take an oath both at the beginning and at the end. Our Simeon is thus of the same opinion as Hanan, while the rabbis hold the same view as the sons of the high priest, Arshis hate the instead of saying the heirs may impose an oath upon her, it should have said Beth may impose an oath upon her. The fact, however, is said Arshis hate that our Simeon referred to this if. She went from her husband's grave to her father's house or returned to her father-in-law's house but was not made administratrix the ears are not entitled to impose an oath upon her but if she was made administratrix the ears may exact an oath from her in respect of her administration during the subsequent period but may not exact one concerning the past and in reference to this ruling our Simeon came to lay down the rule that whenever she claims her kathuba the ears may enact an oath from her but where she does not claim her kathuba the ears cannot impose an oath upon her and they differ on the same principles as those on which Abyssal and the rabbis differed for we have learned an administrator whom the father of the orphans had appointed must take an oath but one whom the Beth didn't have appointed need not take an oath Abyssal however said the rule is to be reversed if Beth didn't appointed him he must take an oath but if the father of the orphans appointed him he need not take an oath, our Simeon thus holds the same view as Abyssal and the rabbis in our Mishnah hold the same view as the rabbis Abedimer, then rather than say wherever she claims her Kathuba, it should have said if she claims the fact, however, is said Abed that our Simeon referred to this if a husband gave to his wife an undertaking in writing, I renounce my claim upon you for either vow or oath, he cannot impose an oath upon her, etc. If the written undertaking read neither I nor my ears nor my lawful successors will have any claim upon you or your ears or your lawful successors for either vow or oath, neither he nor his ears nor his lawful successors may impose an oath either upon her or upon her ears or upon her lawful successors, and in reference to this ruling, our Simeon came to lay down the rule that whenever she claims her Kathuba, the ears may enact an oath from her, and they consequently differ on the same principles as those on which Abyssal, the son of Ima. Miriam and the rabbis differed. Our Simeon agreeing with Abyssal and the rabbis of our Mishnah with the rabbis our Papa Demur. This would satisfactorily explain the expression whenever she claims her Kathuba, what however can be said in justification of but where she does not claim her Kathuba. The fact, however, is said our Papa our Simeon's ruling was intended to oppose the views of both our Eliezer and those who differed from him. Mishnah, if she produced a letter of divorce without a Kathuba. Talmud, Mas Kathuba, she is entitled to collect the amount of her Kathuba if she, however, produced her Kathuba without a letter of divorce, and while she pleads my letter of divorce was lost, he pleads my quittance was lost, and so also a creditor who produced a bond of indebtedness that was unaccompanied by a proposal. These are not paid. Our Simeon Begamaliel ruled since the time of danger a woman is entitled to collect her Kathuba without a letter of divorce, and a creditor is entitled to. Collect his debt without a proposal tomorrow. This implies does it not that acquittance may be written for if acquittance may not be written would not the possibility have been taken into consideration that the woman might produce her kathuba after her husband's death and collect there with a
This statement is quite intelligible since one might interpret it as applying to a locality where it is the practice to write no kathuba and the husband pleaded I did write one in such a case the man might justly be told produce your evidence and should he fail to do so he might well be told go and pay up according to Rab however the question arises granted that she is not to collect her statutory kathuba letter or at least collect the additional jointer or Joseph replied here we are. Dealing with a case where no witnesses to the divorce were present since the husband could have pleaded I have not divorced her Talmud, Mas Kathabuth B. He is also entitled to plead I have divorced her but I have already paid her the Kathabuth but since it was stated in the final clause our Simeon B. Gamaliel ruled since the time of danger a woman is entitled to collect her Kathabuth without a letter of divorce and a creditor is entitled to collect his debt without a proposal it follows that we are dealing with a case where witnesses to the divorce are present for had no such witnesses been present whereby could she have collected her Kathabuth the fact however is that the entire mission represents the view of our Simeon B. Gamaliel but some clauses are missing the correct reading being the following need not be paid this applies only where no witnesses to the divorce are present but if such witnesses are present she is entitled to collect her additional jointer as to the statutory. Kathuba if she produces her letter of divorce she may collect it but if she does not produce her letter of divorce she may not collect it since the time of danger however a woman may collect her Kathuba even if she does not produce her letter of divorce for our Simeon B. Gamaliel ruled since the time of danger a woman is entitled to collect her Kathuba without a letter of divorce and a credit or I is entitled to collect his debt without a proposal our Kahana and RC said to wrap according to the ruling you have laid down that the statutory Kathuba is collected by the letter of divorce the question arises whereby does a woman who was widowed after her marriage collect her Kathuba obviously through the witnesses who testify to the death of her husband should we not however take into consideration the possibility that her husband might have divorced her and that she might subsequently produce a letter of divorce and collect with it also a widow may collect her Kathuba only. If she lived with her husband but is it not possible that he might have divorced her near the time of his death in such a case it is he who has brought the loss upon himself whereby does a woman who was widowed after her betrothal collect her kathuba obviously by the witnesses who testify to the man's death should we not however take into consideration the possibility that the man might have divorced her and that she would subsequently produce her letter of divorce and collect with it. Also this however is the explanation where no other course is possible acquittance may be written for were you not to admit this the objection might be raised even in respect of the very witnesses who testify to her husband's death the possibility should be considered that the woman might present one pair of witnesses to her husband's death before one court and so collect her kathuba and then present another pair before another court and collect it again it must be obvious. Therefore that where no other course is possible acquittance may be written said Mark Ashisa the son of Arhistah to Arashi once is it derived that a woman who was widowed after her betrothal is entitled to a kathuba if it be suggested that it may he derive from this passage a woman who was widowed or divorced either after her betrothal or after her marriage is entitled to collect all that is due to her is it not possible it may be retorted that this applies to a case where the man had written a kathuba for her and were you to argue if he has written one for her what need was there to tell such an obvious rule it could be retorted that it serves the purpose of rejecting the view of RLA's or Ezra who maintained that the man wrote the additional jointure for her with the sole object of marrying her the inference too from the mission aside leads to the same conclusion for it has been stated she is entitled to collect all that is due to her now if you agree that this is a case where the man had written a kathu before her one can well understand why she is entitled to collect all that is due to her if you submit however that the man did not write a kathu before her what it may be objected is the justification for the expression is entitled to collect all seeing that she is only entitled to 100 or 200 zoos should it however be suggested that the law may be derived from that which are high be often taught in the case of a betrothed. Wife a husband is neither subject to the laws of Onan nor may he defile himself for her and she likewise is not subject to the laws of the Onan nor is she obliged to defile herself for him if she died he does not inherit from her though if he died she is entitled to collect the amount of her kathu is it not possible it might be retorted that this refers only to a case where the man had written a kathu before her and should you argue if he had written one for her what need was there to State such an obvious ruling it might be replied that it was necessary in order to inform us that if she died he does not inherit from her Arnav and said to Arunah according to Rab who laid down that a letter of divorce enables a woman to collect her statutory kathuba is there no cause to apprehend that she might produce a letter of divorce at one court of law and collect her kathuba there with and then again produce it at another court of law and collect there with a second time and should you reply that it might be torn up could she not it may be retorted demand I need it to be enabled thereby to marry again what we do is we tear it up and endorse on the back of it this letter of divorce has been torn by us not because it is an invalid document but in order to prevent the woman from collecting there with a second payments mission a woman who produced two letters of divorce and two kathubas may collect payment of the two kathubas if she produces however two. Kathubas and one letter of divorce or one kathuba and two letters of divorce or a kathuba letter of divorce and evidence of her husband's death she may collect payment for one kathuba only for any man who divorces his wife and then Remar rise her contracts his second marriage on the condition of the first kathuba gemara if she desired it she could evidently collect payment of her kathuba either with the one kathuba or with the other may it not then be argued that this ruling presents an objection against the ruling which are nomin stated in the name of Samuel for our nomin stated in the name of Samuel where two bills are issued one after the other the latter annuls the former has it not been stated in connection with this ruling that our papa said our nomin in fact admits that if one has added in the second bill one palm tree it is assumed that he has written it for the sake of that addition so also here it is a case where the husband has added something for her. In the second kathuba, our rabbis taught if a woman produced a letter of divorce, a kathuba, and evidence of her husband's death, Talmud, Mas kathuba, she may if the letter of divorce bears an earlier date than the kathuba, collect payment for two kathubas, but if the kathuba bears an earlier date than the letter of divorce, she may collect payment of one kathuba only for any man who divorces his wife and then remarries her, contracts his second marriage on the condition of the first. Kathuba Mishnah in the case of a minor whom his father had given in marriage, the kathuba of his wife remains valid since it is on this condition that he kept her as his wife. In the case of one who became a proselyte and his wife with him, the kathuba remains valid since it is on this condition that he kept her as his wife. Gemara Arunah stated the ruling of our Mishnah was given only in respect of the main or the two hundred zoos to the additional jointer, however, she is not entitled rab. Judah however stated she is entitled to receive payment for her additional jointure also an objection was raised if an additional monetary obligation was undertaken the woman receives that which was added thus it follows does it not that only if an additional monetary obligation was undertaken is the woman to receive any addition but if no such addition was made she does not receive any addition at all read also that which had been added but surely in the following very day it was not taught so if an additional monetary obligation was undertaken the woman receives that which was added and if no additional monetary obligation was undertaken a virgin receives 200 zoos and a widow receives a mina is not this then an objection against Rav Judah Rav Judah was misled by the wording of our Mishnah he thought that the rule the kathuba of his wife remains valid applied to the full amount but in fact it is not so it applies to the statutory kathuba alone C-H-A-P-T-E-R-X. Mishnah if a man was married to two wives and died the first wife taxes precedence over the second and the heirs of the first wife take precedence over the heirs of the second if he married a first wife and she died and then he married a second wife and he himself died the second wife and her heirs take precedence over the heirs of the first wife Gemara since it was stated the first wife takes precedence over the second but not the first wife receives payment and the second does not it may be implied that if the second wife forestalled the first and seized the payment of her kathuba it cannot be taken away from her may it then be inferred from this ruling that if a creditor of a later date has forestalled one of an earlier date and dist reigned on the property of the debtor his distraint is of legal validity in fact it may be maintained that his distraint is of no legal validity and as to the phrase takes precedence it means complete right of seizure as we have learned a son takes precedence over a daughter.
children and we do not apprehend any quarreling whence is this inferred since it was stated the second wife and her heirs take precedence over the heirs of the first wife it follows that they are only entitled to precedence but that if there is a balance the others also take their share it may also be inferred that the ketuba of the second wife may be regarded as a surplus over the other whence is this inferred since it was not stated that payment is made only if a surplus of a Dinar remained there furthermore it may be inferred that a ketuba claimed by virtue of the male children clause may not be dist reigned on mortgaged property for if it could be imagined that it may be dist reigned on mortgaged property the sons of the first wife should be entitled to come and dist reign on the property of the sons of the second to this arashi demurred whence these conclusions might I not in fact maintain that if one wife died while her husband was alive and the other after his death the sons of the former are not entitled to the ketuba that they claim by virtue of the male children clause whilst the expression of take precedence might refer to the inheritance and were you to retort what was the object of the description the heirs of the first wife I might reply that as the Tana used the expression the second wife and her heirs he also spoke of the heirs of the first wife and with reference to your conclusion that the ketuba of the second wife may be regarded as a surplus over the other might I not in fact still maintain that no ketuba may be regarded as a surplus over the other but here it is a case where there was a surplus of a dinar as to the case where one wife died during her husband's lifetime and the other after his death this is a matter in dispute between Tanaim for it was taught if a man's wives died one during his lifetime and the other after his death the sons of the first wife Ben Nanyas rule can say to the Sons of the second, you are the sons of a creditor, take your mother's ketubah and go. Our said the inheritance has already been transferred from the sole right of inheritance by the sons of the first wife, the joint right of inheritance by these, and the sons of the second, do they not differ on the following principle? One master holds the opinion that where one wife died during her husband's lifetime and the other after his death, the sons of the former are entitled to the ketubah of their mother by virtue of the male children clause, and the other master holds that where one wife died during a husband's lifetime and the other after his death, the sons of the former are not entitled to the male children ketubah. Said Rabbi, I found the young scholars of the academy while they were sitting at their studies and arguing, all may hold the view that where one wife died during her husband's lifetime and the other after his death, the sons of the former are entitled to. Their mother's male children ketuba, but here they differ on the principle whether the second wife's ketuba may be regarded as a surplus over the other, and the same dispute applies to the debt of a creditor. One master holds that the second wife's ketuba is regarded as a surplus over the other, and the same law applies to the debt of a creditor, and the other master holds that no one ketuba may be regarded as a surplus over the other, and the same law applies to the debt of a creditor. Thereupon I said to them in respect of a claim of a creditor, no one's disputes the view that the debt is regarded as a surplus, they only differ in respect of a ketuba to this are Joseph demurred. If so, instead of saying our Akiva said the inheritance has already been transferred, it should have said if there is a surplus of a dinar, the sons of the first wife receive their mother's ketuba. The fact, however, is said are Joseph that they differ on the question whether the male Children Ketuba is payable where one wife died during her husband's lifetime and the other after his death. These Tanaim differ on the same principle as the following Tanaim for it was taught if a man married his first wife and she died and then he married his second wife and he himself died the sons of this wife may come after her death and exact their mother's Ketuba. Our Simeon ruled if there is a surplus of one dinar both receive the Ketubas of their mothers but if no such surplus remains they divide the residue in equal portions do they not differ on this principle whereas one master holds that where one wife died during her husband's lifetime and the other after his death the sons of the former are entitled to the male children Ketuba. The other master holds that where one wife died during her husband's lifetime and the other after his death the children of the former are not entitled to the male children Ketuba. No all may agree that where one Wife died during her husband's lifetime and the other after his death the sons of the former are to receive the male children Ketuba Talmud, Mos Ketuba both but they differ here on the question whether it is necessary for the surplus dinar to consist of real estate the one master holds that only real estate is regarded as a surplus but not movables and the other master holds that even movables are regarded as surplus but can you say so have we not learned our Simeon rule even if there was movable property it is of no avail unless there was landed property of the value of one dinar more than the total amount of the two Ketubas the fact however is that they differ here on the question whether a dinar of mortgage property is regarded as a surplus one master holds that only free property constitutes a surplus but not mortgage property and the other master holds that mortgage property also constitutes a surplus if so instead of stating our Simeon rule if there is a surplus of one dinar should it not have been stated since there is a surplus of one dinar the fact however is that they differ on the question whether a sum less than a dinar constitutes a surplus one master is of the opinion that only a dinar constitutes a surplus but not a sum less than a dinar and the other master holds that even less than a dinar constitutes a surplus but did not our Simeon however say a dinar and were you to reply reverse their views does not the first ten of the mission it may be retorted also speak of a dinar the fact however is that we must follow on the lines of the first two explanations and reverse the views Marzitra stated in the name of our Papa the law is that where one wife died during her husband's lifetime and the other after his death the sons of the former are entitled to the male children Ketuba and that one Ketuba is regarded as a surplus over the other now granted that if we had been told that where one wife Died during her husband's lifetime and the other after his death the sons of the former are entitled to the male children Ketuba but had not been told that one Ketuba is regarded as a surplus over the other it might have been presumed that the former law applied only where the surplus amounted to a dinar but not otherwise why however could we not have been informed of the second law only because that one Ketuba is regarded as a surplus over the other and it would have been self-evident would it not that this ruling was due to the law that where one wife died during her husband's lifetime and the other after his death the sons of the former are entitled to the male children Ketuba if we were given the information in such a manner the law might have been presumed to apply to a case for instance where a man had married three wives of whom two died during his lifetime and one after his death and the last mentioned had given birth to a daughter who is not entitled to heirship but not to the case where one wife died during her husband's lifetime and the other after his death and the latter had given birth to a son since in this case the possibility of a quarrel might have to be taken into consideration hence we were taught that even in this case one ketuba is regarded as surplus over the other mission if a man was married to two wives and they died and subsequently he himself died and the orphans of one of the wives claimed their mother's ketuba but the estate of the deceased husband is only enough for the settlement of the two ketubas all the orphans receive equal shares if there was a surplus of a minimum of one denar each group of sons received the ketuba of their mother if the orphans of one of the wives said we are offering for our father's estate one denar more than the total amount of the ketubas in order that they might thereby be enabled to take their mother's ketuba their request is Disregarded and the estate is properly valued at the Beth if the estate included prospective property it is not regarded as property held in actual possession our Simeon rule even if there was movable property it is of no avail unless there was landed property worth one dinar more than the total amount of the two Ketubas Gemara our rabbis taught if one wife had a Ketubah for a thousand zoos and the other for five hundred each group of sons received the Ketubah of their mother provided a surplus of one dinar was available otherwise they must divide the estate in equal proportions it is obvious that if the estate was large and it depreciated the heirs have already acquired ownership thereof what however is the ruling where the estate was small and it appreciated come and hear the case of the estate of the house of Barzars or which was small and it appreciated and when the heirs came with their suit before our room he said to them it is your duty to Satisfy them as they disregarded his ruling he said to them if you will not satisfy them I will chastise you with a thorn that causes no blood to flow thereupon he sent them to Arnaman who said to them just as in the case where an estate was large and it depreciated Talmud, Mos Ketha both be the ears have already acquired ownership thereof so also where the estate was small and it appreciated the other ears have already acquired ownership thereof Nimon 8000 and 100 duty. In a Ketubah Jacob put up his fields by words of claimants a man against whom there was a claim of a thousand zoos had two mansions each of which he sold for 500 zoos the creditor thereupon came and
Question proposed to say that this was a case exactly analogous to that in our mission if the orphans of one of the wives said etc. But Abbe said to him are the two cases at all alike there the orphans would have suffered a loss but here what loss would the creditor have he lent a hundred and receives a hundred for what amount is the turpa made out of and is said for a hundred rr is said for fifty and the law is that it is made out for fifty a certain man against whom there was a claim. For a hundred zoos died and left a small plot of land that was worth fifty zoos as his creditor came and dis rained on it the orphans went to him and handed to him fifty zoos thereupon he dis rained on it again when they came with this action before Abbe he said to them it is a moral duty incumbent upon orphans to pay the debt of their father with the first payment you have performed a moral duty and now that he has seized the land again his action is perfectly lawful this ruling however. Applies only in the case where the orphans did not tell him these fifty zoos are for the price of the small plot of land, but if they did tell him these fifty zoos are for the price of the small plot of land, they have thereby entirely dismissed him. A certain man once sold the ketubah of his mother for a goodwill price and said to the buyer, If mother comes and raises objections, I shall not pay you any compensation. His mother then died, having raised no objections, but he himself came and objected. Rami Bihama, in discussing the case, proposed to decide that he takes the place of his mother. Rabbah, however, said to him, Granted that he did not accept any responsibility for her action, did he not accept responsibility for his own action? Either Rami Bihama stated if Reuben sold a field to Simeon without a guarantee, and Simeon then resold it to Reuben with a guarantee, Talmud, Mosque, Ketubah, and Reuben's creditor came and seized it from him. The law is that Simeon must proceed to offer. Him compensation Rabbah however said to him granted that Simeon had accepted responsibility for general claims did he also accept responsibility for claims against Reuben himself Rabbah admits however that where Reuben inherited a field from Jacob and sold it to Simeon without a guarantee and Simeon then resold it to Reuben with a guarantee whereupon Jacob's creditor came and seized it from him the law is that Simeon must proceed to offer him compensation what is the reason Jacob's creditor is regarded as any other creditor Rami Bihama further stated if Reuben sold a field to Simeon with a guarantee and allowed the price of the field to stand as a loan and when Reuben died and his creditor came to seize it from Simeon the latter satisfied him by refunding to him the amount the law is that Reuben's children can tell him as far as we are concerned our father has left movables with you and the movables of orphans are not pledged to a creditor Rabbah remarked if the other is Clever he gives them a plot of land in settlement of the debt and then he collects it from them in accordance with the ruling of Arnaman who stated in the name of Rabbi Abba if orphans collected a plot of land for their father's debt a creditor may in turn collect it from them Rabbi stated if Reuben sold all his fields to Simeon who in turn sold one field of these to Levi and then Reuben's creditor appeared the latter may collect either from the one or from the other this law however applies only where Levi had bought land of medium quality but if he bought either the best or the worst he may tell him it is for this reason that I have taken the trouble to buy the best or the worst because either is land which is not available for you and even when he bought medium quality the law is applicable only where Levi did not leave medium quality of a similar nature Talmud Mosque both be but if he did leave medium quality of a similar nature he may lawfully tell him I have left for you ample land from which to collect your debt of a stated if Reuben sold a field to Simeon with a guarantee and a creditor of Reuben's came to dis to rain on it the law is that Reuben may proceed to litigate with that creditor and the latter cannot say to him you are no party to me for the other can retort for whatever you will take away from him he will turn to me to claim compensation others say even where no guarantee was given the same law applies since Reuben may say to him I do not like Simeon to have any grievance against me I further stated if Reuben sold a field to Simeon without a guarantee and there appeared against him Talmud Mosque both the claimants disputing his title to the field he may withdraw before he has taken possession of it but after he had taken possession of it he may no longer withdraw because Reuben can say to him you have agreed to a bag sealed with knots and you got it and from what moment is possession considered to have been affected as soon as he sets his foot upon the landmarks. Others say even if the sale was made with a guarantee, the same law applies since the seller might say to him, produce the turpa that was issued against you, and I shall pay you mission if a man who was married to three wives died and the ketubah of one was a main of the other two hundred zuz and of the third three hundred zuz and the estate was worth only one main of the sum I divided equally if the estate was worth two hundred zuz. The claimant of the main receives fifty zuz and the claimants respectively of the two hundred and the three hundred zuz receive each three gold denarii if the estate was worth three hundred zuz. The claimant of the main receives fifty zuz and the claimant of the two hundred zuz receives a main while the claimant of the three hundred zuz receives six gold denarii. Similarly, if three persons contributed to a joint fund and they had made a loss or a profit, they Share in the same manner Gamara the claimant of the main receives 50 zuz should she not be entitled to 33 and the third zuz only Samuel replied here it is a case where the one who is entitled to the 200 zuz gave a written undertaking to the woman who was entitled to one main I have no claim whatsoever upon the main but if so read the next clause the claimants respectively of the 200 and the 300 zuz receive each three gold area why it may be objected could she not tell her you have already renounced your claim upon it because she can reply I have only renounced my claim if the estate was worth 300 etc why should the claimant of the 200 zuz receive a main when in fact she should be entitled to 75 zuz only Samuel replied our mission refers to a case where the woman who was entitled to the 300 zuz gave a written undertaking to the one who was entitled to the 200 zuz and it other who was entitled to a main I have no claim whatsoever upon you in respect of one main our Jacob of Nihar Pekhod replied in the name of Rubin the first clause deals with two acts of seizure and the final clause deals with two acts of seizure the first clause deals with two acts of seizure the 75 zoos came into their hands the first time and 125 the second time the final clause deals with two acts of seizure the 75 came into their hands the first time and 225 the second time it was taught this is the teaching of our Nathan Rabbi however said I do not approve of our Nathan's views in these cases for the three wives take equal share similarly if three persons contributed Samuel ruled if two persons contributed to a joint fund one of them a main and the other 200 zoos Talmud Mosque both be the prophet is to be equally divided Rabbi said it stands to reason that Samuel's ruling applies where an ox was Purchased for plowing and was used for plowing where however an ox was purchased for plowing and was used for slaughter each of the partners receives a share in proportion to his capital Arham Nana however ruled where an ox was bought for plowing even if it was used for slaughter the profit must be equally divided an objection was raised if two persons contributed to a joint fund one of them Amina and the other two hundred zoos the profit is to be equally divided does not this refer to an ox bought for plowing and used for slaughter and thus presenting an objection against Rabbi no it refers to an ox that was bought for plowing and was used for plowing what however is the law where an ox was bought for plowing and used for killing does each partner in such a case receive a share in proportion to his capital then instead of stating in the final clause if one man had bought some oxen out of his own money and the other had bought some out of his own money and the animals were mixed up each partner receives a share in proportion to his capital could not a distinction have been made in the very same case thus this applies only where an ox was bought for plowing and was used for plowing but where an ox was bought for plowing and was used for slaughter each partner receives a share in proportion to his capital it is this in fact that was implied this applies only where an ox was bought for plowing and was used for plowing but where an ox was bought for plowing and was used for slaughter the law is the same as if one man had bought some oxen out of his own money and the other had bought some out of his own money and the animals were mixed up in which case each party receives a share in proportion to his capital we learn similarly if three persons contributed to a joint fund and they made a loss or a profit they share in the same manner does not they made a loss mean that they made a loss on their actual Transaction and a profit that they made a profit on their actual transaction are nomin replied in the name of Rabbi Bihabu no they made a profit owing to the issue of new coins and they made a loss by the deterioration of a coin into an istir that was only suitable for application to a bunyan mission if a man who was
Debtor's property, the first tanda holds that such distraint has no legal validity, and Ben Nanyas holds that whatever he dis on is legally his arnaman in the name of Rabbi Biabo replied, both agree that the distraint of a creditor of a later date has no legal validity, but here they differ on the question whether provision is to be made against the possibility that the fourth woman might allow the ground to deteriorate. One master is of the opinion that provision is to be made. Against the possibility that she might allow the ground to deteriorate, and the other master is of the opinion that no provision need be made against such a possibility. Abay replied, the difference between them is the ruling of Abay the Elder, who stated the orphans spoken of are grown UPS, and there is no need to say that minors are included. The first tanda does not hold the view of Abay the Elder, while Ben Nanyas upholds it, or who not stated if two brothers or two partners had a lawsuit against A. Third party and one of them went with that person to law. The other cannot say to him, "You are not my party," because the one who went to law acted on his behalf. Also, our nomin once visited Sura and was asked what the law was. In such a case, he replied, "This is a case that has been stated in our mission. The first must take an oath in order to give satisfaction to the second, the second to the third, and the third to the fourth. But it was not stated the first to the third. Now, what could be the reason? Obviously, because the second has acted on her behalf. Also, but are the two cases alike in the latter? An oath for one person is the same as an oath for a hundred. But in this case, he might well plead had El been present. I would have submitted more convincing arguments. This, however, applies only when he was not in town when the action was tried. But if he was in town, his plea is disregarded since if he had any valid arguments, he ought to have come. It was stated if two deeds bearing the same date are presented in court. The property in question, Rab rule, should be divided between the two claimants and Samuel rule. The case is to be decided at the discretion of the judges. Must it be assumed that Rab follows the view of our mayor who holds that the signatures of the witnesses make a get effective Talmud? Mosque hath both be and that Samuel follows the view of our Eliezer who holds that the witnesses to the delivery of a get make it effective. No, all follow the view of our Eliezer. But it is the following principle on which they differ. Your Rab is of the opinion that a division between the claimants is preferable, and Samuel holds that leaving the decision to the discretion of the judges is preferable. But can you maintain that Rab follows the view of our Eliezer? Surely Rab Judah stated in the name of Rab the Halajah is in agreement with our Eliezer in matters of divorce, and he added when I mentioned this in Samuel's presence, he said also in the case of other deeds. Does not this then imply that Rab is of the opinion that in the case of deeds the Halajah is not in agreement with our Eliezer? Clearly Rab follows the view of our Meir and Samuel that of our Eliezer an objection was raised if two deeds bearing the same date are produced in court the property in question is to be divided is not this an objection against Samuel? Samuel can answer you this represents the view of our Meir but I follow the view of our Eliezer but if this represents the view of our Meir. Read the final clause if he wrote a deed for one man and then he wrote a deed for and delivered it to another man the one to whom he delivered the deed acquires legal possession now if this represents the view of our Meir why does he acquire possession did he not in fact lay down that the signatures of the witnesses make a get effective this is a question which is also in dispute between Tanaim for it was taught and the sages say that the money must be divided while here it was. Ruled that the trustee shall use his own discretion. The mother of Rami Bihama gave her property in writing to Rami Bihama in the morning, but in the evening she gave it in writing to Marak Bah Bihama. Rami Bihama came before Arshis Hate, who confirmed him in the possession of the property. Marak Bah then appeared before Arnaman, who similarly confirmed him in the possession of the property. Arshis Hate thereupon came to Arnaman and said to him, What is the reason that the master has acted in this way? And what is the reason the other retorted that the master has acted in that way? Because the former replied, Rami's deed was written first. Are we then the other retorted, living in Jerusalem where the hours are inserted in deeds? And why the former asked, Did the master act in this way? I treated it. The other retorted as a case to be decided at the discretion of the judges. I too, the first said, Treated the case as one to be decided at the discretion of the judges in the first place. The other retorted, I am a judge and the master is no judge. And furthermore, you did not at first come with this argument. Two deeds of sale were once presented before our Joseph, one being dated on the 5th of Nissan and the other was vaguely dated in Nissan. Our Joseph confirmed the holder of the deed which had the entry 5th of Nissan in the possession of the property. And I said, The other must lose you. He replied, Are at a disadvantage since it may be suggested that your deed was one that was written. On the 29th of Nissan, will then the master the other asked right for me Talmud, Mosque Hatha Bothea Terpa authorizing distraint on property sold after the first of year. They he replied, Might tell you you are holding a deed that was written on the first of Nissan. What means of redress can he have recourse to? They write out authorizations to one another. Mission if a man who was married to two wives sold his field and the first wife had given a written declaration to the buyer, I have. No claim whatsoever upon you. The second wife may dis to reign on the buyer and the first wife on the second and the buyer on the first wife, and so they go on in turn until they arrange some compromise between them. The same law applies also to a creditor and to a woman creditor. Tomorrow, what matters it? Even if she had given him a written declaration, has it not been a man says to another, I have no claim whatsoever on this field, I have no concern in it, and I'll entirely dissociate myself from it. His statement is of no effect here. We are dealing with a case where Kanyan was executed, but even if Kanyan had been executed, what is the use? Could she not say, I merely wish to oblige my husband? Have we not in fact learned if a man bought a married woman's property from her husband and then bought it also from the wife? His purchase is legally invalid. Does not this show clearly that the woman can plead, I merely wish to oblige my husband? Arzera replied in the name of Arhista, this is no. Difficulty one ruling is that of our mayor and the other is that of our Judah for it was taught if a husband drew up a deed for the buyer of a field of his wife and she did not endorse it and then he drew up a deed for another buyer of a field of hers and that she did endorse she loses thereby her claim to her kathuba so our mayor our Judah however said she may plead I merely meant to oblige my husband what claim can you have against me as to rabbi however would he allow the anonymous Mishnah here to represent the view of our mayor and the anonymous Mishnah there to represent the view of our Judah our papa replied our Mishnah deals with the case of a divorced woman and it represents the opinion of all our Ashi replied both Mishnahs represent the views of our mayor for our mayor maintains his view only there where two buyers are concerned since in such a case she may well be told if you wish to oblige you should have done so in the case of the first buyer but where only one buyer is Concerned even our mayor admits that the sale is invalid while our mission refers to a case where the husband had first written out a deed for another buyer elsewhere we learned payment cannot be recovered from mortgage property where free assets are available even if they are only of the poorest quality the question was raised if the free assets were blessed it may the mortgage property be dis to on come and here if the husband drew up a deed for the buyer of a field of his wife and she did not endorse it and then he drew up a deed for another buyer of a field of hers and that she did endorse she loses thereby her claim to her kathuba so our mayor now if it could be imagined that where the free assets were blessed the mortgage property may be dis to on the difficulty would arise granted that she lost her right to recover her kathuba from the second buyer why should she not be entitled to recover it at any rate from the first buyer said our nomin b isaac the Meaning of she loses is that she loses her right to recover her due from the second buyer said Robert two objections may be raised against this explanation in the first place it may be pointed out that the expression of she loses implies total loss and furthermore it was taught if a man borrowed from one person and sold his property to two others and the creditor gave a written declaration to the second buyer I have no claim whatever upon you this creditor has no claim whatever upon the first buyer since the latter can tell him I have left you a source from which to recover your debt there it may be argued that it was he who had deliberately caused the loss to himself said Aryamar to Arashi Talmud, Mosque Hatha both be the surely is the regular practice of the courts of law for did not a man once pledge a vineyard to his friend for ten years but it aged after five years and when the creditor came to the rabbis they wrote out a turpa for him there also it was they who Caused the loss to themselves for having been aware that it may happen that a vineyard should age they should not have bought any of the debtors pledged land the law however is that where free assets are blessed mortgage property may be
in the possession of the buyer but why should this case be different from the following where we learned and so they go on in turn until they arrange some compromise between them there they are all suffering some loss but here it is only the buyer who suffers the loss Raf Ram went to Arashi and recited this argument to him could Abbe have laid down such a ruling did he not in fact lay down if a man said to a woman my estate shall be yours and after you it shall be given to so and so and then the woman married her husband has the status of a vendee and her successor has no legal claim in face of her husband the other replied there it is a woman to whom he spoke while she was femme sold but here we are dealing with one to whom he spoke when she was married for it is this that he meant to tell her your successor only shall acquire possession your husband shall not the same law applies also to a creditor a tenant taught the same law applies to a creditor and two buyers and also to a Woman who was a creditor and two buyer C-H-A-P-T-E-R-X I mission a widow is to be maintained out of the estate of her deceased husband's orphans and her handiwork belongs to them it is not their duty however to bury her it is the duty of her heirs even those who inherit her kathuba to bury her Gemara the question was asked have we learned is to be maintained or one who is maintained have we learned is to be maintained in agreement with the men of Galilee so that there is no way by which the orphans can avoid maintaining her or have we rather learned one who is maintained in agreement with the men of Judea so that the orphans if they wish it need not maintain her Talmud, Mosque Ketha both come and hear what Arzara stated in the name of Samuel the find of a widow belongs to herself now if you grant that what we learned was one who is maintained this ruling is quite justified but if you insist that what we learned was is to be maintained why it might be objected should they not have the same rights as a husband and just as in the latter case a wife's find belongs to her husband so with the former case also the find of a woman should belong to the heirs I may still insist that what we have learned was is to be maintained for the reason why the rabbis have ordained that the find of a wife belong to her husband is in order that he shall bear no grudge against her but as regards these let them bear the grudge our Jose be had ruled all manner of work which a wife must render to her husband a widow must render to the orphans with the exception of serving one's drinks making ready one's bed and washing one's face hands or feet our Joshua be Levi ruled all manner of service that a slave must render to his master a student must render to his teacher except that of taking off his shuraba explained this ruling applies only to a place where he is not known but where he is known there can be no objection or as she said even where he is not known the ruling applies only where he does not put on tefillin but where he puts on tefillin he may well perform such a service our high be abba stated in the name of our yohanan a man who deprives his student of the privilege of attending on him acts as if he had deprived him of an act of kindness for it is said in scripture to him that deprives his friend of kindness our nomin be isaac said he also deprives him of the fear of heaven for it is said in scripture and he forsake the fear of the almighty our is ruled if a widow sees movables to provide for her maintenance her act is valid so it was also taught if a widow sees movables to provide for her maintenance her act is valid and so our dimi when he came related it once happened that the daughter-in-law of our shabbatai seized a saddle bag that was full of money and the sages had no power to take it out of her possession robin rule this applies only to maintenance but movable seized in payment of a may be taken away from her mar son of are ashi demurred wherein is the case of seizure for a kathuba different from the other is it because the former may be dis terrain for unlanded property and not unmovables may not maintenance also it may be objected be dis terrain unlanded property and not unmovables the fact however is that as in respect of maintenance seizure is valid so it is also valid in respect of a kathuba said our isaac be naftali to rubbin us in agreement with your view it has also been stated in the name of rabbi are yohanan stated in the name of our jose bizimra a widow who allowed two or three years to pass before she claimed maintenance loses her maintenance now that it has been said that she loses her maintenance after two years was it necessary to mention also three this is no difficulty the lesser number refers to a poor woman while the bigger one refers to a rich woman or else the former refers to a bold woman and the latter to a modest woman rabbi rule this applies only to a retrospective Claim but in respect of the future she is entitled to maintenance or Yohanan inquired if the orphans plead we have already paid the cost of maintenance in advance and she retorts I did not receive it who must produce the proof Talmud. Mosque Ketha both B is the estate of the deceased man in the presumptive possession of the orphans and consequently it is the widow who must produce the proof or is the estate rather in the presumptive possession of the widow and the proof must be produced by the orphans come and hear what Levi taught in a dispute on the maintenance of a widow the orphans must produce the proof so long as she is unmarried but if she was married the proof must be produced by her Arshim IB as she said this point is a matter in dispute between the following ten names she may sell portions of her deceased husband's estate but should specify in writing these I have sold for maintenance and these I have sold for the Ketha as the case may be so our Judah our Jose however Rule she may sell such portions and need not specify the purpose in writing for in this manner she gains an advantage they thus apparently differ on the following point our Judah who ruled that it is necessary to specify the purpose holds that the deceased man's estate is in the presumptive possession of the orphans and that it is the widow who must produce the proof whilst our Jose who ruled that it was not necessary to specify the purpose of holds of you that the estate is in the presumptive possession of the widow and that it is the orphans who must produce the proof once it is made so obvious it is quite possible that all agree that the deceased man's estate is in the presumptive possession of his widow and that the orphans must produce the proof but our Judah is merely tendering good advice by following which the widow would prevent people from calling her a glutton for were you not to admit this could not the question raised by our Yohan and be answered from it. Mishnah she may sell her deceased husband's estate for her maintenance out of court but should enter in the deed of sale I have sold these for maintenance consequently it must be concluded that no deduction may be made from the Mishnah because therein only good advice was tendered and so also here it may similarly be submitted that our Judah was only tendering good advice or else all may agree that the estate of the deceased is in the presumptive possession of the orphans but our Jose's reason is exactly the same as that given by Abbe the elder who stated to what may the ruling of our Jose be compared to the instructions of a dying man who said give two hundred zoos to so and so my creditor who may take them if he wishes in settlement of his debt or if he prefers he may take them as a gift Talmud, Mosque Ketha who if he takes them as a gift has not the same advantage as if he had taken them for his debt in what manner does a widow sell her deceased husband's Property for her maintenance or Daniel son of Arkatna replied in the name of Arhuna she sells portions of it once in 12 months and the buyer supplies her maintenance in installments once every 30 days Rab Judah however stated she sells once in 6 months and the buyer provides her maintenance in installments once every 30 days it was taught in agreement with Arhuna widow sells once in 12 months and the buyer supplies her maintenance in installments once every 30 days it was also taught in agreement with Rab Judah widow sells once in 6 months and the buyer provides her maintenance in installments once every 30 days Amimar said the law is that a widow sells sufficient land to suffice her for 6 months and the buyer provides her maintenance in installments once every 30 days said Arashi to Amimar what about the ruling of Arhuna I the other replied have not heard of it by which he meant I do not approve of it Arshi's hate was asked May a widow who sold land for her maintenance subsequently dis terrain on it for her kathuba. This question was raised on the basis of a ruling of our Joseph who stated if a widow has sold any of her deceased husband's estate the responsibility for the indemnity falls upon the orphans and if the court sold any such property the responsibility for the indemnity again falls upon the orphans what then it was asked is the ruling may she since the responsibility for the indemnity falls upon the orphans dis terrain on the land or is it possible that the buyers may tell her granted that you have not accepted general responsibility for indemnity did you not indeed accept responsibility against distraint by yourself either you he replied have learned that a widow may continue to sell until only the estate of the value of her kathuba remains and this is a support to her since she might thus collect her kathuba from the residue thus it may be inferred that only if she left estate corresponding to the value of her kathuba may she collect her kathuba but if she did not leave so much of the estate she may not but is it not possible that he was merely tendering good advice in order that people might not call her a swindler if so he should have stated she collects her kathuba from the remainder why then did he also add a support to her consequently it
daily occurrence and to which the former retorted yes a dirt at Nihartia is indeed a common occurrence and the law is that if a man sold a plot of land and on concluding the sale was no longer in need of money the sale may be withdrawn Mishnah a widow whether her husband died after her betrothal or after her marriage may sell of her deceased husband's estate without the sanction of Beth Din Arsimian ruled if her husband died after marriage she may sell of his estate without the sanction of Beth Din but if only after her betrothal she may not sell any of the estate except with the sanction of Beth Din since she is not entitled to maintenance and one who is not entitled to maintenance may not sell such property except with the sanction of Beth Din Gamara one can readily see that the privilege of a woman who was widowed after marriage is due to her immediate need for maintenance Talmud, Moskha Tabukhi what however is the reason for conferring this privilege upon one widowed after betrothal Lola replied in order to enhance the attractions of matrimony are Yohanan replied because no man wants his wife to suffer the indignity of appearing in court what is the practical difference between them the practical difference between them is the case of a divorced woman for according to him who replied in order to enhance the attractiveness of matrimony a divorced woman also may claim the privilege of the provision for matrimonial Attractiveness, but according to him who replied, because no man wants his wife to suffer the indignity of appearing in court, a divorced woman is not entitled to the privilege since a man does not care for her dignity. We learned, and a divorced woman may not sell of her former husband's estate except with the sanction of Beth Din. Now, according to him who replied, because no man wants his wife to suffer the indignity of appearing in court, the ruling is well justified since for a divorced wife one does not care, but according to him who replied, in order to enhance the attractions of matrimony, why should not a divorced woman also be entitled to claim the privilege of the provision for matrimonial attractiveness? This represents the view of our Simeon. If this represents the view of our Simeon, the objection arises was not this principle already laid down in the earlier clause after her betrothal, she may not sell, etc. It might have been presumed that his ruling applied only. To a woman widowed after her betrothal, since in her case there was not much affection, but that a divorced woman in whose case there was much affection may demand the privilege of the provision for matrimonial attraction. But have we not learned this also who is not entitled to maintenance, which includes does it not a divorced woman? No, it includes one who is both divorced and not divorced, as the one spoken of by Arzera, who stated wherever the sages describe the woman as both divorced and not divorced, her husband is responsible for her maintenance. Come and hear as she may sell of her deceased husband's estate without the sanction of Beth Din, so may her ears those who inherit her Kathuba sell such property without the sanction of Beth Din. Now, according to him who replied, because no man wants his wife to suffer the indignity of appearing in court, one can well see the reason for this ruling, for as it is disagreeable to him that she should suffer indignity, so it is also. Disagreeable to him that her ears should suffer indignity according to him however who replied in order to enhance the attractiveness of matrimony what consideration for attractiveness it may be objected could there be in respect of her ears will interpreted this to be a case where her daughter for instance or her sister was her ear mission a widow who sold her kathuba or part of it or pledged it or part of it or presented it or part of it to a stranger may not sell the residue of her deceased husband's estate except with the sanction of Beth Din the sages however ruled she may sell the land pledged for her kathuba even in four or five installments and in the meantime she may sell of her husband's estate to provide for her maintenance without the sanction of Beth Din entering however in the deed of sale I sold the land to provide for my maintenance a divorced woman however must not sell such property except with the sanction of Beth Din Gamarahu. Is the author of the first ruling in our mission? It is Arsimian, for it was taught if a woman sold all her kathuba or pledged it or mortgaged the land that was pledged for her kathuba to a stranger, she is not entitled to maintenance. Arsimian ruled even if she did not sell or pledge all her kathuba but half of it only she loses her maintenance. Does this then imply that Arsimian holds the view that we do not regard part of the amount as being legally equal to the full amount? While the rabbis maintain that part of the amount is legally regarded as the full amount, but it may be objected, have we not in fact heard the reverse? For was it not taught and he shall take a wife? It's her virginity excludes one who is adolescent, some of whose virginity is ended. So Armeir, our Eliezer, and Arsimian permit the marriage of one who is adolescent. There they differ on the interpretation of scriptural texts. Armeir being of the opinion that virgin implies even one who retains some of her. Virginity her virginity implies only one who retains all her virginity and her virginity implies only when previous intercourse with her took place in a natural manner but not when in an unnatural manner are Eliezer and Arsimian however are of the opinion that virgin would have implied the perfect virgin her virginity implies even one who retains only part of her virginity Talmud, Mos Kethaboth in her virginity implies only one whose entire virginity is intact irrespective of whether previous intercourse with her was of a natural or unnatural character a certain woman once seized a silver cup on account of her Kethuba and then claimed her maintenance she appeared before Rabbi he thereupon told the orphans proceed to provide for her maintenance no one cares for the ruling of Arsimian who laid down that we do not regard part of the amount as legally equal to the full amount rather the son of Rabbi sent to our Joseph the following inquiry is a woman who sells of her Deceased husband's estate without an authorization of Beth Din required to take an oath or is she not required to take an oath and why the other replied do you not inquire as to whether a public announcement is required I have no need the first retorted to inquire concerning a public announcement because our Zara has stated in the name of our nominee if a widow assessed her husband's estate on her own behalf her act is invalid now how is the statement to be understood if a public announcement has been made the difficulty arises why is her act invalid must we not consequently assume that there was no public announcement and since it was stated that only if the assessment was made on her own behalf is her act invalid it follows does it not that if she made it on behalf of another her act is valid no public announcement may in fact have been made but her act is nevertheless invalid because she can be told who authorized you to make the assessment as was. The case with a certain man with whom corals belonging to orphans had been deposited and he proceeded to assess them on his own behalf for 400 ZUZ and when later its price rose to 600 ZUZ he appeared before RMI who said to him who authorized you to make the assessment and the law is that she is required to take an oath but there is no need to make a public announcement mission if a widow whose kathuba was for 200 ZUZ sold a plot of land that was worth a mana for 200 ZUZ or one that was worth 200 ZUZ for one mana her kathuba is deemed to have been thereby settled if her kathuba however was for one mana and she sold land that was worth a mana and a dinar for one mana her sale is void even though she declared I will return the dinar to the heirs her sale is void our simian Gamaliel ruled her sale is always valid unless there was so much land there as would have enabled her to leave from a field an area of nine cab and from a Garden that of half a cab or according to our Akiba a quarter of a cab if her kathuba was for 400 ZUZ and she sold plots of land to three persons to each for one mana and to a fourth she sold what was worth a main hand a dinar for one mana the sale to the last person is void but the sales of all the others are valid tomorrow wherein does the sale of a plot of land that was worth 200 ZUZ for one mana differ from the previous case is it because she might be told you yourself have caused the loss but then why should she not where she sold a plot of land that was worth a mana for 200 ZUZ also be entitled to say it is I who have made the profit Arnaman replied in the name of Rabbi Abu Talmud, Mos Kethaboth the rabbi has taught here that all profits belong to the owner of the money as it was taught if one unit was added to the purchases made by an agent all the profit belongs to the agent so Arjuna but our Jose ruled the profit is to be divided and in reply to the objection but surely it was taught that our Jose ruled all profit belongs to the owner of the money Rami Bihama replied this is no difficulty for the former refers to an object that has a fixed value while the latter refers to one that has no fixed value our Papa stated the law is that the profit made by the agent on an object that had a fixed value must be divided but if on an object that had no fixed value all profit belongs to the owner of the money what does he teach us that the reply that was given is the proper one the question was raised what is the law where a man said to his agent sell for me a lethek and the latter presumed to sell a core is the agent deemed to be merely adding to the owner's instructions and the buyer therefore acquires possession of a lethek at all events
Void does not this mean that she sold land that was worth a main and a dinar for a main and a dinar and that by the expression for a main of the main that was due to her is meant and by even one is to understand even though she declared I will return the dinar to the heirs by repurchasing for them land of the value of a dinar and was it not nevertheless stated her sale is void no retorted Arhuna the son of Arnathan this is a case where she sold at the lower price Talmud, Moss. Ketha both but since the final clause deals with a case where she sold at a lower price would not the earlier clause naturally refer to one where she did not sell at a lower price for has it not been stated in the final clause if her Kethubal was for 400 ZUZ and she sold plots of n to three persons to each for one main and to a fourth she sold what was worth a main and a dinar for one main of the sale to the last person is void but the sales of all the others are valid no both the earlier and the final clause refer to a sale at a lower price but it is this that we were informed in the final clause the reason why her sale is void is because she sold at a lower price the property that belonged to the orphans but if that had been done with her own her sale is valid but is not this already inferred from the first clause whose Kethubal was for 200 ZUZ sold a plot of land that was worth a main for 200 ZUZ or one that was Worth 200 ZUZ for one main her Kethuba is deemed to have been thereby settled it might have been assumed that the ruling was applicable there only because by her one act she completely severed her connection with that house but that here the sale for the first main should be deemed invalid as a preventive measure against the assumption of the validity of the sale for the last main hence we were informed that the law was not so some there are who say you have no need to ask for a ruling where a man said to his agent go and sell for me a lethek and the latter sold for him of course since in this case the agent was undoubtedly adding to his instructions the question however arises as to what is the ruling where the man said to the agent go and sell for me a core and he sold for him only one lethek do we in such a case lay down that the agent might tell the man I have done for you that which is more advantageous to you for had I sold the full core and you we're no longer in need of money you could not have retracted or is it rather held that the owner might retort to him it is no satisfaction to me that many teeth should be held against me or had an officer reply come and here if one man gave to another a gold dinar and told him bring me a shirt and the other brought him a shirt for three sellers and a cloak for three sellers both are guilty of trespass now if you admit that an agent in similar circumstances has performed his mission and was only adding to his instructions one can well see why the owner is guilty of trespass if however you should maintain that the agent in such circumstances was transgressing his instructions why should the owner be guilty of trespass here we are dealing with a case where the agent brought him a shirt that was worth six sellers for three if so why should the agent be guilty of trespass on account of the cloak but if that were so read the final clause argued a rule even in this case the Owner is not guilty of trespass because he might say to the agent I wanted a big shirt and you brought me one that is small and bad bad means bad in respect of the price for the owner can tell him had you brought me one for six sellers my gain would have been even greater since it would have been worth twelve sellers this may also be proved by an inference for it was stated Arjuna admits that if the transaction was in pulse both are guilty of trespass Talmud, Moskatha both be because the quantity of pulse for a seller is in exactly the same proportion as that for one parata this is conclusive how is this to be understood if it be suggested that it refers to a place where pulse is sold by conjectural estimate does not want it may be objected who pays a seller obtain the commodity at a much cheaper rate our papa replied it refers to a place where each kanda is sold for one parata come and here if her kathubo was for four hundred ZUZ and she sold plots of land too. Three persons to each for one main and to a fourth she sold what was worth a main and a den ar for one main of the sale to the last person is void but the sales of all the others are valid this is no proof for as our shisha the son of red replied that the final clause of our mission deals with small plots of land so it may in this discussion also be argued that the clause cited deals with small plots of land it is obvious that if a man instructed his agent to sell a plot of land to one person but not to two persons and he sold it to two the sale is invalid for he distinctly told him to one person but not to two persons what however is the ruling where he gave instructions that the sale shall be made to one person without mentioning any further limitation our rule to one person implies but not to two both are his and rabbi son of our however rule to one person may mean even to two to one may mean even to a hundred arnam and once happened to be at Surah when Arista and Rabbi Arhuna came to visit him what is the ruling they asked him in such a case to one he replied may mean even to two to one may mean even to a hundred are the sales valid they asked him even where the agent made an error I do not speak he replied of a case where the agent had made an error but did not a master they asked again say that the law of overreaching does not apply to landed property this applies only where the owner made the error but where the agent has made the error the owner might tell him I sent you to improve my position but not to impair it once however is it inferred that a distinction may be drawn between the agent and the owner from what we have learned if a man tells his agent go and give Terima the latter must give sold no more than a leaf the validity of the sales of the former is consequently no criterion for the validity of the sales of the agent in question the Terima in accordance with the disposition of the owner and if he does not know the owner's disposition he should give the terima in a moderate manner of his one fiftieth if he reduced the denominator by ten or added ten to it his terima is nevertheless valid while in respect of an owner it was taught if one setting apart terima there came up in his hand even so much as one twentieth his terima is valid come and here if her kathuba was for four hundred zuz and she sold plots of land to three persons to each for one main and to a fourth she sold what was worth a main and a dinar for one main of the sale to the last person is void but the sales of all others are valid arshisha the son of arishi replied this clause deals with small plots of land mishnah if an assessment of the judges was by one sixth less or by one sixth more than the actual value of the property their sale is void arsimian be gamaliel rule their sale is valid for otherwise of what advantage would the power of the court be of a bill for inspection However has been drawn up their sale is valid even if they sold for 200 ZUZ what was worth 1 mina or for 1 mina what was worth 200 ZUZ Gamara the question was asked what is the legal status of an agent Talmud, Moskatha both a rabba in the name of Arnaman replied an agent has the same status as judges but our Samuel Bibisna replied in the name of Arnaman as a widow rabba in the name of Arnaman replied an agent has the same status as judges for as judges do not act in their personal interests so does an agent not act in his personal interests thus excluding a widow who acts in her own personal interests our Samuel Bibisna replied in the name of Arnaman as a widow for as a widow is a single individual so is an agent a single individual thus excluding members of a court who are many and the law is that an agent has the same legal status as a widow but why should this case be different from that concerning which we learned if a man tells his agent Go and give Terima the latter must give the Terima in accordance with the disposition of the owner and if he does not know the owner's disposition he should separate Terima in a moderate manner of his one fiftieth if he reduced the denominator by ten or added ten to it his Terima is nevertheless valid there the circumstances are different for since someone might give his Terima in an eagerly manner while some other might give it liberally the agent might tell the owner I deemed you to be of such a disposition but here since it was clearly an error the owner might well say you should have made no error Arhuna be handed as stated in the name of Arnaman the Halajah is in agreement with the ruling of the sages can it be said however that Arnaman does not hold that the act of a court is invariably valid since otherwise of what advantage would the power of a court be when Arnaman in fact ruled in the name of Samuel if orphans came to take their shares in their fathers his state the court must appoint for each of them a guardian and these guardians choose for each of them a proper share and when the orphans grow up they may enter a protest against the settlement but Arnaman in his own name laid down even when they grow up they may enter no protest since otherwise of what advantage would the power of a court be this is no difficulty the former referring to a case where the guardians made a mistake while the latter deals with one where no error was made if no error was made on what grounds could the orphans enter their protest on that of the adjacent fields when Ardimi came he stated it once happened that rabbi acted in agreement with the ruling of the sages when Parada the son of our Eliezer be Parada grandson of our Parada the great asked him if so of what advantage would the power of a court be and as a result rabbi reversed his decision thus it was taught by Ardimi our Safra however taught as follows it once
not necessary indeed in respect of the widow but was required in respect of the court for it might have been assumed Talmud, Moscat the be that whoever buys from the court does so in order that he may have the benefit of a public announcement hence we were informed that the responsibility for the indemnity still remains upon the orphans our Simeon B. Gamaliel ruled etc. to what limit of error are who not be Judah replied in the name of our she's hate to have so it was also taught our Simeon B. Gamaliel ruled if the court sold for one maina what was worth two hundred zoos or for two hundred zoos what was worth one maina their sale is valid Amimar laid down in the name of our Joseph A. Court that sold one's estate without a previous public announcement Artin to have overlooked the law cited in a mission and their decision must be reversed you say Artin since have they not in actual fact overlooked one we learned the assessment of the property of the orphans must be accompanied by a public announcement for a period of thirty days and the assessment of consecrated land for a period of sixty days and the announcement must be made both in the morning and in the evening if the ruling were to be derived from admission alone it might be presumed that it applied only to an agent but not to a court hence we were taught that the law applied to a court also our Ashi raised an objection against Amimar if an assessment of judges was by one sixth less or one Six more than the actual value of the property their sale is void but it follows if it corresponded to the actual worth of the land their sale is valid does not this apply even to a case where no public announcement was made no it applies only to one where an announcement was made but since the final clause refers to a case where an announcement was made must not the first clause refer to one where no announcement was made for in the final clause it was taught if a bill for inspection however has been drawn up their sale is valid even if they sold for 200 zuz what was worth one mina or for one mina what was worth 200 zuz the fact indeed is that the first clause refers to a case where no announcement was made and yet there is no difficulty for one ruling refers to objects concerning which public announcements must be made while the other refers to objects concerning which no public announcements are made such as slaves movables and deeds what is the reason why no announcement is made in the case of slaves because if one were made they might hear it and escape movables and deeds because they might be stolen if you wish I might reply one ruling refers to a time when an announcement is made while the others refers to a time when no announcement is made the Nihardians having laid down that for poll tax maintenance and funeral expenses an estate is sold without a public announcement and if you prefer I might reply one ruling applies to a place where announcements are made while the other applies to one where no announcements are made Arnaman having stated never was a bill for inspection drawn up at Nihardia from the statement one implied that the reason was because they were experts in assessments but our Joseph B. Minyamai stated it was explained to me by Arnaman that the reason is because they were nicknamed consumers of publicly auctioned estates Rab Judah ruled in the name of Samuel orphans movables must be assessed and sold forth with our historical ruled in the name of Abami there to be sold in the markets there is however no difference of opinion between them one speaks of a place in the proximity of a market while the other deals with one from which the market is far Arkahana had in his possession some beer that belonged to the orphan our Meshachia Behilka he kept it until the festival saying though it might deteriorate it will have a quick sale Rubina had in his possession some wine belonging to the orphan Rubina the little his sister's son and he had also some wine of his own which he was about to take up to Sakara when he came to Arashi and asked him may I carry the orphan's wine with my own the other told him you may go it is not superior to your own mission a minor who exercised the right of me on a forbidden relative of the second degree or a woman who is incapable of procreation is not entitled either to a Ketuba or to the benefits of her melic property or to Maintenance or to her worn out articles if the man however had married her at the outset on the understanding that she was incapable of procreation she is entitled to a Ketubah a widow who was married to a high priest a divorced woman or a Haliza who was married to a common priest a bastard or a Nethina who was married to an Israelite or the daughter of an Israelite who was married to a Nathan or a bastard is entitled to a Ketubah Gemara Rab taught a minor who is released by means of a letter of divorce is not entitled to a Ketubah and much less so a minor who exercises the right of me on Samuel taught a minor who exercises the right of me on is not entitled to a Ketubah but a minor who is released by a letter of divorce is entitled to her Ketubah Samuel follows his previously expressed principle for he laid down a minor who exercises the right of me on is not entitled to a Ketubah but a minor who is released by a letter of divorce is entitled to her Ketubah Minor who exercises the right of Mion is not through this act disqualified from marrying the brothers of her husband nor is she thereby disqualified from marrying a priest but a minor who is released by a letter of divorce is through this act disqualified from marrying the brothers of her husband and also from marrying a priest a minor who exercises the right of Mion need not wait three months Talmud, Moscat both but a minor who is released by a letter of divorce must wait three months what does he teach us when all these cases have already been taught if a minor has exercised the right of Mion against her husband he is permitted to marry her relatives and she is permitted to marry his relatives and he does not disqualify her from marrying a priest but if he gave her a letter of divorce he is forbidden to marry her relatives and she is forbidden to marry his relatives and he also disqualifies her from marrying a priest he found it necessary to restate these rulings in order to mention she must wait three months which we did not learn must one assume that they differ on the same principles as the following Tanay Marilizer stated there is no validity whatsoever in the act of a minor and her husband is entitled neither to anything she finds nor to the work of her hands nor may he invalidate her vows he is not her heir and he may not defile himself for her this being the general rule she is in no respect regarded as his wife except that it is necessary for her to make a declaration of refusal and our Joshua stated the act of a minor is valid and her husband has the right to anything she finds and to the work of her hands to invalidate her vows to be her heir and to defile himself for her the general principle being that she is regarded as his wife in every respect except that she may leave him by declaring her refusal against him must one then assume that Rab has laid down the same principle as that of our Eliza and that Samuel has Laid down the same principle as that of our Joshua, there is no difference of opinion between them as to what was the view of our Eliza. They differ only in respect of the view of our Joshua. Samuel ruled in agreement with our Joshua, but Rab argued that our Joshua maintained his view only there where the benefits are transferred from her to him, but not where the benefits are to be transferred from him to her or to her worn out article. Said Arhuna Bihaya to Arkahana, you have told us in the name of Samuel that this was taught only in respect of Melik, but that to Zan Barzal property she is entitled. Our Papa, in considering the statement, raised the point to which class of women did Samuel refer. If it be suggested to a minor who exercised the right of me on the difficulty would arise if the articles are still in existence, she would be entitled to receive them in either case, and if they were no longer in existence, she would in either case be entitled to receive them is the reference. Then to a woman who is incapable of procreation, but here again it may be objected if the articles were still in existence, she would receive them in either case, and if they no longer existed, the ruling should be reversed. She should receive Melik property since the capital always remains in her legal possession, but should not receive Zanbarzal property since the capital does not remain in her possession. The fact, however, is that the reference is to a forbidden relative of the second degree, in whose case the rabbis have penalized the woman in respect of what is due to her from the man, and the man in respect of what is due to him from the woman. Our Shimai B. Ashi remarked from Arkahana's statement, it may be inferred that if a lawful wife brought to her husband a cloak, the article is to be treated as capital, and the man may not continue to wear it until it is worn out, but did not Arnaman, however, rule that a cloak must be treated as produce. He differs from Arnaman I.S. Not entitled to a Ketubah Samuel stated this was taught only in respect of the Mina and the 200 Zeus to the additional jointure however she is entitled so it was also taught the women concerning whom the sages have ruled they are not entitled to a Ketubah as for instance a minor who exercised the right of Mion and the others enumerated in the same context are not entitled to the Mina or to the 200 Zeus but are entitled to their additional jointure as women however. Concerning whom the sages have ruled they may be divorced without receiving their Ketubah as for instance a wife who transgresses the Mosaic law and others enumerated in the same context are not entitled to their additional jointures and much less to their statutory Ketubahs of a Mina or 200 Zeus whilst a woman who is divorced on the ground of inrepute takes only what is hers and departs this provides support to Arhuna who la
Defect she is entitled to a ketubah and if he did not know of her defect she is not entitled to a ketubah a widow's has always the status of a proper wife or whether her husband was aware of her widowhood or whether he was not aware of it she is always entitled to a ketubah Rab Judah however said the one as well as the other has sometimes the status of a wife and sometimes she has no such status for in either case if her husband was aware of her condition or status she is entitled to a ketubah and if he was not aware of it she is not entitled to a ketubah an objection was raised if a high priest married on the presumption that the woman was in her widowhood and it was found that she had been in such a condition she is entitled to her ketubah does not this imply that if there was no presumption she is not entitled to a ketubah do not infer that if there was no such presumption but infer this if he married her on the presumption that she was not in her Widowhood and it was found that she had been in such a condition she is not entitled to a ketubah. What however is the ruling where he married her with no assumption is she entitled to a ketubah? Then instead of stating on the presumption that the woman was in her widowhood and it was found that she had been in such a condition she is entitled to her ketubah. Should it not rather have been stated with no assumption she is entitled to her ketubah? And it would have been obvious that this applied with even greater force to the former. Furthermore, it was explicitly taught if he married her in the belief that she was a widow and it was found that his belief was justified she is entitled to a ketubah. But if he married her with no assumption she is not entitled to a ketubah. Does not this present an objection against Arhuna? It was Armisha that caused Arhuna to hear. He thought that since a distinction was drawn in the case of a woman incapable of procreation and no. Distinction was drawn in respect of a widow. It must be inferred that a widow is entitled to a ketubah even if she was married with no assumption of her status. In fact, however, this is no proper conclusion for in stating the case of a widow, the author intended to apply to it the distinction drawn in the case of a woman who was incapable of procreation. C H A P T E R X I I Mishnah. If a man married a wife and she made an arrangement with him that he should maintain her daughter for five years, he must maintain her for five years. If she was subsequently married to another man and arranged with him also that he should maintain her daughter for five years, he too must maintain her for five years. The first husband is not entitled to plead if she will come to me, I will maintain her, but he must forward her maintenance to her at the place where her mother lives. Similarly, the two husbands cannot plead, we will maintain her jointly, but one must maintain her and the other allow her the Cost of her maintenance if she married her husband must supply her with maintenance and they allow her the cost of her maintenance should they die their own daughters are to be maintained out of their free assets only but she must be maintained even out of assigned property because she has the same legal status as a creditor prudent men used to write on condition that I shall maintain your daughter for five years while you continue to live with me tomorrow it was stated a man who said to his fellow I owe you a man is you and ruled liable but Resh Lakish ruled he is free how is one to understand this dispute if it refers to a case where the man said to them you are my witnesses what it might be objected is the reason of Resh Lakish who holds him to be free if it is a case where he did not say to them you are my witnesses what it might equally be objected can be the reason of Aryohanan who holds him liable the fact is that the dispute relates to a case where he did not tell them you are my witnesses, but here we are dealing with the case of a person who said to another, I owe you a mana by handing to him a note of indebtedness, or you had ruled he is liable because the contents of a bond has the same force as if the man who delivered it said, You are my witnesses, but Reshlakish ruled he is free because the contents of a bond has no binding force. We learned if a man married a wife and she made an agreement with him that he shall maintain her daughter. For five years he must maintain her for five years. Does not this refer to a case like this Talmud? Moskatha both know our mission is dealing with deeds on verbal agreements, and the ruling was necessary in accordance with the view of Argidal, since Argidal has laid down in the name of Rab. If one man said to another, How much are you giving to your son? And the other replies, Such and such a sum, and when the other asks, How much are you giving to your daughter? The first replies, Such. And such a summon on the basis of this talk of betrothal was affected. Kanyan is deemed to have been executed. These being matters concerning which Kanyan is affected by a mere verbal arrangement. Come and here if a man gave to a priest in writing a statement that he owed him five sellers, he must pay him the five sellers, and his son is not redeemed thereby. There the law is different because one is under a pentateuchal obligation to give them to him. If that be so, why did he write in order to choose for himself a priest? If that is the case, why is not his son redeemed in agreement with the ruling of Olaf or Ola said pentateuch ally? The son is redeemed as soon as the father gives a note of money and indebtedness to the priest. And the reason why the rabbis ruled that he was not redeemed is because a preventive measure was enacted against the possibility of the assumption that redemption may be affected by means of bonds. In general, Rabbis said their dispute seems to follow the same principles as laid down by Tanaim if the guarantee of a guarantor appears below the signatures to bonds of indebtedness the creditor may recover his debt from the guarantor's free property such a case once came before our Ishmael who decided that the debt may be recovered from the guarantor's free property Ben Nanyas however said to him the debt may be recovered neither from free property nor from assigned property while the other asked him behold he replied this is just as if a creditor were in the act of throttling a debtor in the street and his friend found him and said to him leave him alone and I will pay you where he is undoubtedly exempt from liability since the loan was not made through trust in him may it not be suggested that Aryohanan holds the same view as our Ishmael while Reshlakish holds that of Ben Nanyas on the view of Ben Nanyas there can be no difference of opinion Talmud Moskata both be their dispute however might relate to the view of our Ishmael or Yohanan is of course in agreement with our Ishmael while Resh Lakish might argue our Ishmael maintains his view there only because a pentateuchal responsibility is involved but not here where no pentateuchal responsibility is involved the above text stated Argidal has laid down in the name of Rab if one man said to another how much are you giving to your son and the other replies such and such a son and when the other asks how much are you giving to your daughter the first replies such and such a sum and on the basis of this talk betrothal was affected Kanyan is deemed to have been executed these being matters concerning which Kanyan is affected by a mere verbal arrangement said Rab it stands to reason that Rab's ruling should apply only to the case of a man whose daughter was NAR since the benefit of her betrothal goes to him but not to that of a Bogoret since the benefit of the betrothal of the latter does not go to him but by God Rab meant his ruling to include even one who is a Bogoreth for should you not concede this the objection could be put what benefit does the son's father derive the reason consequently must be that owing to the pleasure of the formation of a mutual family tie they decide to allow one another the full rights of Kanyan said Rabbanit to Ashi are those verbal arrangements allowed to be recorded or are they not allowed to be recorded the other replied may not be recorded he raised an objection against him prudent men used to write on condition that I shall maintain your daughter for five years while you continue to live with me the meaning of right in this context is sacred saying however be described as writing yes for so we learned if a husband gives to his wife a written undertaking I have no claim whatsoever upon your estates and are high taught if a husband said to his wife come and your deeds of betrothal and marriage may not be written except with the consent of both parties but it follows that with the consent of both parties they may be written does not this refer to deeds based on verbal agreements no deeds of actual betrothal the ruling being in agreement with our papa and our sharabia for it was stated if a man wrote it in her name but without her consent she is said rabba and robin of betrothed but our papa and our sharabia she is not betrothed come and here should they die their own daughters are to be maintained out of their free property only but she must be maintained even out of assigned property because she has the same legal status as a creditor here we are dealing with a case where the man was made to confirm his obligation by kanyan if so the same right should be enjoyed should it not by one's own daughters also this is a case where kanyan was executed in favor of the ones but not in favor of the others once the certainty since she was in existence at the time the kanyan was executed the kanyan in her Favor is effective the other daughters however since they were not in existence at the time the Kanyan was executed the Kanyan in their favor is not effective but do we not also deal with the case where they were in existence at the time of the Kanyan this being possible where for instance the man had divorced his wife and then remarried her this however is the explanation since she is not covered by the provision of Beth Din Kanyan in her case is effective in the case of the other daughters
and asked thereupon he said to the other until now I have had my grinding done at your place but not pay me rent I shall the other replied only grind for you Robin and considering the case intended to rule that it involved the very principle that was laid down in our mission the two husbands cannot plead we will maintain her jointly but one must maintain her and the other allows her the cost of her maintenance are our however said to him are the two cases alike there the woman has only one Stomach not to but here the lessee might well tell the owner grind in your own mill and sell grind in mine and keep this however has been said only in a case where the lessee has no other orders for grinding at his mill but if he has sufficient orders for grinding at his mill he may in such circumstances be compelled not to act in the manner of Sodom mission should a widow say I have no desire to move from my husband's house the ears cannot tell her go to your father's house and we will maintain you but they must maintain her in her husband's house and give her a dwelling becoming her dignity if she said however have no desire to move from my father's house the ears are entitled to say to her if you stay with us you will have your maintenance but if you do not stay with us you will receive no maintenance if she based her plea on the ground that she was young and they were young they must maintain her while she lives in the house of her father Gemara, our rabbis taught. A widow may use her deceased husband's dwelling as she used it during his lifetime. She may also use the bondmen and bondwomen, the cushions and the bolsters and the silver and gold utensils as she used them during the lifetime of her husband. For such is the written undertaking he gave her, and you shall dwell in my house and be maintained therein out of my estate throughout the duration of your widowhood. Our Joseph learned in my house implies, but not in my hovel, our nomin rule if orphans sold. A widow's dwelling there act is legally invalid, but why should this case be different from that of which R.C. spoke in the name of our Yohanan as follows? If the male orphans forced all the female orphans and sold some property of a small estate, their sale is valid there. The property was not pledged to any daughter during her father's lifetime, but here the dwelling was pledged to the widow during her husband's lifetime. Abbe stated we have a tradition that if a widow's dwelling Collapsed it is not the duty of the ears to rebuild it so it was also taught if a widow's dwelling collapsed it is not the duty of the ears to rebuild it furthermore even if she says allow me and I shall rebuild it at my own expense she is not granted her request of a asked what is the legal position if she repaired it this is undecided if she said how very have no desire etc why should they not give her maintenance while she lives there this supports a statement of Arhuna who said the blessing of a house is proportionate to its size why then can they not give her according to the blessing of a house that is so said Arhuna the sayings of the sages are a source of blessing wealth and healing as to blessing we have the statement just mentioned wealth because we learned if one sold fruits to another and the buyer pulled them though they have not yet been measured ownership is acquired if however they have been measured but the buyer has not pulled them Ownership is not acquired, but if the buyer is prudent, he rents the place where they are kept healing. For we learned a man should not chew wheat and put it on his wound during the Passover, because it ferments. Our rabbis taught when Rabbi was about to depart from this life, he said, "I require the presence of my sons." When his sons entered into his presence, he instructed them, "Take care that you should do respect to your mother. The light shall continue to burn in its usual place. The table shall be laid in its usual place, and my bed shall be spread in its usual place." Joseph of Haifa and Simeon of Ephrath, who attended on me in my lifetime, shall attend on me when I am dead. Take care that you should do respect to your mother. Is not this instruction pentateuchal, since it is written, "Honor thy father and thy mother." She was their stepmother. Is not the commandment to honor a stepmother also pentateuchal? For it was taught, "Honor thy father and thy mother." Thy father includes thy. Stepmother and thy mother includes thy stepfather and the superfluous Bob includes thy elder brother. This exposition was meant to apply during one's own parents' lifetime, but not after their death. The light shall continue to burn in its usual place. The table shall be laid in its usual place, and my bed shall be spread in its usual place. What is the reason he used to come home again at twilight every Sabbath? Eve? On a certain Sabbath, even neighbor came to the door speaking aloud when his handmaid whispered, "Be quiet, for Rabbi is sitting there." As soon as he heard this, he came no more in order that no reflection might be cast on the earlier saints. Joseph of Haifa and Simeon of Ephrath, who attended on me in my lifetime, shall attend on me when I am dead. He was understood to mean in this world when it was seen. However, that their beers preceded is all said. That the conclusion must be that he was referring to the other world, and that the reason why he mentioned it was that it might. Not be suspected that they were guilty of some offense and that it was only the merit of Rabbi that protected them until that moment I require he said to them the presence of the sages of Israel and the sages of Israel entered into his presence do not lament for me he said to them in the smaller towns Talmud, Mosque Etha both be and reassemble the college after thirty days my son Simeon is wise my son Gamaliel Nisai and Hanan Abiham shall preside at the college do not lament for me in the smaller towns he was understood to give this instruction in order to cause less trouble as it was observed however that when lamentations were held in the large towns everybody came they arrived at the conclusion that his instruction was due to a desire to enhance the honor of the people reassemble the college after thirty days because he thought I am not more important than our teacher Moses concerning whom it is written in scripture and the children of Israel went for Moses in the Plains of Moab thirty days for thirty days they mourned both day and night subsequently they mourned in the daytime and studied at night or mourned at night and studied during the day until a period of twelve months of mourning had passed on the day that Rabbi died a bath coal went forth and announced whosoever has been present at the death of Rabbi is destined to enjoy the life of the world to come a certain fuller who used to come to him every day failed to call on that day and as soon as he heard this went up upon a roof fell down to the ground and died a bath coal came forth and announced that fuller also is destined to enjoy the life of the world to come my son Simeon is wise what did he mean it is this that he meant although my son Simeon is wise my son Gamaliel shall be the nice I said Levi was it necessary to state this it was necessary replied our Simeon be Rabbi for yourself and for your lameness what was his difficulty does not scripture state but the kingdom gave you Jehoram because he was the firstborn the other was properly representing his ancestors but Argamaliel was not properly representing his ancestors then why did Rabbi act in the manner he did granted that he was not representing his ancestors in wisdom he was worthily representing them in his fear of sin Hanan Abiham shall preside at the college Arhanan however did not accept the office because Arix was by two and a half years older than he and so Arix presided Arhanan sat at his studies outside the lecture room and Levi came and joined him when Arix went to his eternal rest and Arhanan took up the presidency Levi had no one to join him and came in consequence to Babylon this description coincides with the following when Rab was told that a great man who was lame made his appearance at Nehardia and held a discourse in the course of which he permitted the wearing of a wreath he said it is evident that Arix has gone to his eternal rest and Arhanan has taken over the presidency and that Levi having had no one to join him has come down here but might not one have suggested that Arhanan came to his eternal rest that Arix continued in the presidency as before and that Levi who had no one to join him came therefore to Babylon if you wish I might reply Levi would have submitted to the authority of Arix and if you prefer I might reply since Rabbi once said Hanan Abiham shall preside at the college there could be no possibility of his not becoming head for about the righteous it is written in scripture thou shalt also decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee was there not Arhai he had already gone to his eternal rest but did not Arhai state I saw Rabbi sepulchre and shed tears upon it reverse the names but did not Arhai state on the day on which Rabbi died holiness ceased reverse the names but has it not been taught when Rabbi fell in Arhai entered into his presence and found him weeping master he Said to him, Why are you weeping? Was it not taught if a man dies smiling? It is a good omen for him. If weeping, it is a bad omen for him. His face upwards, it is a good omen. His face downwards, it is a bad omen. His face towards the public, it is a good omen. Towards the wall, it is a bad omen. If his face is greenish, it is a bad omen. If bright and ruddy, it is a good omen. Dying on Sabbath, it is a good omen. On the termination of the Sabbath, it is a bad omen. Dying on the eve of the Day of Atonement, it is a bad omen. On the termination of the Day of Atonement, it is a good omen. Dying of diarrhea, it is a good omen. Because most righteous men die of diarrhea. And the other replied, I weep on account of my impending separation from the Torah and the commandments. If you wish, I might reply, reverse
Replied, let no such thing be mentioned in Israel. I desire he announced the presence of my younger son Arsimian entered into his presence and he entrusted him with the orders of wisdom. I desire the presence of my elder son he announced when Argamaliel entered he entrusted him with the traditions and regulations of the patriarchate. My son he said to him conduct your patriarchate with men of high standing and cast by among the students but surely this is not proper for is it not written in scripture but he honoreth them that fear the Lord and the master said that this text might be applied to Jehoshaphat king of Judah who on seeing a scholar used to rise from his throne embrace him and kiss him and call him my master my master my teacher my teacher this is no difficulty the latter attitude is to be adopted in private the former in public it was taught rabbi was lying on his sickbed at Sephoris but a burial place was reserved for him at Beth was it not however taught justice justice shalt thou follow follow rabbi to Beth rabbi was indeed living at Beth but when he fell ill he was brought to Sephoris Talmud mosque Ketha, both because it was situated on higher ground and its air was salubrious on the day when rabbi died the rabbis decreed a public fast and offered prayers for heavenly mercy they furthermore announced that whoever said that rabbi was dead would be stabbed with a sword rabbi's handmaid ascended the roof and prayed the immortals desire rabbi to join them and the mortals desire rabbi to remain with them may it be the will of god that the mortals may overpower the immortals when however she saw how often he resorted to the privy painfully taking off his tefillin and putting them on again she prayed may it be the will of the almighty that the immortals may overpower the mortals as the rabbis incessantly continued their prayers for heavenly mercy she took up the jar and threw it down from the roof to the ground for a moment they ceased praying and the soul of rabbi departed to its eternal rest go said the rabbis to bar and investigate he went and finding that rabbi was dead he tore his cloak and turned the tear backwards on returning to the rabbis he began the angels and the mortals have taken hold of the holy ark the angels overpowered the mortals and the holy ark has been captured has he they asked him gone to his eternal rescue he replied said it i did not say it rabbi at the time of his passing raised his ten fingers towards heaven and said sovereign of the universe it is revealed and known to you that I have labored in the study of the Torah with my ten fingers and that I did not enjoy any worldly benefits even with my little finger may it be thy will that there be peace in my just resting place a bath call echoed announcing he shall enter into peace they shall rest on their beds does not the context require the singular pronoun on thy bed this provide support for our high began for he stated in the name of our Jose B. Saul when a righteous man departs from this world the ministering angels say to the holy one blessed be he sovereign of the universe the righteous man so and so is coming and he answers them let the righteous man come from their resting places go forth to meet him and say to him that he shall enter into peace and then they shall rest on their beds our Eliezer stated when a righteous man departs from the world he is Welcomed by three companies of ministering angels, one exclaims, Come into peace, the other exclaims, He who walketh in his uprightness, while the third exclaims, He shall enter into peace, they shall rest on their beds. When a wicked man perishes from the world, he is met by three groups of angels of destruction, one announces, There is no peace, saith the Lord unto the wicked, the other tells him, He shall lie down in sorrow, while the third tells him, Go down and be thou laid with the uncircumcised Misha. So long as she lives in her father's house, a widow may recover her ketubah at any time, as long, however, as she lives in her husband's house, she may recover her ketubah only within twenty five years, because in the course of twenty five years she has sufficient opportunities of rendering favors corresponding in value to the amount of her ketubah. So our mayor who laid down the ruling in the name of our Simeon Begamaliel, the sages, however, ruled, so long as she lives in her husband's whole use. Widow may recover her ketubah at any time, but as long as she lives in her father's house, she may recover her ketubah only within 25 years. If the widow died, her heirs must mention her ketubah within 25 years. Gemara said, Abbe to our Joseph, is it logical that the poorest woman in Israel should be allowed to recover her ketubah only within 25 years? And Martha, the daughter of Boethus, also only within 25, as the other replied in accordance with the camel. Is the burden the question was raised? Must she, according to our mayor, lose in proportion? This must stand undecided. The sages, however, ruled so long, said Abbe to our Joseph, is it reasonable that if she comes before sunset, she may recover her ketubah, and that if she came after sunset, she may not recover it? Is it likely that she has surrendered it in that short while? Yes, the other replied, All the standards of the sages are such in a bath of 40 se for instance, one may perform ritual. Immersion in a bath of 40 se minus one quart of one may not perform ritual immersion. Rab Judah reported in the name of Rab Arish Mael, son of Ar Jose, testified in the presence of Rabbi to a statement he made in the name of his father that the ruling in our mission was taught only in respect of a woman who produces no deed of the ketubah, but if she produces the deed of the ketubah, she may recover the amount of her ketubah at any time. Our Eliezer, however, ruled even if she produces it. Deed of the ketubah, she may recover the amount within 25 years. Only Arshis hate raised an objection. A creditor may recover his debt at any time, even if there was no mention of it. Now, how is this to be understood? If it refers to a creditor who holds no bond whereby it might be asked, could he recover his debt? Consequently, it must refer to one who does hold a bond from which it follows. Does it not that only a creditor may recover his due because he is not likely to have? Surrendered his claim, but that a widow is deemed to have surrendered. He raised the objection, and he also removed it. This may, in fact, refer to one who holds no bond. But here we are dealing with a case where the debtor admits his liability. But surely, Arlay had stated they taught a divorced woman has the very same rights as a creditor. Now, how are we to understand this ruling if it refers to a divorcee who holds no ketubah, whereby it might be objected? Could she recover her due? Consequently, it must refer to one who does hold a ketubah, from which it follows. Does it not that only a divorcee may recover her ketubah because she is not likely to have surrendered it? But that a widow is deemed to have surrendered. Here also, it is a case where the defendant admits the claim. Arnam and B. Isaac stated Arjuna B. Kaza learned in the Beritha of the school of Bar if she claimed her ketubah Talmud, Mas both B. Talmud, Mas both B. She is again entitled to. The original period, and if she produced the deed of the ketubah, she may recover the amount of her ketubah at any time. Arnam and B. Arhista sent the following message to Arnam and B. Jacob. Will our master instruct us as to whether the dispute refers to one who produced the deed of the ketubah or to one who produced no deed of the ketubah? And with whose ruling does the halachah agree? The other replied, The dispute refers to one who produced no deed of the ketubah, but a woman who produced a deed of the ketubah may recover her ketubah at any time. And the halachah is in agreement with the ruling of the sages. When Ardimi came, he reported Arsimian B. who laid down in the name of Arjashu B. Levi, who had it from Barkapur. This was taught only in respect of the main and the two hundred Zeus to any additional jointer. However, the woman is always entitled Arabau in the name of Aryohanan. However, rule she is not entitled even to the additional jointer for Aribu has laid down in. The name of Arjane, the additional provisions of the Ketubah are subject to the same rules as the Ketubah itself, so it was also said Arabah laid down in the name of Arhuna who had it from Rab. This was taught only in respect of the Mina and the two hundred Zeus to any additional jointer, however, she is always entitled, said Arabah to Arhuna. Did Rab really say this? Do you wish the other replied to silence me or to stand me a drink? If other replied, wish to silence you, the mother in law of Ar. Hi, Erica was the wife of his brother, and when she became a widow, lived in her father's house. Arhai maintained her for twenty five years at her paternal home, but when at the end of the period she said to him, Supply me with my maintenance, he told her, You have no longer any claim to maintenance, pay me. Then she said, My Ketubah, you have no claim, he replied, either to maintenance or to the Ketubah. She summoned him to law before Rabbi Bishila tell me, the judge said to him, What? Exactly were the circumstances I maintained her the other replied for twenty five years at her paternal home and by the life of the master I carried the stuff to her on my shoulder what is the reason the judge said to him that the rabbis ruled so long as she lives in her husband's house a widow may recover her ketubah at any time because we assume that she did not claim it in order to save herself from shame similarly here also it may well be assumed that she did not previously submit her claim in
allowed to deteriorate and the ear might eventually tell her take years and return to me mind and a stigma would thus fall upon the court chaptery -E mission two judges of civil law were administering justice in Jerusalem admin and Hanan via Bishalom Hanan laid down two rulings and admin laid down seven if a man went to a country beyond the sea and his wife claimed maintenance Hanan ruled Talmud, Mosque Ethobo that she must take an oath at the end but not at the beginning the sons of the high priest however differed from him and ruled that she must take an oath both at the beginning and at the end Ardosa Bihar Kainis agreed with their ruling Aryohan and Bizakai said Hanan has spoken well she need take an oath only at the end Gemara I would point out an inconsistency three judges in cases of robbery were administering justice in Jerusalem admin begat Hanan the Egyptian and Hanan via Bishalom is there not an inconsistency between three and two and an inconsistency between Civil and robbery one might well admit that there is no real inconsistency between the three and the two since he may be enumerating only those whom he considers important and omitting the one whom he does not consider important does not however the inconsistency between civil and robbery remain our nomin b isaac replied both terms may be justified on the grounds that they impose fines for acts of robbery as it was taught if a beast nipped off a plant said our jose the judges of civil long jerusalem ruled that if the plant was in its first year the owner of the beast pays as compensation two silver pieces if it was in its second year he pays as compensation four silver pieces i point out another contradiction three judges of civil law were administering justice in jerusalem and hanan and nahum our papa replied he who mentioned nahum was our nathan for it was taught our nathan stated nahum the meat also was one of the judges of civil law in jerusalem but the sages did not agree with him were there however no more judges did not Arfin Ahaz in fact state on the authority of Arashai that there were 394 courts of law in Jerusalem and an equal number of synagogues of houses of study and of schools judges there were many but we were speaking of judges of civil law only Rab Judah stated in the name of RC the judges of civil law in Jerusalem received their salaries out of the temple funds at the rate of 99 minna if they were not satisfied as they were given an increase you say they were not satisfied are we dealing with wicked men the reading in fact is if the amount was not sufficient an increase was granted to them even if they objected Karna used to take one iskira from the innocent party and one iskira from a guilty party and then informed them of his decision but how could he act in such a manner is it not written in scripture and thou shalt take no gift and should you reply that this applies only where he does not take from both litigants since he might in consequence rest judgment but Karna since he took the same amount from both parties would not come to rest judgment it can be retorted is this permitted even where one would not come to rest judgment was it not in fact taught what was the purpose of the statement and thou shalt take no gift if to teach that one must not acquit the guilty or that one must not condemn the innocent the objection surely could be raised. It was already specifically stated elsewhere in scripture thou shalt not rest judgment consequently it must be concluded that even where the intention is to acquit the innocent or to condemn the guilty the Torah laid down and thou shalt take no gift this applies only where the judge takes a gift as a bribe but Karna took the two is here as a fee but is it permissible for a judge to take money as a fee have we not in fact learned the legal decisions of one who takes a fee for Acting as judge are null and void this applies only to a fee for pronouncing judgment while Karna was only taking compensation for loss of work but is a judge permitted to take compensation for loss of work was it not in fact taught contemptible is the judge who takes a fee for pronouncing judgment but his decision is valid now what is to be understood by fee if it be suggested that it means a fee for acting as judge the objection would arise how could be said his decision is valid when in fact we have learned the legal decisions of one who takes a fee for acting as judge are null and void consequently it must mean a fee for loss of work and yet it was stated was it not contemptible is the judge etc this applies only to a loss of work that cannot be proved but Karna received compensation for loss of work that could be proved for he was regularly occupied in smelling tests at a wine store and for this he was paid a fee this is similar to the case of Arunawane. Lawsuit was brought to him he used to say to the litigants provide me with a man who will draw the water in my place and I will pronounce judgment for you said Arabab come and see how blind are the eyes of those who take a bribe if a man has pain in his eyes he pays away money to a medical man and he may be cured or he may not be cured yet these take what is only worth one pair of time blind their eyes therewith for it is said in scripture for a gift blindeth them that have sight are. Rabbis taught for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and much more so those of the foolish and pervert the words of the righteous and much more so those of the wicked are than fools and wicked men capable of acting as judges but it is this that is meant for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise even a great sage who takes bribes will not depart from the world without the affliction of the dullness of the mind and pervert the words of the righteous Talmud, Mosque Ketha both be even one who is. Righteous in every respect and takes bribes will not depart from this world without the affliction of confusion of mind when Ardimi came he related that Arnam and Biko and made the following exposition what was meant by the scriptural text the king by justice establisheth the land but he that loveth gifts overthrow it if the judge is like a king who is not in need of anything he establisheth the land but if he is like a priest who moves to and fro among the threshing floors he overthrow it. In Rabbi Arshila stated any judge who is in the habit of borrowing is unfit to pronounce judgment this however applies only where he possesses nothing to lend to others but where he possesses things to lend his borrowing does not matter this however cannot surely be correct for did not Rabbi borrow things from the household of Barmerian although they did not borrow anything from him there he desired to give them better standing Rabbi stated what is the reason for the prohibition against taking a gift because as soon as a man receives a gift from another he becomes so well disposed towards him that he becomes like his own person and no man sees himself in the wrong what is the meaning of shahad she who had our papa said a man should not act as judge either for one whom he loves or for one whom he hates for no man can see the guilt of one whom he loves or the merit of one whom he hates abe said if a scholar is loved by the townspeople their love is not due to his superiority but to the fact that he does not rebuke them for neglecting spiritual matters robber remarked at first i thought that all the people of mahusa loved me when i was appointed judge i thought that some would hate me and others would love me having observed however that the man who loses today wins tomorrow i came to the conclusion that if i am loved they all love me and if i am hated they must all hate me our rabbis taught and thou shalt take no gift there was no need to speak of it Prohibition of a gift of money, but this was meant even a bribe of words is also forbidden for scripture does not write and thou shalt take no gain what is to be understood by a bribe of words as a bribe offered to Samuel he was once crossing a river on a board when a man came up and offered him his hand what Samuel asked him is your business here I have a lawsuit the other replied El came the reply I am disqualified from acting for you in the suit Amimar was once engaged in the trial of an action when a bird flew down upon his head and a man approached and removed it what is your business here Amimar asked him I have a lawsuit the other replied I came the reply I am disqualified from acting as your judge Marakba once ejected some saliva and a man approached and covered it what is your business here Marakba asked him I have a lawsuit the man replied I came the reply I am disqualified from acting as your judge Arishmael son of Arhose whose heiress was want to bring him a basket full of fruit every Friday but on one occasion brought it to him on a Thursday asked the latter why the present change I have a lawsuit the other replied and thought that at the same time I might bring the fruit to the master he did not accept it from him and said he am disqualified to act as your judge he thereupon appointed a couple of rabbis to try the case for him as he was arranging the affair he found himself thinking if he wished he could plead thus or if he preferred he might plead thus oh he exclaimed the despair that waits for those who take bribes if I who have not taken the fruit at all and even if I had taken I would only have taken what is my own am in such a state of mind show much more would that be the state of those who accept bribes a man once brought to our Ishmael be Elisha gift of the first fleece once the latter asked him are you from such and such a place the other replied but our Ishmael asked was there no priest to whom to give it in any of it places between that place and this I have a lawsuit the other replied and thought that at the same time I would bring the gift to the master he said to him I am unfit to try your action and refused to receive the gift from him thereupon he appointed two rabbis to try his action as he was arranging this affair he found himself thinking if he wished he could plead thus or if he
Your gift Arainan said to him but now that you have given me a reason I will accept it thereupon he sent him to Arnaman to whom he also dispatched the following message will the master try the action of this man for Arnaman am disqualified from acting as judge for him since he has sent me such a message Arnaman thought he must be his relative and orphan's lawsuit was then in progress before him and he reflected Talmud, Mosque Ketha, both of the one is a positive precept and the other is also a positive precept but the positive precept of showing respect for the Torah must take precedence he therefore postponed the orphan's case and brought up that man's suit when the other party noticed the honor he was showing him he remained speechless until that happened Elijah was a frequent visitor of Arnaman whom he was teaching the order of Elijah but as soon as he acted in the manner described Elijah stayed away he spent his time in fasting and in prayers for God's mercy until Elijah came to him again but when he appeared he greatly frightened him thereupon he made a box for himself and in it he sat before him until he concluded his order with him and this is the reason why people speak of the Seder Eliyahu Rabbi and the Seder Eliyahu Zudah in the days of our Joseph there was a famine said the rabbis to our Joseph will the master offer prayers for heavenly mercy he replied if Elisha with whom when the main body of rabbis had departed there still remained two thousand and two hundred rabbis did not offer up any prayers for mercy in a time of famine should I at such a time venture to offer prayers for mercy but once is it inferred that so many remain from scripture where it is written and his servant said how should I set this before a hundred men now what is meant by the expression before a hundred men if it be suggested that all was to be set before the hundred men one might well object that in years of famine all this is rather large Quantity consequently it must be concluded that each loaf was set before a hundred men when the main body of rabbis departed from the school of Rab there still remained behind one thousand and two hundred rabbis when they departed from the school of Arhuna there remained behind eight hundred rabbis Arhuna when delivering his discourses was assisted by thirteen interpreters when the rabbis stood up after Arhuna's discourses and shook out their garments the dust rose so high that it obscured the light of day and people in Palestine said they had risen after the discourses of Arhuna the Babylonian when the main body of rabbis departed from the schools of Rabbah and Arjoseph there remained four hundred rabbis and they described themselves as orphans when the main body of rabbis departed from the school of Abay others say from the school of Arpapa while still others say from the school of Arashi there remained two hundred rabbis and these described themselves as Orphans of the orphans are Isaac the Rehavah said in the name of RMI the inspectors of animal blemishes in Jerusalem received their wages from the temple funds Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel the learned men who taught the priests the laws of ritual slaughter received their fees from the temple funds Argidal said in the name of Rab the learned men who taught the priests the rules of Chemizer received their fees from the temple funds Rabbi Barhanna said in the name of our Yohanan book Readers in Jerusalem received their fees from the temple funds Arnaman said Rab stated that the women who wove the temple curtains received their wages from the temple funds but I maintain that they received them from the sums consecrated for temple repairs since the curtains were a substitute for builders work an objection was raised the women who wove the temple curtains and the house of Garmo who were in charge of the preparation of the shoe bread and the house of Aphidus who were in charge of the preparation of the incense received their wages from the temple funds there it may be replied the references to the curtains of the gates for our zero related in the name of Rab there were thirteen curtains in the second temple seven corresponding to the seven gates one for the entrance to the Hikal one for the entrance to the Ulam two at the entrance to the Debir and two above them and corresponding to them in the upper story our rabbis taught the women who brought up their children for the services of the red heifer received their wages from the temple funds Abbasal said the notable women of Jerusalem fed them and maintained them are who not inquired of Rab Talmud Mosque both be may vessels of ministry be procured with the offerings consecrated to temple repair are these a part of the equipment of the altar and were therefore purchased with the offerings consecrated to temple repair or are they rather among the requirements of the sacrifices and were Therefore procured with the temple funds that the other replied may be procured with the temple funds only he raised an objection against him and when they had made an end they brought the rest of the money before the king and Jehoiada were were made vessels for the house of the Lord even vessels wherewith to minister etc. The other replied he that taught you the hagiographer did not teach you the prophets but they were not made for the hose of the Lord cups etc. for they gave that to them. That did the work but if so was there not a contradiction between the two scriptural texts there is really no contradiction the former is a case where after the collections were made for temple repair there remained a balance while the latter is a case where no balance remained but even if there was a balance after the collection had been made what of it or a bad reply Beth did make a mental stipulation that if they be required they should be utilized for their original purpose and that if they would not be required they should be spent on vessels of ministry a tana of the school of Arishmael taught vessels of ministry were provided from the temple funds for it is said in scriptures the rest of the money now with funds should a balance obviously the temple funds but might it not be suggested that only the balance itself could be spent on the vessels of ministry as Rabbah said the burnt offering implies the first burnt offering so must the money imply the first money in. objection was raised the incense and all congregational sacrifices were provided from the temple funds the golden altar the frankincense and the vessels of ministry were provided from the residue of the drink offerings the altar for the burnt offerings the chambers and the courts were provided from the funds that were dedicated for temple repair and whatever was situated outside the court walls was provided out of the surplus of the temple funds and it is this that explains what we learned the city wall and its towers and all other requirements of the city were provided from the surplus of the temple funds. This point is in fact a question at issue between Tanaim for we learned what were they doing with the surplus of the offerings for the temple funds beaten gold plates that served as a covering for the walls and floor of the Holy of Holies. Our Ishmael said the surplus of the fruit was spent on the purchase of sacrifices for the dry season of the altar while the surplus of the offerings for the temple funds was spent upon vessels of ministry. Our Akiva said the surplus of the offerings for the temple funds was spent on sacrifices for the dry season of the altar while the surplus of the drink offerings was used for the purchase of the vessels of ministry. Our Hannah the deputy high priest said the surplus of the drink offerings was spent on sacrifices for the dry season of the altar while the surplus of the offerings for the temple funds was spent on vessels of ministry and neither the one nor the other admitted that there ever was a surplus in the proceeds of the fruit what is meant by fruit it was taught what were they doing with the surplus of the offering to the temple funds they bought fruit at a low price and sold it at a higher price and with the profit sacrifices were purchased for the dry season of the altar and it is this that explains what we learned the surplus of the fruits was spent on sacrifices for the dry season of the altar what is meant by neither the one nor the other admitted that there ever was a surplus in proceeds of the fruit the following of which we learned what were they doing with the surplus of the temple funds they purchased there with wines oils and various kinds of fine flour and the profit resulting was credited to the sacred funds so our Ishmael our Akiva said no sale for profit is made with the sacred funds nor out of those of the poor why may no sales for profit be made with Sacred funds there must be no poverty where there is wealth why is no sale for profit made with the poor funds because a poor man might come unexpectedly and there would be nothing to give him if a man went to a country beyond the sea it was stated Rab ruled Talmud, Mosque both an allowance for maintenance must be granted to a married woman but Samuel ruled no allowance may be granted to a married woman said Samuel Abba agrees with me that no allowance is to be granted during the first three months because no man leaves his house empty in a case where a report was received that he was dead there is no difference of opinion between them they only differ when no one heard that he was dead Rab ruled an allowance for maintenance must be granted since he is under an obligation to maintain her on what ground however did Samuel rule no allowance may be granted Arzibid replied because it might well be assumed that he handed over to her some bundles of valuables or papa. Replied we must take into consideration the possibility that he told her to deduct the proceeds of your handiwork for your maintenance what is the practical difference between them the practical difference between them is a case of a woman who is of age but the proceeds of whose handiwork did not suffice for her maintenance or a minor the proceeds of whose handiwork is sufficient for her maintenance we learned if a man went to a country beyond the sea and his wife claimed maintenance. Hanan ruled she
daughters or for anything else Arshi's hate replied here it is a case where a husband maintained his wife at the hands of a trustee if so should not maintenance be granted to one's sons and daughters also it is a case where a husband made provision for the maintenance of his wife but not of his daughters once the certainty this however said our papa is the explanation this is a case where she heard from one witness that her husband had died to her since she could marry on the evidence of one witness we must also grant maintenance to his sons and daughters however since they even if they desired it could not be allowed to take possession of his estate on the evidence of one witness maintenance also may not be granted what is meant by anything else our historic reply cosmetics are joseph reply charity according to him who replied cosmetics the ruling would apply with even greater force to talmud mosque both be charity however who reply charity restricts it Ruling to this alone, but cosmetics he maintains must be given to her, for her husband would not be pleased that she should lose her comeliness. Come and hear Yebama during the first three months is maintained out of the estate of her husband. Subsequently, she is not to be maintained either out of the estate of her husband or out of that of the lover. If, however, the lover appeared in court and then absconded, she is maintained out of the estate of the lover. Samuel can answer you what possibility need we take into consideration in the case of this woman if that of having been entrusted with bundles of valuables one could well object that such a lover is not well disposed towards her and if that of the remission of her handiwork the fact is it could be retorted that she is under no obligation to give it to him. Come and hear a woman who went with her husband to a country beyond the sea and then came back and stated, My husband is dead, may if she wishes successfully. Claim her maintenance and if she prefers may equally claim her kathuba if she stated however my husband has divorced me she may be maintained to the extent of her kathuba here also it may be replied it is a case where a report was received that he had died then why is she maintained only to the extent of her kathuba because she herself has brought the loss upon herself come and here in what circumstances was it laid down that a minor who exercised her right of refusal is not entitled to maintenance it cannot be said in those of one who lives with her husband since in such circumstances her husband is under an obligation to maintain her but in those for instance of one whose husband went to a country beyond the sea and she borrowed money and spent it and then exercised her right of refusal now the reason why she is not entitled to maintenance is obviously because she exercised her right of refusal had she however not exercised her right of refusal Maintenance would have been granted to her. Samuel can answer you what possibility need we provide against as far as she is concerned if against that of having been entrusted with bundles of valuables it may be pointed out that no one entrusts a minor with valuables and if against that of the man's remission of her handiwork the fact is it could be argued that the handiwork of a minor does not suffice for her maintenance what is the ultimate decision when Ardini came you related such a case was submitted to Rabbi at Bethshiarim and he granted the woman an allowance for her maintenance while a similar case was submitted to Arishmael at Sephoris and he did not grant her any maintenance or Yohanan was astonished at this decision what reason he wondered could Arishmael see that in consequence of it he allowed her no maintenance surely the sons of the high priest and Hanan differed only on the question of the oath but they all agreed do they not that maintenance is too. Be given to her. Our shaman B. Abba answered him. Our master Samuel in Babylon has long ago explained this as being a case where a report had been received that the absent husband had died. You, the other remarked, explained so much with this reply. When Rabin came, you related such a case was submitted to Rabbi Abba and he did not grant the woman any maintenance. While in a similar case, which was submitted to our Ishmael at Sephoris, the latter granted her an allowance for her maintenance. Said Aryohan, and what reason could Rabbi see for not granting her an allowance when Hanan and the sons of the high priest obviously differed only in respect of the oath, but agreed that maintenance is to be given her. Our shaman B. Abba replied, Samuel in Babylon has long ago explained this as being a case where a report has been received that the absent husband had died. You, the other remarked, explained so much with this answer. The law, however, is in agreement with Rabbi and a married woman is to be. Granted an allowance for her maintenance, the law is also in agreement with the ruling which Arhuna laid down in the name of Rab Arhuna, having stated on the authority of Rab a wife is within her rights when she says to her husband, I desire no maintenance from and refuse to do any work for you. The law furthermore agrees with the ruling of Arzibit in respect of glazed vessels. Arzibit having laid down glazed vessels are permitted if they are white or black but forbidden if green. This, however, applies only to such as have no cracks but if they have cracks they are forbidden. Mishnah, if a man went to a country beyond the sea and someone came forward and maintained his wife Hain and said he loses his money, the sons of the high priest differed from him and ruled let him take an oath as to how much he spent and recover it. Said Ardosa Biharkinus, my opinion is in agreement with the ruling Arhuna and Bizakai said Hain and spoke well for the man put his money on a stag's horn tomorrow elsewhere we. Have learned if a man is forbidden by a vow to have any benefit from another Talmud, Moscatha both of the latter may nevertheless pay for him his check or repay his debt and restore to him any object he may have lost but where a reward is taken the benefit is to be given to the sacred funds now one can well be satisfied with the ruling that he may pay for him his check because by this payment he merely performs a religious act for it was taught it is lawful to withdraw from the funds of the temple treasury on the account of that which was lost collected or about to be collected and the ruling that he may restore to him any object he may have lost is also intelligible since thereby also he is performing a religious duty but how could he be permitted to repay his debt when thereby he undoubtedly benefits him or Ashai replied this ruling is that of Hanan who said he loses his money Rabbah however replied the ruling may be said to agree even with the view of the rabbis for here we are dealing with the case of a man who borrowed money on the condition that he does not repay it except when he is inclined to do so it is well that Rabbah does not give the same reply as Arashai since he wishes the ruling to agree even with the opinion of the rabbis on what ground however does not Arashai wish to give the same reply as Rabbah Arashai can answer you granted that he has no actual benefit Talmud, Mosque Ketha both be has he not some benefit in being spare shame. Another reading there also he has benefit the benefit that he need not feel embarrassed in the other's presence mission had been laid down seven rulings if a man dies and leaves sons and daughters if the estate is large the sons inherit it and the daughters are maintained from it and if the estate is small the daughters are maintained from it and the sons can go begging admin said am I to be the loser because I am a male or Gamaliel said admin's view has my approval tomorrow what does he mean? Abbe replied he means this am I to be the loser because I am a male and capable of engaging in the study of the Torah said Rabbah to him would then he who is engaged in the study of the Torah be entitled to heirship while he who is not engaged in the study of the Torah not be entitled to be but said Rabbah it is this that he meant am I because I am a male and entitled to be in the case of a large estate to be the loser of my rights in the case of a small estate mission of a man claimed from another jars of oil and the latter admitted his claim to empty jars had been ruled since he admitted a portion of the claim he must take an oath but the sages said the admission of the portion of the claim is not of the same kind as the claim Argamaliel said admin's view has my approval tomorrow from this it may be inferred that according to the rabbis a man from whom one claimed wheat and barley and he admitted the claim to the barley is exempt from oath must it then be said that this presents an objection against the ruling which Arnaman laid down in the name of Samuel for Arnaman laid down in the name of Samuel a man from whom one claimed wheat and barley and he admitted one of them is liable to an oath Rab Judah replied in the name of Rab Armishna deals with the case of one from whom a certain quantity of oil was claimed if so what could admin's reason be this however said Rabbah is the explanation both agree that where the claimant said to the other I have the contents of ten jars of oil in your tank he claims from him the oil but not the jars and if he said you owe me ten jars full of oil he claims both the oil and the jars they only differ where the claimant said to him you owe me ten jars of oil admin maintains that in this expression a claim for the jars also is implied and the rabbis contend that in this expression the jars were not implied the reason then is because in this expression the jars were not implied but if it Jars had been implied in this expression he would apparently have been liable to the oath must it consequently be presumed that this presents an objection against the ruling of our high Abba for our high Abba ruled a man from whom one claimed wheat and barley and he admitted one of them is exempt from an oath our shy be as she replied the making of such a claim is the same as if one had claim
Remain single until my hair grew gray, but now that my father has promised it, what can I do? Either marry me or set me free. Our Gamaliel said, Edmund's words have my approval. Gamara, our mission does not uphold the same view as that of the following Tanifer. It was taught our Jose, son of Arjuna, stated there was no difference of opinion between Edmund and the sages that where a man promised a sum of money to his prospective son in law and then defaulted his daughter may say, My father has promised. On my behalf, what can I do? They only differ where she herself promised a sum of money on her own behalf, in which case the sages ruled let her remain single until her hair grows gray while Edmund maintained that she could say, I thought that my father would pay for me the promised amount, but now that my father does not pay for me, what can I do? Either marry me or set me free, said our Gamaliel. Edmund's words have my approval. A Tanit taught this applies only to a woman who is of age, but in the case. Of a minor compulsion may be used who is to be compelled if the father be suggested should not the ruling it may be retorted be reversed but said rob compulsion is exercised against the prospective husband that he may give her a letter of divorce or Isaac B. Eliezer laid down on the authority of Hezekiah wherever Argamaliel stated Edmund's words have my approval the Halisha agrees with him said Rabbi to Arnam and even in the Beritha the other replied did we say in the Mishnah what we said was wherever Argamaliel stated said Arzera in the name of Rabbi B. Jeremiah as to the two rulings which Hanan has laid down the Halisha is in agreement with him who followed his view but in respect of the seven rulings that were laid down by him the Halisha is not in agreement with him who followed his view what does he mean if it be suggested that he means this as to the two rulings which Hanan has laid down the Halisha is in agreement with himself and with him who followed his view and that in respect of the seven rulings that were laid down by Edmund the Halachah is neither in agreement with himself nor with him who followed his view it may be objected did not our Isaac B. Eliezer lay down on the authority of Hezekiah that wherever Argamaliel stated Edmund's words have my approval the Halachah agrees with him what he meant however must have been this as to the two rulings which Hanan has laid down the Halachah is in agreement with himself and with him who followed his view. But in respect of the seven rulings that were laid down by Edmund the Halachah does not agree with him who followed his view but agrees with himself in all his rulings but surely our Isaac B. Eliezer laid down on the authority of Hezekiah that wherever Argamaliel stated Edmund's words have my approval the Halachah agrees with him does not this imply only where he stated but not where he did not state the fact however is that he meant this as to the two rulings which Hanan has laid down it. Halacha is in agreement with himself and with him who followed him but of the seven rulings that were laid down by him and there are some concerning which the Halacha is in agreement with himself and with him who followed his view while there are others concerning which the Halacha does not agree with him but with him who followed his view the rule being that wherever Argamaliel stated Edmund's words have my approval is the Halacha in agreement with him but not elsewhere Mishnah if a man contests the ownership of a field on the deed of sale of which he is signed as a witness Edmund ruled his claim is admissible because he can say litigation with the second is easier for me since the first is a more difficult person than he the sages however ruled that he has lost his right if the seller made it a boundary mark for another person the contestant has lost his right Gamar Abbe said this was taught only in respect of a witness but a judge does not lose his title for our high talk witnesses may not sign a deed unless they have read it Talmud, Mosketa both be but judges may sign even though they have not read it if the seller made it a boundary mark for another person Abbe said this was taught only where it was for another person but if it was made a boundary mark for himself he does not lose his right for he can say had I not done that for him he would not have sold the field to me what possible objection can you have that he should have made a declaration to that effect your friend it can be retorted has a friend and the friend of your friend has a friend a certain man once made a field a boundary mark for another person and one of the witnesses having contested its ownership died when a guardian was appointed over his estate the guardian came to Abbe who quoted to him if the seller made it a boundary mark for another person the contestant has lost his right if the father of the orphans had been alive the other Retorted could he not have pleaded I have conceded to him only one for O you speak well he said for our Yohanan stated if he submitted the plea I have conceded to you only one for O he is believed proceed at any rate Abbey later told the guardian to give him one for O on that for O however there was a nursery of palm trees and the guardian said to him had the father of the orphans been alive could he not have submitted the plea I have repurchased it from him you speak well. Abbey said to him for our Yohanan ruled if he submitted the plea I have repurchased it from him he is believed said Abbey anyone who appoints a guardian should appoint one like this man who understands how to turn the scales in favor of orphans mission if a man went to a country beyond the sea and in his absence the path to his field was lost it been ruled let him walk to his field by the shortest way the sages however ruled let him either purchase a path for himself even though it cost. A may hundred may not or fly through the air tomorrow what is the rabbi's reason does not admin speak well rab judah replied in the name of rab the ruling refers to a field for instance which the fields of four persons surrounded on its four sides if that be so what can be admin's reason rab explained where four persons succeeded to the adjacent fields by virtue of the rights of four persons respectively or where four persons succeeded to them by virtue of one all agree that these may turn him away they only differ where one person succeeded to all the surrounding fields by virtue of four persons admin is of the opinion that the claimant can say to that person at all events my path is in your territory and the rabbis hold the opinion that the defendant might retort if you will keep quiet well and good but if not l will return the deeds to their respective original owners whom you will have no chance of calling to lie dying man once instructed those around him that a palm tree shall be given to his daughters, but the orphans proceeded to divide the estate and gave her no palm tree. Our Joseph, in considering the case, intended to lay down that it involved the very same principle as that of our mission. But Abbe said to him, Are the two alike there? Each one can send a claimant to the path away, but here the palm tree is in their common possession. What is their way out? They must give her a palm tree and divide the estate all over again. A dying man once instructed those around him that a palm tree shall be given to his daughter when he died. He left two halves of a palm tree. Set our Ashi discussing the case and grappled with this difficulty. Do people call two halves of palm trees a palm tree or not? Set our Mordecai to our Ashi. Thus said Abimi of Hagronia in the name of Rabba. People do call two halves of palm trees a palm tree. Talmud, Mosketa, both a mission of a man produced a bond of indebtedness against another and the latter produced. A deed of sale showing that the former had sold him a field had been ruled the other can say had I owed you anything you would have recovered it when you sold me the field the sages however say the seller may have been a prudent man since he may have sold him the land in order to be able to take it from him as a pledge tomorrow what is the reason of the rabbis does not admin speak well where the purchase money is paid first and the deed is written afterwards no one disputes that the defendant may well say to the claimant you should have recovered your debt when you sold me the field they only differ where the deed is written first and the purchase money is paid afterwards admin is of the opinion that the claimant should have made a declaration of his motive while the rabbis maintain that the claimant can retort your friend has a friend and the friend of your friend has a friend mission if two men produce bonds of indebtedness against one another admin ruled it. Holder of the later bond can say to the other had I owe you any money how is it that you borrowed from me the sages however rule the one recovers his debt and the other recovers his debt tomorrow it was stated if two men produce bonds of indebtedness against one another are nomin rule the one recovers his debt and the other recovers his debt Arshis hate said what is the point in exchanging bags the one rather retains his own money and the other retains his all agree that if both litigants possess land of the best medium or worst quality distrain for each on the other is undoubtedly a case of changing bags they differ only where one of the litigants has land of medium quality and the other of the worst quality are is of the opinion that the one recovers his debt and the other recovers his debt because in his view an assessment is made on the basis of the debtor's possession so that the owner of the land of the worst quality proceeds to dis terrain on the medium quality of the other which then becomes with him the best and the other can then proceed to take from him the worst only Arshis hate however said what is the point in exchanging bags because he is of the opinion that an assessment is made on a general basis so that eventually when the original owner of the medium land proceeds to dis terrain on the property of the other he will only take back his own medium land but what reason can you see according to our nomin that the owner of the worst
The time for payment had not yet arrived while payment was not yet due and what it may again be asked is admin's reason this ruling was required in that case only where the holder of the earlier bond came to borrow on the day on which the five years had terminated the masters are of the opinion that it is usual to borrow money for one day and the master is of the opinion that one does not borrow money for one day Rama B. Mama explained we are here dealing with a case where one of the bonds was presented by orphans who are themselves entitled to recover a debt but from whom no debt may be recovered was it not however stated the one recovers his debt and the other recovers his debt the meaning is the one recovers his debt and the other is entitled to recover it but gets nothing said Rama two objections may be advanced against this explanation firstly it was stated the one recovers his debt and the other recovers his debt and secondly could not the other party allow the orphans to dist rain on a plot of land of his and then recover it from them in accordance with the ruling of Arnaman for Arnaman said in the name of Rabu Biabu if orphans collected a plot of land for their father's debt the creditor may recollect it from them this is a difficulty why could it not be explained that this is a case where the orphans owned land of the worst quality and the other owned best and medium quality so that the orphans proceed to dist rain on his medium land and allow him to dist rain on their worst only for even though an assessment is made on a general basis is not payment from orphans property recovered from their worst land only this applies only where the creditor has not yet seized their property but where he had seized it he may lawfully retain admission the following regions are regarded as three countries in respect of matrimony Judea Transjordan and Galilee a man may not take out his wife with him from one town to another or from one city to another within the same country, however, he may take her out with him from one town into another or from one city into another Talmud, Mosque both be, but not from a town to a city nor from a city to a town. A man may take out his wife with him from an inferior to a superior dwelling, but not from a superior to an inferior dwelling. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel ruled not even from an inferior dwelling to a superior dwelling because the change to a superior dwelling puts a human body to a severe test. Tomorrow one may readily grant the justice of the ruling that a wife may not be compelled to move from a city to a town since everything necessary is obtainable in a city while not everything is obtainable in a town. On what grounds, however, can she not be compelled to move from a town to a city? This ruling provides support for our Jose B. Hanna, who stated once is it deduced that city life is difficult from scripture where it is said and the people blessed all. Men that willingly offered themselves to dwell in Jerusalem are and be Gamaliel ruled etc. What is meant by puts a human body to a severe test in agreement with the saying of Samuel for Samuel said a change of diet is the beginning of bowel trouble it is written in the book of Bensera all the days of the poor are evil but are there not the Sabbaths and festivals the explanation however is according to Samuel for Samuel said a change of diet is the beginning of bowel trouble Bensera said the nights also lower than all the roofs is his roof and on the height of mountains is his vineyard so that the rain of other roofs lowers down upon his roof and the earth of his vineyard is washed down into the vineyards of others mission a man may compel all his household to go up with him to the land of Israel but none may be compelled to leave it all one's household may be compelled to go up to Jerusalem but none may be compelled to leave it this applies to both Men and women, if a man married a woman in the land of Israel and divorced her in the land of Israel, he must pay her her ketubah in the currency of the land of Israel. If he married a woman in the land of Israel and divorced her in Cappadocia, he must pay her her ketubah in the currency of the land of Israel. If he married a woman in Cappadocia and divorced her in the land of Israel, he must again pay her ketubah in the currency of the land of Israel. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel, however, ruled that he must pay her in the Cappadocian currency. If a man married a woman in Cappadocia and divorced her in Cappadocia, he must pay her her ketubah in the currency of Cappadocia. Tomorrow, what was the expression may compel all intended to include to include slaves? What, however, was the expression intended to include according to him who specifically mentioned slaves in our mission to include removal from a superior dwelling to an inferior one? What was the expression but none may be? Compelled to leave IT intended to include to include a slave who fled from outside the land of Israel into the land in which case his master is told sell him here and go in order to encourage settlement in the land of Israel. What was the expression all may be compelled to go up to Jerusalem intended to include to include removal from a superior dwelling to an inferior one. What was the expression but none may be compelled to leave IT intended to include to include even removal from an inferior dwelling to a superior one only since as it was stated in the earlier clause none may be compelled to leave IT. It was also stated in the latter clause none may be compelled to leave IT. Our rabbis taught if the husband desires to go up and his wife refuses she must be pressed to go up and if she does not consent she may be divorced without a ketubah. If she desires to go up and be refuses he must be pressed to go up and if he does not consent he must divorce her and Pay her ketubah if she desires to leave and he refuses to leave she must be pressed not to leave and if pressure is of no avail she may be divorced without a ketubah if he desires to leave and she refuses he must be pressed not to leave and if coercion is of no avail he must divorce her and pay her ketubah if a man married a woman etc. is not the self-contradictory it was stated if he married a woman in the land of Israel and divorced her in Cappadocia he must pay her her ketubah in the currency of the land of Israel from which it clearly follows that we are guided by the currency of the place where the obligation was undertaken read however the concluding clause if he married a woman in Cappadocia and divorced her in the land of Israel he must again pay her her ketubah in the currency of the land of Israel from which it follows does it not that we are guided by the currency of the place where collection is effected rabbi replied the rulings taught here are among those in which the claims relating to a ketubah are weaker than those of other claimants for the author is of the opinion that the ketubah is a rabbinical enactment our Simeon B. Gamaliel however ruled that he must pay her in the Cappadocian currency he is of the opinion that the ketubah is pentateuchal our rabbis taught if a man produces a bond of indebtedness against another and the place of issue entered therein was Babylon the debtor must allow him to collect it in Babylonian currency if the place of issue entered therein was the land of Israel he must allow him to collect it in the currency of the land of Israel if no place of issue was entered he must if it was presented in Babylon pay him in Babylonian currency and if it was presented in the land of Israel he must pay him in the currency of the land of Israel if merely a sum of silver pieces was entered the borrower may pay the other whatever he wishes this is a ruling which does not apply to a ketubah. To what ruling does this refer? Our measure she replied to that in the first clause, thus indicating that the law is not in agreement with our Simeon B. Gamaliel, who ruled that the ketubah is pentacle. If merely a sum of silver pieces was entered, the borrower may pay the other whatever he wishes. May not one say that a silver piece merely signified a bar of silver? Our Eliezer replied, This is a case where coin was mentioned in the bond. May not one suggest that it signified small change? Our papa replied, Small change is not made of silver. Our rabbis taught one should always live in the land of Israel, even in a town most of whose inhabitants are idolaters, but let no one live outside the land, even in a town most of whose inhabitants are Israelites. For whoever lives in the land of Israel may be considered to have a god, but whoever lives outside the land may be regarded as one who has no god, for it is said in scripture to give you the land of Canaan to be your god, has he then? Who does not live in the land no god but this is what the text intended to tell you that whoever lives outside the land may be regarded as one who worships idols similarly it was said in scripture in the story of David for they have driven me out this day that I should not cleave to the inheritance of the Lord saying go serve other gods now whoever said to David serve other gods but the text intended to tell you that whoever lives outside the land may be regarded as one who worships idols. Arzera was evading Rabjuda because he desired to go up to the land of Israel while Rabjuda had expressed the following view whoever goes up from Babylon to the land of Israel transgresses a positive commandment for it is said in scripture Talmud, Mosque Ketha both they shall be carried to Babylon and there shall they be until the day that I remember them saith the Lord and Arzera the text refers to the vessels of ministry and Rabjuda another text also is available I adjure you. Daughters of Jerusalem by the gazelles and by the hinds of the field that yeah awaken not nor stir up love until it please and Arzera that implies that Israel shall not go up altogether as if surrounded by wall and Rabjuda another I adjure you is written in scripture and Arzera that text is
is said in scripture and the inhabitant shall not say I am sick the people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity said Rabbi Duarashi we apply this text to those who suffer from disease Arain and said whoever is buried in the land of Israel is deemed to be buried under the altar since in respect of the latter it is written in scripture at altar of earth thou shalt make unto me and in respect of the former it is written in scripture and his law doth make expiation for his people Ola was in the habit of paying visits to the land of Israel but came to his eternal rest outside the land when people came and reported this to our Eliezer he exclaimed thou Ola shoots die in an unclean land his coffin they said to him has arrived receiving a man in his lifetime he replied is not the same as receiving him after his death a certain man who fell under the obligation of marrying a sister in law because he came to our Hannah and asked him whether it was proper to go down there to contract with her leave right marriage his brother Arhanan replied married a heathen and died blessed be the omnipresent who slew him and this one would follow him Rab Judah stated in the name of Samuel as it is forbidden to leave the land of Israel for Babylon so it is forbidden to leave Babylon for other countries both Rabbah and Arjoseph said even from Pamadiva to Bikubi a man once moved from Pamadiva to settle in Bikubi and Arjoseph placed him under the ban a man once left Pamadiva to take up his abode at Astunia and he died said Abay if this young scholar wanted it he could still have been alive both Rabbah and Arjoseph stated the fit persons of Babylon are received by the land of Israel and the fit ones of other countries are received by Babylon in what respect if it be suggested in respect of purity of descent surely it may be objected did not the master say all countries are like dough towards the land of Israel and the land of Israel is like dough. Towards Babylon, the fact, however, is that the fit are received in respect of burial. Rab Judah said, Whoever lives in Babylon is accounted as though he lived in the land of Israel, for it is said in scripture, Hosion escaped thou that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. Abay stated, We have a tradition that Babel will not witness the sufferings that will precede the coming of the Messiah. He also explained it to refer to Husel and Benjamin, which would be named the corner of safety. Our Eliezer stated, The dead outside the land will not be resurrected, for it is said in scripture, and I will set glory in the land of the living, implying the dead of the land in which I have my desire will be resurrected, but the dead of the land in which I have no desire will not be resurrected. Our Abimel objected, Thy dead shall live, my dead bodies shall arise. Does not the expression, Thy dead shall live, refer to the dead of the land of Israel, and my dead bodies shall arise to the dead outside the Land while the text and I will give glory in the land of the living was written of Nebuchadnezzar concerning whom the Almerciful said I will bring against them a king who is as swift as a stag. The other replied, Master, I am making an exposition of another scriptural text. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. But is it not written, My dead bodies shall arise? That was written in reference to miscarriages. Now as to our Abu Bimel, what is it? Application he makes of the text. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it. He requires it for an exposition like that of our Abu, who stated even a Canaanite bond woman who lives in the land of Israel is assured of a place in the world to come for. In the context here it is written unto the people upon it and elsewhere it is written about here with the ass which may be rendered people that are like an ass and spirit to them that work therein. Teacher said, Our Jeremiah B. Abba in. The name of our Yohanan that whoever walks four cubits in the land of Israel is assured of a place in the world to come now according to our Eliezer would not the righteous outside the land be revived our Eli replied they will be revived by rolling to the land of Israel our Abbasala the great demurred will not the rolling be painful to the righteous Abbey replied cavities will be made for them underground thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place Karna remarked there must be here some inner meaning our father Jacob well knew that he was a righteous man in every way and since the dead outside the land will also be resurrected why did he trouble his sons because he might possibly be unworthy to roll through the cavity similarly you read in scripture and Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel saying he shall carry up my bones from hence and our Hannah remarked there is here an inner meaning Joseph well knew himself to be a righteous man in every Way and since the dead outside the land will be revived, why did he trouble his brothers with a journey of four hundred parasangs because he might possibly be unworthy to roll through the cavities? His brothers sent the following message to Rabbi Jacob well knew that he was a righteous man in every way, etc. Ill fi added to this the following incident. A man was once troubled on account of his inability to marry a certain woman and desired to go down to her country, but as soon as he heard this, he resigned himself to his unmarried state until the day of his death. Although you are a great scholar, you will admit that a man who studies on his own cannot be on a PAR with a man who learns from his master, and perchance you might think that you have no master good enough for you here. We may inform you that you have one and he is our Yohanan. If you are not coming up, however, beware, we advise you of three things. Do not sit too long for long sitting aggravates one's abdominal troubles. Do not stand for a long time because long standing is injurious to the heart and do not walk too much because excessive walking is harmful to the eyes rather spend one third of your time in sitting one third in standing and one third in walking standing is better than sitting when one has nothing to lean against standing how can this be imagined in view of the statement that long standing is injurious to the heart what was meant in fact was this better than sitting Talmud, Moss. Ketha both be with nothing to lean against is standing with something to lean against and thus his brothers proceeded to say in their message Isaac and Simeon and Ashai were unanimous in their view that the Halacha is in agreement with Arjuna in respect of the mating of mules for it was taught if a mule was craving for sexual gratification it must not be mated with a horse or an ass but only with one of its own species Arnam and B. Isaac stated by Isaac was meant or Isaac Napa Habai. Simeon are Simeon because the others say Resh Lakish and by Ashai are Ashai by our Eliezer said the illiterate will not be resurrected for it is said in scripture the dead will not live etc. So it was also taught the dead will not live as this might be assumed to refer to all it was specifically stated the lax will not rise thus indicating that the text speaks only of such a man as was lax in the study of the words of the Torah said are Yohanan to him it is no satisfaction to their master that you should speak to them in this manner that text was written of a man who was so lax as to worship idols I the other replied make an exposition to the same effect from another text for it is written in scripture for thy dew is as the dew of light and the earth shall bring to life the dead him who makes use of the light of the Torah will the light of the Torah revive but him who makes no use of the light of the Torah the light of the Torah will not revive observing however that he was Distressed, he said to him, Master, I have found for them a remedy in the Pentateuch, but yet that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive. Every one of you this day now is it possible to cleave to the divine presence concerning which it is written in Scripture for the Lord thy God is a devouring fire. But the meaning is this any man who marries his daughter to a scholar or carries on a trade on behalf of scholars or benefits scholars from his estate is regarded by Scripture as if he had cleaved to the divine presence. Similarly, you read in Scripture to love the Lord thy God, to hearken to his voice, and to cleave unto him is it possible for a human being to cleave unto the divine presence. But what was meant is this any man who marries his daughter to a scholar or carries on a trade for scholars or benefits scholars from his estate is regarded by Scripture as if he had cleaved to the divine presence. Our high B. Joseph said a time will come when the just will break through the soil and Rise up in Jerusalem, for it is said in Scripture, and they will blossom out of the city like grass of the earth, and by city only Jerusalem can be meant, for it is said in Scripture, for I will defend the city. Our high B. Joseph further stated that just in the time to come will rise apparel in their own clothes. This is deduced to menorah and mages from a grain of wheat. If a grain of wheat that is buried naked sprouts up with many coverings, how much more so the just who are buried in their shrouds? Our high B. Joseph further stated there will be a time when the land of Israel will produce baked cakes of the purest quality and silk garments, for it is said in Scripture, there will be a rich cornfield in the land. Our rabbis taught there will be a rich cornfield in the land upon the top of the mountains. From this it was inferred that there will be a time when wheat will rise as high as a palm tree and will grow on the top of the mountains, but in case you should think that there will be trouble. In reaping it, it was specifically said in scripture, its fruit shall rustle like Lebanon, the Holy One, blessed be he will bring a wind from his treasure houses which he will cause to blow upon it. This will loosen its f
of Israel that does not produce a load of fruit for two she asses in case you should imagine that it contains no wine it was explicitly said in scriptures he washes his garments in wine and since you might say that it is not red it was explicitly stated and of the blood of the grape thou drankest foaming wine and in case you should say that it does not cause intoxication it was stated his vesture and in case you should think that it is tasteless it was expressly stated his eyes shall be red. With wine any palate that will taste it says to me to me and since you might say that it is suitable for young people but unsuitable for old it was explicitly stated and his teeth white with milk read not teeth white but to him who is advanced in years in what sense is the plain meaning of the text to be understood when Ardimi came he explained the congregation of Israel said to the Holy One blessed be he Lord of the universe wink to me with thine eyes which to me will be sweeter than wine. And shoe me thy teeth which will be sweeter than milk. This interpretation provides support for our Yohanan who said the man who by smiling affectionately shoes his teeth to his friend is better than one who gives men's milk to drink for it is said in scriptures and his teeth white with milk read not teeth white but chewing the teeth are high beato was the scriptural tutor of the young children of Resh Lakish on one occasion he took a three days holiday and did not come to teach the children. Why the other asked his when he returned did you take a holiday my father he replied left me one espalier and on the first day I cut from it 300 clusters of grapes each cluster yielding one cake on the second day I cut 300 clusters each two of which yielded one cake on the third day I cut 300 clusters each three of which yielded one cake and so I renounced my ownership of more than one half of it if you had not taken a holiday from the tour of the other told him it. Would have yielded much more. Rami B. Ezekiel once paid a visit to Baini Barak where he saw goats grazing under fig trees while honey was flowing from the figs and milk ran from them and these mingled with each other. This is indeed he remarked the land flowing with milk and honey. Our Jacob B. Dust I related from Lot to Ono is a distance of about three miles. Once I rose up early in the morning and waded all that way up to my ankles in honey of the figs. Resh Lakish said I myself saw the flow of it. Milk and honey of Sephoris and it extended over an area of 16 by 16 miles. Rabbi B. Barhanna said I saw the flow of the milk and honey in all the land of Israel. Talmud, Mosketha both A and the total area was equal to the land extending from Bimax to the fort of Tulbank an area of 22 parasangs in length and 6 parasangs in breadth. Our Helbo R. R. and our Jose B. Hanna once visited a certain place where a peach that was as large as a pot of farhino was brought. Before them and how big is a pot of farhino 5 se one third of the fruit they ate one third they declared free to all and one third they put before their beast a year later our Eliezer came there on a visit and a peach was brought to him taking it in his one hand he exclaimed a fruitful land into a salt waste for the wickedness of them that dwell there in our Joshua B. Levi once visited Gabli where he saw vines laden with clusters of ripe grapes standing up to all appearances like calves calves among the vines he remarked these they told him are clusters of ripe grapes land o land he exclaimed withdraw thy fruit for whom art thou yielding thy fruit for those Arabs who rose up against us on account of our sins towards the end of that year our high happened to be there and saw them standing up to all appearances like goats goats among the vines he exclaimed go away they told him do not you treat us as your friend did our rabbis taught in the blessed years of the land of Israel of Beth Sia yielded 50,000 core though and so and even in the days of its prosperity of Beth Sia yielded no more than 70 core for it was taught our Meir said I saw in the valley of Beth Sheen that of Beth Sia yielded 70 core now among all the countries there is none more fertile than the land of Egypt for it is said in scripture like the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt and there is no more fertile spot in all the land of Egypt than that of Zoan where kings were brought up for it is written in scripture for his princes are at Zoan furthermore in all the land of Israel there is no ground more rocky than at Hebron where the dead were buried Hebron was nevertheless seven times as fertile as Zoan for it is written in scripture and Hebron was built in seven years before Zoan in Egypt now what can be the meaning of build if it be suggested that it was actually built is it possible it may be objected that a man would build a house for his younger son before he built one for his elder son it being stated in scriptures and the sons of Hamcush and Mizraim and put and Canaan the meaning must consequently be that it was seven times as fertile as Zoan this refers to stony ground but in ground where there are no stones of Beth Sea would yield five hundred core this too refers to periods when the land was not blessed but of the time when it was blessed it is written in scripture and Isaac sowed in that land and found in the same year a hundredfold it was taught our Jose stated one Sea in Judea yielded five Sea one Sea of flour one Sea of fine flour one Sea of bran one Sea of coarse bran and one Sea of Sibarium a certain Sadducee once said to our Hannah you may well sing the praises of your country my father left me one Beth Sea and from it I obtained oil wine corn and pulse and my cattle also feed on it an Amorite once said to a Palestinian how much do you gather from that day tree that stands on the bank of it Jordan 60 core the other replied you have not improved it the former said to him but rather ruined it we used to gather from it 120 core I too the other replied was speaking to you of the yield of one side only Arhista stated what was meant by the scriptural text I give thee a pleasant land a heritage of the deer why was the land of Israel compared to a deer to tell you that as the skin of a deer cannot contain its flesh so cannot the land of Israel contain its. Produce another explanation as the deer is the swiftest among the animals so is the land of Israel the swiftest of all lands in the ripening of its fruit in case one should suggest that as the deer is swift but his flesh is not fat so is the land of Israel swift to ripen but its fruits are not rich it was explicitly stated in scripture flowing with milk and honey thus indicating that they are richer than milk and sweeter than honey when our Eliezer went up to the land of Israel he remarked I have escaped one penalty when he was ordained he said I have now escaped two penalties when he was given a seat on the council for intercalation he exclaimed I have escaped the three penalties for it is said in scripture and my hand shall be against the prophets that see vanity etc they shall not be in the council of my people which refers to the council for intercalation neither shall they be written in the register of the house of Israel refers to ordination neither shall they enter into the land of Israel is to be understood in accordance with its plain meaning when Arzara went up to the land of Israel and could not find a ferry wherein to cross a certain river he grasped a rope bridge and crossed there upon a certain Sadducee sneered at him hasty people that put your mouths before your ears you are still as ever clinging to your hastiness the spot the former replied which Moses and Aaron were not worthy of entering who could assure me that I should be worthy of Entering our Abba used to kiss the cliffs of Ago, our Hanana used to repair its roads, our MI and our Sea Talmud, Mosque both used to rise from their seats to move from the sun to the shade and from the shade to the sun, our High began to roll himself in its dust, for it is said in scripture, for thy servants take pleasure in her stones and love her dust, our Zara said, our Jeremiah be Abba stated in the generation in which the son of David will come, there will be prosecution against scholars when I repeated the statement in the presence of Samuel, he exclaimed, there will be test after test, for it is said in scripture, and if there be a tent in it, it shall again be eaten up, our Joseph learned, there will be plunderers and plunderers of the plunderers, our High be Ashi stated in the name of Rab, in the time to come, all the wild trees of the land of Israel will bear fruit, for it is said in scripture, for the tree beareth its fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength.